Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society representative in your community. Homeowners, attention please. Have you heard about the assured home ownership plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society? If not, be sure to listen carefully to the middle commercial. Find out why this Equitable Society plan is both a money saver and a home saver. Find out why the Equitable Society calls it America's finest plan for home ownership. Tonight's FBI file, The Reluctant Thief. Every study made into the field of crime by your FBI in recent years has shown that juvenile delinquency is the number one problem facing law enforcement agencies all over the nation. The most recent study covering all crimes committed in the past year is no exception. Year by year, America is producing more and more junior criminals. Youngsters who will, unless headed off, Keep the crime wave mounting. For example, and this is only one of the frightening statistics produced by the study, the number of youngsters arrested in 1946 between the ages of 18 and 20 was 24% higher than in 1945. That is a jump of almost one quarter. And as if to prove the inevitable consequences of the juvenile delinquents who grew up through the war years... Arrests in the age bracket of 21 to 24 rose more than 64%. The time to do something about the juvenile delinquency problem is now, for tomorrow may be too late. Tonight's FBI file opens in a modest frame house located in the suburbs of a small eastern city. A stout, middle-aged woman is tidying up the living room of this dwelling. As the front doorbell rings, the woman hurries to the door and opens it. Hiya, Mom. Eddie. Yeah. Oh, son, it's so good to see you. (laughs) Oh, goodness, let's not stand out here. Come in, son, come in. Okay, Mom, sure. Oh, now let me have a good look at you. Look okay? Wonderful. One thing I can say for the school, they sure fed me good. They must have. Goodness, how you've grown. Well, it's been almost a year, Mom. That's right, it has. Hey, where's Joey? Oh, he's out, out playing. Didn't he know I'd be home this afternoon? Well, uh, yes, he did. What's the matter? Didn't you want to see his own brother? Uh, Son, Joey is... Uh, well, I've been having quite a bit of trouble with him lately. What about? He just refuses to pay any attention to what I tell him. Oh, wise guy stuff, huh? Not really. After all, he's only 15. Well, that's old enough to know better, Ma. He'll learn, Eddie. Right now, he just doesn't seem to understand. Well, look, will you let me have a talk with him? Oh, I wish you would. Oh, heaven, son, you must be starved. Now, you go inside and get washed, and I'll set out your dinner. Wait, Mom, why don't you let... Is that you, Joey? Yeah, Mom. Well, come on in here, Eddie's home. Oh. Hiya, Joey. Hello, Eddie. Well, Joey, aren't you going to say you're glad to see him? Glad to see you, Eddie. That's better. Joey, where are you going? In my room. Wait a minute. Huh? I want to talk to you. Well... Joey, Mom says you've been giving her trouble while I was away. How? Not minding it. That ain't so. Look, kid, Mom just told me. Now, just a minute, both of you. I didn't say that Joey didn't mind me. It's just that he's slow. He doesn't understand. I can't help that. You certainly can, son. People aren't born thieves. It takes a lot of thought, a lot of practice. But I don't like stealing. (laughs) Get him. I mean it. 
I'd rather be doing things like other kids do. How square can you get? Now, don't pick on him, Eddie. I know how the boy feels. His Uncle Ben was the same way when he was a kid. So what? So, when my mother finished with him, he turned out to be the best safe cracker this side of the Mississippi. Well, he ain't no Uncle Ben. He can be. Now that you're home again and can work right with him, he'll pick up things in no time. Maybe. Say, you must have picked up some new tricks at the reform school that you could teach him. Yeah. Then starting tomorrow, you can take your brother right under your wing. <laughs> On the outskirts of the same city at the local police pistol range, FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor has accepted an invitation for an afternoon of practice. Jim, hmm? Jim Taylor. Yes? Hello there, you remember me? Oh, sure, you're Tom Gelford. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Swell. Hey, you were at the police academy last year when I was taking my refresher course. Right. When did you get into town? Several days ago. Oh, I've been temporarily assigned to our local field office here. Say, how about having dinner with me one night this week? Why, sure. Now, how's Friday night? Friday? Friday's fine. And, uh, do you mind if I mix a little business with the food? <laughs> Not at all, Tom. Our police chief has just assigned me to head up our juvenile delinquency bureau. Oh, I see. I know you fellas are interested in the problem. I'm going to call on you for some advice. Well, I'll be glad to help you with anything I can, Tom. Swell. Say, there's a target free now. Let's do a little shooting, huh? I'm out here in the kitchen, son. Well, dinner'll be ready, boy. I'm starved. Yeah, we'll eat just as soon as these potatoes boil. Where's Joey? Oh, he stopped off at the candy store. Oh, did you work with him today? Yeah. How'd it go? Oh, he's coming along. Still kind of stupid, though. Eddie, you've just got to be patient with the boy. Now, what did you have him do? Well, I took him to the five and dime store. Had him lift a few things. Novelty stuff, you know. Yes. Well, he'd done that clean enough. What else? Oh, he snatched a purse right out of a dame's hand while she was parking her car. Any trouble? No, he lost himself in the crowd pretty good. Well, that sounds like he's doing fine. Why do you say he's still stupid? Well, Mom, because you can see he ain't getting no kicks. It's, it's like work to him. Oh, he'll get over that. Uh, Just wait till we get to the big city. What big city? New York. Where are we going there? Tomorrow night, if we're lucky. Huh. What do we use for money? You and Joey are going to get it. Oh. I've got a job all cased out for you. Yeah? Well, what's the setup? A big house out in Brentwood. A friend of mine worked out there. She nailed the combination of the safe. She gave it to you? Yeah. The people who own the place are out of town, and there's no one there but a caretaker. Oh, boy, that sounds like a breeze. Well, it'll have to be a daytime job. Caretaker naps every day from two to four. That's when you and jo Joey move in. What do we need him for? Well, you'll need a lookout. Besides, you can use the experience. Oh, okay. Well, what's in the safe, do you know? Cash and jewelry. Hey, that should take us to New York real good. Oh, yes, that's what I've always lived for. Once my two boys get on the big time, I know they'll go right to the top. <laughs> Where's the safe? It's supposed to be right behind this picture. There's a catch here someplace. Find it? Yeah, yeah, here it is. Look, you stay by that door. Okay. Eddie, what is it? Did you open it yet? Of course not, stupid. These take time. Oh. Hey, what is it? Give me one of them cigarettes. Where are they? On the table there. Okay, do you need me? Oh, you stupid! I couldn't help it, Eddie. I caught the lamp with my elbow. Shut up. Get back by the door. Listen for that caretaker. Okay. You hear anything? No. I still better hurry with this thing. Eddie. Huh? Someone's coming downstairs. Listen. Yeah. Let's get out of here. Stay put. But we can't... Get behind the door and shut up. Someone here? Who's behind that door? Come on, I've got you covered. Oh. Now, let's get that safe open. Have some more coffee, Jim? Oh, thanks, Tom. Call me the story. Well, as I told you, wall safe was robbed and the caretaker was slugged. Mm -hmm. I questioned the caretaker just before I came over here. 
He said the two youngsters did the job. One about 17, the other about 14. Did he know them? No, I'd never seen them before. Well, could he give you a description of the boys? No, he couldn't. All was taken from the safe. The money and jewelry. Worth about 5000 you know? I see. Tom, is there any interstate angle? No, unfortunately there isn't. Hmm. Did you pick up any fingerprints around the safe? Uh, none at all. These kids work like pros. Well, Tom, you don't seem to have much to go on. Well, I did pick up one clue. Oh, what was that? Now, this uh, clasp pin. I found it on the floor near the safe. You see, huh? Thanks. Class of 1950, huh? Yeah, that was issued at Northside High School. Well, then it's pretty safe to assume that one of the boys goes there. Yeah. Tom, what time this afternoon did that robbery occur? Approximately 3.15. And how far is Brentwood from Northside High? It's over 15 miles. Well, let's see. If school was out at 3, then the boy who did the job must have skipped school today. I've already covered that angle, Jim. I oh. contacted the principal. He's going to gather a list of all absentees in class 1950. Good. I'm going to check up on those boys tonight. Yeah, Mom. Are you all finished packing? Uh-huh. My bag's out in the hall. Where's Joey? In his room. He's packing, too, I guess. <laughs> I wonder if he can even do that right. Eddie, you've complained enough about him. Look, Mom, I'm only beginning. When I think of the jam he almost got us in today, we could both be in the clink right now. He couldn't help what he did. Mom, I'm not talking about knocking the lamp over. I mean when he kicked that dog. The poor boy was nervous. He had stage fright. It was his first big job. Mom, I'm telling you right now, you're wasting your time with that guy. He just ain't got no talent. Son, let's not start that again. Why do you bring him to New York? Why don't you send him to live with Aunt Mary? Oh, Ed. Why not? And have him wind up working in the bank. Your Aunt Mary is so honest. She's... Oh, that must be Mrs. Carson. She's lending me an extra suitcase. Just a minute. Oh, uh, yes? Mrs. Clinton? That's right. I'm Detective Sergeant Guilford. In my bed. Well? I'd like to talk to you a minute, please. Can I come in? Of course. Come ahead. Uh, who is it, Ma? Uh, a detective. Huh? Um, what can I do for you, mister? You have a son named Joe? That's right. Is he at home? No. Where is he? Out playing. Do you know why he didn't go to school today? Why, what are you talking about? Joe, we went to school. Not according to the records, Mrs. Clinton. Oh, I'm going out back a minute, Ma. Hey, just a minute, son. Huh? Are you Joe's brother? That's right. Is your name Edward? Yes. I believe you just completed serving a sentence in the state reformatory. That's right. I'm afraid I'm going to have to find out where you were today, too. Look, what's this all about? There was a robbery out in Brentwood, Mrs. Clinton. Two boys were involved. Oh, goodness. One of them dropped this class pin. It's from Northside High School, class 1950. That's your son Joe's class. Well, I know that Joey didn't have anything to do with... I finished packing, Mom. Now should I... Who's this guy? He's a cop, Joey. Huh? I thought he was out playing. Uh, he he must have come in the back way. I want to talk to you, son. Uh, what about? This pin. You ever see it before? Why? It was found on the floor in a house out in Brentwood that was broken into this afternoon. Two boys did the job. I, I don't know nothing about it. Where were you today? I was I was in school. Not according to the records? Yeah. That's where I was, I tell you. You're lying, son. Look, I, I don't know anything about that robbery. Then where were you this afternoon? I was... Eddie, Mom, help me. I'm asking you, son. Leave me alone. Where were you this afternoon, Joey? Please. Answer me. Eddie, help me. Sure, kid. Oh, Eddie, my boy, I'm proud of you. <laughs> Tonight's case from the official FBI files will be reopened in just a moment. We work and save to buy the house we live in. It shelters us from the wind and the rain. Witnesses our joys and sorrows. Our home. The more home means to you, the more interested you will be in the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. It's a money saver. It's a home saver. It's America's finest plan for home ownership. Sounds like it was made to order for me. That's right. There's no plan for homeowners like it. Just listen to these four advantages. First, 
During the owner's lifetime, a special cash fund is built up in this plan, ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. Second, as your mortgage shrinks, the cash fund increases. You can use it to pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in approximately 14 years. Third, mortgage interest is only 4%, and there is a liberal allowance to help cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. Fourth, if the owner dies, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage. It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. You mean my wife would inherit our home? Yes, she would. Free and clear? Yes, she would. And interest charges stop the day of death. All in all, a man is mighty lucky if his health, age, income, and the location of his home qualify him for an equitable assured home ownership plan. Well, how can I find out if I qualify, Mr. Keating? Ask your Equitable Society representative. Get full information on the plan that protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. Look in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to the FBI file, The Reluctant Thief. There may be those of you who are listening to this program who doubt that any mother ever existed like the one in tonight's case from the files of your FBI. In a book entitled The Story of the FBI, recently published by E.P. Dutton, you will find in text, and pictures the true story of a mother who went even further. A mother named Ma Barker who taught her four children the gentle art of murder. Or maybe you're thinking that this case doesn't apply to you because you're not teaching your children to cheat and lie and steal. But it does apply to you because the road to juvenile delinquency is paved with the neglect of parents. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. Special Agent Taylor, returning to his desk, finds a visitor waiting for him. Jim Taylor? Yes, that's right. Uh, I'm Dick Rutland, Lieutenant of Detectives over at headquarters. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. I've heard of you. I'm glad to know you. Oh, yeah. Well, I hope you haven't been waiting long. No, no, I just got here just a few minutes ago. Fine. Well, what can I do for you? Well, this isn't a very happy mission I'm on. Oh? I've come here to tell you about Tom Guilford. Why? What's wrong? He was shot what? and seriously wounded last night. What? We didn't find him until this morning. He'd been driven across the bridge and dumped out on the other side of the river. How is he now? The doctors say he's off the danger list. Oh, good. What about visitors? He wants to see you. In fact, he sent me over here to get you. Where is he, Lieutenant? Memorial Hospital. Let's get right over there. Hello, Tom. Uh, hello, Jim. Uh, just take it easy, boy. Keep your head down. Okay. I hear you're doing fine. Sure, I'm okay. Swell. Uh, sit down, Jim. Okay, thanks. Did they uh, tell you what happened? Uh, look, I think I have this story. You just let me repeat it to you, huh? Right. Now, you went to see a family named Clinton. Mother and two sons. One son just out of the reform school. The other goes to Northside High. That's right. As you were questioning them, the older boy pulled a gun and shot you. Uh-huh. Then they put you in the back seat of your own car, drove across the river, and when they hit an isolated stretch of road, they dumped you up. Right. Then they obviously... Wait, Jim. Hmm? What's the matter? Crossing the river took me into another state. Over the state line brings the FBI in. That's right. They kind of got you into this the hard way, huh? Yes, I should say you did. Well, to review the rest of it. An alarm has already been sent out on your car, Tom. So far, there's nothing on that. The Clinton house was searched, but no clue was found as to where they were going. Oh, one thing, Jim. Yes? Someplace along the way, I must have come to... Oh. I'm sure I heard one of them say something about going to New York. Well, the New York police have already been alerted to watch out for the Clintons and your car. Good. New York field office have been notified, too, so something should turn up from one of those sources. I hope so. Now, look, Tom, there's only one thing for you to worry about now. That's getting better. So now close your eyes and get some sleep. you, Mom? Yes. How'd you make up? Fine. Did you see the fence? Yes, he was a very nice man, an old friend of your Uncle Ben. Well, what did he give you for the jewelry? $1,800. Is that all? 
son, when you do business with the fence, especially one here in New York, you take what he offers you. Where's Joey? In the bedroom, getting dressed. Look, Mom, when are you going to have a talk with that guy? Oh, now's as good a time as any. Call him in here. Okay. Joey. Yeah? Come in here. Ma wants you. Okay. What is it, Ma? I want to have a talk with you, son. Well? Sit down. Okay. Joey, you've done several things now that have gotten us into a great deal of trouble. You're forcing Eddie to shoot that cop could have finished all of us. Yeah, I, I know. Fortunately, we got away with it. But we can't afford to have you make any more mistakes. Now, if I give you one more chance, will you promise to behave yourself? Okay, Mom. Oh, that's my good boy. I'm left you. Oh, now, let's see. I left a grocery list here someplace. It's right on the table, Emma. Oh, here. Take this list, Joey. Here's the money. I want you to go to the store. Okay. Hey, stupid. Why? Let's see if you can handle something legitimate without getting into trouble. Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Jim. This is Dick Rutland. Oh, yes, Dick. I just left Tom Guilford. He's feeling much better. Oh, swell. I've just got some news that should make him really feel better. What's that? I got a call about an hour ago from our New York office. They've located Guilford's car. Really? Yes, it was found abandoned on the Lower East Side. I see. And just a few minutes ago, the New York police called. Yes? They picked up a boy. When they questioned him, he... T- Forty minutes. Can you meet me at the station? Sure, Jim. Good. I'll see you at the ticket window. <laughs> Boys, right in this room here, Lieutenant. Oh, fine. Go ahead. Thanks. Hello, Joey. Hello. I'm a special agent of the FBI. FBI? That's right. And this is Lieutenant Rutland. He's from your hometown. Oh. Joey, we've come here to find out where your mother and brother are. I. I can't tell you. Look, son, your brother is wanted on a very serious charge. He shot a policeman. <laughs> Now, you'd better tell us where we can find it. I... I can't. I can't on it. Why not? I... I promise not to mess him up anymore. Please. Please don't make me tell. Look, son. We know they're somewhere in this neighborhood. We will find them eventually ourselves. Now, why don't you help us and save us that trouble? Look. Look, you can talk to me forever. I'm... I'm not squealing. Jim, this is the same routine he's been giving the New York police ever since they picked him up. Yes, I know. Joey... Do you know anything about the law? Why? You were present when that policeman was shot. He'd come to your house to pick you up. That makes you an accessory to the shooting. You know what that means, son? No. It means you can be sent away for a long term if we never find your mother and brother. Do you realize that? I... I don't care. I still ain't gonna talk. Son, you'd better listen Wait to what minute, I... Lieutenant. Huh? Joey, is this your jacket? Yes, sir. We don't have to question him anymore, Dick. I know where they can be found. Eddie. Huh? What time is it? Ten after six. What could have happened to him? He left here over four hours ago. I know, I know. Do you think he could have gotten lost? No. No. He's missing. There's only one reason for it. He's in trouble again. Oh, dear. Now look, Mom, if he's in trouble, he's most likely been picked up. Do you think so? Sure, if he's picked up, he's going to talk. Oh, no. Mom, he's bound to. If he talks, we better not stay here much longer. He wouldn't squeal on his own mother and brother. He's stupid enough to do anything. Wait. Huh? It might be the cops. Well, it could also be Joey. I'm going to find out. Who is it? It's, it's me, Mom. Joey. Oh, thank heaven. Where have you been? I... I got picked up. By the cops? Yeah. What for? I... I tried to steal some groceries. You what? Mom, I thought you'd be proud of me. How'd you get away from them? I didn't get away. What? Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. Oh, Oh, little stool pigeon. You tipped them off where we were. No, I didn't. Your mother tipped us off. I... uh, What do you mean? I found this grocery list in his jacket, Mrs. Quinn. You wrote it on the back of the stationery of this apartment hotel. Oh. All right, now come along, all of you. The 
Clinton family were turned over to the local authorities. Young Joey was sentenced to a reformatory. His brother Eddie's parole was revoked, and he was sentenced to ten years in a state prison. The mother was prosecuted as an accessory and aider and abettor to theft and was sent to prison for 15 years. In connection with tonight's case from the files of your FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, has this to say to you listeners. I quote, Juvenile delinquency is the number one problem of not only your FBI, but of every law enforcement agency in the country. Children constitute one-fourth of the population of our nation and 100% of the future of the country. For that reason alone, we dare not allow another day to go by without interesting ourselves in the problem of how to help the children of America. That is a problem that concerns you because the solution to it lies in your own hometown. There are civic groups in your community who are trying to combat the evil. Join them and fight with them. They need your help because it is important that the children of the country know that the adult population is not composed of their enemies, but of their friends. This is the time to prove to your own conscience that you are indeed your brother's keeper. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. What you said about the assured home ownership plan impressed me a lot, Mr. Keating. I'm going to find out if I can qualify. I certainly hope you can, Ted, because look what you get in one package from the Equitable Society. A mortgage that's paid in full if the owner dies. If not, a cash fund to be used in financial emergencies. And mortgage interest at only 4%. No wonder it's called America's finest plan for home ownership. So don't delay. See your equitable representative soon. Or write to the Equitable Society, care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Frustrated Mice. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Frustrated Mice on This Is Your FBI. Now stay tuned for Break the Bank, radio's biggest money-paying quiz show. Match your knowledge against contestants trying for $1,000 or more. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. One of the great days in a man's life is the day he pays off his mortgage and owns his home free and clear. If you agree, then be sure to listen to the main commercial on this program. Our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society, has some interesting and important information about mortgages. 
you'll learn about the Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan. A plan that's a real money saver and a home saver, too. Be sure to listen carefully. Tonight's FBI file, The Frustrated Mice. In the annual study which your FBI makes of the field of crime, this year's report verified one fact which has been true since the very first survey was started. That fact is that crimes are committed by criminals in line of business. More than 50% of the people arrested in the past year showed records of previous arrests. And a recent study of the prisoners in this country showed that once a person has been to prison, there is better than an even chance that he will again be arrested after his release. Not that regeneration is not possible. Many thousands of prisoners are released every year who go out and live a decent, law-abiding life after serving their time. But mostly they are people who committed their single crime because of circumstances. They did not commit their crimes for profit or as a business. The hard fact is that once a man has been convicted of having committed a crime for profit, he will probably go on being a criminal until the very end. Tonight's FBI file opens in a small apartment located in the downtown section of a large Midwestern city. Wally Franklin, the occupant of this flat, is just ushering in a woman visitor. Throw your coat on that chair, May. Okay. If you want a drink or something, help yourself. Thanks. Working on a little problem here. It's called a fifth at Belmont Park. I saw the Duke today. Yeah? How is he? I'm worried about him, Wally. Why? What's the matter? Staying all alone up in that cabin's beginning to get the guy. Honey, not the Duke. Look, hiding out in a place for four months all alone will show on the Duke or anybody else. Why? What's he doing? Well, about a month ago, when I came up with his food, he asked me to bring some rubber boots next time I came. What do you need with them? Said that he wanted to explore the streams around the cabin. What's wrong with that? Wally, in the old days, Duke Calvert would take a cab if he was going from here to your kitchen. So now he's a lamister. He's got nothing else to do. Two weeks ago, he asked me to bring up some lanterns. That he wanted to explore an old abandoned mine near the cabin. What's the rap on that? Would you go down in a mine? Something was running down there, yeah. Look, honey, you still haven't proved your point. Just wait till you hear what he asked for last week. I brought him out today. What? White mice. Huh? Half a dozen of them. White mice? Yeah. Now, do you think the joint's getting it? Yeah, that don't sound too good. Wally, we got to get him out of there. Honey, the cops are still looking for him, remember? I don't care. Look, he asked me to bring you out tomorrow. Will you come? Sure. Between the two of us, maybe we can talk him into doing something normal again, like robbing banks. You, yeah. Just a minute. Uh, good evening, May. Wally's with me. Well, hello there, Wally. Hi, Duke. Come in, both of you. Go on, May. Yeah. <laughs> Wally, I welcome you to Dismal Villa. Yeah, it's a good name for it. Just hang your wraps on that hook on the wall. Uh, huh. What's that? What? A big box laid out on the table there. Ah, a very interesting project. Come along and take a look at it. The uh, idea was suggested to me from one of the science magazines you brought out, May. Yeah? I just finished it this morning. Duke, what is it? Well, I guess you'd call it a miniature labyrinth. What's that mouse doing in there? He's getting a lesson in frustration. He acts like he's crazy running around like that. He isn't yet. But he will be. Huh? You see, I put cheese in that center enclosure. I let him find it several times. Then I close the entrance. He'll keep looking for that entrance until his nerves break down completely. There, Wally. What did I tell you? Yeah. What did you tell him, May? That this place is getting you. You got to get out of here. My dear girl, this is what keeps me sane. Look, I'm serious, Duke. You got to get into action. I'm going to. When? Right now, tonight. 
That's why I had you bring Wally out here. Duke, you mean you got a touch lined up? Yes. What is it? Take a look at this newspaper. That girl's picture there on the front page. Well, let me see it. Yeah. Queen of Spring Festival. Alice Marshall, daughter of prominent socialite, is chosen festival queen by local florist group. Well, so what? So, she's our action. $25,000 worth. How? That's what her parents will pay to get her back. You mean we snatch her? Yes. Oh, kidnapping's a tough rap, Duke. It's a quick touch. That's what I'm interested in. Getaway money. What's the setup? I worked the whole thing out. Go make us some coffee, May, and I'll tell you all about it. Okay. Oh, wait. Huh? <laughs> Look at that mouse. See how he's acting? Didn't I tell you he'd go crazy? Two days later, in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is approaching his desk. A visitor greets him. Jim Taylor? Yes, that's right. I'm Detective Sergeant Grafton, attached to headquarters. Oh, hello there. Hi. I've just been in to see your agent in charge. He told me to talk to you. Oh, fine. Sit down, Sergeant. Thank you. Well, what can I do for you? We received a report last night about 9 o'clock from a man named Marshall. He's a prominent local banker. Yes. He told us that his daughter had disappeared early yesterday afternoon. She'd last been seen leaving her class at Westside High School. I see. We got a complete description of the girl and sent out an alarm... Nothing came in on her last night. But this morning, her parents contacted us. They'd received a note saying the girl was being held for $25,000 ransom. Well, I gave the note to your agent in charge. He's forwarding it to your laboratory in Washington. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sergeant, was this note mailed to the parents? No, it was left in their mailbox. Have you been able to establish where the girl went after she left school? Well, we contacted one of her classmates this morning. You see, this Marshall girl had been chosen Queen of the Spring Festival. And? Her classmates said a woman approached Alice Marshall near the school, said she was a photographer on a national magazine, and asked to take pictures of her. Mm-hmm. They drove away in the woman's car. And that's the last that was seen of her? Yes. Any description on this woman? None. Has any of this been given to the newspapers? No, the parents have requested that there be no publicity. That's good. Now, did the kidnapper suggest any means of contacting them? Yes. They asked that an ad be placed in the personal column of the Morning Star. I see. Well, Sergeant, I gather that the FBI will merely be observers in this case. That is, until it's established that they've crossed a state line with the girl, or until the ransom money is paid. Yes, but uh, we would appreciate your unofficial help. And we'll be glad to give you that. Or tell me, have the parents consented to take that ad in the paper? Yes. Fine. Sergeant, all we can do now is wait for the kidnapper's next move. I'm out here in the kitchen. Well, what are you doing? Establishing some improvements in my labyrinth. What for? We'll be out of here tomorrow night. Well, I enjoy it, May. It was too simple before, though. The mice broke down much too quickly. Where's Wally? Uh, He went into town. What for? Buy a paper to see if they ran that ad. Huh? Yes, he just called a few minutes ago. Did they run the ad? They did. Good. How's the girl? Uh, she's awake now. I just left her. I think I'd better go in and have a talk with her. What for? I've written a second note, the one telling her parents where to leave the money. I want her to sign it. Make some lunch, will you, May? Okay. Got a key to her room? Yes. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> I'm your host here, Miss Marshall. I hope you're comfortable. I want to go home. When can I leave here? Well, that more or less depends upon your parents. What do you mean? How promptly they pay for your release. <laughs> oh, now, now, that won't do any good. Keep away from me. Don't touch now, me. Now, stop cringing. Let me assure you right now that this is strictly a business proposition. Please get out of here. We have some business to take care of first. Oh, leave me alone. You're just as annoying to me as I am to you. I have a paper here that I want you to sign. Just put your signature on it, and I'll get out of here fast. Jim, are you busy? No, no. Come on in, Sergeant. Well, we've gotten results from the ad. Oh? Marshall's just received the second note. What did it say? 
It instructed them to put the $25,000 in a bag, all small bills. Mm -hmm. Then they're to put the bag in the trunk compartment of their daughter's car. Yes, go on. And they're to keep the trunk compartment unlocked, leave the car in a parking lot at the corner of 4th and Main Street at 8 o'clock tomorrow night. Then they've obviously gotten a description of the car from the girl. Yes. Oh, incidentally, the girl signed the note herself, so we can assume that she's still alive. Oh, I certainly hope so. Oh, by the way, we just received a teletype from Washington on that first note. Oh? What's the story? There were no fingerprints on it other than the girl's parents. The handwriting didn't check with anything in the files. Hmm. Uh, more or less figured, I guess. They also sent a report on the ink. It was manufactured by Carlton Company in 1944. The paper was a cheap variety that sold in countless five-and-dime stores. <laughs> Doesn't give us much to go on. Yes, I know. Now, tell me, Sergeant, have the girl's parents decided to pay the ransom money? Yes. Good. Now, look, please assure them that no action will be taken by any of us until their daughter is returned safely to her home. How did you make out? Okay. Did you get the note to them? Yeah. How about the newspapers? Did they have anything on the kidnapping? No, not a word. Well, I guess they ain't gone to the cops, huh? Oh, of course they have. Evidently, they want it kept quiet. Oh. Well, what's our next move, Duke? We wait until tomorrow night. Then pick up the money. Do we all go in for it? No, that will be May's job. What's that? You're to collect the ransom money. Well, thanks. It'll be easier that way, May. Not if I'm picked up. They'll be too smart to do that. Don't forget, we warned them. If there was any hitch, they'd never see the girl again alive. Well, what do I do with the money when I get it? You call here, then come out and pick us up. What about the girl? What do you mean? When do you release her? We don't. Huh? Oh, that'd be a sucker play, my dear. You mean, when we blow, we take her with us? No, stupid. She stays here. Yeah, but then she could tip off the cops. She won't tip anyone off, Wally. She'll be dead. Tonight's case from the official FBI files will be reopened in just a moment. One of the most beautiful words in our language. A word that paints a picture of happiness and contentment, peace and security. And it is to guard that security, to protect that home, that the Equitable Life Assurance Society created its famous Assured Home Ownership Plan. What's that, Mr. Keating? It's an insured mortgage plan. You see, in the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan, you get these four advantages. First, if the owner dies, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage. It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Second, during the owner's lifetime, a special cash fund is built up in this plan, ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. You mean if I get hard up or lose my job, this cash fund takes care of the mortgage payments for me? Yes. For instance... At the end of five years, the cash fund would be sufficient to carry your mortgage installments for nearly a whole year. You see, as your mortgage shrinks, the cash fund increases. You can use it to pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in approximately 14 years. Finally, mortgage interest is only 4%, and there is a liberal allowance to help cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. All in all, a man is mighty lucky if his health, age, income, and the location of his home qualify him for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. Well, how can I find out if I qualify, Mr. Keating? Ask your Equitable Society representative. Get full information on the plan that protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. Look in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to the FBI file, The Frustrated Mice. As is proven by tonight's case in the files of your FBI, one crime leads to another in a criminal's career. And no crime is too brutal if it serves his purpose. 
Here, it is the plan to compound kidnapping with murder. With the willful taking of a human life. That callous disregard for other human beings, that sudden decision to murder this one and spare that one, is all a part of the criminal's ego. He feels power because he can decide on whether someone shall live or die. And his pitiful inferiority feeds on that power. Whether his name is Hitler, Mussolini, or the criminal in tonight's case, Duke Calvert, he never realizes that there is a consistent record behind every such quest for power. And the record shows that in every case, lust has proven self-destructive. The night's file continues at the kidnapper's cabin. Twenty-four hours have elapsed. Duke Calvert and his confederate are seated at the living room table. <laughs> Wally, look at this. Huh? Just watch that mouse. He's completely frustrated. Duke, if you don't mind, I'll just read this magazine. Huh? Oh, does this bother you? Yeah. Why? I just can't help betting on the mouse. <laughs> look at that little devil. I wonder how she's making out. Uh, oh, May? Yeah. She should have collected that dough by now. Oh, nothing can go wrong. I hope you're right. Relax, Wally. Relax. Hey. I'll get it. Think that's May? I imagine so. Hello? Duke? Oh, yes, May. I got the dough. Any trouble? None that I know of. Where are you now? In a lunch wagon just outside of town. Get out here as fast as you can. Right. How'd it go, Duke? Fine. Where is she? On her way out here. Oh, good. Now, Wally, I think it's time we took care of the girl. Duke, you really going to kill her? Of course. Where's your key? Oh, I have it right... Wait a minute. Well? Oh, it was in his pocket. Yeah, wait a second. Maybe it's over. No. Have you lost it? Well, I got it here someplace. Never mind. There's an extra one on the shelf. I couldn't have lost the whole ring of keys. This will let us in. Wait. Huh? That other door, the back door, it's open. The girl's gone. Gone? Yes. How could she get out that door? There's your answer. What? Your bunch of keys. They're in that lock. She got them and opened it. Yeah, I don't get it. Look, how could she get out there? When did you see her last? I... I don't know. Think. About an hour ago? There's no telling how far she's gotten, you stupid fool. Look, Duke, I, I couldn't help it. Duke, everybody makes mistakes. But you're not making any more. <laughs> The girl's in this room. Motorist brought her here to headquarters about 20 minutes ago. Good. Go ahead, Jim. Thanks. Miss Marshall? Yes? This is Mr. Taylor. He's a special agent of the FBI. Hello. Hello, Miss Marshall. Do you feel well enough to tell us your story now? Yes. Fine. I, I was being held in the cabin. There were three of them. Two men and a woman. I, I was kept locked in a room all the time I was there. Cabin was across the state line, Jim. I see. Go ahead, Miss Marshall. But tonight, one of the men came in my room and forgot his keys. When he left, I used one of the keys to open the back door. Mm -hmm. I ran out, kept running until I came to a highway. And that's when the motorist picked you up? Yes. Where are my father and mother? They've been notified that you're here. They're on their way over. Oh, thank heaven. Miss Marshall, can you give us a description of these three people? Yes, I'm sure I can. And how about the cabin? Do you think you could lead us to it? Yes, I believe I could. Good girl. Sergeant, let's get a description of the people, send out an alarm, and then we'll try and find that cabin. That you, May? Yeah? Just stay right in the car. What's the matter? Turn around quick. Look, what's wrong? Do as I say. Okay. What's happened? The girl got away. What? How? Our dear friend Wally left his keys in her room. Oh, brother, when was this? Oh, a couple of hours ago, I that guess. Jerk, where is he now? Back in the cabin. You left him there? I wasn't interested in bringing a corpse. He's dead? Yes, my dear, he's very dead. That's kind of rough, Duke. I refuse to put up with stupidity. I see what you mean. Where do we go now? Just keep heading down the hill. Then what? When you hit the highway, head south. Well, don't you think the cop... Wait a minute. Huh? Down to the bottom of the hill. Two sets of headlights, two cars coming up. Yeah. Stop the car. Why? No one but cops would be coming up this private road. The girls evidently led them here. Now, 
Where's the money? Oh, the bag's right there on the floor. Is there a flashlight in the car? A glove compartment. Get it. Okay. I'll take the money. All right, come on. Where are we going? Up this hill. You can't go that way. That's sheer cliff. Just follow me. The cops are bound to come along May, and... listen. You remember that abandoned mine I told you about? You brought me the lantern so I could explore it? Yeah. One of the passageways in that mine cuts right through the hill. It opens onto a lake. We can pick up a boat there. Oh, I get it. All right, then. Hurry. <laughs> Sergeant, slow the car down. There's another car up ahead. Yeah, I see it. Oh, the cabin's right up there. Oh, good. The car's blocking the road. We'll have to stop. Miss Marshall, get down on the floor, please. We may have some trouble. Oh, surely. Huh. I don't see anyone in that car. Come on, let's have a look. I'll tell the boys in the car behind to cover us. All right. Cover us, boys. Okay. I got my flashlight. Come on, Sergeant. Yeah, certainly looks empty. Yes, the door is open. Uh-huh. There's no one in it. Uh, Jim. Yes? The motor's still warm. And this must be the kidnapper's car. They were probably making a getaway when they saw our headlights. All right. Sergeant, look here. What? Footprints. A man and a woman's, and they lead up the hill. Yeah. Sergeant, tell your men to take Miss Marshall with them up to the cabin. I think we'd better follow these footprints. Yes, what is it? Oh, that flashlight. Still, I can't see where I'm walking. Very well. You sure you know where you're going? Of course. I've explored this place a dozen times. How can you tell which passage is the right one? We've gone past at least a dozen of them. Are you trying to confuse me? Of course not. Well, then please be quiet. Oh, wait. What? We've come to a dead end. Huh? I'd have sworn this was the right way out. You mean we're lost? I don't think so. You said you knew the way. Well, let's go back. It must be the last turn. But you're not sure. Let's go back, I said. Come on. Jim. Yes, Sergeant? I think I have an idea where these footprints are going to lead us. Really? I'll know for sure as soon as we get up this little hill. Oh, good. Yeah, just as I thought. What? Flash your light over there. Okay. Well, it looks like the entrance to a mine. It's just what it is. It was abandoned many years ago. I used to play up here when I was a kid. Look, those footprints lead right into it. Yeah. Taken quite a chance going in there. It's quite a labyrinth. Sergeant, do you remember it well enough for us to follow them? Yeah. I think I do. Good, then let's go. What? The passage, the one you missed. It, it should be right here. Right around this corner. Oh! Oh, what is it? Big rat ran out ahead of us. Oh, please stop being so jumpy. Come on. Okay. Wait a minute. What now? There are four different ways to go here. I don't know which one to take. Look, I thought you said... We'll, in... we'll, we'll follow this one on the left. Come on. What do you want? What do you don't want? Don't go so fast, please. You want us to get out of here, don't you? Yeah. Well, then we've got to move. Keep moving. You hear me? I hear you. Oh! Don't you hurt? Oh, my... My ankle. Oh, where's the flashlight? I... I dropped it. Oh. Oh, it's right... Right here someplace. Yeah? Let me look for it, man. Yeah? You hear me? I can't see. Have you any matches? No. Oh, now we're really in a fix. Can't even see... We're lost in this darkness. Don't stop it. How are we going to get out of here? Can't even find the place we came in. Look, you're acting like one of those mice in that, that labyrinth. Yes. That's what we are, May. We are those mice. Duke. We're trapped just like they were. All right, down there. Stay where you are. Who is that? Got to get out of here. I'm moving one of you. Oh, I've got to get out of here. Get out of here. Stay with me. Duke, what do we do? Take the girl, Sergeant. Right. I'll bring this man along with me. Duke L. 
Shepard was sentenced to life imprisonment for kidnapping, then turned over to state authorities for prosecution for the murder of his confederate. His girlfriend, May, was sent to prison for life for her part in the kidnapping. In tonight's case from the files of your FBI, you have another example of how weak even a strong criminal is of how little chance there is for anyone to succeed in a life of crime. Because his plans went wrong at one point, the entire structure also fell. But even if everything had gone the way he planned, he would not have escaped. For your FBI does not allow kidnapping cases to remain unsolved. That is part of their credo. And what is even more important, that is also part of their record. Just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. I've been doing some thinking, Mr. Keating, and I've decided to see if I qualify for one of those assured home ownership plans. Let's hope you do, Henry, because look what you get in one package from the Equitable Society. A mortgage that's paid in full if the owner dies. If not, a cash fund to be used in financial emergencies. And mortgage interest at only 4%. No wonder it's called America's finest plan for home ownership. So don't delay. See your equitable representative soon. Or write to the Equitable Society, care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Fugitive Traveler. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Fugitive Traveler on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Among the many life insurance plans offered by our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society, one is of particular interest to homeowners. This plan combines a money-saving mortgage with life insurance security, all in one package. For further information on this Equitable Society Assured Home Ownership Plan, listen carefully to the middle commercial in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Fugitive Traveler. There are more than 5,000 crimes committed in the United States every day. When you pause to think about that fact, your mind conjures up the dark streets of a big city late at night. But the experience of your FBI in dealing with crimes in every one of the 48 states is that crimes don't happen because of geography, but because of people. 
Crimes are being committed tonight in crowded tenement slums and in peaceful moonlit valleys because there is a criminal president in each case. It is true that there are more crimes committed in big cities, but no section of the nation is so remote that it remains isolated from the crime wave. Tonight's FBI file opens in a farmhouse located in the hilly section of one of our eastern states. It is early evening. A young girl is seated alone on the back steps of this hillside dwelling. In a valley below, a passenger train moves swiftly through the dusk. The girl watches the train, her eyes follow it intently. Ned! Ned! What? Oh. Oh, what is it, Aunt Bessie? I've been calling you for the last five minutes. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Did you bring in some wood? Yes, ma'am. Did you feed the chickens? Yes. Did you bring in the eggs? I I think I did. Well, where are they? Uh, didn't I put them on the kitchen table? No. Oh, I I must have left them in the barn. In the barn? Why? I just forgot them, I guess. Well, go get them. Oh, Aunt Bessie, please, not right now. Just let me wait till the train goes around the hill. Oh, good heavens, child. When will you stop this foolish nonsense? Mooning over trains, mooning over books, mooning over going to far off places. I'll get the eggs. If you'd just give a little more thought once in a while to the fact that I'm an old woman trying to run this farm all by myself, and at least that a strong young girl like yourself... I'm getting them, Aunt Bessie. Well, try and remember to bring them right back in the house. We should have to do the dishes in the icebox. Need cleaning. I know. Never mind. Look at your arm. It's bleeding. Yeah. Let me go in the house. Oh, oh. Who else is in that house? My aunt. Is that all? Yes, just the two of them. How did you get here? Where, where did you come from? I fell off a train, a freight train. Oh. That's how you were hurt? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I see. Look, I just want to rest a while, and I'll get out of here. But you're bleeding so you need a doctor. I'll find my own doctor. Did you come from far away? What's that to you? I just wondered. Len? <gasps> Len? Who is it? My aunt, I've got to go. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Do me a favor, a big favor. Don't, don't tell her I'm here. Why? Just do me that favor, please. All right. I'll come back later. Some 50 miles away from the lonely farmhouse in a nearby city at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is approaching the desk of the agent in charge. You wanted to see me, Mr. Henderson? Yes, Jim, come in. All right, sir. Jim, you're about finished with the Brooks case, aren't you? Yes, I dictated my full report this morning. Good. We just received a teletype that you can go to work on. Oh, what's it about? Criminal named Ralph, alias Rip Gibson, was being transported here from the penitentiary to testify at a federal trial. Yes. He was traveling by train, had an armed guard with him. I see. While en route, he requested to go to the washroom. The guard consented. Once he was in there, Gibson smashed the washroom window and jumped off. While the train was in motion? Yes. Well, when did the guard discover this? Almost immediately. Heard the glass crash and rushed to the train platform, saw Gibson rolling down the embankment. Fired at him, believes he wounded him. But Gibson still got away. Yes. When did all this happen, sir? Several hours ago. Any trace of him since? No. Train was stopped, searching party was organized. But Gibson must have found some means of transportation that took him out of the immediate neighborhood. Well, if the guard did wound him, and it's serious enough, he'll most likely be needing medical attention and so... We've already notified all doctors in the escape area. Local police are cooperating, too. Oh, good. I want you to stand by, Jim. All right. As soon as we get a definite lead, we'll go to work. Hello. Hello. How's your arm? Okay, I guess. 
I brought some bandage, some water. Maybe you'd like me to take care of it. Yeah, go ahead. I'd have been out sooner, but I had to wait till my aunt went to bed. Didn't tell her about me? No. I've got to rip your shirt sleeve. It may hurt a little. It's all right, I won't mind. Me? Right. Sorry. Okay. Now let me bathe it. Yeah, sure. I've got to get the wound clean first. The bullet went right through, didn't it? What bullet? The one the guard fired at you. What are you talking about? I know who you are. What is this? I just heard the report on the radio. Your name is Gibson, Rip Gibson. You escaped from your guard, jumped from a moving train. He shot at you. Look, I don't know what you're talking about. They gave you a description. Now, just lift your shoulder a little. Did your aunt hear this report? No. Did you tell anybody else? No. Please lift your shoulder. Okay. That's fine. Now I can put the bandage on. Look, Miss... Uh... Nan. Nan Carroll. Nan. Why didn't you blow a whistle? What do you mean? Why didn't you call the cops? Let them know I'm here. Doesn't matter. I want to know. I know what it's like to be caged. Huh? To not be able to get away. Be free. I've spent my whole life right here. Oh. Anyone who can escape from anything, I envy. I get it. That's the best I can do with the bandage. Well, thanks. I better go now. There's some milk and cheese that I brought out. I'll bring you a real meal in the morning. Swell. Good night. Good night. Well, Mr. Henderson. Yes, what is it, Jim? If you've got the time, sir, I'd like to have you give a report on Ralph Gibson. Let's have it. All right. Well, two hours ago, we received word from a witness who saw a man answering to Gibson's description hop a freight train about half a mile from the point where he jumped. I see. This witness was a railroad employee. He said the train was a westbound freight. Its destination was a point about 50 miles down the line, Centerville to be exact. This was two hours ago? That's right, sir. The train should be there by now. Yes, I know. I've already contacted the yards. Some railroad detectives are going to search the train for me. Good. We have no guarantee, of course, that he didn't jump off somewhere en route. I uh, know. Excuse me. Sure. Anderson speaking. Yeah, just a minute. It's for you, Jim. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Hello. Yes. Oh, hello there. Really? Well, did you... Did you pick up any other clues? Hmm. Yeah, I see. Well, thanks a lot. All right. Goodbye. That was the Centerville Railroad Police. What did they have? A coat that they positively identified as belonging to Gibson was found in one of the freight cars. But no sign of him? No, they feel he jumped off somewhere en route. Oh, by the way, there was a bullet hole in the coat, and it was quite heavily stained with blood, so he was wounded. Uh, Jim, I suggest that you alert the local police all along that 50-mile route. Right, sir. Then arrange for a crew to cover the tracks. See if you can pick up any evidence on where he jumped off that freight. <laughs> Yes, Aunt Bessie. Where have you been all morning? I, I just went out a half hour ago. Well, where did you go? I took a walk. Well, what were you doing in the barn? The barn? I just saw you coming out of there. I was putting away some tools. Oh. I think I'll go... Wait a minute. What? That plate in your hand, that's my best china. What were you doing with it? I just picked it up. You had it in your hand when you came in. Well, if you must know, I used it to feed the chickens. My best china? I'm sorry, Aunt Beth. Wait. Huh? What's that all over your apron? Where? Right there. Looks like blood. Oh. It is blood. I cut my finger. Let me see it. Please, Aunt Bessie, leave me alone. Now, just a minute, young lady. But there's no point in making a fuss over just a little cut. I'm going to go upstairs and fix it right now. <laughs> Rip! 
back here. Oh, you were able to move. Yeah. I thought you weren't coming back till later. Something's happened. What? It's my aunt. She knows I'm here? No, but she saw me come from the barn before, and she saw the plate and some blood stains on my apron. Uh, I didn't know how to handle it. That's why I came here. What should I do? Let me think. I won't let her come into the barn. I promise you that. Uh-huh. Even if she wants wait to, minute, I'm not... Wait a minute. Tell me something about her, will you? What? She got a car? Yes. Is it around here now? Yes. How's she fixed? I don't know what you mean. Has she got dough money? Well, she has a bank account, yes. Oh. How much are you keeping it? I don't know for sure. Well, about how much? Well, the last time she gave me her bank book to take into town, there was $800. Eight, huh? Well, that ain't too bad. Why do you want to know all this? Well, I'll tell you, honey. I feel sorry for you. Real sorry, see? A kid like you should get a chance to live big. Yes? I'm going to give you that chance. How? By taking you away from here. Oh. Oh, of course, we're going to need some cash and a car. That got to get from your aunt. Oh, she'd never help us. I'm sure she wouldn't. Honey, she won't have much to say about it. Huh? We're taking... Oh, I, I, I couldn't do that. Look, you told me last night you've been spending your whole life in a cage. This is your chance, baby, your chance to bust out. I know, I know. If you don't take it, you'll spend the rest of your life in this trap. You can sit here watching trains. Wait. Huh? Look out the window. My aunt's coming. Come in here. Yes. I'll stall her. Keep her off. Hold it. But she's... Let her come in. What? Let her come in. I'll let her find out what it feels like to be caged. <laughs> Tonight's case from the official FBI files will be reopened in just a moment. Home, where Claire and I have lived together all these happy years. Where Sonny took his first steps. The place in all the world we love the best. If that's the way you feel about your home, then it's time you knew about the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. It's a money saver. It's a home saver. It's America's finest plan for home ownership. A money saver, you say? That's right. Just listen to these four advantages of the Equitable Society's assured home ownership plan. First, if the owner dies, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage. It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Second, mortgage interest is only 4%. And there is a liberal allowance to help cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. Third, during the owner's lifetime, a special cash fund is built up in this plan, ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. Fourth, as your mortgage shrinks, the cash fund increases. You can use it to pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in approximately 14 years. Well, that sounds good to me, paying off my mortgage in 14 years with that cash fund. Yes, you might be very glad by then to get rid of further payments. All in all, a man is mighty lucky if his health, age, income, and the location of his home qualify him for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. Well, how can I find out if I qualify, Mr. Keating? Ask your Equitable Society representative. Get full information on the plan that protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. Look in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's... E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Fugitive Traveler. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI points up two important morals. Important because they concern you. The first is that wherever you are, however hidden your shelter may be, the crime wave in this country is your problem because it is a wave that may wash up on your shore at any time. The second moral, and one which your FBI cannot impress upon you too strongly, 
is that you, the decent citizen, should have nothing whatever to do with any criminal. You do not help him by condoning his crime. Instead, you only endanger yourself and become an accessory to his crime. When you come in contact with a criminal, your duty is clear. You should do one thing and one thing only. Notify your local police. Tonight's file continues at the FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is just reporting to the agent in charge. Oh, Mr. Anderson. Yes, Jim. Sending out that crew to cover the railroad tracks is what results. Really? What happened? They're pretty certain they've located the exact spot where Gibson left the freight train. Good. It's about 25 miles east of Centerville, near a community called Ridgewood. Well, I know Ridgewood. I'm a good sheriff up there. Name's, uh, uh, Morgan. Yes, that's right, sir. I just talked to him. Oh, fine. The track crew called him in on the case as soon as they established where Gibson had jumped. He's taking over right now. I think you better get right down there, Jim. All right, sir. Get Morgan to work with him. I'm sure he'll be helpful. Good. I'll let you have a report, sir, as soon as anything breaks. Nan? Yes. How's your aunt? I just brought her some soup. You didn't untie her? No. She was awful mad at me. Well, if she's lucky we brought her in the house, she could still be tied up in that barn. How do you feel? Yeah, I'm okay. Did the walk in from the barn tire you? No, no, I'm doing fine. Rick? Hmm? When do we leave here? Just figuring that now. Look, what about this bank account? My aunt? Yeah. What is it? Savings or checking? She writes checks. Would the bank take your signature? Oh, no. we got to get her to sign one. Rip, I wish we could just leave here and forget about the money. Are you kidding? We wouldn't get as far as that next corner. Well, she'll never sign a check for you. I know she won't. Where's the checkbook? Over there in her sewing basket. Bring it here. I'll get her to sign. <laughs> Sheriff Morgan? That's right. Hello, I'm Jim Taylor. Oh, how do you do, Jim? I didn't know you. Any word on Gibson, sir? Nothing yet, I'm afraid. We have a number of searching parties out looking for him. I see. Our bad break was that it rained last night. How do you mean? Well, as you know, Gibson's presence in this territory was established by that railroad crew who found bloodstains leading down that embankment. Yes. When I got out there, I picked up Gibson's trail. I followed it to a stream about a hundred yards away. It's a shallow stream. Gibson waded into it. Obviously, to avoid detection. Right. Just at that point, the rain started. Hmm. We worked both sides of the stream up and down for several miles, but we weren't able to find any trace of where he came out. The rain, of course, had washed it away. Oh, I see. Oh, Sheriff, could you determine if he was bleeding much? I think he lost quite a good deal of blood. Well, then he couldn't have gotten very far. I know. I've set up a house-to-house search for him. Oh, I'd like to join you in that, if I may. You certainly can. Did you uh, drive down here? Yes. Well, we'll divide up our assignment. I'll give you half a dozen farmhouses all on one road. Okay. You'll have no trouble finding them. Fine. Let's have that list, and I'll get started. And a check. But was there any trouble? Of course not. She was very happy to do it. That's not true. You, you didn't hurt her. I didn't have to. What time is it? Almost one o'clock. This bank stay open till three? I think so. All right. You better get into town and cash us. How much is it for? Five hundred. Dollars? What else? Get going. Rip, I don't think they'd give me that much money. Look, look. You've got a check here with your aunt's signature on it. Tell him that she sent you in for the dough. Tell him she needs it to, uh, oh, take a trip. Yes, but I... They know you at the bank, don't they? Yes. All right, then get it. Trip. Shh. Get rid of whoever it is. I'll hide it here. Hello. Yes? Are you Miss Carroll? That's right. My name is Taylor. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Yes, here my credentials. What do you want here? Well, I don't wish to alarm you, but we have every reason to believe there's rather a dangerous criminal at large somewhere in this vicinity. Oh. 
Have you seen any strangers around your place in the past 24 hours? No, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, I have the man's picture here. I'd like to have you look at it, please. All right. Now, will you try to remember him? And if you should see anyone resembling this man, get in touch with your sheriff at once. I will. I understand you live here with your aunt. That's right, but she's upstairs taking a nap. Oh, I see. Well, just pass this information on to her, too, will you? Yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, uh, by the way, would you mind if I took a look around in your bar? No, go ahead. Thanks again. Goodbye, Miss Carroll. Goodbye. Rip, he was from the FBI. Yeah, I know. I heard the whole thing. He's gone to the barn. He won't find anything. I cleaned up around where I'd been. Oh. Now, look, you wait long enough for him to pull away from here. Then get into town and cash that check. Well, Jim, how'd you make out? I didn't get a thing, sir. I drew a blank, too. Look, I'll tell you what. I'll review all the calls I made and see if by any chance I missed a farmhouse. Go ahead. Well, my first call was a family named Pastor, a man and wife. Right. Did you have any trouble getting in? No, I... Well, they're uh, not usually very sociable as strangers. Uh, they were very cooperative. Good. My second call was a man named Stewart. Oh, Pop Stewart. <laughs> you have to shout at him a bit. <laughs> he seemed pretty deaf. He is. My third stop was at the Carroll farmhouse. Who'd you talk to, Nan or Aunt Bessie? The girl, Nan. Her aunt was taking a nap. Probably just as well. Aunt Bessie's a man-hater. Oh? She won't have one around the place. Wait a minute. Not even a hired hand? No, sir. Hasn't been a man around there in years. Sheriff, I think we ought to go back to the Carroll place. Rip. I'm right here. Oh. I stayed behind the door just in case. Well, how'd you make out? They cashed the check. Good, baby. It's at the door. Just a minute. Here. <laughs> okay. Small bills, that's eh? good. Uh, where's the car? Out back. Right. Give me the keys. Are we leaving right now? Let's have the keys. Don't you think we should do something about my aunt first? We just can't leave her tied up. Honey, will you give me those keys? Sure. Here. I'll go get my bag. Wait. What? I've changed the schedule. What do you mean? You'll stay here. Oh, no. You heard me. But everything we planned, the reason I did all this was to get away. You've got to take me with you, Rip. No dice. You promised. Look, sweetheart, you're better off here. I don't want to stay here. I want to go with you. Oh. Honey, I might as well tell you right now. Going away with me was strictly a routine. What? What would I do with you? All the things you said we'd do together. The places you'd take me. Clothes, I guess. Baby, did you ever look at yourself in the mirror? What do you mean? Guys just don't go any place with an ugly like you. Oh. I'm getting out of here. No, wait. Let go. Dad, you can't leave me here. You can't. Let go, I said. No, no. Okay. <laughs> you just stay put. Hello, Gibson. Huh? You saved us the trouble of coming in for you. Uh, who are you? A special agent of the FBI. What? I was just showing the sheriff here why I came back to this farmhouse. Your footprints there in the mud. Huh? Now I think we should arrange to put you back behind bars. Ralph Gibson was returned to prison after being given an additional 20-year sentence in a state court for his brutal assault on the elderly farm woman. And thus, another criminal was brought back after escape by your FBI and a local, local policeman. Another instance in which local authorities lent a very important hand to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Your FBI has stated before and wishes to repeat that it owes a great debt of gratitude to local police departments all over the nation for the cooperation it has received from those departments. And on this official broadcast, it wishes publicly to thank every local law enforcement agency in the United States.
just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. You say my Equitable Society representative is the man who'll tell me if I can qualify for an assured home ownership plan, Mr. Keating? That's right, Joe. And don't forget, you get a lot of good things in that plan. A mortgage that's paid in full if the owner dies. If not, a cash fund to be used in financial emergencies. And mortgage interest at only 4%. No wonder it's called America's finest plan for home ownership. So don't delay. See your equitable representative soon. Or write to the Equitable Society, care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Curious Cameraman. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Curious Cameraman on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Do you have a mortgage on your home? The reason I ask is this. In about 14 minutes, our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society, is going to tell you about America's finest plan for home ownership. It's called the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. Don't miss this important information. It's sure to save you worry. It may save you money. Tonight's FBI file, The Curious Cameraman. When you hear that there is an army of six million people in the United States today who have engaged in criminal activity, you're likely to think of them as being all the same kind of people. But that would be a mistake, because men and women become criminals for many different reasons. Some do it out of desperation and hunger, others because of passion or revenge. But one group of criminals, however, engage in crime as a business. They are likely to be shrewd and cunning, and are the hardest to catch. This is because they plan their crimes well. And usually they all have one goal. Each one wants to commit the perfect crime. Tonight's FBI file opens in a car that is driving slowly through the factory district of a large eastern city. A man is seated behind the wheel. The girl is beside him reading a newspaper. Pete. Huh? Will we get to the track in time for the second race? I don't know. (laughs) There's a horse here called Paul's Dream. Gee, I gotta play him. It's a hunch for me. My sister used to go with a fellow named Paul. He was all the time having dreams. That sounds very scientific. 
What are you slowing down for? We're, uh, we're stopping here. Why? I'm going to take your picture. What? Sure. Let's get out, Ruth. Are you serious? Yes, yeah, sure. I've got my movie camera right here. Yeah, but what about the track? Don't you want to have your picture taken? Well, sure, but... All right, then just stand over there by that lamppost. Oh, <laughs> you do the silliest thing. It won't take long. Well, is it uh, color film? No. Well, I'll fix my makeup first anyway. No, don't bother. Well, okay. Pete, are you taking the picture from there? Yep. With that half-finished building in the background? Uh-huh. Well, look, couldn't I stand in front of something better than that? No, just stay right where you are. Okay. Uh, you taking it now? Mm-hmm. Well, um, should I uh, wave at something like this? Fine, honey. Well, uh, how about if, um, if I was to, well, maybe blow kisses, huh? Great. Now I'll spin around. Uh, open my coat. Terrific. Pete, I can't think of anything else. Oh, you're doing swell, honey. Just uh, just hold it there another few seconds. Okay. <laughs> ah, that's it. All over? Uh-huh. <laughs> well, when will they be developed, Pete? Oh, next week. I'm dying to see them. I hope they turn out good. Well, I, uh, I got some news for you, honey. Huh? You're not even in them. <laughs> have another drink, Marty? Uh, no, thanks. How about you, Lee? I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Ruth, what's with Pete? What's he doing? Oh, he's fixing up something in the next room. Well, what's the stall? I thought he asked us here to talk about a job. He did. Well, where's the action? Well, he just... Hiya, went... fellas. Oh, hi, uh, Pete. Hey, uh, come on in here, huh? Hey, okay. Me too, Pete? Yeah, sure. Yeah, come go here. ahead, Ruth. Thanks. What goes in here? I want to show you guys something. Hey, what's that thing? It's a movie projector. Huh? I'm going to show you some pictures. What is this? I thought we came here to talk business. This is part of the business. Put out the lights, Ruthie. Oh, sure. Uh, are these the ones you took last week, Pete? The ones I'm not in? Yeah, yeah. Now, let me give you a short rundown here first. This is a job I've been casing for the last four weeks. It's a payroll job. I want you to watch it closely, fellas. All right. Now, this first picture is an alleyway. The construction job on the right is a big factory that's being put up. I took a picture of the alley because that's where we're going to park the getaway car. You'll be driving, Lee. Okay. Now, this view is the whole building. And you see that little shack? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. That's where they handle the payroll. That line of guys there now are getting paid off. There's one guard on the job. On payday, which is Friday... That line forms at 11.30 sharp. Now, the guard starts at the shack and works down the line checking badges. I got two badges. You'll be wearing one, Marty. Huh? I'll wear the other. Oh, okay. Next Friday, we'll be at the head of that line. A whistle blows when they start paying off. Lee? Yeah? When you hear the whistle, you move the car out of the alley and start slowly down the street. Right. By that time, we'll be in the shack. You park behind that pile of bricks, that'll give us cover. By the time you're there, Marty and I will have knocked off the payroll. We'll hop out and join you in the car. Well, that's the story, boys. Oh, that sounds real good, Pete. Yeah, it'll work. How big is the payroll? Around 30000 wow. Hey. Now, I'll run it over again, fellas, so you'll remember it good. Wait, look. Huh? There I am. I'm in the picture after all. <laughs> is okay, Pete. Right at the head of the line. I told you we would be. Only two guys in the shack. I know. Well, this is it. Right. All right, you guys. Come ahead. Let's go. Okay. All right, boys. Come ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Summers, sir. Badge number. Never mind that, you. This is a stick-up. Huh? Cover the Marty. Right. Give me them envelopes. Slap in this bag. Look here, you... Shut up, you. How you doing? Okay. Anybody help outside? No, not yet. Give me that bundle, too, mister. All right, here. Nearly done? Yeah. Yeah, this does it. 
Now, listen to me, both of you guys. Keep your trap shut until we're out of here. Do you hear me? Okay. Now, let's go. What's the here? Around this pile of bricks, Marty. Is that car there? Yeah, yeah. Everything okay? Yeah, get going. Any trouble? No, it was a breeze. I'll cover the back. Okay. Here, Marty. Hold the money back there. All right. Yeah, right. How much you get? The works. Uh, the payroll guy's just coming out in the Lee. street. Lee! Has... Lee, look out for that cab. He's making a left in front of you. Yeah. Well, do something. Swing your wheel. <laughs> you stupid jerk. You okay, Pete? Yeah, we got to get out of this heat. Oh, wait, fellas, my leg. Hey, look. There's a cop in the corner there. Let's blow. Don't leave me. We're all on our own. Meet back at my apartment. Pete, the cop's pulling his gun. Yeah, scatter. Wait, you guys, Wait. Several miles from the scene of the stick-up, at an FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just giving a report on this daring job to a fellow agent. It looked as if they were going to get away clean until a cab accidentally cut in front of a getaway car, Dan, and the two cars crashed. The stick-up men abandoned theirs and made a run for it. Mm, this was just a block from the scene of the stick-up? That's right. And what happened then, Jim? Well, there was a policeman on the corner. He called out to the men, ordered them to halt, and when they didn't, he fired upon them. Any results? He killed one of them, and he believes that he wounded another. The second man, however, still made a getaway along with the third. Yeah. Uh, how about the money? Unfortunately, one of the two men who escaped still has it. Mm. How do we come into the case, Jim? Oh, the car that was used had out-of-state license plates. It was from Illinois. That gives us a basis to help the local authorities. Incidentally, a checkup revealed that the car had also been stolen. I see. It was the driver of the car who was killed. Well, any identification on him? I don't know, Dan. The body was taken down to the morgue. I'm going down there now to pick up his fingerprints and check over his effects. So I'll contact you as soon as I return. Who is it? Me, Mark. Oh, well, just, just a minute. Let me in. You alone? Yeah. Well, where's Lee and Pete? I don't know. What do you mean? What happened? Just let me sit down. Where are they, Marty? Huh. Where are they? We all scattered. We, we're all supposed to meet back here. I don't think Lee will make it. Why not? He got shot. <gasps> Bad. Last I seen of him, he was stretched out in the street. What about Pete? He got away okay. Did the job go bad? No, that worked okay. After we got the dough pulling away, we ran into a cab. Oh. Cops seen us. When we made a break, he started shooting. Help me get my coat off. Will you? What's wrong with you? I got hit, too. Oh, Marty. Where? Here in the chest. Pull that sleeve. Oh, gee, you're bleeding bad, huh? Yeah, kind of. Well, we better call a doctor or something. No, no dice. Well, look, if you... Now, just help me in the bedroom. Let me lay down a while. Sure, Marty. Here, just lean on me. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, yeah that's fine. Oh. Yeah. What about the money? Oh, we got that okay. Has Pete got it? No, I took it. I stashed it away. I didn't want to carry it around. Oh, How'd you get here, bleeding like that? Well, it, it didn't start to get bad till just before I got here. Just let me lay down here, huh? Oh, sure. There, there you are. Well, I'll go get some towels and stuff and fix you up. Did you go to the morgue? Yeah, I just came from there. And? The police have been working. They contacted the Illinois State Police, gave them a complete description of the man who was killed. Yeah? They seemed to think it was a man named Lee Perry. He had a long criminal record. I got a set of his fingerprints and sent them on to the Bureau in Washington. I see. Uh, did the Illinois police have any idea who Perry's associates might be here? No, Dan, they didn't. They're checking on that now, though. Uh, how about the paymaster at the construction job? Hmm? Was he able to identify the other two hold-up men? Oh, he's down at headquarters now looking over pictures. He didn't remember them very well, though, so that may not lead to anything. Hmm. Uh, was there anything found on Perry that might help? The only thing that might be important is a note. I have it here. Huh? It reads, go to Ruth's apartment on 12th Street. Pick her up and have her bring the movie projector to my place. Any signature? No, but this note is written on the back of an envelope which originally contained snapshots, eh? Ah. It's from the Argosy camera shop. Oh, they're down on Spring Street. Yeah, I know, Dan. This envelope has a number on it. 
I'm going over to the camera shop now and see if they have any record of the name of the person these pictures were developed for. Uh, I, I went there. I was there on time. Marty. Little boy. Blue suit. Always wears a blue suit. Marty. Uh, don't, don't try it now. Marty. Huh? What? D- don't you think I should get uh, a doctor? Send a little boy up and down, up and down, race you to the Marty, corner. Marty, will you listen to mm-hmm. me? You need a doctor uh, real bad. Oh, oh uh, water, get me some water, huh? Water. Sure, sure, Marty, sure. I'll be uh, right back. Uh, everybody can swim but me. All the guys... Oh, oh, Pete, I'm so glad to see you. Anybody get here? Yeah, Marty. Where is he? He's in the bedroom. Oh, Oh, he's in bad shape, Pete. He got shot, and he's bleeding real bad. Never mind that, never mind that. Did he bring the dough? No, he didn't. What? What happened to it? He said he stashed it away. He he didn't want to carry it around. I gotta go talk to him. I'll get him a glass of water. He's been saying right along how thirsty he is, and I was just gonna get him... Ruth! Yeah? What is it? Where, uh, where did Marty stash that dough? I don't know. Didn't you ask him? No. Oh, you blubberhead. Look, ask him yourself. I can't, stupid. Uh, He's dead. Tonight's case from the official FBI files will be reopened in just a moment. My house is not the largest in the world, not the finest, not the most luxurious, but it's a good place to live in, the place I love the best. It's my home. You're the kind of man, you who think a lot of your home, that the Equitable Life Assurance Society had in mind when it created its famous Assured Home Ownership Plan. It's a money saver. It's a home saver. It's America's finest plan for home ownership. Sounds good to me so far. Let's hear more. Well, this Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan has four main advantages. First, if the owner dies, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage. It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Second, during the owner's lifetime, a special cash fund is built up in this plan, ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. Third, as your mortgage shrinks the cash fund increases. You can use it to pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in approximately 14 years. Fourth, mortgage interest is only 4%, and there is a liberal allowance to help cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. You mean it? Interest only 4%? Yes, and it's a true 4% rate, because interest charges go down every month. All in all, a man is mighty lucky. If his health, age, income, and the location of his home qualify him for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. Well, how can I find out if I qualify, Mr. Keating? Ask your Equitable Society representative. Get full information on the plan that protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. Look in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to the FBI file, The Curious Cameraman. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI proves that no matter how carefully a crime is planned... There is always some unlooked-for incident that throws all previous calculations into discard. For example, the unforeseen automobile accident which resulted in the death of two of the conspirators. There was no margin for error in the master scheme. And when the accident occurred, the chain was broken and panic replaced planning. Once again, it had been proven that there is no such thing as the perfect crime. 
Tonight's file continues at Pete Warren's apartment. He is pacing the living room floor. The girl, Ruth, sits dejectedly on the sofa. Oh, weeks I spend on this job. Weeks. And what have I got to show for it? A great big hunk of nothing. I'm awfully sorry, Pete. Oh, look, instead of being sorry, if you just had brains enough to ask the guy where he stashed the dough, a five-year-old child would have done that. But you always told me not to ask questions. Shut up. But you did, Pete. Shut up, I said. I'm trying to think. Not having the dough ain't our only problem. What do you mean? Well, I don't know how bad off Lee was. He might be singing to the cops right now. Oh. And that ain't all. We got a stiff in the bedroom, a dead body we got to get rid of. What do we do with him? Well, let me. Think. I'm not asking you. Okay. Oh, give me a cigarette, will you? Gee, I, I don't think I have any. Oh, wait, I'll look in Marty's jacket. Got to figure some way to blow town. I better get a hold of some cash in a hurry. No, no cigarettes in his pocket. Nothing but this claim check. Oh, for the. What? This, here. It's a baggage check. Let me see that. Sure, here. This is from the railroad station. There's a time stamp on it. Hey. What? He checked something this afternoon. Honey. Huh? This is where he stashed the dough. <laughs> Dan, over here. Right. Did you pick up that search warrant for me? Yes, I have it right here. Well, let's go inside. Now, what's this all about, Jim? Well, I went over to the camera shop and had them check the number on that envelope. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Dan. All right. The camera shop said that the films were left there by a man named Warren. He lives at this address. I see. Uh, We go up one flight. Okay. I arrived here, but there was no answer at Warren's apartment. The superintendent gave me a key. So I've been waiting for you with that warrant. Well, do you think Warren was one of the stick-up men? Well, according to the superintendent, he answers to the general description. Uh, to this apartment right over here. Okay. Camera people said he was a regular customer, that they did an awful lot of work for him. I see. Here we are. Go ahead, then. Thanks. Well, let's take a look around, huh? Right. Well, look here. What? This movie projector. Imagine it's the one that was mentioned in the note, and there's a whole stack of movie film here, too. Jim. Uh, What's uh, this? What is it? Jacket. Pretty well soaked with blood. Hmm. And there appears to be a bullet hole in it, too. Dan, looks like this was a good lead. Let's search the rest of the rooms. Okay. Uh, Let's try this one first, huh? This appears to be the... Look, Dan... Yes, I see him. Even from here, I'd say he was dead. Hmm. Do you think this is Warren? No. No, he looks nothing like the description. This must be the one who was wounded. Dan, we'd better call the police at once. Right. And uh, suppose you wait here for them. I doubt that the money is here, but they can search for it. Okay, Jim. I'm going to take these rolls of film back to the office. I want to see what's so important about them that they needed a projector. Yes, come in. Well, how are the movies going, Jim? Oh, Dan, you're just in time. Uh, snap that light off, will you? Sure. This is the reel I want you to see. Okay. Well, these pictures are where the stick-up took place. Oh. You mean this is the way they cased the job? Evidently, yes. See, that's the construction job there. Pretty clever of them. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, uh, yeah. there was no trace of the money at the apartment. I didn't think there would be. One of the men from Homicide identified the body. Oh? A man named Marty Stone. He'd been involved in another holdup several years ago. I see. Uh, is that all there is to this, Jim? The scene of the crime? No, there's something coming up right now that should be very helpful. Uh, Here it is. Oh, that girl? Opening up her coat? That's it. She has to be a friend of Warren's, Dan. So I'm having a blow-up made of her. There might be something she's wearing that'll give us a lead on where to pick her up. And if we find her, we might find Warren.
Hey, I'm over here. Okay. You, you got the money, huh? Yeah, yeah. I thought you said it was in a canvas bag. It was. Well, where'd you get that suitcase? I bought it in a luggage shop. The canvas bag was a dead giveaway. Oh. So let's get going. Where? To get some tickets. We're blowing out of here, honey. Now? Right now. Oh, Pete, we can't. Huh? Why not? I gotta go back to my apartment and pack. Oh, no good. But I haven't any clothes. I'll buy you some new ones. Look. There's a mink coat there, and I'm not leaving it. Honey, we can't take a, a chance. A mink coat's a mink coat. You can buy the tickets, take me home, then we'll get a train. What's happening, Jim? I just got the enlargements on that girl. Here they are. They lead to anything? Yes, I found out that she's the one who's mentioned in that note. Ruth? That's right. Look, she has a lapel pin there. R-U-T-H, see it? Oh, yes. I found something else here, too, but I'm a little puzzled by it. Oh, what is it? Well, as you can see, she's holding her coat open. How many times, you know, women have their name written on the inside lining? Well, there is something on the lining. Yes, but it isn't writing. It's a couple of bars of music. Let me look at it. Here, take this magnifying glass. Okay. okay. Dan, can you read music? Yeah. Well, is there any melody there? Yeah. Uh, it goes... Da, da, da... Da, 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 da. That's the melody. Sounds familiar. Hum it again, huh? Da, 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 da. Hey, wait a minute. That's an old song called Sweet Lorraine. That's right. Dan, her last name could be Lorraine, and that note said she lived on 12th Street. Come on, let's get busy. Aren't you finished packing yet? These are the last things. There, that's all. Well, close that bag and let's get out of here. Okay. Now, come on, come Wait on. Wait a minute. Oh, what now? My coat. I almost forgot my coat. Well, honey, hurry it up, will you? Okay. What time does the train leave? In a half an hour. Oh, there. Now I'm ready. Good, good. I forgot to ask, where are we going? West. Where west? California. Oh, wonderful. Okay, go ahead. Thanks. Just a minute. Huh? Huh? Are you Ruth Lorraine? Yeah. Why? Well, then you must be Pete Warren. Who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. Oh. Look out, Jim! Now, when he comes to, miss, we'd like to talk to you both about some pictures. Pete Warren was convicted in a federal court for violation of the National Motor Vehicle Theft Act and sentenced to serve a five-year term. He was then turned over to the local authorities for prosecution on robbery charges. The conviction of the two criminals in tonight's case makes you stop and wonder why two such people never learned the futility of crime for profit. That such a career is futile is proven again by the fact that prisons all over the nation are full to the point of being overcrowded. And yet criminals will not learn. They continue to try to commit that perfect crime. But they will not succeed so long as there are law enforcement agencies on the job. Law enforcement agencies like your FBI. <laughs> In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Mr. Keating, the more I think about that assured home ownership plan, the more interested I am to find out if I qualify. You're right, Ed, because look what you get in one package from the Equitable Society. A mortgage that's paid in full if the owner dies. If not, a cash fund to be used in financial emergencies. And mortgage interest at only 4%. No wonder it's called America's finest plan for home ownership. So don't delay. See your equitable representative soon. Or write to the Equitable Society care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. 
The Horoscope Homicide. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Jim Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Horoscope Homicide on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Did you ever hear of a mortgage that cancels itself if the owner dies? That's the kind of modern mortgage that thousands of American homeowners now have. They've taken advantage of the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. So if you own your own home, be sure to listen carefully to the middle commercial of this program for interesting information on America's finest plan for home ownership, offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Tonight's FBI file, The Horoscope Homicide. The basic quality of crime has not changed materially in the last hundred years. In 1847, men were committing murders and robbing other men and doing the very same things that criminals do today. And crimes were committed a century ago for the very same reasons they're committed today. For revenge or lust or greed. But there is one big difference in the crime picture today. And that is that law enforcement has progressed to the point of being not a business, but a science. In the old days, if the constable of a town did not apprehend the criminal before he fled, the criminal was safe. But today, there is a vast network of law enforcement agencies that makes every career of crime unprofitable. That network begins with your local police and ends with your FBI. The last line of your defense. Tonight's FBI file opens in a small, dimly lighted room. Bruce Holden, a slightly studious-looking man, is seated in one corner of this room, busily writing. A companion nervously paces the floor. Bruce. Uh, yes, Wally? You got a cigarette? Uh, there's some in my jacket there. Help yourself. Oh, okay. You want one? Uh, no, thank you. Well, sir, does this bother you? What? Uh, my talking like this while you're working. No, no, not at all. Hey, mind if maybe I watch a while? No, no, go right ahead. Not that I'd understand any of it. Astrology is really quite simple. Uh, not the way you work it. What do you mean? All them charts and things. Well, they just look complicated, Wally. Actually, when you understand what the position of the stars mean, what relation they have to the individual, then it's not involved at all. Uh, to me, it is. If I want to know what my fortune's going to be, I'll invest a penny and get my correct weight besides. <laughs> You'd be wasting a penny. Why? 
this is a very exact science. Now, look here. Yeah? Now, here you see the planets as they are at the present time. Mm. The accompanying graph is their relationship to me. Now, this is determined, of course, by the year and day of my birth. Uh-huh. Now, I've been working on this chart for a very specific reason. Trying to determine what the immediate future holds in store for me. Well, how are you doing? Oh, fine. Well, what'd you find out? This coming Wednesday will be a most favorable day for us to break out of this jail. Two days later, in a large city some 50 miles away from the jail holding the two astrology-minded criminals, FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor is just entering the office of his agent in charge. Oh, Mr. Houston. Yes, Jim. May I see you for a minute, please? Yes, come in. Thank you. What's on your mind? Well, I was going down to the Elton County Jail this afternoon to interview a man named Walter Middleton. Middleton? Yes, the local police picked him up down there. But we have a detainer on him. He was involved in the Williams extortion case. Oh, yes. And we never recovered the money he collected. That's right, sir. That's what I was going down to question him about. Why do you say was going down? Well, I received a call from the warden of the jail about 20 minutes ago. Middleton and another convict just escaped. Well, how did that happen? Well, the two men were cellmates. They complained of feeling ill, so they were given permission to see the prison doctor. Yes? Once they were in the doctor's office, they overpowered him. He used his keys to get out, and what's more, they even stole his car. I see. When did this break occur? Oh, uh, just about one hour ago. Any trace of them yet? Well, the warden hadn't received any word when I spoke to him. Local and state police have been alerted, I imagine. Yes, sir, they have. We have an interest in finding Middleton, too. Send out an alarm on our teletype, Jim. I've already done that, sir. Good. Let me know as soon as something breaks. Relax, Wally. Uh Uh-huh. Relax and enjoy the scenery. Are you kidding? Look. As long as we stay on these back roads, we're perfectly safe. Believe me, nothing can happen to us. Oh, I know, I know. It says so in the stars. Exactly. Look, Bruce, I don't want to put the whammy in your astrology deal, but well, I'd feel a lot safer if we were holed up someplace right now. We will be shortly. You mean if your mother done like you told her? I'm certain she has. Uh, when did you give her the word? Last week, when she came to visit me. W- what'd you tell her? That she should find a cabin in some isolated spot. How do you know she got it? Wally, I told you. She sent me a note describing the place. Said she'd wait there for company. Uh, Company meaning us. Oh. Uh, How far is it from here? About another 30 miles. What's the name of the place? Uh, Center Falls. I never heard of it. It's about 10 miles from Quincy. Oh. Oh. You know Quincy, don't you? Yeah, yeah. In fact, I seem to recall your telling me that you hid that extortion money somewhere near there. That's right. Uh, how much was that, by the way? Uh, Twenty grand. Quite a sum. Oh, what good does it do me? I can't pick it up while the heat's on me. Say, I just thought of something. What? Perhaps my mother could help you out. How? I'll just tell her where the money is. Uh, let her pick it up. Oh, I couldn't have anybody's mother do a job like that. Uh, mine is quite exceptional. Just wait and see. Hey. What are you turning here for? I see a car parked down on the road there. There's no one in it. So? And this doctor's car is pretty hot by now. I think we should work out an exchange. <laughs> Special Agent Taylor. Hello there. This is Sergeant Burbank, State Police. Oh, hello, Sergeant. I worked with you last year on the Collins case. Oh, yes. Yes, I remember you very well. Oh, what's on your mind, Sergeant? Well, I understand that you fellows are interested in this uh, man Middleton who escaped from the county jail. Yes. Yes, we certainly are. We have a detainer on him. Well, we located the car that he used in the prison break. It was found on the outskirts of Quincy. Abandoned? Yes. Any sign of Middleton and the other convict? No, but a second car was stolen right near the place where they left the first one. Evidently decided to change cars and take some of the heat off. Well, 
Oh, Sergeant, has an alarm been sent out on the second car? Yes, it has. But they may have gotten quite a start. According to the owner, it could have been stolen any time within the last four hours. Mm-hmm, I see. Well, if we come up with anything, Jim, I'll call you immediately. All right, thanks, Sergeant. Goodbye. Well, here we are. Uh, this is really hidden away, all right. Uh, uh, let's get out on your side. Oh, okay. Uh. What do we do with the car? Just leave it here for now. Look. Oh. <laughs> the lamp in the window. Oh. That's Mother's touch. She's such a sentimentalist. <laughs> you mean wandering boy stuff? Exactly. Who is it? It's I, Mother. Bruce. Hello, Mother. Oh, son, it's so good to see you. Come right in. Shirley, come ahead, Wally. Okay. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, Mother, this is Wally Middleton. Hello, Wally. Uh, Hiya, Mrs. Holden. I've heard so much about you. You were Bruce's roommate, weren't you? Well, uh, uh, yeah. Now tell me, how did everything go? Just fine. No trouble at all? Uh, Just with the doctor. Goodness, I hope you didn't use any gun. No, uh, I just slugged him. Oh, that's much nicer. I-, I owe a great deal to Wally Mother. Really? If it hadn't been for his muscular skill, we'd still be cooped up in that cell. Oh, stop, will you? It was your brains that got us out of there. Don't forget the astrology. Oh? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, the stars. Now, don't get him started on that. Look, uh, sit down, both of you. I've had dinner on the stove for hours. Hey, that sounds okay. I'm real hungry. I'm sure you are. I can remember once when Bruce's father broke out of jail. The poor man was starved. Some more pie, young man. Oh, no, thanks, Mrs. Holden. How about you, Bruce? Oh, Mother, I'm full. Oh, what a dinner. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm afraid that roast will have to go a long way, though. Why's that, Mother? Well, son, I spent practically everything I had on getting here and renting this cabin. Oh? I'm afraid one of you is going to have to do a job real soon if we're going to go on living here. Oh, wait a minute. What? Oh, I got plenty of dough. Really? Oh, how wonderful. Uh, Mother, Wally is referring to some loot from a former job. He has it hidden away over in Quincy. Oh. Well, look, didn't you say before that your mother would go get it? Yes, but I didn't know if you wanted her to. Oh, sure I do. Uh, if it's okay with her. What do you say, Mother? I'm afraid I don't quite follow you. Wally has $20,000 buried over near Quincy. Yes? Uh, I can give you the directions where it's hid. I see. Uh, how would you feel about going over tomorrow morning and getting it? Uh, where did you get this money, young man? On a job. What kind of a job? Uh, extortion. Oh, how clever. I'll get it first thing in the morning. <laughs> Busy, Mr. Houston? Uh, no, come in, Jim. Fine. I'd like to give you the latest report on that escaped convict, Middleton. Well, let's have it. Well, as you know, the state trooper called me yesterday. He reported that Middleton and his companion had stolen a second car. Yes? Well, they set up roadblocks for it, but nothing turned up all night. And they've evidently gone under somewhere in that neighborhood. It would appear that way, yes. However, it's too large an area to do any house-to-house checking. Have you gone into the background of these men, Jim, to see if they have any friends or relatives living in that vicinity? Oh, yes, sir, I have. And as far as I could learn, Middleton has no known friends or relatives near where the car was stolen. I see. I checked on the man who escaped with him. His name is Bruce Holden. Yes? He has a mother who has a criminal record herself. They've always worked very closely together. Hmm. I put a tracer out on the mother, and I found that she'd moved from the last address just a week ago. Could you learn where she's gone? Well, I talked to her landlady... She said that her daughter had brought the Holden woman a bus ticket to some place in the vicinity of where the car was stolen. That sounds like a lead, Jim. Yes, sir, I know. The landlady's daughter was out when I called. I'm going over there later and interview her. Bruce? I'm in 
dear mother. Oh. How did you make out? Just fine. Did you get the money? Of course. Good for you. Oh, it was the funniest thing. I went... Goodness, what happened to him? Hmm? Look at your friend Wally. He's tied up in that chair. Oh, that's right. Who did that to him? I did. Uh, where's the money, Mother? Oh, I have it right here in my shopping bag. Oh, Bruce. Yes, Mother. Why did you tie him up? Well, to begin with, Mother, according to the stars, his future was very dark indeed. Oh, poor boy. Then there was a selfish motive, too. Money. Uh, this money I have here? Yes. I see. Did you have any trouble getting to Quincy? No. I found a bus that took me right there. You made very good time. Didn't I, though? Uh, son? Yes? What are you going to do with your friend here? I've just been thinking about that. I'm afraid I'm going to have to kill him. Oh, goodness. He seems like such a nice young man. I know, Mother. But $20,000 can make life very pleasant for us. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Look, Mother, I think I'll get this over with now. It may not be very pleasant. You'd better leave the room. Oh, don't mind me, son. I, I'll just stay here and count this money. Tonight's case from the official FBI files will be reopened in just a moment. The place where I find rest and relaxation. Where I spend the happiest hours of my life. My own home. Yes, but there can be a sour note in Home Sweet Home when the shadow of insecurity menaces the family's peace of mind. And that's why the Equitable Society created its Assured Home Ownership Plan. A money-saving plan that has these four advantages. First, if the owner dies, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage. It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Second, mortgage interest is only 4%, and there is a liberal allowance to help cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. Third, during the owner's lifetime, a special cash fund is built up in this plan, ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. Fourth, as your mortgage shrinks, the cash fund increases. You can use it to pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in approximately 14 years. Well, suppose I don't use the cash fund for an emergency or to pay off my mortgage. It's yours. And after you've paid off your mortgage, the cash fund equals about half of the original loan. All in all, a man is mighty lucky if his health, age, income, and the location of his home qualify him for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. Say, I'd like to know whether I can qualify. Ask your Equitable Society representative. Get full information on the plan that protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard time. Look in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file... The Horoscope Homicide. Recently, in a large eastern city, a policeman apprehended two men in the act of committing an armed robbery. In the gunfight which followed, one of the criminals was severely wounded. The other made his getaway. The policeman questioned the wounded thief before he died, but he could get no information. The next day, in recounting the story, one newspaper pointed out that this was the law of the underworld. That this was honor among thieves. But tonight's case from the files of your FBI proves that there is no such thing as honor or decency or loyalty among thieves when there is something to be gained by being disloyal. There are no codes of honor among criminals for one very good reason. There are no honorable criminals. <laughs> Tonight, 
Tonight's file continues at the FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is talking to the agent in charge. Mr. Houston, I think we're beginning to get someplace in that Middleton case. Good. What have you got, Jim? I told you I was going to check up on Holden's mother. That's the man who escaped with Middleton? That's right, sir. I went to the place where she last lived and interviewed her landlady's daughter. Yes? She said she bought a bus ticket for the old woman to a place called Center Falls. I see. And Center Falls is only ten miles from Quincy. Well, that sounds like she's involved, all right. Yes, I have a hunch that she's the one who set up the hideout. That's logical. I contacted the state trooper down there I've been working with and gave him a description of Holden's mother. I asked him to check with real estate men, tourist camps, and find out if she's been seen. Good. Mr. Houston, I think I should get down to Center Falls. I agree with you, Jim. Get going right away. Yes, Mother? Uh, what are you doing? Uh, working on a chart. Oh, and what do the stars have to say today? Uh, they're quite favorable, Mother. Oh, isn't that nice? They seem to indicate that a trip is in order. Good heavens, son, I wouldn't need the stars to tell us that. They seem to point to either a boat trip or the seashore. Please, let's make it the seashore. I don't like boats. Very well. That's what it will be. Oh, uh, did you finish counting the money? Yes. How much was that? Exactly 20000 Just as poor Wally said. Fine. By the way, Bruce, what are we going to do about his remains? We'll bury him. Oh, how sweet. When do you intend to leave here, son? As soon as possible. Are we going to use the car you came in? No, that's too hot. I want you to go into town and buy one. Uh, go to a used car lot. Buy one? Yes? Well, it's against my principle, but I'll do it. Oh, Sergeant. Sergeant Burbank. Yes? Yeah, I've been looking all over for you. Oh, hello there, Jim. Hi. <laughs> Got a job finding you. First headquarters, headquarters to a real estate man. And he sent you here. That's right. Well, it's too bad we both didn't arrive a little sooner. Why, what do you mean? This is the hideout, all right, but two of our birds have flown. Middleton and Holden? Holden and his mother. Middleton is still here. Oh, good. Not so good, Jim. Hmm? He's dead. Oh. I just discovered the body a few minutes ago. Uh -huh. And is it in the cabin? No, he was buried out back. I noticed a fresh mound of earth. That's how I found him. I see. Have you searched the cabin yet? No, I just gave it a quick going over. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go in and give a look around, huh? Really? How was Middleton killed, Sergeant? He was stabbed. A knife was buried with him. I'm holding it for print. Mm -hmm. Evidently killed by his confederate, huh? Yeah, it looks that way. Well, go ahead, Jim. Thanks. There are just two rooms here, Jim. Holden's mother rented it just a week ago. Well, let's have us a look around. Right. They couldn't have left here too long ago. I know. Uh, they didn't take the second car they stole, either. That's still parked out in the... Wait a minute, Sergeant. Yeah? Well, look here. What is it? Newspaper. Dated last May 17th. And, Sergeant, if I remember correctly, May 17th was the day that Middleton's extortion victim paid him off. Really? Yes. Notice where this newspaper's folded. It could easily have been wrapped around a package of money. And if he recovered that money, then it could be the motive for his murder. You mean Holden and his mother used it for a getaway? That's right. There's something else, too, that might be a lead for us. What, Jim? It's a writing pad. I can see the indentation where something was written. That... Well, I'll get this off to our laboratory. Oh, Sergeant. Look, the FBI has no jurisdiction on this murder, but we do want to recover that extortion money, so we're still very much in this case. <laughs> Oh, Sergeant, I've been waiting for you. I have a report here from our laboratory. It's on that indented writing we found on that pad. Yes? The report states the writing was a letter that Holden had sent to a book company requesting they send some astrology books to an enclosed address. An enclosed address? Yes. That kind of stymied us. But we can contact the book company and they should be able to help us. Sergeant. Yes, Jim? The book company just called me back. Yes? They recall getting that order. It was sent to Ocean City General Delivery. In Holden's name? That's right. I'll check General Delivery down there at once. Well, Sergeant, we've hit a stone wall. 
How's that, Jim? I contacted the Ocean City Post Office. The package was picked up yesterday. Oh, that is a tough break. Yes. Well, at least we know where they are. We can get the local police down there to help us look for them. Give them general descriptions. Wait a minute, Sergeant. There may be a quicker way of getting them. I just remembered something. Who is it? It's me, son. Oh, just a minute. Come in. Oh, thank you. Oh, I had such a wonderful morning shopping. I brought some of the things home with me. I'm having all the groceries. I see. Son, are you working on one of those charts again? Yes, Mother. Don't you think you should quit for a while? After all, we're at the seashore. Mother, uh, please. Son, what's wrong? Oh, it's this chart I'm quite worried about. Why? It's right on the cusp. I, I don't know if we're about to be very lucky or unlucky. Now, don't you go worrying over some little cusp. Put those papers away like a good boy and relax. Mother, I'd rather... Oh, oh that must be the groceries. I'll answer it. Just a minute. Yes? Mrs. Holden? That's right. The grocery store sent me over here. Oh, uh, well, where are the groceries? Oh, I'm not the delivery boy. I'm a special agent of the FBI. What? What's wrong, Mother? He's from the FBI. Oh, close that door. Wait on that just a minute. How did you get in here? That money you took from Middleton was extortion money. All the bills were marked. So you see, you led me here yourself. <laughs> Bruce Holden was turned over to the local authorities, tried, convicted, and sentenced to be executed for the murder of Wally Middleton. His mother was prosecuted as an accomplice to the murder in the state court and was given a life sentence. And so another file was marked closed because of the facilities that are available to law enforcement agencies today, like the FBI laboratory, and also because of the fact the special agents of your FBI have trained minds. Minds that remember things like the fact that the extortion money was marked. Those things are not accidents. Your FBI did not win its international reputation quickly or accidentally. It attained the status it now holds because it is made up of men who have dedicated their lives to public service. To the protection of every one of us. Every minute. Every hour. Every day. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting story from the files of your FBI. You know, Mr. Keating, that assured home ownership plan you were telling me about sounded mighty good to me. I'm going to find out if I can qualify. I surely hope you do, Frank, because look what you get in one package from the Equitable Society. A mortgage that's paid in full if the owner dies. If not, a cash fund to be used in financial emergencies. And mortgage interest at only 4%. No wonder it's called America's finest plan for home ownership. So don't delay. See your equitable representative soon. Or write to the Equitable Society, care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Mysterious Fugitive. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Mysterious Fugitive on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. 
The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you the owner of the house you live in? If so, and if that house has a mortgage on it, then our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society, has some interesting and important information for you. In just about 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will give you the facts about America's finest plan for home ownership. It's called the Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan, a money-saving plan that has meant increased security for thousands of homeowners. Tonight's FBI file, The Mysterious Fugitive. It is the proud record of your FBI that 97% of those the Bureau apprehends and takes to court are later found guilty and sentenced. Now, that record indicates a thoroughness and a basic respect for detail in every investigation. Because it often happens that the only testimony for the prosecution is given by special agents of your FBI. After conviction, the file on that case is marked closed. Now, those files are records of jobs well done. Records of which the Bureau is justifiably proud. For that reason, it is understandable that your FBI does not like to reopen a file that's been marked closed does not like to have to do its job all over again. That does not happen very often, but as you will see in tonight's case, it does happen. Tonight's FBI file opens at the mouth of a river located in one of our eastern seaboard states. The cabin cruiser courses slowly down the stream, rounding a bend and reaching the sea, it noses into a weather-worn dock. The pilot, a young man in his middle twenties, ties the boat to a stanchion and walks down the dock to a dilapidated waterfront hotel. He opens the sun warped screen door. That is the lobby. Hello? Anyone here? Just a minute. Well. Hello. What do you want? Are you in charge here? Yeah. Why? I'm looking for information. What about? Uh, one of the boats that's tied to the dock out there. Which one? The Sea Maid 2. Who owns that, do you know? No. Well, isn't that dock connected with your hotel? Hmm. Everybody uses it. Oh. Look, mister, if you just came here to ask questions, I haven't got the... Oh, no, wait, please. What is it? The Sea Maid passed me an hour, uh, an hour or so ago upstream, and I thought I recognized that pilot. Did you see that boat tie up? No. Well, perhaps you know this man. He's about my size, blonde hair, mustache. His name is Sebring. Never heard of him. But if he uses this dock... I told you anybody could Well, he couldn't it. have docked more than 10 or 15 minutes ago. Where could he have gone from here, do you know? Oh, the town, maybe. What town? Fairfield, Clearwater, Twin Falls are all near here. Let's see. Well, I guess I'll just have to wait for him. Sometimes people leave their boats here for days. I'll wait. <laughs> What is it? What do you want? I gotta see you. All right. Come in. I told you, Anna, that I wanted to take a nap. Yeah, I know. Well, why do you disturb me? Well, a man was here looking for you. Huh? Who was he? I don't know. What did he want? He didn't say. Did he ask for me by name? Yeah, he said you passed him in your boat upstream, and he thought he recognized you and followed you down here. Where is he now? He left. He returned to his boat. What did you tell him? That I didn't know who you were or where you'd gone. I see. He's going to wait for you anyhow. This is bad. Well, I tried my best to get rid of him, Frank. Raise the window shade. Yeah, sure. 
Just a trifle. How's that? Fine. Now, which one is his boat? Uh, oh, yeah, at the very end of the dock there. You see it? Yeah. Well, he must be below. Where's your husband? He went into town. As soon as he returns, send him up here. I have some work for him to do. Hello, aboard there. Yeah. Someone hailing me? Yeah. What do you want? Are you the owner of this boat? Yeah. I see your license. Boat license? Nope. The license for using this dock. Oh, I, uh... I didn't know that one was necessary. It's a town ordinance. Who are you? Deputy Sheriff. Oh, I see. Well, can I arrange to get a license from you? Nope. Gotta get one in town. They open this time of night? Nope. Well, then what do I do? Leave the dock. I couldn't do that. Look, mister, that's an order. Sheriff, I... Well, I, uh... I might as well tell you why I'm here. All I'm interested in is a license. Listen, Sheriff, that boat right over there, the Sea Maid 2, I followed it down the river this afternoon. There was a man aboard that I think I recognized. Well? I know that government agents would be very anxious to apprehend him if he's the man I think he is. Are you a government agent? No. Uh, any kind of policeman? No. Well, then why are you so interested? I was in Army intelligence during the war. Buddy, the war's all over. Yes, but don't you... Look, look, uh, where, which boat are you talking about? That one down there. With the black hull. Her name ain't Seamaid, too. Oh, yes, it is. That's the Ebony Queen. I'm sorry, you're wrong. Uh, come on, have a look for yourself. Very well. I'll prove to you that that's the Ebony Queen, mister. It's owned by a man named Smith who lives in Twin Falls. He ain't been in no trouble with the government ever. Well, is this Smith about my size, blonde hair, mustache? No, 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 sir. He's, he's short, fat, and bald. Well, well, would anyone else be using his boat? Nope. Well, what does it say there? Uh, Ebony Queen. Yeah. I, uh, I don't understand. That's the boat I followed. Look, mister, your story just don't make sense. You go on back to your boat. Cast off your lines and pull out of here. I'm sorry, Sheriff. I'm staying. Some 50 miles away in an FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just approaching the desk of the agent in charge. Mr. Price. Yes, Jim? Could I see you for a moment, sir? Surely. What's on your mind? Well, I received a phone call late this afternoon from a friend of mine named Tom Logan. Yes? Tom was in Army intelligence during the war. We worked together on a number of cases involving enemy aliens. That was when I was with the New York office. I see. Well, one of the men we picked up at the beginning of the war was a Nazi named Frank Sebring. Mm -hmm. He'd been engaged in subversive activity. He was convicted on several counts and sent to a federal prison. Mm. I remember hearing about him. Well, then you may recall also, sir, that Sebring was released at the end of the war and deported to Germany. Yes, I do, but uh, what's this got to do with your friend's phone call? Oh, well, Tom has been out on his boat for a fishing trip for the past week. This afternoon, a small pleasure cruiser passed him. Tom was almost certain the man at the wheel was Sebring. What? Yes. He said he followed the boat to a dock down near Twin Falls. No one was aboard her, so he inquired at a nearby hotel as to where the man had gone, but he couldn't learn anything there. Jim, this sounds more like a case of mistaken identity. Well, I thought so myself at first, sir, but Tom insisted he had the right man. Knowing him, I'm inclined to believe him. We have a file here on Sebring, Jim. Uh, check it. It's possible that we're both mistaken. Maybe he wasn't deported. I already have checked on it, sir. He was sent out of the country over six months ago. I see. Uh, where's your friend now? He's standing by down there waiting for the man to return. Has he uh, contacted the local police? I advised him to, but I'm not so sure that he will. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Price. Yes? Yeah? I wonder if you'd give me permission to go down there. If this is a false lead, I'll be back by tomorrow night. Yes, go ahead, Jim. from the window. It was too dark to see, but I didn't hear his boat pull away. Well, he ain't going. Why not? He just said he was going to wait until you came back. Did you impersonate the deputy sheriff? Yeah. Didn't you threaten to arrest him? Yeah, and he just said, go ahead, so what could I do? 
What about the boat? Did you repaint the name? Uh huh. But but he's still going to stay. What did you find out about him? They said he was in army intelligence during the war. Oh. And he also said that government agents would be very happy to grab you. He's really going to be difficult to get rid of. Yeah. Where's Anna? Downstairs. Bring her up here at once. We're going to have to deal with this man a bit differently. Can you see all right, mister? Yes, just lead the way. When did this man come to your hotel? Oh, about oh, 20 minutes ago. Took a room for the night. His name is Sebring? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's got blonde hair and a mustache. Just like the fellow you was looking for. That's why I came right down to the boat to get you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Well, here's the back door. I'm going this way. Now, his room is right at the head of these stairs. Thanks. Oh, wait a minute, mister. Yeah. I, uh, just happened to think. There ain't going to be any trouble between you two, is there? Well, to tell you the truth, there might be. Oh. Well, I'd better get the sheriff. He's right out in front in the lobby. It might not be a bad idea. Bring him up to the room. Yeah, okay. Come in. Yes. Hello, Mr. Sebring. Hello. You remember me? Yes. Course. You're the young man who was in Army Intelligence. That's right. What brings you here? Your boat passed mine on the river today. I recognized you. So? You were deported from this country about six months ago, weren't you, Sebring? That's right. Then how did you get back here? Illegally. You admit that? Yeah. Then I'm going to have to see to it that you're deported again. Really? How? By turning you over to the FBI. Have you the authority to make an arrest? No. Then how are you going to do it? This should be your answer. Come in. Here's the sheriff, mister. Good. Come in, sheriff. Okay. You wanted to see me? Yes, sheriff. This is the man I was looking for. Well? He's in this country illegally. He should be arrested and turned over to the FBI. Did you hear that, sheriff? Yeah. Well, what are you going to do about it? Well, now, let me see. You should obey the man, you know. Oh, you think so, huh? Of course. What is this? Show him, Carl. Okay. Uh. Nice work, Sheriff. Tonight's case from the official files will be reopened in just a moment. never grows old because love of home and love of family are emotions that never die, never fade, never wither. Yes, and as long as men love their homes, we of the Equitable Life Assurance Society will continue to feel proud of our assured home ownership plan. Proud because it's both a money saver and a home saver. Proud because it's America's finest plan for home ownership. Just what is this plan, anyway? Well, it has four main advantages. First, if the owner dies, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage. It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Second, during the owner's lifetime, a special cash fund is built up in this plan, ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. Third, as your mortgage shrinks, the cash fund increases. You can use it to pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in approximately 14 years. Fourth, mortgage interest is only 4%. And there is a liberal allowance to help cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. Could I prepay this uh, mortgage at an early date if some unexpected good fortune makes it possible, or if I should decide to sell the house? Yes, there is a liberal prepayment privilege. All in all, a man is mighty lucky if his health, age, income, and the location of his home qualify him for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. Well, how can I find out if I meet those qualifications, Mr. Keating? Ask your Equitable Society representative. Get full information on the plan that protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. Look in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. (laughs) 
And now back to the FBI file, The Mysterious Fugitive. The desire to see that justice is done is strong in almost every one of us. But sometimes that desire leads to trying to take the law into your own hands. As tonight's case from the files of your FBI illustrates, that is the wrong course of action. In every city, there is a local police force. In every state, there are state troopers. And in every section of the country, there are field offices of your FBI. It is their job to see that laws are enforced, that justice is dealt out fairly. Your job as a citizen is to respect and obey those laws. And when, as will sometimes happen, in all the crime that's been committed, or a criminal who has gone unpunished, do not assume the responsibility of seeing justice done. Your responsibility ends when you have done your duty, when you have notified your local police. Tonight's file continues at the police station in the town of Twin Falls. Special Agent Jim Taylor has just introduced himself to the chief of police. Sit down, Mr. Taylor. Thank you. Now, what can I do for you? Did a man named Tom Logan contact you at any time yesterday or this morning? Logan? Hmm. No, he didn't. Why? Well, he called me yesterday afternoon. He'd been out on his boat on the river, and he thought he recognized a man who had been deported from this country some six months ago. Where was he? On the river. This man was in another boat. He trailed him to a dock about uh, two miles north of here. The one near the Riverview Hotel? Yes, that's it. I told him to contact the police. I thought he might have come to you. He didn't. Have you tried the Fairfield police? Yes, I have. How about Clearwater? Oh, they hadn't heard from him either. Have you looked for him? Yes, I went down to the dock, but I couldn't find any trace of his boat. Maybe the man took off again and Logan followed him. Yes, yeah, that's very possible. Did he give you a description of the other boat, the one the suspect was on? No, he didn't. Well, I'm afraid that... I... Oh, excuse me. Oh, certainly. Chief Merrill. Yes? Yes. What's that? Where was this? I see. What's the name of the boat? Right. Thanks a lot. I'll be right down there. Mr. Taylor. Yes? What does uh, Logan look like? Oh, he's about six feet tall. Has dark hair. Was the name of his boat the Lucky Star? Sounds like it, yes. I'm afraid I have some bad news for you. What? The body of a man of that general description was just found in the boat named the Lucky Star. Oh, no. We can't be sure that it's Logan, of course. Where was this? About ten miles down the bay. It drifted in the shore. Let's get down there at once. Anna, find out who that is. Okay. Is that you, Carl? Yeah. We're here in the back room. Carl, did you go into the village? Yeah. Any news of the boat? Nope. It'll probably be found sometime this afternoon. That soon? I imagine so. Well, what'll we do, Frank? I'll leave tonight just as I planned. Well, suppose the police should come here. Why should they? Well, when they find his body. They could also learn that he docked here. My dear sister, in the first place, we took great pains to make it appear that his death was accidental. Why, sure we did. Furthermore, no one knows that he used the dock except us. Well, I hope not. Oh, look, Anna, stop worrying. Everything's going to be Okay. <laughs> There's the body right over there, Mr. Taylor. Yes, I see. Well, that's Tom Logan, all right? Too bad. Well, I guess we'll have to examine him. Look at the back of his head. Yes, I see. Say, there's blood on the back of that boat hook there. From the position of the body, he could have very easily slipped and fallen against it. He could have, but I don't think he did. I'd say this was very carefully staged to appear that way. You think he caught up with the man he was looking for? Yes. Uh, if only he'd contacted you, Chief, instead of trying to do the job alone. Yeah. Well, shall we go below? Oh, wait, I... I want to search his pockets first. Very well. 
just barely possible that he might have left a note of some kind. Telling you more about this man he was following? Mm Mm-hmm. We just had a description of his bolt. Yes, I know. Find anything? Oh, just this book of matches. Might be of some help to us. How's that? They're from the Riverview Hotel. That's the place for the dock, isn't it? Yeah. Well, then he must have gone in there at some time. Uh, Chief, do you know the people who run it? Yes, a couple named Bremerton. Well, they might be able to give us some information. Well, we can... Hold on a minute. What is it? Some blue paint here on the deck. See? Yeah. Very odd shade of blue. There's no color like it on the boat. Didn't spill there. Looks like it rubbed off or something. Uh huh. I'm gonna scrape a few flecks of it off. Want a knife? No, I have one. Thanks, Chief. Why don't you go ashore and notify the coroner? I'll finish up here. <laughs> Go ahead, Miss Taylor. Thanks. Who's that? Chief of Police Merrill, Mrs. Bremerton. Oh. 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 Hello, Mr. Merrill. Hello. This is Mr. Taylor, Mrs. Bremerton. How do you do? Hello. Uh, Mr. Taylor is a special agent of the FBI. I see. You might be able to help him. How? Well, yesterday afternoon, a man named Tom Logan put his boat into that dock outside. Tom Logan? That's right. He was a man about six feet tall. Had dark hair, slightly broken nose. Did you see him by any chance? No, sir. Well, we have reason to believe that he came here to your hotel. Well, I, I didn't see anybody that looked like him. Did you see his boat? It was called the Lucky Star. No, sir. I... Oh, well, here's my husband. He, he might be able to help you. Oh, good. Mr. Bremerton? Oh, hello, Chief. Oh, this is Mr. Taylor. He's from the FBI. Hi, Hello there. We're looking for information, Mr. Bremerton, about a man named Logan who docked his boat outside here yesterday afternoon. It was called the Lucky Star. Did you see it? No, I didn't. Maybe you saw him. He was six feet tall, dark hair, slightly broken nose. Mm, no, no, but I didn't see him. Well, Chief, I'm afraid this was a bad lead. We'd better get going. But Thanks be. a lot anyway, folks. Come on, Chief. Okay. After you. All right. Carl. Huh? Get up there. Tell Frank who was here and hurry. Chief, let's head out here to the end of the dock. Okay. Say, don't you think we should have questioned the Bremertons a little more? I purposely cut that interview short. Why? Did you notice Bremerton's trousers? No, I didn't. Well, there was a streak of blue paint on his right leg. And I'm certain it was the same color paint that I scraped off the deck of Logan's boat. Well. That reminded me of where I'd seen that paint before. I noticed the can of it yesterday when I came down here to the dock. Whereabouts? Right alongside this boat up here. Uh, Chief, uh, shine your flashlight around, will you? Oh, Hey, there's a paint can. Yeah, I think that's the one. See? That same odd shade of blue. Yeah. I wonder if... Wait a minute. I'll shine your light again on the stern of that boat. Right there? Yeah, that's it. Look, Chief, the name on that boat has been freshly painted. Ebony Queen. Did you suppose it was called something else before? That the name was changed to avoid suspicion? Could have been. Well, if it was, then that's Sebring's boat. Oh. This whole paint cycle ties together. I think Bremerton's mixed up in this, too. Look, you go aboard, search the boat. Right. I'm heading for the nearest phone to call my office. I want to see if anyone named Bremerton has ever been mixed up with Sebring. Is that you, Mr. Taylor? I'm below here. I've just been going through this chest. I found some papers that Can I... Can I put up your huh? hands? What are you doing on this boat? I'm Chief of Police Merrill. You haven't answered my question. Who are you? That doesn't matter. Would your name be Sebring? Yes, it is. Then you know why I'm here. Yes, but unfortunately it isn't going to do you any good. What do you mean? I'm about to take a trip down the river. I need a change. You won't get very far. I will if I travel alone. You'll be with me, Chief, but only in spirit. You talk real tough. As a matter of fact, I am. Is that you, Carl? Yeah. Come below. We have company. Okay. You undoubtedly know the Chief of Police. Yeah. 
He was nosing around down here. We're going to have to take care of him. Uh-huh. Go above and cast off the line first. I would prefer that this happen while we're out on the river. Well, do as I say. I, uh, I can't. Why not? Because I have a gun in his back. Huh? Drop your sibling. Pick up his gun, Chief. Okay. And thanks. My office told me that Bremerton was Sebring's brother-in-law, so I dropped by, picked him up, and brought him down here. I'm sure glad you did. Now we can place them both under arrest. It was proved that although Logan was assaulted in the hotel, his death occurred on the boat. Therefore, Sebring was convicted in a federal court for murder on the high seas and sentenced to be executed. Carl and Anna were convicted as accomplices and given a life prison term in the federal penitentiary. At this time, your FBI marked its file not closed, but dead. And it was able to do that only because of the shrewd powers of observation of a special agent who remembered where he had seen an off-shade of paint. Now, those powers of observation are not a talent that anyone is born with, but they are a talent that can be developed, that has been developed in the course of study that every special agent must pass before he becomes a qualified member of your FBI, before he goes to work for you, the American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. You know what I'm going to do first thing tomorrow, Mr. Keating? I'm going to find out if I can qualify for an assured home ownership plan. Mighty good idea, George, because look what you get in one package from the Equitable Society. A mortgage that's paid in full if the owner dies. If not, a cash fund to be used in financial emergencies. And mortgage interest at only 4%. No wonder it's called America's finest plan for home ownership. So don't delay. See your equitable representative soon. Or write to the Equitable Society, care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Juvenile Shakedown. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Juvenile Shakedown on This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Homeowners, does this sound interesting to you? A mortgage that may save money for you and also furnishes you with life insurance security. Be sure to listen closely to the middle commercial. It's a special message to homeowners from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society, 
telling you about the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. It's America's finest plan for home ownership. Tonight's FBI file, The Careless Killer. The enormity of the crime wave now engulfing the United States cannot be fully realized unless you know some of the figures. Figures which are the result of crime surveys made by your FBI. The number of people arrested and fingerprinted in this country in the past year is almost 25% higher than the number arrested 10 years ago in 1937. The number of crimes committed in the past year total more than a million six hundred thousand. During the average day, 36 people were slain. Every 24 hours, an average of almost 400 people were feloniously assaulted or robbed. In addition, there were more than 4,000 other larcenies of various types being committed every day. Those are the shocking proportions of the current crime wave. The crime wave about which something must be done immediately, before it's too late. Tonight's FBI file opens in an apartment in a large Midwestern city. The occupants of this flat are a young married couple named Rockford. Mrs. Rockford is at the front door, just admitting the visitor. <coughs> Hello, Mom. Hiya, Peg. Well, come on in. Okay. Well, gee, you'll have to excuse how the house looks, Mom. I, I didn't expect nobody so early. This ain't the first sloppy joint I've seen. Where's that husband of yours? Charlie. Well, how many husbands have you got? Just Charlie. Uh, he, he's in bed. Get him up. Oh, well, he's still sleeping, I Mom. I said get him up. I want to talk to him. Oh, sure, sure, okay. He uh, may not like this. That really worries me. Charlie. Huh? Charlie. Huh? What? Charlie, will you wake up? Oh, what is it? My mother's here. Uh, so what? She wants to see you. Oh, look, tell her to come back later, huh? I don't Who feel like... what you feel like. Huh? Wake up, you bum. Oh, oh, good morning, Mrs. Wilton. It ain't morning, it's afternoon. Uh, Charlie didn't get to bed till awful late, Mom. Yeah, I... don't I... care about that. Are you awake enough to listen to something? Sure, sure. It's about that counterfeit stock plate you bought. Yeah? I advanced you the dough for it. I know you did. Four thousand bucks I gave you. That's right. It ain't worth ten cents. What? Mom, what do you mean? Your little genius here has done it again. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. The guy guaranteed it. No, he did, huh? Yeah, he said all I had to do was put ink on the plate, then paper, then I had stock. But you saw the certificates. I gave them to you. And I tried to cash them. What happened? The company he picked went out of business ten years ago. Oh. Mom, how was Charlie to know that? Shut up. And I think of all the smart thieves you could have married, and I get a son and all like that. Oh, no, now look, Mother. Never mind that mother routine. Who was the guy you bought that plate from? A man named Carson. All right. Get dressed and get over and see him. What for? Give me my money back. Oh, but I can't do that. Why not? The deal's all closed. You can open it up again. You got a gun, ain't you? Sure. Take it along with you. Let him see you mean business. Oh, I know. Get but... over there. If you don't come back here with the money, you can use the gun on yourself. In the same city in the nearby FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just reporting to his agent in charge. You sent for me, Mr. Stoning? Oh, yes, Jim. Just got a report from our Chicago office. Huh? Wants to get right to work on it. What's it all about, sir? National Stolen Property Act. Oh. They picked up a suspect yesterday who was trying to pass over $5,000 worth of counterfeit stock certificates. I see. And the agents who searched his effects found that he also had counterfeit stock plates in his possession. Well, <laughs> did his own printing job, huh? That's right. Well, this man was questioned for a number of hours, and he finally broke down and revealed where he got the plates. And where was that? Right here in town. Well, 
He claimed he got them from a man named Carson. Here's his address, Jim. All right, sir. According to the suspect's testimony, this Carson makes a business of turning out counterfeit stock plates. I see. Get right over there and check on Carson. Okay. See what you can find out. And now, as our story opens, we find Betty Jane, girl of the hills, sitting in the palatial drawing room of her husband Roger's mansion. That's enough of that. Ah, oh, Mom, what'd you turn it off for? Are you kidding? But I wanted to hear it. It's such a sweet, sad story. It's all about a girl who's looking for a missing husband. I'd rather and... hear about your missing husband. Let's keep on that guy. Well, he's only been gone an hour. It's almost two hours. Mom, you don't like Charlie very well, do you? You can say that again. Well, what have you got against him? Mostly the fact that he breathes in and out. You know, it hurts him real bad when you talk to him real mean like you do. Ain't that a shame. He he says he thinks of you like you're his real mother. That's just how he treats me. Do you realize how much dough I've shelled out for that grifter? Well, it was all on business deals. Some business deals. First, I set him up in that bookmaking joint. He blows that one. I make him a fence. He kicks that around. Oh, those were bad breaks. This one was the topper. A six-year-old kid. A backward six-year-old. Couldn't miss making dough these days. But no, oh, he... I'll, I'll get it. Hello? Oh, hello, Charlie. Yeah? Huh? You what? What's the matter? Oh, Charlie, that's terrible. What is it? Uh, hold on a minute. What's wrong? Charlie went to see that Mr. Carson. Yeah? Did he get the dough? No. Why not? They had a fight. Charlie killed him. That's great. He wants to know what he should do. Wait a minute. Tell him to get out of town. Hello, Charlie. I just told Mom. She said you should get out of town. Huh? Wait a minute. He says he hasn't any dough. Tell him to dig it someplace. He ain't getting it from me. Oh, but, Mom... Let me talk to that guy. All right, here. Hello? Yeah, this is Mother. I want you to listen to me, stupid, and listen close. You get out of town right now. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You ain't seeing Peg because she's coming with me. Look, get this straight. If you come near my club, you won't have to worry about the cops. I'll take care of you myself. Mr. Sterling. Yes, Jim. May we come in? Come ahead. This is Detective Harvey, Homicide Squad. Mr. Sterling. Hello, sir. Hello, Harvey. Did you go to Carson's office? Yes, sir. That's why I brought Harvey back here with me. What do you mean? Carson was shot and killed this afternoon. Well, when was this? About ten minutes before I arrived. What about the killer? We don't know who he is yet, sir. Let's have the whole story, Jim. All right, sir. Well, as I told you, as soon as I arrived at Carson's office, I found his body... Was uh, anyone else there? Yes, a young lady, his secretary. Hmm, could she shed any light on the killing? Well, she didn't know the name of the man who did it, but she said he had been in Carson's office before. Oh? I got a complete description of him from the girl, sir. Right down to a ring that he was wearing. Good. I also learned why this man was there. Yes? The secretary admitted that he had bought some counterfeit stock plates from Carson in the past. On this visit, he had an argument with him, claiming these plates were worthless. And that evidently led to the shooting. Mm Mm-hmm. Where is the secretary? We're holding her now as a material witness. You can question her at any time. Good. Well, Mr. Sterling, we have an interest in finding this killer, too. How's that? The secretary stated that he walked out of there with another set of counterfeit stock plates. Oh. Well, I'd suggest you work right along with the police on this. All right, sir. You can come down to headquarters with me now, Jim. We can see if the secretary's identified anyone. Okay. Is uh, she looking over pictures? Yes, sir. Then get going. <laughs> Jim. Oh, yeah, well. I've just talked to Carson's secretary. Any luck? Yes, she's identified the murderer. Good. Who is it? A small-time thief named Charlie Rockford. Charlie Rockford. Mm -hmm, I see. Our lieutenant seems to have a pretty good line on him. Oh? Knows where he lives, where he hangs out. Hey, that's fine. They've sent out a general alarm on him. They also have a squad car on the way over to his home. Good. Oh, Bob, I'd like to talk to that secretary now. See if I can get a complete line on Carson's operation. Table four on the house. Mom, mom. 
How does it pay? Charlie's here. What? He just came in. He's waiting out by the check room. What for? Well, he says he's got to see you. That chump. I told him not to come here. He says to tell you that a mother shouldn't desert a son in his hour of peril. Well, that guy quit saying he's my son. Well, Mom, you know that Never he... mind, never mind. He can't be standing out there like a signpost. Bring him back to my office. Sure, okay. I'll be right there. <laughs> Charlie. Uh, what'd she say, Peg? She wants you to come back to her office. Oh, swell. Let's go. She's sort of mad at you, Charlie. Oh, look, honey, I'll con her out of that. She says you shouldn't have come here. Now, what sort of way is that to act to her own flesh and blood? She says you ain't her flesh and blood, Charlie. Listen, I'm getting sick of what she says. Now, don't go acting that way. Here we are. Go ahead. Okay. Hiya, Mother. I thought I told you to keep away from here. I'm in trouble. Flash. Look, I'm hot, I tell you. So I see by the newspapers. Huh? The papers have got something about me? Only a story and a picture. Oh, so that's why them cops showed up. What do you mean, Charlie? Showed up where? At the apartment. You went back to your apartment? Yeah. Why? Well, I thought maybe Peg would be there. Why, you stupid... What happened with the cops? I happened to spot the squad car pulling up in front of the building, so I lammed down a fire escape. And then you came right over here? Yeah. That's great. Drag me into this thing. How? They wouldn't be tailing you or nothing. Oh, I gave them a slip. Some slip you could give them. Blind Tom could follow you. You shouldn't have done that, Charlie. Oh, look, lay off of me, will you? Both of you. I need some dough, getaway money. And that's what you came here for? Yeah. Not a chance. Oh, now, wait a minute. You're in this thing, too, you know. How do you figure that? Well, you put up the dough for that phony stock plate. You were the one who told me to use a gun to get the dough back. Charlie, that isn't fair. Let him talk. I want to hear more. Sure, I'll talk. I'll tell you this right now. Unless you kick in with a bundle for me to go away with, I blow a whistle on you. <gasps> I bet you would, too. Sure. So how about it? Are you getting it up? The answer's still no. Okay. Maybe this will change your mind. Charlie! I was wondering when you'd pull that gun. How about some dough? Charlie, put down that gun. She's my mother. Never mind the song titles. Come on, money. Your desk is loaded with cash, I know that. Well, I was always taught to pay a good deal of respect to a guy with a pistol. Mom, don't you give him anything. Keep out of this. Looks like I gotta give him something, honey. Think this would be enough? <laughs> Is he dead? What do you think? Mom, you shouldn't have done that. Tonight's case from the official FBI files will be reopened in just a moment. Home, sweet home. I forget the words now, but it's always hard for a man to express his real feeling, the warmth, the love of his own home. As a homeowner myself, I know what you mean. And for that reason, I also know you'll be interested in the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. It's a money saver. It's a home saver. It's America's finest plan for home ownership. Assured home ownership? Well, what is this plan, and why is it the finest? The Assured Home Ownership Plan has these four main advantages. First, if the owner dies, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage. It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Second, during the owner's lifetime, a special cash fund is built up in this plan, ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. Third... Mortgage interest is only 4%, and there is a liberal allowance to help cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. Fourth, as your mortgage shrinks, the cash fund increases. You can use it to pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in approximately 14 years. Well, what if I don't use this cash fund? Who gets it when the mortgage is paid off? You do. It's all yours. That's why I call this plan a money saver. After the mortgage is paid, this cash fund equals about half the original loan. All in all, a man is mighty lucky if his health, age, income, and the location of his home qualify him for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. 
Well, who can tell me if I qualify, Mr. Keating? Ask your Equitable Society representative. Get full information on the plan that protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. Look in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to our FBI file, The Careless Killer. Blooded murder in tonight's case in the files of your FBI would be shocking if it happened in the lives of ordinary people. But it ceases to be surprising when it occurs in the lives of a criminal family. It seems like a stunning climax only because it violates every basic precept of family life. Love, loyalty, devotion, and protection. But those characteristics are connected with the lives of those who live by the law who regard their fellow human beings with compassion and understanding. Love, loyalty, devotion, and protection are not in the criminal vocabulary because they would stand in his way when he was stealing or murdering. To the criminal, nothing must be allowed to shackle his desires. In his own mind, the world was built to provide him with a living, an effortless living, and in quest of that kind of a life, the criminal will stop at nothing. The night's file continues at the FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk as Detective Harvey enters. I didn't think you'd still huh? be here, Jim. Oh, hello, Bob. Doing a little night work. These are cars and books and papers. Oh, I see. Uh, anything on that man, Rockford? No, you appears to have given us the slip. Huh? For a while, at least. Did the police go to his apartment? Yes. What happened? Well, I'm kind of ashamed to tell you this. Uh, what? They neglected to surround the place, and he made a getaway out of one of the windows. That's too bad. I'll hope he's picked up soon. I want to talk to him. About Carson's operation? Mm Mm-hmm. He could be a valuable source of information on how he operated. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Special Agent Taylor. Oh, yes. Yes, he is. Just a minute, please. Bob, it's for you. Oh, here. Thanks. Hello? Yes, Lieutenant. Yes. Uh-huh. I see. I'll get on it right away. Right, sir. I was lead on Rockford, Jim. Oh, has he been located? No, but they learned that his mother-in-law owns a nightclub right downtown here. A place called the Club Adrian. Oh, yeah, I've heard of it. How about coming over there with me? Good idea. I'll be right with you. Will you cut that out? I feel just like Betty Jane. Who's she? Betty Jane, Girl of the Hill, that radio program. Oh, that. You should suffer so long. She, too, has no husband. Look, save those crocodile tears. You miss him just about as much as I miss Hitler. But he died so bravely. Yeah, just as he was about to shoot your mother. Now cut it out. Mom. Yeah? What are you going to do with him? Get rid of him, of course. Where is he now? In a closet in the back hall. Will anyone find his body? Eventually. Look, go on outside in the club and get a drink or something, will you? Yeah, but there's a couple of things I want to ask you. What? Well, first of all, should I start wearing black? Oh, that'd be great. The guy's body may not turn up for months. But I look good in black. Look, please go outside, hon. How are you going to get rid of him? I told one of the boys to pick up a truck of some kind. Steal it? Yeah. He'll come around to the back of the club and we'll load the body in after we close. Oh. Now, will you go outside? There's a lot of guys in the joint looking for young girls to dance with. Well, why didn't you say so? Quite a dive, huh, Jim? (laughs) It's hard for me to tell. I can't see very well through this haze of smoke. I wonder if the owner will join us. Mrs. Wilton? Yes. Oh, did you tell the captain we'd like to see her? Yes, but that I doesn't... I beg your pardon, boys. Did you want to see me? Are you Mrs. Wilton? That's right. How do you do? My name is Taylor. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Oh. This is Detective Harvey of the local police. Hello. 
Hello. Well, you boys just about cover everything, huh? <laughs> just about. <laughs> Glad to see you. Thanks. Uh, won't you join us for a moment? What's on your mind? We'd like to talk to you if we may. Oh, sure. Here, yeah, sit right here. Thanks. Will you have a drink? Oh, thanks. I just sell the stuff. Well, go ahead. It's about your son-in-law, Mrs. Wilton. I figured that was it. He killed a man today. Yeah, I read it in the papers. And so far, your son-in-law has managed to elude the police. I was wondering if uh, you had seen anything of him. No. Hmm. And frankly, I don't want to. And how about your daughter? Has she heard anything of him? No. Well, how do you know? She's been with me all day and tonight. Is she at the club here now? We'd like to talk to her, too. Well, she ain't around at the moment. If you was to come back later or wait here oh, or what? Oh, there you are. I've been looking all over for you, Mom. Is this your daughter? Yeah. I've just been dancing with that cute little guy. He works for an advertising uh, agency. Excuse and... me, Mrs. Rockford. Yeah? I'm a special agent of the FBI. Huh? I've come here to find out about your husband. I already told you. We ain't seen him. Oh, Oh, no, we ain't seen him all right. N- not at all. Go finish your dance, honey. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, goodbye. Nice to meet you. <laughs> you see, she don't know any more about him than I do. Yes, I gathered that. How about a drink for you boys? Uh-huh. Uh, no, thanks. We've got to be going. Well, if the guy turns up, you can believe me. I'll get right in touch with you. I ain't looking for the kind of trouble he carries. <laughs> Well, Jim, pretty phony routines you gave it. Yeah. I think they've heard from Rockford, all right. In fact, I know they have. How's that? You remember that ring that Carson's secretary said that Rockford was wearing? Yes. Black onyx with three diamond chips. Mm -hmm. Well, his wife was wearing it tonight. Oh. Mm -hmm. Of course, it could be a duplicate, but I doubt it. Well, that means that he's been back here at the club. I think so. It could also... Look out, Bob! Thanks, Jim. It's okay. That would have been a nice finish. Knocked off by a truck from a diaper service. <laughs> yeah. He certainly was... Hey. Wait a minute, Bob. What? That alley the truck just went down. I'd like to see where it leads to. Okay. Seems to go around back of the club. Mm-hmm. What would a diaper truck be doing back there? Yeah. Bob, if Rockford is still in the club, they could be using that truck to get him out. That's logical. No one would ever suspect he was getting away in that. Bob. Yes, Jim? Let's find a patrolman. Have him cover the front door of this club. Okay. I'll cover this alley and keep an eye on the truck. Right. You go down and pick up a warrant for us to search this place at once. Peg, open up the door of that truck. Very well. Well, hurry up about it. This guy's heavy. Yes, Mom. Oh, well, you cut out that sniveling. This is his funeral, Mom. And I ain't even wearing black. Yeah, I know. Girl of the hills. Oh. Where's the truck driver? Inside, grabbing a drink. Now, we got to... Quiet. What's that? Good evening, Mrs. Wilton. Who is it? Special Agent Taylor. The FBI. Oh, hello there. I thought I heard some kind of activity going on back here. Yeah, just taking in some laundry. Oh. And is your laundry usually delivered in a diaper truck? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, Peg, you can tell the driver to come out. Oh, uh, just a minute. Huh? I'm curious to know what it is you were putting in the truck, Mrs. Wilton. What do you mean? You just carried something in there, didn't you? No. Uh, you mind if I take a look in there anyway? No, no, don't. Shut up. What's wrong, miss? Keep away from that truck. Why? I've got a gun here. That's reason enough. That wouldn't be Rockford's body in there, would it? Real smart, ain't you? No, just observant. Well, that observant stuff ain't going to do you any good. Mom, take it easy. We might just as well add another body to the collection. Give me that gun. Not a chance, mister. Yes! Yeah, huh? Give me that gun. No, the gold me. Sorry, Mrs. Wilton. Yes. I have a search warrant. Oh, Bob, you'd better change it to an arrest warrant for murder. <laughs> Mrs. Wilson was convicted in the state court of first-degree murder and sentenced to be executed. Her daughter was convicted for her part in the murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. 
Too much credit for the closing of tonight's case in the files of your FBI cannot go to the local police department whose cooperation has extended to the fullest extent. And it is true that in many cases throughout the year, your FBI would find their investigations much more difficult without the help of local law enforcement agencies. For that reason, the Federal Bureau of Investigation urges you to do your part as a citizen in seeing to it that your community has the strongest possible local police force. And by doing that, you'll be doing your part in fighting the crime wave. just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Uh, Mr. Keating, about that assured home ownership plan. My next move is to see my equitable society representative and find out if I can qualify. Is that right? Right you are, Ed. And he'll tell you more about what you get in one package from the equitable society. A mortgage that's paid in full if the owner dies. If not, a cash fund to be used in financial emergencies and mortgage interest at only 4%. No wonder it's called America's finest plan for home ownership. So don't delay. See your equitable representative soon. Or write to the Equitable Society, care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Unhappy Hijacker. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Unhappy Hijacker on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you taking a vacation this month? Here in the Equitable Life Assurance Society... We like to think that the 12 million policyholders and beneficiaries who own or will benefit by Equitable Society life insurance policies will have a specially enjoyable vacation. Holidays unmarred by fears and worries. Through life insurance with the Equitable Society, they have safeguarded their homes, provided secure futures for themselves. So, for a carefree vacation, for a worry-free holiday... Better get in touch with your Equitable Society representative before you go. Tonight's FBI file, The Unhappy Hijacker. Last year... There were more than a million and a half major crimes committed in the United States. Of the people arrested for those crimes, more than half had previous arrest records. And some of those arrested had records which covered many pages, many states, and many years. 
They are the professional criminals. The ones to whom a previous sentence is merely an interruption of their careers. They're driven on by many complex usages. But the basic ingredient behind their continuance as criminals is that they are sure they won't make the same mistake again. The mistake that resulted in their previous capture, arrest, and imprisonment. They're confident that their experience has made them smarter than all the police in the world. And when they have achieved that state of illusion, no crime is beyond them. Armed robbery, arson, or even murder. Tonight's FBI file opens in a comfortable frame house located in a large city in one of our Midwestern states. One of the occupants of this dwelling, and Mrs. Johnson, is just answering the front doorbell. Yes? Hello, Mrs. Johnson. Hello. I'm Mildred Phelps, remember me? Yes. I, um, I talked to Mr. Johnson before I made an appointment to see him. I know. Well, can I come in? Come ahead. Thanks. He's out in the greenhouse. Follow me. Okay. I haven't seen you for a long time, Mrs. Johnson. I know. How have you been? My husband's in here. George? Yes, Mama? Here's your company. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. Hello, Mr. Johnson. Hello there, Mildred. Hey, this is really a layout. The greenhouse? Yeah, look at those orchids. I have over a dozen species here. This is my hobby. I spend a great deal of time with them. No wonder nobody sees you anymore. Well, I'm pretty much out of action these days. Completely out? No. Excuse me a second, Mildred. This orchid needs a little attention. Mr. Johnson, I have something I think will interest you. What is it? Did you read this morning's paper? Uh Uh-huh. See the story about a truckload of whiskey being hijacked? Yes, yes, I did. That's why I'm here. Well, what's the story? I know who knocked it off. And I know where it's stored. Well? If I told you how you could get it, how much would the information be worth? Uh, you want me to take it from the person who hijacked? Well, it wouldn't be the first time, would it, George? No. There's 300 cases, high-grade scotch. What's my cut? Well, in the past, I've always paid $10 a case. You've got a deal. Oh, wait a minute. I want to find out a few things first. Where is the stuff? How do I get it? I'll call you this afternoon and give you all the dope. Uh, who am I taking it from? Does that matter? Yes. Look, I'd rather not tell. Oh, Mildred, I have to know who did the job. Okay. It's Paul Carter. What? Well, he's your boyfriend. He was my boyfriend. Oh. So oh, that's it. Yeah. Dirty pool, Mildred. He deserves it. Does it bother you? Not at all. In fact, I'd like to hand Paul one myself. I figured that. Well, how about it? I'll be glad to do business with you. Paul, that's the story. And the sucker fell for it, huh? Real big. Good. Now, suppose you tell me what this is all about. Well, to coin a phrase, I'm uh, killing two birds with one stone. What do you mean? That truck I hijacked was awful hot. I got to get rid of it. So I'm going to let Mr. Johnson take it off my hands. But, honey, what about the whiskey? I've already taken that out, but I've left the empty cases. Oh. Where is the stuff? I took it to that building I rented over on 12th Street. I see. What's the other bridge you're killing? George Johnson. I've owed him one for a long time. But how are you getting even? He still winds up with a truck. He winds up with trouble. How? I know pretty much how he operates. When he gets his truck tonight, he'll drive it right to his house. It'll be too late for him to unload it until morning. Hmm. By that time, I'll uh, have called the cops. Oh, and they pick him up for the hijack. Right. Oh, that's very cute. <laughs> what do I say to the guy when I call him? Uh, I give him the address where the truck is. They can get in through a window at the back. Tell him nobody will be there between 10 and 12 tonight. Okay. Oh, uh, 
And, uh, one other thing. Yeah? He promised you ten bucks a case? That's right. Say you'll come around to his place at midnight to collect. Wait a minute. Suppose he finds out the truck is empty. Honey, it's all locked up, believe me. Don't find out till the morning. Meantime, he pays us three grand for the privilege of going to jail. <laughs> the same city at a nearby FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is just entering the office of the agent in charge. May I see you, Mr. Morgan? Yes, come in, Jim. I've been waiting for you to come back to the office. Well, I've been caught all day. What's on your mind? I don't imagine you've had a chance to read the report on a hijacking that occurred last night. No, I haven't. A liquor truck was waylaid just across the state line. Just one man did the job. Oh? He overpowered the driver when he stopped for a traffic light on a lonely stretch of road. I see. The driver was severely beaten and left by the side of the road. Uh However, he managed to make his way to a nearby filling station and report the crime. Now, what time did all this happen? Well, the hijacking occurred at approximately 12.30 a.m. The driver reported it to the police about two hours later. Any leads? Yes, sir. The police checked with the toll booth on Midway Bridge as soon as they received the report. And? And they remembered the truck. It had passed through about an hour before. Then it came here to the city? Yes, sir. So they immediately sent out an alarm on it here. Any results? Well, a truck very much like it was spotted driving through the West End about 3 a.m. It disappeared, however, before it could be picked up. Any report on it since? No, sir. But we've set up a procedure that may bring some results. What's that? Well, the section where the truck was last seen is at the tip of that peninsula that juts out into the river. Yeah. Now, going on the theory that it found cover there someplace, we've blocked out the whole area. Fine. The police are cooperating with us, and we're going to search every building. Good, good. Uh, What about the driver? He's in the hospital, sir. Uh, Could he give any description of the hijacker? No, not too good a one. Police have brought some pictures down to the hospital to him for him to look at. Fine, that's fine. I'll let you know, sir, if we get any results. George. Yes, Mama? Are you getting ready to go out? Uh, Yes. You promised to take me to the movies tonight. Oh. Oh, that's right, I did. Well? Mama, I'll... I'm afraid we'll have to make it some other evening. Why? Well, tonight I have to go out on some business. I have a chance to make a very nice score. Mm -hmm. I heard of a truck full of liquor that's been hijacked. I was tipped off how to pick it up. I got to go over there right now. Wait a minute. Who tipped you off? Uh, Mildred Phelps. How did she know about it? Well, Paul Carter did the job. She goes with Paul Carter. Uh, she used to, Mama. That's all over. She's very mad at him. That's why she gave me the information. Uh, I, I have to go Wait. over there. Wait. Sit down. But, Mama... Sit down, I said. Very well. Now, listen to me. I don't like that Mildred Phelps. And I don't trust her. Mama... Let me finish. Paul Carter's been an enemy of yours for years. It sounds to me as if they put their heads together and have come up with some scheme to get you in trouble. Well, how can that be? She told me where the truck is. I know. Well, then what can be wrong? George, take my word for it. They're up to something. Mama, I've got to go over there. This is too good to pass up. Very well. Go ahead. Be stubborn. But do me one favor. What's that? Check every detail of her story before you take that truck. news, Jim? Oh, hello, Mr. Morgan. I didn't think you'd be here this way. Any report on the hijacked truck? No, sir, not yet. What have you got there? Oh, this is a detailed map of the peninsula where the truck was last seen. Oh, uh-huh. Now, those white pins indicate every possible building in which the truck could have been stored. I see. And the blue pins here indicate places that have already been checked by the police. Uh-huh. How many men have they got on the job? A detail of over two dozen, sir. Good, good. They've been calling in every hour all evening, giving their reports. Well, you're certainly doing a thorough job, Jim. Thank you, sir. Oh, say, uh, hmm? the driver look over those pictures of suspects? Yes, sir. He picked out five men that might possibly have been his assailant. The police are rounding them up now. Yes, sir. Oh, excuse me. Surely. Special Agent Taylor. Oh, hello there, Sergeant. Yes. Hmm. Oh, good work. Will you let me have that address? Mm-hmm. Got it. Thanks a lot. I'll be right over. Well, sir, they found the truck. Fine. It's in a small garage on West Street. I'm going right over there. Just a minute. Hello, Mrs. 
Mrs. Johnson. Come in. Thanks. Mr. Johnson get home yet? Yes, he's here. George? Yes, Mama? Your company's here again. Oh. Hello there, Mildred. Hiya, George. How'd everything go? Just fine. No trouble, huh? No trouble at all. Oh, that's swell. Well, you can pay me off then, if you will, and I'll be on my way. What's your hurry? Well, it's pretty late, you know. Let's have the dough, huh, George? I'm afraid I have some bad news for you, Mildred. What? There isn't going to be any payoff. What are you talking about? You got the truck, didn't you? No. I thought you said everything went okay. It did. But not the way you planned. What is this? Well, uh, before I went over for the truck tonight, I told my wife the whole story. So? Well, I don't like to say this, but at times, Mama has a very suspicious nature. She didn't believe your story. Now, look. Let me finish. She uh, warned me to proceed very cautiously, so when I went to the garage, I decided to examine the truck before I moved it out. Tell her what you found. There was no whiskey. The truck was empty. Well, I, I don't understand that. I think you do. Tell her the rest, George. Well, I realized then that Mama was right. Something was wrong. Look, I don't want to hear any more of this. He hasn't finished. I don't care. I'm getting out of here. Just stay with you. Oh! Now, George, finish your story. Very well. You see, I decided to wait around the garage. I figured if it was a trap that Paul might drop by later to see if the truck was gone. (laughs) That's just what he did. Paul came in? Yes. What happened? We discussed the matter, and then I left him there. Left him? And what he means is... Your boyfriend, Paul, is dead. We will reopen tonight's FBI file in just a moment. Did you ever hear of a professional worry lifter? Hmm? What in the world is that? I mean a man whose life work is lifting the burden of worry from other people's shoulders. Not just a man who says, cheer up, everything is going to be all right, but a man who actually does something about it. Oh, sounds like a man worth knowing. He is. He's your equitable society representative. You'll find that if you have fears about your family's future, your equitable society representative will leave no stone unturned to do a complete job of worry lifting. For instance, lots of husbands worry because no one ever told them about readjustment income. Readjustment income? What's that? The Equitable Society's Readjustment Income Plan provides extra income for the widow during the two toughest years, the two years immediately following her husband's death, years in which she is adjusting the family way of life to a lowered income. You know, expenses can't be reduced overnight. It takes time. And that's why every life insurance program should provide readjustment income for extra help during the two toughest years. As a matter of fact, the thought of those years has worried me. How much does one of those readjustment income plans cost? Why, it may not cost you a cent. It may require only a simple rearranging of your present life insurance program. In any event, the man to see is your professional worry lifter, your Equitable Society representative. Look in the phone book for the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Unhappy Hijacker. Occasionally, there comes along a criminal who is so publicized as to make the public believe that they understand him. And understanding him, they are want to sympathize. If you have ever been a victim of that kind of thinking, you have been experiencing the wrong emotion. The only feeling you should have for the professional criminal is one of revulsion. He is not a person whose mind you can understand. Because his life is built on moral standards that you know nothing about. Moral standards which not only condone, but approve. Lying, cheating, and above all, double-crossing. 
As you can see from tonight's case from the files of your FBI, they're all treacherous, evil people. And they want none of your sympathy or your friendship. Because to the criminal, you, as a decent citizen, represent only one thing. His next victim. The night file continues the following morning at the FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is just making a report. Good morning, Mr. Morgan. Oh, good morning, Jim. Did you complete your investigation on that hijacking case last night? Well, no, sir. I'm sorry to say I didn't. Oh, what happened? I thought the police had located the truck. Oh, they did. Well? That only led to further complications. How do you mean? Well, let me give you the whole story. Yeah, huh? go ahead. When I arrived at the garage, I learned that the police had found the body of a man named Paul Carter in the back of the truck. Paul Carter? Yes, he was a small-time racketeer and thief. Oh. One of the five suspects that the truck driver had identified from those pictures. Well, obviously, he was the right one. Yes, but that only complicated the case. How's that? The whiskey had been removed from the truck. Now, we searched the premises completely, but we couldn't find any trace of it. Oh. Any lead on who killed Carter? No, sir, not yet. We found a window in the back of the garage that had been jimmied open. That was evidently how the killer came in. I see. There was a peculiar matted substance on the windowsill. It appeared to have come off the intruder's shoe. A matted substance? Yes, it resembled moss. I sent it on to the laboratory last night. We should have a report on it soon. Uh-huh. Say, this killer could have taken the whiskey. And that would keep us in the case. Yes, I know. Have the police checked on Carter's associates or enemies? Well, they're doing that now. They're also trying to learn where Carter lived. And as soon as they have any information, they'll get in touch with us. Good morning, Mildred. Oh, gosh, I forgot you can't talk with that gag at your mouth. Here, let me untie it for you. There we are. Did you have a good night? Now, what do you think? Oh, must be pretty uncomfortable. You can say that again. Why are you keeping me here? Well, uh, Mama and I had to have a little talk. We had to decide what we should do with you. Well? We're going to let you leave here. Oh. On one condition. What's that? If you tell us what Paul did with that whiskey. I... I don't know. Oh, Mildred, you must He know. didn't tell me anything about it. Now, please, tell the truth. You'll only make Mama mad at you all Mama, day. Mama, haven't you got anything to say around here? Of course. Well, I haven't noticed it. Everything you do is in order for Mama. That's not true. George. Yes? Why do you let her run your life? Why don't you get smart? You're clever, attractive. Why don't you act like a man? Mildred. I mean it. Look, baby, if you just let me leave here, I'll... Mildred, pick from somebody your own size. Mama, I've just been asking her about the whiskey. Leave me alone with her. I'll get the information. Well, Mr. Morgan. Yes, Jim. A report just came in from the laboratory on that substance I found at the scene of the killing. Oh, what was it? Well, they describe it as a plant called fern root. It's a species of moss. I see. They also said that it's not native to this section. It's found mostly in the eastern states. Oh, that's strange. You say you believe it came from the killer's shoe? That's right, sir. There was a suggestion of a heel imprint on it. That's where I got that idea. You keep coming up with puzzlers on this one, don't you? <laughs> oh, by the way, a list of Paul Carter's enemies just came in. There's uh, 22 names on it. Ooh, quite a roster. Mm-hmm. Won't be easy to pick any individual out of that. No. Police are cooperating with our agents, checking up on the men, finding out about their backgrounds, when they saw Carter last. And... Oh, excuse me, sir. Certainly, sir. Morgan speaking. Yes, he is. Yeah? Yes. Uh, Jim, sir. Uh, copy down this address. All right. uh, go ahead. 228 North Adams Street. I have it, sir. We have it. Yes, yes, he will. Goodbye. That was police headquarters, Jim. No. That address I just gave you is where Paul Carter lived. I told the police you'd be right over there. <laughs> Yes, Mama. You can come in here now. Very well. How did you make out? I got the information. Good for you. What did you do to her? Never mind. Found out where the whiskey is. Where? Tell him. Tell him, I said. It's in a 
building over on 12th Street. Give him the address. Number 741. 300 cases are there? Yes. Look at her. She isn't so pretty now, is she? Mama, I never thought she was pretty. You could have, if I hadn't come in. Oh, stop. I'll go get the stuff right away. That's a good idea. What about me? Can I go now? No. But you said I... are staying here until my husband gets back with the whiskey. I want to be sure you told us the truth. Mr. Morgan, I'm a little ashamed to be coming in like this again. What do you mean, Jim? I have to report another failure. What is it this time? Well, I went to the place where Carter lived. It was a small apartment downtown. Yeah? The police had already arrived there. They'd searched his effects. They found a rental receipt for a small building over on 12th Street. In Carter's name? That's right, sir. We went over there and found that it was the place he had used to store the liquor. Had used? Yes. By the time we got there, it was gone. Well, how did you know it had been there? Well, there were several boxes and a few broken bottles of the same brand that Carter had hijacked. Oh. Well, does that mean he moved it to another place before he was killed? I don't think so. Why not? A truck had just recently been driven into the building. We could still smell the exhaust fumes. Oh. Mr. Morgan, I have an idea that whoever killed Carter is the same person that came and took away the whiskey. What do you base that on, Jim? Well, I found several particles of what appeared to be that same matted substance that I picked up on the windowsill back at the garage. The fern roof? Yes. I dropped it off the laboratory. They're going to make a quick comparison. Oh. You say a truck was used? That's right, sir. Were there any tire impressions? No, sir, there weren't. It was a concrete floor. No moisture. Oh. Now, come in. Excuse me, sir. And what is it, Tom? I have a report from the laboratory. It's with Jim. Oh, let me have it, huh? There you are. Thanks, Tom. Right. Is that a report on the second fern root sample, Jim? Um, yes, sir. It's the same substance. Something else, too. What? The laboratory says that fern root is used in the growing of orchids. Hey, wait a minute. Well, what are you looking for? That list of Carter's enemies. I think it'll tell us who the killer is. <laughs> That you, George? Yes, Mama. Right in here. Uh huh. How'd you make out? Fine. How many cases were there? Three hundred, just like she said. What'd you do with it? It's out the back in the shed. Oh, I'm tired. It's been a busy day. Yes. Did you keep supper for me? Mm, it's already. Good. Oh, well, where's Mildred? Next room. Well, I guess you can let her go now. Are you serious? Well, that's what you promised her. Only to find out where the liquor was. You can't let her go. she tell the police about your killing Paul. Oh. Oh, that's right. What else can we do with her? That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Kill her, too? Of course. I see. When? Right now. Before supper? Yes. Very well. Set out the food. This won't take me. What was that? My greenhouse. Someone broke a window. George. My orchids, Mama. My orchids. Oh, look. The glass door is broken. I had to break it, Johnson. Who are you? Special agent of the FBI. What? I want to talk to you about a case of whiskey and murder. George Johnson was turned over to state authorities, convicted of first-degree murder, and sentenced to be executed. Mrs. Johnson was given a life sentence as an accomplice. And thus, another cluster of criminal careers was brought to a close, mainly because of the fine work done by your FBI's special laboratory. 1947's crop of criminals includes those who have taken advantage of modern inventions, and no law enforcement agency could cope with them unless it, too, used the aid of science in its investigations. Tonight's case involved the use of the spectroscope, one of the many machines which are at work even now at Washington, D.C., in the laboratory of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. At work for you and for your FBI. <laughs> just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. 
Now, Mr. Keating, uh, let me see if I have this Equitable Society Readjustment Income Plan straight. As I understand it, this plan would give my wife extra income during the first two years after my death. That's right, Jim. Extra cash every month for two years to give her time to adjust her expenses to a new standard of living. Well, knowing my wife was going to get that would surely take a load off my mind. Then let me suggest that you get in touch with your Equitable Society representative without delay. Let him show you how little it costs to provide your wife with equitable readjustment income. Call your Equitable representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. <laughs> Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Red-Headed Blackmailer. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The red-headed blackmailer on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you this kind of a person? You go on a summer vacation only to discover that all your worries have gone right along with you. If that's a true picture of you, then we of the Equitable Life Assurance Society would like to make a very simple suggestion. See your Equitable Society representative without delay. Ask him to fix you up with a lifelong vacation from worries about your family's financial future. Tell him you want the complete peace of mind that comes from a well-planned life insurance program with the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Benevolent Hijacker. Throughout the nation, in every corner of every state, wherever there's a patch of sand and a body of water or a cluster of trees, citizens who have worked hard all year are taking their well-earned vacations. For this short period, they are in temporary retirement from their places of business. But in at least one field of endeavor, there is no holiday season, no vacation period when work is forgotten. And that field is crime. The criminal is busy stealing, cheating, killing 52 weeks a year. And that is why every law enforcement agency, like your FBI, is at work every day and every night. Only in that way can any progress be made against the crime wave and against the army of criminals. Tonight's FBI file opens in an apartment in a smart residential section of a large eastern city. A young man is sitting in the living room of this suite. He gazes admiringly at the oil paintings that line the wall. A door opens and a middle-aged man enters. Hiya, Bob. Oh, hello there, Uncle Ed. Uh, I'm sorry to keep you waiting, kid. Oh, that's all right. Uh, just a second, I take a look at my mail here. Oh, surely. 
Uh, I was just admiring your apartment. Oh, yeah, that's right. You've never been to this one, have you? No. It's not a bad scatter. I like your taste in paintings. Oh, I have a guy who buys them for me. Oldies, you know. Oh, that one there isn't old. Hmm? Old the girl? Yeah. She's lovely. Who is she? <laughs> a very personal friend, kid. <laughs> Lay off. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, let's hear about you. I haven't seen you for a few weeks. Oh, I'm getting along all right, Uncle Ed. How long is it now since you graduated? A little over two months. How do you like working for me? Just fine. Are you sure that doing all kinds of little odd jobs isn't beneath your dignity as a college man? Oh, of course not. Well, you know, this isn't what I had in mind for you, kid, when I sent you through school. Uncle Ed, I like the work. And what's more, I want to stay in it. Well, now, that's what I was hoping you'd say. Uh, what are the reports on me, then? Oh, oh okay, okay. In fact, uh, that's why I sent for you today. I've got you lined up for a promotion. Hey, that's wonderful. What is it? I'm sending you out tomorrow night with two other boys to hijack a truck. <laughs> Pardon me. What? This is Mr. Shelby's car, isn't it? Oh, yes. He called for it. He didn't. I did. I'm Miss Jackson. Yes, I recognized you. Have we met? Well, no, but I've seen your portrait in my uncle's living room. Oh, you're Ed's nephew, Bob Norwood. <laughs> That's right. I've heard an awful lot about you. It's nice to see you. It's nice to see you, Miss Jackson. Uh, can I drive you someplace? Where's your uncle's chauffeur? Oh, you went to the ball game. I told him I'd stand by and take any calls. Now, where to, Miss Jackson? I'd like to go to my hairdresser. All right, hop in. Thanks. Where is your hairdresser? 12th in May. You know, I've seen you before. Really? Where? Well, I... Your uncle took me to a football game last fall. I saw you play. <laughs> and you still talk to me? You went bad. <laughs> uh, you got the numbers mixed. Kind of a switch for you, isn't it? Oh, what do you mean? Working for your uncle. Maybe, but I like it fine. How long have you been with him? Almost eight months. He says you're doing a real good job. He hey, says... Look, do me a favor, huh? What? Well, I'm a very dull topic. Let's talk about you. That would be really dull. Not to me. Look, I've got an idea. Why don't you skip the hairdresser? Oh, but I have an appointment. Well, cancel it. It's a beautiful day. Let's head for the country. What do you say? Well, I... Come on. Okay. In another section of the city at an FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just approaching a fellow agent's desk. Oh, Carl. Yes, Jim. Have you talked to Mr. Price? Yes, just a few minutes ago. He told me that we've both been assigned to the same case. That's right. I've already been out doing some preliminary work on it. I just left police headquarters. Well, suppose you fill me in, Jim. Okay. Well, as you know, a truck was hijacked early this morning. Yes. It was traveling interstate. That's what brought us into the case. And uh, where was this? Out on Route 17. Two men slugged the driver just as he left an all-night diner. They took his keys and drove the truck away. Was the driver badly hurt? Yeah, he's in the hospital. Could he identify either of the men? Oh, no one has talked to him, Carl. He's still unconscious. Mm. Well, are there any clues on the thing at all, Jim? No, not a one. I'm hoping the driver can help us when he comes to. Uh, what were you doing at police headquarters? Oh, they reported the case to us and asked me to drop over there. Oh, I see. They've been trying to solve a series of hijackings that have happened in the past few months. They were local jobs, but the pattern of operation is exactly the same as the one employed in the case that we're working on. Sounds like the work of a professional gang. Yeah, Carl, I would say it does. Now, incidentally, in one of the cases the police are working on, the truck driver was killed. Well. So we'll work right along with the police on this thing. Well, that should be a help. Uh, Jim, what's our next procedure on this case? Well, I think we should go over to the hospital to check on that injured driver. See if he's well enough to talk. Hello, darling. Hello, Laura. Sorry I'm late. <laughs> Honey, it's not the first time. Where are we going, Bob? Oh, someplace I thought up all by myself. Like where? Around the park and that handsome cab. Wonderful. <laughs> Come on. Okay. Haven't done this in years. Oh, you don't know what you've missed. Well, there's your other customer, driver. Shall we just hop in? Right. Here, let me help you in, honey. Give me your hand. All right. There you go. <laughs> there we are. Okay, driver, let's go. Go, Nellie. 
Well, how is it? Pretty collegiate, but I like it. <laughs> Good. And no one will see us. Are you still worried about that? You should be, too. Don't forget, honey. He's your uncle. I know. He put me through college, gave me my start, and I should be properly grateful. You should. Bob, there's one thing that's always puzzled me. What? After spending all that time on a college education, why did you turn to law, Smith? Well, doesn't being smart help? Sure. But there's so many other things you could have done. Oh, they take too long. I want a quick money business. That's why I work for Uncle Ed. Honey, do you realize that if I maneuver correctly, I can have enough money to retire at 30? Is that all you want? That and one other thing. What? You. Sorry, honey, I'm not available. Well, now, wait a minute. Why have you dated me so much these past three months? Because I liked you. So? Why aren't you available? Your Uncle Ed's been very nice to me, Bob. Oh, I could be just as nice. Not as long as you just work for Uncle Ed. Oh. So, honey boy, let's forget about us. Till you get to be 30. Carl. Yes, Jim. The police have found the truck. The one that was hijacked? Mm -hmm. Where was it? At the bottom of the river. What? Yeah, I'll give you the whole story, Carl. A patrolman saw a man drive a truck off the end of a pier early this morning. Yeah. Now, he couldn't save the truck, but he did arrest the driver and he notified headquarters. So a diving crew went on the job. I see. Their description of the truck proved it to be the same one that was hijacked. Have you questioned the driver? Yes, but he wouldn't talk. The police are still grilling him. And does he look important? No, I'd say he was just a stooge who'd been ordered to get rid of the truck. Oh, incidentally, none of the trucks ever turned up in any of the previous hijackings. This must be the way they disposed of them. Yes. And, Carl, there's another factor in this. What's that? This was a white truck. Now, that's pretty conspicuous. I don't think they would have dared to have driven it very far before getting rid of it. Mm, that's true. Now, there's a warehouse district near there. I think we should get a map, section it off, and do a systematic check of all warehouses in that vicinity. <laughs> Someone just come in. It's me, Uncle Ed. Bob. Oh, where have you been, Bob? Why? I've been looking all over for you. What for? Well, we got trouble. One of our drivers was picked up. Oh, what happened? Well, he was getting rid of that last truck. A cop saw him. They got him at headquarters now. Which driver? Willie. Oh, he's pretty solid. Yeah, uh, they're all solid till the pressure's on. You think he'll talk? I don't know. I don't know. But I can't take any chances. Well, that's true. What are you going to do? I'll get over to the warehouse and move the stuff out. Take it to our west side building. Then if he does blow a whistle, the cops won't find a thing. Uncle Ed, hmm? if you don't mind my saying so, that's not the way I'd do it. No? Well, what's your idea? Well, I'd move this stuff and then get out of town. Stay away until you're sure that nothing can happen to you. Well, what would I do with the business? Well, you've been giving me a pretty thorough training. You mean, let you run it? Well, just till you get back. No. No, that don't sound right, kid. Don't you trust me? Oh, that ain't the point. That ain't the point. I don't like walking out on things. I've been in tougher spots than this. Well, then you're going to do it your way and go to the warehouse? Yes. Yes, I'm getting over there right now. Just a minute. Hello, honey. Bob, what are you doing here? Paying a social call. Darling, I told you never to come here. And I told you I was sick of meeting you on back streets and in handsome cabs. Well, aren't you going to ask me in? Okay, just this once. Thanks. Well, this place really fits you. What do you mean? Hmm, duplex living room. White leather chairs, very plushy. Oh, I'm glad you approve. Well, now, what kind of a hostess are you, anyway? What about a drink? Okay. But, Bob, I'm going to warn you now. You can't stay long. Why not? Your Uncle Ed is due here at 8 o'clock. Honey, I don't think he'll show up. Why? Oh, he's got trouble. One of his drivers was picked up by the police. He's being questioned now. Oh, well, that's bad. What's Ed going to do? Well, I tried to advise him to go away. Go away? Just temporarily, until the trouble was over. Wait a minute. That isn't what you had in mind. What do you mean? You try to get him to go away so you could take over. 
Darling, you're psychic. I bet it didn't work. No, truthfully, it didn't. But I think I win anyway. How? Well, he went to the warehouse near where the driver was picked up. He intended to move out the stuff that was in there. So? So, I called the police and told them that he was there. Oh. That shocks you? Yes. Well, I was just following Uncle Ed's advice. He's told me right along that if you want anything badly enough, you take it any way you can get it. Now, I have you. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Don... Do you think you'd know a professional worry lifter if you saw one? Did you say professional worry lifter? That's right. And when old man worry is darkening your life, a professional worry lifter is a mighty good man to know. You'll get more from him than sympathy and good advice. You'll find he actually does something about throwing old man worry for a loss. Okay, lead me to it. Well, he's never hard to find. He's your equitable society representative. If you have fears about your family's future... Your Equitable Society representative is always ready to pitch in and do a thoroughgoing job of worry lifting, which will even include readjustment income. What kind of income is that? The Equitable Society's readjustment income plan provides extra income for the widow during the two toughest years, the two years immediately following her husband's death, years in which she is adjusting the family way of life to a lowered income. You know, expenses can't be reduced overnight. It takes time. And that's why every life insurance program should provide readjustment income for extra help during the two toughest years. You know, you may have something there. Does this readjustment income run into a lot of money? Why, it may not cost you a cent. It may require only a simple rearranging of your present life insurance program. In any event, the man to see is your professional worry lifter, your equitable society representative. Look in the phone book for the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Benevolent Hijacker. Sociologists have been making studies of the criminal for many years in a sincere effort to find out what makes one man a criminal and allows another man to become a respected member of the community. As yet, they have not arrived at the final and conclusive answer to that question. It has been shown that environment is very important, and yet bank presidents have come from the slums. It has also been shown that a lack of education was at least partially responsible for some men turning to crime. And yet, as can be seen from tonight's case from the files of your FBI, formal education is not the complete answer either. This man, with the benefits of a college education and an unlimited allowance, still turned to crime and ended by betraying his benefactor. Tonight's file continues at the FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk. Uh, Jim, I didn't think you'd still be here. Well, I've been waiting for you, Carl. And not having dinner. Something developed in the hijacking? Yes. The head man has been arrested. I seem to miss out on everything. How did this happen? An anonymous phone call was received at police headquarters late this afternoon. They were given an address down on River Street. Told to go there and pick up the man responsible for the recent hijackings as well as a goodly portion of the loot. And the tip really paid off? That's right. Well, that was a break. Who is this man? Well, his name is Ed Shelby. He has a long criminal record. And where is he now? Well, the police have booked him. He's in city jail. Did he admit to the hijacking? No, no, he wouldn't talk. But he doesn't have to. There's sufficient evidence in the warehouse to indict him, and the place was leased in his name. Mm. There must have been a number of men employed in his operation. Were any of them picked up? Two of them. I believe the police are trying to get a line on the others now. How about our jurisdiction on this? Hmm? Will he be liable to federal prosecution? Oh, the DA will work that out with the United States Attorney. But I have a feeling the state will try him first. Why? Well, there's a murder charge against him from one of those early hijackings, remember? Oh, yes, of course. Well, Carl, now that this one is over, I think we ought to get to work and write up our report. Bob. Yes, Laura? What are you doing? 
Just making a few notes. About what? Procedure. What? How I'm going to handle things now that I'm in charge. Oh. One question, hmm? Huh? What? What's there left for you to be in charge of? Are you kidding? No. Police have knocked off Ed in the warehouse, and they undoubtedly pick up some of the boys. I've taken all that into consideration. There's still plenty left. Like what? Well, like the second warehouse over on the west side. It's full of loot. And there'll be enough boys who weren't picked up to keep us in business. Do you think they'll work for you? Yes. Just because you're Ed's nephew? No, because I'm moving in fast. Uncle Ed always said that's what you should do if you want to take over. Oh. And that's just how I'm going to work, honey. I'm going to round up the boys now. I'll see you later. Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Jim. This is Carl Spencer. Oh, yes, Carl. I'm down at police headquarters. For once, I'm getting a chance to give you some news. Oh, what is it? Ed Shelby's broken out of jail. What? When was this? About an hour ago. How did it happen? He asked for permission to see the prison doctor. Mm -hmm. He was allowed to go to the doctor's office unescorted. En route there, he shinnied up a pipe to a window about ten feet up, unlocked it, and jumped out. Well, just like the Raymond Street jailbreak in New York last winter. Yes. Any trace of him? No. He just disappeared. Hmm. I assume the police have already sent out an alarm. Yes, they have. Have they knowledge of where he lived, who his friends were, Carl? I have his address, Jim. They're working on who his friends were now. No. Where does he live? Apartment house on Maple Road. You got the number? 728. 728 Maple Road. That's right. Police been over there? Yeah. So far, he hasn't shown up. Oh, I don't imagine he will. Not there. But I think we should search the place, Carl. Might give us some lead on where he could be found. I'll pick up a search warrant and meet you over there. Just a minute. Hello, honey. Oh, come in, Bob. Thanks. Well, everything worked fine. Really? Mm-hmm. Make me a drink, honey, and I'll tell you all about it. Sure. You know, I owe a great deal of thanks to Uncle Ed. How's that? Oh, he taught me well. I used his technique today, and it worked like a charm. His boys were delighted to come over with me. Do you want soda? Please. Here you are. Thanks. Aren't you drinking? Not right now. No. A toast to Uncle Ed. Thanks, kid. What? Thanks for the toast. Uncle Ed. <laughs> what are you doing here? Oh, Lara's an old friend of mine. I, I mean, I thought you were in jail. I was. How did you get out? Busted out. Oh, well, congratulations. Stop the con, kid. I know everything that's happened. What do you mean? I've just been having a nice long talk with Lara. She gave me the full rundown. Lara, you told her? Yes. You see, kid, there's a couple of lessons I didn't give you. The first one is never trust a dame. They always play the winner. I see what you mean. The second one is even more important. Don't ever double-cross anyone. Especially your uncle. Look, Uncle Don't Ed... Don't try I... any tricks, kid. I've got a gun right here. And you know I'm the guy who can use it. Yeah. Okay, but... What happens now? Well, to tell you the truth, I really came here on business. Finding out about you just happened on the side. What kind of business? I've got to blow town. I need money. Lara, you're getting it for me. How? There's plenty of cash in that safe deposit box. Either one of us can sign for it, Remember? Yes. I want you to go over there and empty it. I'll call one of the boys to escort you there and back, just to keep you in line. Jim, where are you? In the living room, Carl. Oh. I just went through all Shelby's bedroom. Oh? You find anything that might be a lead? No, nothing. He's a pretty smart operator. I just looked all through his desk, and there's no personal papers in it at all. How about an address book? No, no sign of one. I called the police headquarters while I was in the bedroom. No, any developments? No. They've been working on Shelby's personal life. They learned that he had a nephew who worked for him. Oh, they think this nephew might be hiding him out? Not at his own place. He lives in a hotel room. Police went to his hotel. He was out. 
I see. I also learned that Shelby has a girl. Huh? Who is she? Where does she live? And I haven't found that out yet. Well, that could be a very important lead, Carl. It'd be very logical for him to seek shelter with her. Yeah. Well, there should be something around here to tell us no, something. No, I... Hey, wait a minute. What? Well, look, this is just a wild stab, Carl, but... Take a look at all those paintings on the living room wall. Yeah? Well, only one of them looks contemporary. There, that one. Portrait of that girl. See? Yeah, that's right. Say, it's just barely possible. I know. That's what I'm thinking, Carl. Look, there's the artist's signature in the right-hand corner. Let's get in touch with him at once. <laughs> Wait a minute. Where are you going, kid? I, I just wanted to get a cigarette. Oh? Well, remember, I still have the gun. I know. Go ahead. Throw me one, too. Yeah. Thanks. You know something, Bob? You're not a bad kid. You just made your move at the wrong time. <laughs> I'm glad you're that understanding. Well, why shouldn't I be? After all, you are my own flesh and blood. What happens when Laura comes back? Oh, I take the money and blow. Where to? South America. Do you think you'll get that far? Well, sure, why not? Well, after all, you broke out of jail. Every cop in town will be looking for you. I can handle that. Do you plan to take Laura with you? <laughs> what for? In South America, dames like her grow in bunches. On trees. They're going to leave it for me, then? Well, <clears throat> not exactly. You see, kid, you're not going to be around. Oh. So that's it. Mm-hmm. A present from my uncle. Oh, I, uh, I wouldn't kill you myself, kid. I, I couldn't. It's like I told you. You're my own flesh and blood. Yeah, I know, I know. I got a much cleaner way all figured out. Like what? I'll, uh, I'll let Lara do it. She wouldn't. You couldn't make her. Oh, yes, I can. I'll hold the gun. She'll pull the trigger. There she is. Stay right where you are. She's got her key. Lara? Yes, Ed. Well, how'd you make out? Okay, I cleaned out the box. Well, come on in, come on in. Close the door. She can't, Shelby. Huh? I'll take that gun. Let's go. Private. Got it, Jim? Yeah. Yeah. All right, Carl, call the police. Tell them we have their fugitive. Ed Shelby was turned over to state authorities, convicted and sentenced to be executed for murder. His nephew, Bob, was convicted in the federal court for theft from an interstate shipment and sentenced to 20 years. For her complicity, Laura Jackson was convicted on the same charges and sentenced to five years in a federal penitentiary. Tonight's case was brought to a successful close because a special agent of your FBI was able to recognize that one portrait in a room full of paintings was a recent work. A visit to the painter produced the address of the subject, and there, as you have seen, the arrests were made. Arrests which led to removal of these criminals to a place where they could no longer be a menace to the safety of you or any other American citizen. <laughs> In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Mr. Keating, Mary has been a mighty good wife to me. I've been thinking that the least I could do would be to fix her up with one of those equitable society readjustment income plans you were telling us about. Right, Don. One of the finest things any husband can do for his wife is to provide her with that extra income during the two tough years. She might need that extra cash to give her time to adjust her expenses to a new standard of living. I won't even tell her about it until I can show it to her in black and white. That'll be a grand surprise, Don. Get in touch with your equitable society representative without delay. Let him show you how little it costs to provide your wife with equitable readjustment income. Call your equitable representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Uninvited Partner. 
The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The uninvited partner on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. A tour, a cruise, the mountains or the shore, wherever you are this summer, if you are one of the 12 million policyholders and beneficiaries who own or will benefit by Equitable Society life insurance policies, We like to think that your vacation is especially pleasant. Your Equitable Society policy safeguards you against uncertainty and insecurity. Yes, to enjoy a completely carefree vacation, make sure you have all the life insurance protection you need. See your Equitable Society representative soon. Tonight's FBI file... The Uninvited Partner. Our civilization is the most advanced in the long history of the world. We who are alive today enjoy advantages of living undreamed of generations ago. And yet, with all of our refinements, If you can pay for it, you can still rent a human being to commit murder. These professional killers have no single base of operations. And they murder not because they hate, but because it's their business. They care not why they kill, nor in most cases whom they kill. Just so long as they remain employed. Tonight's FBI file opens in an apartment hotel located in one of the better residential districts of a large western city. A young lady who lives in one of the suites in this building is just entering her front door. Well? Yes, Walter. Did you go to the lawyers? Well, of course I told you I would. What's the story? They want to have the marriage annulled. For how much? Ten thousand? Not enough. Walter, that isn't bad. Honey, what do you think you're playing, Jax? Well, it's better When than... the Conway family is very rich. If they want to have your marriage to their pride and joy annulled, they've got to up that figure. Plenty. Walter, don't forget, we did frame the guy into marrying me. That's not true. Oh, stop. You got him so drunk he'd have married you if you asked him. Very funny. Well, what do I tell the lawyer? About the money? Yes. Tell him it's not acceptable. He said that was their final offer. Forget what he said. I've got other ideas. Oh. Where is your husband now? On a hunting trip. Where? At his camp. Have you ever been there? Yeah. Why? Do you know the way up there well enough to direct somebody to the place? Oh, sure. Look, what is this? We're not going to take the 10,000. And we're not going to have your marriage to Mr. Conway annulled. We're not? 
No. I know how you can get all of Mr. Conway's money. How? It's very simple. Instead of being his wife, you become his widow. Answer the door, will you, Gwen? Okay. Just a minute. Hello. Hello. Is Walter Hughes here? Oh, are you Russ Moody? That's right. Come in, please. Hello there, Russ. Hello, Walter. Uh, this is Miss Blair, Mr. Moody. How do you do? Hello. Well, it certainly has been a long time, huh? Yeah. You haven't changed a bit, Russ. You look fine, fine. Walter, uh, let's get down to business. Oh, oh, sure, sure. I've got a job for you. I can use one. The horse has been running bad? They've been running fine, but too slow. Uh, can I make you fellas a scotch? A swell, a scotch and soda for me, honey. Yeah, I'll have the same. Okay. What's your deal, Walter? I've got a client. I can't tell you his name... He wants to have a certain party disposed of. For how much? One thousand in cash. Where did you come up with that kind of a client? Russ, I don't ask you anything about your business, do I? Sorry. Where is this guy? He's up in a hunting lodge about 30 miles from here. Miss Blair's drawn a map for you with all the directions. Okay. When do you want the job done? As soon as possible. Tomorrow? Fine. Oh, one thing. Yeah? Yeah. It should appear to be an accident. A hunting accident. It will. Swell. Now, uh, here's the guy's picture, Russ. Uh, don't make any mistakes. I never have. Here's your drink, boys. Oh, thank you, dear. Mr. Moody? Thanks. I have a toast. To what? To Russ. And a successful mission. <laughs> The following evening at the local FBI field office, a sergeant of the state police is just introducing himself to Special Agent Jim Taylor. Uh, Mr. Taylor, I'm Sergeant Hall. Oh, hello there, Sergeant. How do you do? Uh, your agent in charge sent me in to see you. Good. Sit down, won't you? Thanks. Well, Sergeant, what's on your mind? Well, my regular patrol includes a pretty remote section of mountain country about 30 miles north of here. Mm -hmm. There was a hunter found dead up there this morning. He'd been shot through the head. Oh, I see. Did you identify him? Yeah. Name's Conway. Hmm. Ralph Conway. He comes from a well-to-do family here in town. Sergeant, was this a hunting accident? I don't think so. Oh, why not? Well, there were several factors in the case that make me seem to think he was murdered. Well, let's hear them. Well, first of all, examination showed that Conway was killed with a forty-five caliber bullet. Uh -huh. I've never heard of anyone going hunting with a forty-five. <laughs> not unless they're hunting people. Right. What other factors have you? Well, we found a car abandoned not too far from the scene of the crime. It had Oregon plates on it. Our office wired to see if it had been stolen. Mm, I see. Sergeant, you find any trace of the weapon? No. How about footprints? It's pretty dry country this time of year. Well, Sergeant, what would you like the FBI to do? I'd like some help on these. That's a shell I found near the body. Mm -hmm. And that's the bullet the coroner removed from Conway. I see. Well, I'll have them sent on to our laboratory in Washington and get a check against the National Unidentified Ammunition File. What's that? Well, that's a file of guns and ammunition found at the scenes of unsolved crimes. Now, they'll check the markings on this bullet with other forty-five slugs they have on file and see if the same gun was ever used in any other crime. Well, how long do you think it'll be before you get a report? Well, I'm afraid that depends on how busy they are, Sergeant. However, I'll be in touch with you as soon as I hear from them. <laughs> Uh, yes, Gwen? Any word from Russ? No. Gee, you, you, you'd think he'd call or something. He doesn't have to. Why not? He did his job. Very successfully, too. How do you know? I'm just reading the morning papers. They've all carried an account of a very tragic hunting accident. To Conway? Of course. Was he killed? Naturally. That's wonderful. You should read these papers when you get a chance. They gave the story quite a play. One of them even has an editorial warning all of its readers to be more careful when they go hunting. <laughs> no kidding. Hey, maybe we did some good with this. Darling, that was the whole idea, to help the community. 
Well, what happens now? I think you should go to see Conway's lawyer. Okay. On your way, stop off at the bank. What for? Draw out $900. I want to give it to Russ. Well, you promised him a 1000 I'm holding out 10% for my commission. How can you charge a commission? You remember I was very careful to tell him the job was for a client of mine. Oh, look. How cheap can you get? Oh, darling, this is merely good business. Okay. What do I say to the lawyer? Just tell him you'd like him to make all the necessary arrangements for you to collect your husband's estate. I wonder how much it'll be. I'd say at least a quarter of a million. No kidding. Gee, being a widow is wonderful. Busy, Mr. Taylor? Oh, no, no. Come on in, Sergeant. I just got your message a little while ago. Have you heard from Washington? Yes, I received a report on that bullet. Wait, it's in this file here. Um... Oh, here it is. A bullet used to kill Ralph Conway matched two others in the unidentified ammunition file. Two others? That's right. In uh, October of 1946, there was a petty racketeer killed back east with the same gun. And in June of this year, the same gun was used to murder a bookmaker. Almost sounds like the owner is a professional. Yes. There's one thing that puzzles me, though. What's that? Well, the other two known murders that were committed with this gun were killings that involved other criminals. Yes. Now, you told me that Ralph Conway was from a well-to-do family. How does he fit in? I don't know. We checked on him, but he was never in anything that wasn't legitimate. But if we're correct in assuming that he was killed by a hired gunman, he had to be mixed up in something. That's true. Well, Sergeant, I think the first thing to do is go and talk to Conway's family. See if he had any enemies. Uh, would you mind doing that? Oh, oh, not at all, Sergeant. I'll get over there right now. Oh, gee, it's good to be back here. Oh, hello, honey. Sure hot downtown. Was it hot in the lawyer's office? No, his place is air-conditioned. That's not what I meant. Hmm? I mean, how did you make out with him? Oh. Well, I don't think he likes me very much. Really? Why not? I was so charming. Nothing happened. You mean he didn't go for the widow routine? Oh, yeah. He admitted I was a legitimate widow. That's all I wanted to hear. Uh, did you ask about the estate? Mm-hmm. How much? Over $300,000. Such sweet music. Oh, that must be Russ. Let him in. Okay. Hello. Hello, Mr. Moody. Come on in. Thanks. Hello there, Russ. Hello, Walter. Allow me to congratulate you. That was a fine job you did. Thank you. Well, I suppose you've come here about your fee. That's right. Gwen. Yeah? Did you bring back that cash? Yeah, I have it right here. Miss Blair cashed my client's check. As you know, he requested secrecy. I know. Here's the money, Walter. Thanks. Here you are, Russ. Your thousand, less ten percent commission for me, making nine hundred net. Okay. Well, I guess that closes the books, hmm? Uh, not quite. What do you mean? Let's uh, review a few of the facts. Well... When you first talked to me about the job, I thought I was going to knock off some stale nobody. So? And I pick up the papers and find I work on a guy named Ralph Conway. who's worth a bundle. What's your point, Russ? I'm getting to that. I also find out that Miss Blair here is Mrs. Ralph Conway. Who told you that? It's in the afternoon papers. Mm. Russ, what difference does that make to you? I can figure as good as you can. She comes into a chunk of dough now as his widow. That's right. And you're going to get a piece of that dough for seeing to it that she became a widow. I still don't see why it matters to you. All well, right, I did the dirty work on this job. And according to the papers, you two figured to split up about 300,000. Um, where's the whiskey? Why? Well, you two were nice enough to drink a toast to my success when I left for the mountains. Let's drink another toast now. To our new partnership. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file from your FBI. Ed, 
I've just been talking to a professional worry lifter. You've been talking to a professional what? A professional worry lifter. And believe me, I can't think of anyone I'd rather have around in time of trouble. He's not the ordinary garden variety of worry lifter, the kind that's long on advice and short on action. He's a professional who really knows how to go to work and crack down on worries. I sure could use one right now. But where do you find it? Oh, that's easy. He's your equitable society representative. And believe me, when you're taking a beating from old man worry, when fears about your family's future are keeping you awake half the night, your equitable society's man is just what the doctor ordered. Ask him for a full and complete job of worry lifting, including readjustment income. Say that again, will you? Readjustment income. The Equitable Society's Readjustment Income Plan provides extra income for the widow during the two toughest years, the two years immediately following her husband's death, years in which she is adjusting the family way of life to a lowered income. You know, expenses can't be reduced overnight. It takes time. And that's why every life insurance program should provide readjustment income for extra help during the two toughest years. Sounds swell, Mr. Keating. But are there any strings attached to it? Does this readjustment income cost a lot of money? Why, it may not cost you a cent. It may require only a simple rearranging of your present life insurance program. In any event, the man to see is your professional worry lifter, your Equitable Society representative. Look in the phone book for the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to our FBI file, The Uninvited Partner. There is one characteristic of criminals which marks them as being different from the rest of their fellow citizens. And that is that their lives are motivated entirely by greed. The success of one plan, in this case the marriage of the nightclub singer to the young playboy, does not satisfy the criminal. His insatiable greed always drives him on to the next crime, even if that next crime, as in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, is murder. Tonight's file continues in the FBI field office. Sergeant Hall of the State Police is just approaching Special Agent Jim Taylor's desk. Hello, Sergeant. Hello, Jim. Did you contact Conway's family? Oh, I talked to his lawyer. Said he didn't know any enemies Conway might have had who'd want him murdered. I see. He did tell me something that might help us, though. Oh? What was that? Well, he discussed young Conway's secret marriage. Yes? It seems that the marriage was the result of a frame-up for her, so the lawyer said. Well... Why didn't they have it annulled? Well, the Conway family hates publicity, and they were in the process of dickering with a girl to get her to agree to an annulment. And what was her reaction to that? Well, according to the lawyer, she seemed about to accept their offer of $10,000 when the murder occurred. Oh, I see. She gets the whole estate now, I guess. That's it. And she's already been to see him about it, too. Huh. I wouldn't say she was exactly in deep mourning, then. No. Well, who is she? Or who was she before she married Conway? A nightclub singer. She met Conway in one of the places she was working on. Huh? According to his lawyer, she got him quite drunk one night, drove him to a justice of the peace outside the city, and then married him. Did you find out where we can locate her? Yes. Yes, she lives in an apartment hotel. I checked over there before I came back to the office, and she'd left word at the desk that she wouldn't be back for about an hour. Uh, can I use your phone? Sure, Sergeant. I want to make a report on this to my office. Okay. I think I'll go over and talk to the widow. We'll meet back here. <laughs> from the lawyer? No. But while you were out, I had a visitor. Russ? No. This was a man named Taylor from the FBI. What did he want? Oh, he asked a million questions about Ralph. When we got married, how, who was there. What else? Wanted to know if I'd ever heard Ralph talk about any of his enemies. His enemies? Why did he ask you that? He said that they knew that Ralph was murdered, and that it wasn't a hunting accident. That's not so good. What do you think went wrong? How do I know? I'm not working with the police. Well, I just thought you might have an idea. Look, don't make me such a big man. You were a full partner when things were going good. Have you heard from Russ? No, not a word. He said he'd get in touch with us when his money ran out. Must have had a couple of winners at the track. I hope he stays lucky. 
Maybe he won't bother us then. That's wishful thinking, honey. He'll be back here whether he goes broke or not. Walter. Hmm? Suppose he gets picked up by the cops for the killing. You might decide to talk. I know. That'd make everything just dandy. Wait. What? I just thought of something that might cover everything. What? Have you got any stationery in your desk? Yeah. I want you to write a letter. To who? To the FBI. To... Now get some stationery and write what I tell you. Sorry to keep you waiting, Sarge, but I was in talking to the agent in charge about this case. Well, that's all right, Jim. Did you get to see Miss Conway? Mm -hmm, I did. Get anything from her? Well, that's what I was in talking to the agent in charge about. About what she told you? No, she didn't tell me a thing I didn't know before I went to see her. I don't understand, Jim. Well, after I interviewed her, I came back here to the office. Uh Uh-huh. About an hour later, I got a note from her. What does it say? Well, when I was talking to her, I asked her whether or not she knew of any enemy Conway might have had who would go so far as to kill him. And she said no. That's correct. Now, in this note here, she says that she used to go with a hoodlum named Russ Moody before she married Ralph Conway. And she thinks that Moody may have killed Conway? That's it. She says that Moody was insanely jealous of anyone she even spoke to, and that in some way he found out about her secret marriage to Conway. Who is Moody? Oh, we checked up on him. Got a bad record. Fortunately for us, he's wanted by the FBI now for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. Are you going to pick him up? Yes, I'm having a warrant drawn up now for his arrest. Another one so that we can search his apartment, too. Mrs. Conway included his address in her note. Well, when do you want to go over there? Well, what time is it now, sir? Uh, 3.15. Well, those warrants ought to be ready by now. Let's pick them up and get going. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Conway. This is one of your partners. What do you want, Mr. Moody? Well, it's a long story. I went up to a horse room a little while ago, and I bet on three horses that were sure things. What's that got to do with me? They lost. That's too bad. Oh, it's worse than that. I lost a thousand more than I got. You shouldn't gamble. Look, I didn't call you for any lessons. Well, what did you call for? I want another thousand today. I got to pay that bookmaker. Well, can't he wait? That's not his business. He plays for cash. I don't care how you do it, but dig me up a thousand by six o'clock. Where am I going to get a thousand dollars? Call Conway's lawyer. He'll go for I it. can't call Look, him. Look, I just told you, I don't care where you get it. Are you calling me from your apartment? No, I'm in the horse room. You going home from there? No. I'm going to stay here until after the last race. Then I'm coming over to your place. I'll be there at six o'clock. Be sure you're home. And be sure you have that dough. <laughs> Is that you, Jim? No. Yeah, I've got the keys. I showed the superintendent the search warrant and he handed them right over. Well, let's go in. All right. Yeah, it does Go ahead, Sergeant. Thanks. Well, we've got one break anyway. We've only got one room to search. Yes. Well, let's take a look in that dresser, huh? Okay. Let's see. Shirts. Socks. Wait a minute. This might be what we're looking for. What is it? Look, it's a forty-five. The same caliber gun that was used on Conway. I know. Sorry, let's take a look at that firing pin. Oh, off center, eh? Mm-hmm. You remember the peculiar markings on the shell you found near Conway's body? Mm-hmm. This could very easily be the gun that was used. Well, we'll send it along to the laboratory and let them check. They can tell us for sure. Well, let's look into the drawer. Give me the gun, Jim. I'll wrap it up. Okay, here you go. Anything in there? Mm, no. Well, let's see what's in there. Mr. Moody doesn't have many possessions. No. Hey, wait a minute. What? Something under these handkerchiefs, eh? Oh. Okay, Sarge. What is it? A hand-drawn map. Does it look familiar to you? Yes. That's the territory where Conway was shot. Mm-hmm. This ties Moody into it, all right. I think it does more than that, Sergeant. Let's get back to the office. Walter? 
Where have you been? What's the matter, Brad? I got a phone call from our partner. Russ? Who else? Where was he? In a horse room. Did he say if he was going home? No, he's coming over here. Then your note to the FBI won't work. Yeah, I know. Did he say why he was coming here? Now, I'll give you just one guess. Money? Naturally. When did he say he'd be here? Six o'clock. Six now? Yeah. I called the FBI a few minutes ago. Told him Russ would be here. When did Russ call? Two hours ago. Why didn't you call the FBI then? Oh, I was too upset. I didn't think. Walter, if he gets here before the FBI does, what do we do? I'll handle that. Do you think we should... Answer it. Okay. Hello? Come in, Russ. Thanks. Well, all partners present, eh? That's right. I won't waste much of your time. Did you dig me that money? It's not here yet. Did you call the lawyer? Uh, yes, she did. He's sending it over. Okay. Oh, well, that must be the messenger now. Let him in, Gwen. Yeah, yeah, sure. Hello, Mr. Conway. Oh, come in. Thank you. I received your message. That man there is Russ Moody. What is this? Say where you are, Moody. I have a gun. Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. I've got a warrant here for your arrest for the murder of Ralph Conway. Oh, I'm sure glad you got here before he made any trouble. I'm grateful to you, too, Mrs. Conway. If it hadn't been for you, we might never have known about Moody. Why? We also might never have found the map you drew for Moody to get to your husband's hunting lodge. What? I found that in his room. The handwriting matched the note you sent me at the office. Walter. There must be some mistake. I'll give all of you a chance to correct it. I'm taking you in now for questioning. Russ Moody was convicted in a state court for murder and sentenced to be executed. Walter Hughes was convicted as an accomplice to murder and sentenced to be executed. Gwen Blair, his female companion, was also convicted as an accomplice to murder and given life imprisonment. And thus, three more criminals saw their careers ended because of thorough investigative work by a special agent of your FBI. And the important thing about the arrests was that it removed from circulation a professional killer, a man who made his living by murder. His conviction also closed the files on a number of unsolved murders, thanks to the unidentified ammunition file, a little-known but very important section of the laboratory of your FBI. just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Say, Mr. Keating, just one last question about the Equitable Society Readjustment Income Plan you were telling us about. You said extra cash for the first two years after the husband's death. Does it have to be exactly two years, no more, no less? No, Ed, this equitable plan is completely elastic. Its purpose is to give your wife extra cash for as long a period as you think she'll need to adjust her expenses to a new standard of living. I see. Why not get the whole story from your Equitable Society representative? Let him show you how little it costs to provide your wife with equitable readjustment income. Call your Equitable representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Big Build-Up. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis, your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The big build-up on This Is Your FBI.
This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. By rail, by bus, by car, plane or ship, Americans are on the move. It's vacation time. Twelve million of these Americans are policyholders and beneficiaries who own or will benefit by Equitable Society life insurance policies. We like to think that these folks are enjoying extra peace of mind on their holidays thanks to the extra security they have gained through the Equitable Life Assurance Society. To make your own vacation carefree, take care to have all the life insurance protection you need. See your Equitable Society representative. Tonight's FBI file, The Big Build-Up. In many ways, the world of crime is an accurate reflection of the customs and the conditions of the country. For one thing, crime flourishes in economic times like the present, after a war when money is loose. But perhaps the way in which the criminal population has most completely mirrored our civilization is that this, for them, too, has become an age of specialization. A time when one man does one job well. Whatever his field of crime, be it arson, blackmail, or swindling, once he finds a formula that works, he does not deviate. That is true of almost every type of criminal but is especially true of one specific type, the criminal known as the confidence man. Tonight's FBI file opens in a motor court on the outskirts of a large Midwestern city. There, in one of the cabins, confidence man George Thompson is present as his two partners, Mr. and Mrs. Jack Milford, engage in a family fight. George, trying to stop it, speaks. Oh, Gloria, why don't you just relax, honey? This isn't getting us any place. Oh, shut up. But I'm trying to... Look, to... you're not doing any better than he is. A oh, fine pair of con men. Oh, Gloria, lay off. We've been here five days now, and the only people we've met are bartenders. That's a lie. Sure, we've been at every meeting at that convention since it started. It was your idea to come to the convention, not mine. But you were with us when we heard that this loyal order of Lemrods was loaded with rich guys. I know. And we've been working on them, too. We even learned their secret handshake. Sure, and we got badges that say we're loyal sons of the Lemrods. What more do you want us to do? The convention ends in three days. I want to see some action. Look, we've dropped the wallet five times already. And every time we do, the sucker is either too rich or too honest to go for it. Yeah. Oh, don't con me. There aren't that many honest people in the whole world. Okay, okay. You know it all. You take over. That's just what I intend to do. Come on, let's all get dressed and go into town. I'll find a sucker tonight if it kills me. <laughs> Gloria, you want to dance? We didn't come here to dance. Oh, I thought we could chase the room better from the floor. I'm looking. If anybody live comes in, I'll see him. Okay, okay. You run it the way you want. Thanks. Only do me one favor, huh? will you? Stop nagging all the time. Hey, what are you staring at? I don't round now, but I think I see our man. Where? The next table right behind you. It's okay now. Take a gander. Oh, yeah. How do you figure him? Well, for one thing, I saw him set the head waiter a pin when he sat down. Oh, I saw him look at the wine card and order a bottle of high-class Fino. Oh. And he's wearing his badge from the Lemrock. You better put yours on. Yeah, okay. Um, how do you think we ought to make them? You just leave that part to me. All right. But don't let this one get away. Good evening, Brother Lemrock. Hey, hello, son. I can't quite read your name on that badge in this light, but my name is Milford. <laughs> Glad to meet you. 
Uh, my name's Sheldon. This is Mrs. Sheldon. Uh, how do you do, you do? So nice to meet any of Wilbur's lodge mates. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to meet you, too. Uh, oh, Gloria. Yeah? Come here, Melville, huh? And this is Mrs. Melford, Mr. and Mrs. Sheldon, dear. How do you do? How are you? How are you? This is Gloria's first convention, and mine, too. Oh, my, I stopped counting years ago. <laughs> yes, Mother and I have been coming ever since the children grew up. Gives us something to do, you know. <laughs> well, we've certainly had a lot of fun all week. Oh, so have we. Say, I've got an idea. Eh? What's that, son? Why don't we move our tables together and make it one big happy party? <laughs> All right, now, hold it, everybody. Hold it. What for? Uh, the girl's going to take another picture of it. Oh. <laughs> now, everybody put on their paper hat. All right. Yeah, Mother. Put this on there. Uh, that's it. Okay, now. Hold it. <laughs> that did it. That Goodness, I haven't had my picture taken this many times in my whole life. <laughs> and you haven't been to this many nightclubs, Mother, either. No, I haven't. Oh, hey, look. Look at Jackie's under the table. Hey, what's the matter? Pass out there? Oh, no, no, no. I didn't pass out. I just felt this with my foot. Oh, well, what is it? It's a wallet. Yeah. And look at this. It's loaded with cash. And who does it belong to? Oh, I don't know. Well, what do I see here? Oh, here's a card. Uh, George Thompson. But it doesn't say where he lives? No. Hmm. Well, I guess the best thing to do is turn it over to the head waiter. Oh, yes, yes. 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 Uh, that would be the honest I thing. I uh, yes. beg your pardon. Did you find that wallet here? Well, yes, I did. Oh, brother, believe me, I'm very grateful to you. Why, is it yours? Yes. Well, can you identify yourself? Oh, certainly. My name is George Thompson. Oh, right here, I've got my signature on my cigarette lighter. Uh, any signature in the wallet? Yes. I'll write my name here. This should be proof. There. How's that? Oh, it's okay. Here's your wallet, Mr. Thompson. Oh, thank you very much. And, uh, here. I'd, uh, like to give you a reward. Oh, no. Oh, I wish you'd take this cash. No, no, thanks. Maybe I'll be that lucky next time I lose something. <laughs> well, uh, do you mind if I do something for you? Oh, you mean like buying us a drink? No, no, I'd like to do more than that. Uh, look. I, uh, hear of a good horse every now and then. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Well, what's that? Well, I was going to give you $200 for returning my wallet, but uh, suppose I just bet it for you on a horse tomorrow and give you the profits. Well, that's all right with me, except that all four of us should be partners on that bet. Uh, okay, Mr. Shelton? Well, I... Uh... Uh, I'll speak for him, Mr. Milford. We think it's fine. <laughs> <Yeah>. Good. <laughs> well, uh, where can I get in touch with you people? Well, uh, contact Mr. Sheldon. You folks are at the Central Hotel, aren't you? Yes, that's right. right. Well, that's fine. I think I'll be contacting you there tomorrow evening with your profits. <laughs> Meanwhile, in that same city at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Adam Preston is just entering the office of his fellow agent, Jim Taylor. Jim, Mr. Weaver said I was going to work with you. Uh, what's it all about? Well, Adam, we just received a wanted circular from the Chicago office on three swindlers. Mm -hmm. Chicago thinks they're headed this way? Yes, their lead is that the trio was headed here by car. In fact, they should already be here in town now. What's the racket? Well, they've been pulling the old wallet gag and tying it up to another old horse racing swindle. How does that work? Well, the wallet gag is worked when one swindler finds a wallet full of money in front of the victim. The swindler's partner then steps up and claims the wallet. Mm -hmm. He offers a reward, which the swindler refuses. Then, in gratitude, he says he'll make a free bet for the swindler and the victim on a sure thing horse. And the horse loses. Oh, no, no, the horse wins. But instead of paying any money, the man with the wallet says he'll bet it back on another horse. I see. Now, that horse wins, too. Well, by now, the swindler and the victim theoretically have a profit of, oh, say, several thousand dollars. What happens then? Then the man with the wallet says he'll give them their profits. But before he does, they have to prove that they would have been able to pay that much had they lost. Mm -hmm, I see. And the victim draws his money out of the bank to prove that he could have paid. That's it. Whereupon, swindler and his confederate take the victim's money and leave. And people fall for that kind of a swindle? Oh, yes, indeed they do, Adam. Mm -hmm. What do you think ought to be our first step on this case, Jim? Well, let's start a check on every hotel and rooming house in the city. Maybe we can catch them before they build up another victim.
Can I uh, fix you something to drink, Miss Milford? <laughs> no, thanks. Oh, why don't you try one of those sarsaparilla drinks? Oh, no, thank you. Jack should be here any minute. I just hope I'm not inconveniencing you hanging around like this. Well, of course not, child. He uh, said he was seeing that Mr. Thompson, didn't he? Yes, yes. He he was going to collect our winnings. Uh, how much have we won all together now? Over $4,000. Oh, good oh, heavens. Yes, 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 yes. Well, answer the door, Father. Yes, dear. Hello, Mr. Sheldon. Well, hello, son. Come in. Come Hi, in. Miss Sheldon. Hello, dear. Hello, honey. Well, folks, we won again today. Good no. How much? Our total is now $12,000. Oh, oh, but that's $6,000 apiece. That's right. But there's one small hitch. Oh, what is it, son? Well, Mr. Thompson won't give us the 12000 unless we show him 12000 of our own money. He says he wants to be sure that we could have paid this much if we had lost. Oh. And, and then he'll give us the money? Oh, yes. Well, that, that sounds fair and square to me. Yes, yes. but where am I going to get 12000 to show him? I've only got about $6,000 myself. Oh, well, we can help you there, son. Oh? Why, well, after all, we are partners. Yes, that's uh, right. You put up 6000 and we'll put up the other six. Yes. Oh, swell. Uh, when does Mr. Thompson want to see this money? Well, he said he'd meet us here at the hotel tonight at 9. Uh, up here in this room? Yes. Well, you get your money and I'll go get ours. And we'll all meet back here. <laughs> Jim, I hope you had better luck than I did. Not much, Adam. I went to the clerk at every hotel and rooming house on my list, but none of them recognized any of the pictures. Yeah, same thing happened to me. I did pick up what might be a small lead, though. What's that? I had a hunch they might go to work on some of the people who were in town for the Lemrods convention. And did they? Apparently they did. I checked with the convention chairman, and he said that several members had told him they'd been approached with the old wallet gag. And none of them went for it? Fortunately, no. Chairman said he'd warn the other delegates at the next meeting. Well, that ought to stop them there. Mm-hmm. Then I went over to the city desk at each paper, gave them the story with pictures of the three swindlers. Are they going to print the pictures? Yes, with stories, too, warning the people about the racket. Well, I guess they'll have trouble pulling anything now. I'd still like to mail them, though, before they leave town. What do you think we ought to do? Oh, I received a teletype from the Chicago office just before you came in. About the swindlers? Yeah, it said they just learned the trio had lived in a motor court in one of the suburbs of Chicago. You think they're following the same pattern here? I don't know, Adam, but let's try and find out. Well, are you? Huh? What is it? Before we get to Sheldon's room, let's check up on our routine. What is there to check? Have you got our 6000 Mm-hmm. Right here in my purse. You know the procedure? Yeah. Oh, I flash our money first. Right. Well, here's their room. Um, hey, what, what time to tell George to get here? In ten minutes. Oh. oh good evening. Oh, yes. Hello, Mr. Sheldon. You've come in, both of you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank yes. you, Mr. Sheldon. Hello, Mr. Sheldon. Hello, how are you, Mr. Sheldon? Yeah, no sign of Mr. Thompson yet. Well, he's not due for another ten minutes. Uh, did you get your money? Yes, sir. Six thousand? Right. Uh, did you bring your money? Uh-huh. Oh, here it is. Oh, goodness, all those bills. Well, there's our half, folks. Could we see yours? Oh, oh, surely. Uh, show it to the mother. Very well. There you are. <gasps> what? A gun? That's right. Hey, what is this? My dear boy, you didn't think we were going to fall for that old racetrack swindle, did you? Oh, huh? Mom's right. I'd advise you to get yourselves a new racket. Either that or pick your suckers more carefully. Jack, do something. Don't yeah. move, son. I can use this if I have to. Father, pick up their money. Yes, mother. Yeah. Let me have it, my dear. No. No, keep away. Dear girl, please remember this gun. Gloria, give them the dough. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Well, what happens now? We're just going to put you both in the closet and leave. What? But first, I have some advice for you. Well? For the sake of our profession... Please go into some legitimate work. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Tom, how would you like to meet a professional worry lifter? Professional worry lifter? Well, that's a new one on me. Well, a professional worry lifter is a man whose business it is to make other people's worries vanish. For instance, an amateur worry lifter may give you plenty of sympathy and nothing else. A professional worry lifter really does something about it. 
actually worked hard to make your worries disappear. Say, he must be a popular man. He's your equitable society representative. And if you are haunted by thoughts of what might happen to your family if you were no longer there to take care of them, let me suggest that you see an equitable man right away. You'll find he doesn't miss a single trick. His plan will include everything, even readjustment income. Readjustment income? What's that? The Equitable Society's readjustment income plan provides extra income for the widow during the two toughest years, the two years immediately following her husband's death, years in which he is adjusting the family way of life to a lowered income. You know, expenses can't be reduced overnight. It takes time. And that's why every life insurance program should provide readjustment income. For extra help during the two toughest years. Sounds like a mighty good idea. Does it cost an awful lot? Why, it may not cost you a cent. It may require only a simple rearranging of your present life insurance program. In any event, the man to see is your professional worry lifter, your Equitable Society representative. Look in the phone book for the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to the FBI file, The Big Build-Up. Statistics are available on almost every field of crime. You can learn how many murders there were in any period, or the number of armed robberies, or the value of every stolen automobile. But in one field of crime, the figures are inaccurate. And that field is swindling. The figures are inaccurate here because in many cases the victims prefer to take his loss and not admit that he has been duped. It is safe to say, however, that the American public every year is swindled out of millions and millions of dollars. That was true last year, and it'll be true this year. There's one way and only one way in which you can protect yourself. In doing business with strangers, don't expect to get something for nothing. Tonight's FBI file continues in the hotel room of the Sheldons. Gloria and Jack Milford are still locked in the closet. Now Jack is trying to break down the door. Yeah. Yeah. We must have built this closet as an air raid shelter. This is a good time for jokes. Well, I'm tired. I've been banging away at that door now for ten minutes. What do you want? Sympathy? No, no. Just be your usual charming self. Hmm. If you think it's so easy, take a crack at it yourself. Oh, not me. You got us in here. I did. Who picked out the sucker? Remember? Well, if you hadn't been so stupid, you'd have recognized them. I'll get back. I'm going to try this again. <laughs> oh, then I can reach out and unlock the door. There. Come on. Hey, they're gone. Naturally. Did you think they'd wait for us? Oh, shut up. Where do you think they went? How do I know? They didn't tell me. Oh, that must be George. I'll get it. Hey. Come in, come in. Uh, What's been going on in there? We got stuck up. Stuck up? Who did it? Our two suckers. Huh? We asked to see their dough, and they asked to see ours first. When Gloria flashed it, the old lady came out with a Betsy. Oh, that's great. Well, there's only one thing to do. Let's try to find them and get our dough back. Okay, well, let's split up. I'll see what I can find out here at the hotel, and I'll meet you at the Crystal Bar in an hour. Yes, dear. What's that you're working on? Some embroidery. It's a pillow. Pillow? With writing on it? Of course, it's a souvenir pillow. Giving it to Cousin Kathy for a wedding present. Oh. Uh, what's it say on the pillow? The motto. Honesty is the best policy. Ah, that's very nice. Mm-hmm. What time is this train due in Cleveland, Father? I, uh, about an hour now. What kind of a convention are we attending? Undertakers. Oh, that sounds very enjoyable. Never contacted undertakers before. I know, Mother. Change will do us good. (laughs) (laughs) What's the joke? I'm just thinking about those youngsters and their racetrack swindle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they were very, very cruel. I know. 
But, Father, they do make it hard for the rest of us. The way they work, they'd make anyone suspicious. Yeah, and make people honest, too. Oh, heavens, don't say that. People are getting more honest right along as it is. <laughs> no, no, Mother. Don't start talking yourself into one of those moods. Just remember this. If there's someone dishonest around, we'll find them. <laughs> Where have you been, Jim? Looking at tourist cabins. I located the place where our swindling trio was staying. Was staying? Yeah, they checked out several hours ago. I searched the cabin, though. Did you find anything? Yes, this picture here. It's taken at the 907 Club. Hmm. That's Milford and his wife, all right. And I also know that old couple that's with them. You do? Who are they? Well, that's what I've been trying to think of. I came back here to check their picture against the files. I have a strong hunch they're wanted, too. Are they also swindling? I think so, Adam, mm-hmm. yes. You think they might have all been working together? No, that's pretty hard to tell. Did you get any lead on where the gang had gone? Well, the manager of the outer court said that Milford made a phone call from his office. Did he know who he called? Yes, it was the Central Hotel, but he wasn't sure who he talked to at the hotel. No idea at all. Well, he didn't remember for sure. He said it might have been Shelburne. She... Wait, I remember now who that old couple is. That's Mom and Pop Sheldon. Then they must be the ones at the Central Hotel. That's right. Let's get over there right now. <laughs> Look, if Jack doesn't show up All here in a right, few minutes... Here he comes now. Well, I didn't get much, but I got something. Yeah, what's that? Uh-huh. Well, nobody at the hotel knew where the Sheldons went, but I picked up some information from the bartender here. Uh-huh. Well, don't keep it a secret. We got taken by two of the slickest con merchants in the business. Huh? Mom and Pop Sheldon. Oh, yeah, I've heard of them. I give the bell captain at the hotel a double saw, and I got to call him later to see if they come back for their bags. Well, what do they want with their bags? They got our six Gs. Hey, isn't the bartender waving to you? Yeah, I'll I'll be right back. Uh, The Sheldon, huh? Well, honey, you really picked a couple of daisies when you took over. Well, let's not go into that again. Uh, You weren't satisfied to let me and Jack run things. Well, what do you want me to do, kill myself? All right, so we got outsmarted. Next time we'll know better. Yeah, there might not be a next time unless we get our six Gs back. I think I got it. I got what? I told the bartender there was 50 in it for him if he could find out where the Sheldons went. Yeah, did he know? No, but they were in here drinking last night, and the other bartender served them. Oh, when did they come to work? We don't have to wait. This guy called him at home. Oh. And he remembered hearing them say that their next stop was Cleveland. Well, what are we waiting for? <laughs> Adam, over here. Jim. Hmm? Sheldon's have skipped without paying the hotel bill. Well, did you find anything in the room? Not a thing except the smashed closet door. You think there was a fight? No, hardly. The Sheldon's are too old to fight. My guess is they locked someone in that closet and then left. Could it have been the Milfords? Could have been. The elevator boy remembers taking them up there. He identified them from the pictures I showed. It sounds like everybody was double-crossing everybody else. Oh, why? Well, the desk clerk looked at the pictures and said that Milford was here looking for the Sheldon. Trying to find out where they went? Yes. Well, that is right. Mm-hmm. But I think there's one thing we can be sure of, Adam. What's that? If we can find the Sheldons, we've got a good chance to grab all of them. Yes, but there's not a single lead on where the Sheldons went when they left here. Oh, there's only one. What's that? The bell captain told me that during the week, old man Sheldon sent him out to buy a book on embalming. On embalming? Yeah. Well, what would he want that for? From the record, the Sheldons don't get mixed up in any murders. I know. Their record shows that the... Hey, wait a minute. I've got a hunch. Let's get to that out-of-town newspaper stand. I think we might find out where the Sheldons have gone. Mother, pass me the butter, please. Surely. Here you are. Thank you, dear. This is a wonderful idea, having dinner served in the room. Yes, gives us a chance to rest. You know, every time I walk into a hotel dining room, it's like work. Always looking for a prospect. (laughs) (laughs) Me too. (laughs) It's ought to be a wonderful convention. Yes. There are a lot of rich undertakers. Mm -hmm. There's some more coffee there? No, thank you. When I get a good night's sleep. (laughs) Convention opens at nine tomorrow morning, you know. Yes, I I must be the waiter coming back to the table. Yeah, are you all finished here? Yes, let him in. All right. Hello, Mr. Sheldon. What? Mr. Milford. That's right. Back up and let us in. Father? What? Who's that? It's us, Mrs. Sheldon. Oh. George, keep that gun on him. Right. Now, don't move either one of you. We've got the gun this time. Now, right now, where's the dough? We haven't got it. We, 
We put it in the bank. You're lying. Wait, look. We've never killed anybody before, but we wouldn't mind starting on you. So get it up. Yeah. All right. It's in that wallet. Inside pocket of my coat. Oh, Father. There's one on that chair. Get it, Gloria. Okay. And it better be all there, too. It is. So you took us for chunks, huh? You were very clumsy. Is it all there, Gloria? Yeah. Looks like more than we gave him. Oh, that's fine. Who's that? That's the man from room service for the table. Okay. George, open the door and let him in. All right. But remember, you two, don't get out of line. That gun kills waiters, too. Drop that gun, Thompson. Huh? Go and drop it. <laughs> Adam, see if any of the others have guns on them. Right. Well, who are you? Special agents of the FBI. Goodness. Now, you're all coming along with us. All five swindlers were tried and convicted for violating the National Stolen Property Act and sentenced to long prison terms in a federal penitentiary. And thus, five criminals engaged in confidence games were removed to a place where they will not be able to swindle anyone for quite a while. Now, this case in the files of your FBI was closed because a special agent, hearing that a confidence man had bought a book on embalming, remembered that the confidence man always worked conventions. A study of -of out-of-town newspapers showed that there was to be a convention of undertakers in nearby Cleveland. Putting those two pieces of information together closed the case. And once more, protected you, the American people, from a criminal enemy. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Mr. Keating... I've been thinking about that Equitable Society Readjustment Income Plan. And the more I think, the better I like the idea of fixing it so my wife would have extra income during those first two years. That's right, Tom. That extra cash every month for two years would give her time to adjust her expenses to a new standard of living. Okay, I'm sold. Then let me suggest that you get in touch with your Equitable Society representative without delay. Let him show you how little it costs to provide your wife with Equitable Readjustment Income. Call your equitable representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Ambitious Widow. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis, your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Ambitious Widow on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community.
rain isn't the only thing that can ruin a summer vacation. Worry is another. Worry about the financial future of your family. Well, why not slip some of that burden onto the broad shoulders of the Equitable Life Assurance Society? The Equitable Shoulders have the combined broadness of nearly four million members who have joined forces to protect one another. For the peace of mind that only well-planned life insurance can give, see your Equitable Society representative. He'll arrange to give you a lifelong vacation from worry. Tonight's FBI file, The Ambitious Widow. There have been many wise and practical suggestions offered to your FBI and to every other law enforcement agency on methods of curbing the current serious crime wave. Most of those suggestions had merit. But of them all, only one was an absolute preventative. That one was eternal vigilance. Law-abiding citizens have a tendency to forget that crime, like many other things, runs in cycles. Let one crime seem to be successful, and there will be a series of such crimes. Then, because the gap has been filled, those crimes cease and another type will begin. But there's no way of knowing which new trend will begin. And that is why your FBI tells you that there's only one way for you, the citizen, to help fight the crime wave. That way, to repeat, is eternal vigilance. Tonight's FBI file opens on a rainy day in a quiet cemetery near a large Midwestern town. Two of the mourners are talking as in the background, a solemn prayer is being intoned as the casket is about to be lowered. For as much as has pleased Almighty God in his wise providence... Poor Lou. Yeah. You know, Hank, I still can't believe he's dead. Yeah, I sure would quick. I saw him the day before he died. He never looked healthier to me. Uh-huh. He was a nice guy. I liked working for him. Yeah, Lou was okay. Yeah, one good thing about it, he went out legitimate. No guns or nothing. I wonder who'll take over now. Hank, Hank, that ain't no way to talk. Why not? Lou ain't even buried yet. He's dead, ain't he? I know, but... I was thinking... I've been working with Lou for better than ten years. I'm the logical guy to step in. Hank, let's talk about it later. To the earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust. Amen. 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 Well, let's go over and see Nan. Okay. Hello, Nan. Hello, Hank. Ted? We, uh... We want to tell you how sorry we are. Yeah. Thank you. If there's anything we can do, just say the word. You're very sweet. You still going to live at the hotel? No, I bought a boat. Are you going to live on it? Yes. Hey, that's a good idea. You can get away for a while. Help you forget. I don't plan to go away. Where is the boat? Tied up at the foot of 14th Street. You going to keep it there? Yes. What for? Hang, hang, lay off the question. It's all right, Ted. I'm keeping the boat at 14th Street, Hank, for a very good reason. So many piers near there to steal from. Hank, there's a lot of boats tied up here. It's a public dock. Anybody can come in. Well, how do you tell which one is Anne's? Ted, she told me the name. It's the Dolphin. And there it is. Where? That black job down at the end, see? Oh, yeah. Hey, that's a big boat. Yeah. Hey, I don't see Nan. We'll hail her. Oh, hi there. Anybody aboard? Hey, there she is. Jump aboard, boys. Okay. Okay. Hi, Nan. Hello. 
Oh, it's so nice of you to come down to see me. As soon as we got the word you were looking for us, we came right over. It's quite a bug. Well, I think it should be good to work with. You know, when Lou and I were first married, we spent our honeymoon on a cruiser like this. Oh? We stole enough to make us rich. Stole what? Stuff off piers. Uh, Nan. Yes? Is that what you uh, plan to do again? Yes. That's kind of tough for a dame, isn't it? Well, I'm really depending on Lou's friends to carry me through. Is that why you're sent for us? Yes. You're the last two boys on my list. I've talked to all the others. They're all coming along with me. You uh, got definite plans for action? Yes. Uh, would you care to join us? Okay. Good. How about you, Ted? Uh, anything you say is good enough for me. Oh, fine. Come on down to the cabin, then. I'll tell you about our first job. Uh, when is it? Tonight. Hmm. Please cut the motors. Right. We'll drift in just right. Hey, look at those crates of silk. We should be able to load all of them onto the boat in ten minutes. What about the uh, watchman? We always stay up front. You case this thing pretty good. Lou always said it pays to be careful. Hey, uh, how much is that silk worth, man? It ought to be about $30,000 in that load. That much? Surely. Silk's back on the market, but it's still difficult to get. Here we are. Tie us up, Hank. Yeah. Ted, you and the boys start working. All right. Okay, boys, up you go. Wait a minute. Duck you guys. What is it? Someone is coming down the pier. Can you handle this, Hank? Sure, sure. Hey, what's going on here? What are you doing in that boat? Well, uh, I'll tell you, mister. We sprang a leak, and it looks like this pier. Okay, let's finish loading and get out of here. The next morning in the field office of your FBI, Special Agent Jim Taylor enters his office to find Elliot Sheridan waiting for him. Well, hello, Elliot. Hi, Jim. You look like you've done a hard day's work. I have. I've been climbing all over Pier 27. Uh, I was hoping you'd come into the office before you went out there. Oh, why? Well, when I checked in this morning from Salt Lake City, I finished my report. The boss assigned me to work with you. Hey, that's fine. Well, there's plenty of work for both of us to do. Oh, what's the story? It's a theft from an interstate shipment. Done with the boat? That's right. Now, what was stolen? Over $30,000 worth of silk. Oh. Any clues? No, we can't tell yet. Watchman was slugged, but he may be able to help us. How? Says he got a pretty good look at one of the men on the boat. He's almost certain he can identify that man. And where's the watchman now? He's down at police headquarters looking over pictures. If he finds the man he saw, they'll call us. What's the next step? Well, I've alerted all dock owners to be doubly careful, keep their goods well guarded at night. Uh, any chance of locating the stolen silk? I've already contacted every silk wholesaler in town. No luck, though. Well, none yet. But they're going to call in if they come across any of the loot. What do we do now? Well, there's nothing much we can do, Elliot, but wait until we hear from that watchman. Jack! Oh, hi, Hank. Come on, have a drink. You buying? Sure. Okay. Hey, Matt, a couple of rides. Where you been? Oh, I went to the boat. Oh, did you get paid? Sure. How much? Huh? How much did Nan give you? Five bills. Five hundred? Uh-huh. No wonder she wanted to pay everybody off one at a time. Hey, what are you talking about? I spoke to the other guys. They got a hundred apiece. What? Is that all? Yeah. That's eight hundred for them and five for you. That's thirteen hundred she's paid so far. Out of 8,000. She told me she only got 2,000. I checked up. She got eight G's in cash. Hey, uh, okay. Well, I'll tell you one thing. She ain't gonna pay me off in the dark. 
I did a lot of work. I arranged for the trucks to pick up the stuff off the dock. I even arranged for the fence to get rid of it. Well, I guess there's always trouble when you work for a dame. They don't have to be. Not if you handle them right. How much are you going to ask for? Twenty-five percent. That's two Gs. Ah! <laughs> she won't go for that. Oh, yeah? Come on over with me. I'll show you. I, I can't go right now. Why not? I got a date. Look, you go on down to the boat. I'll meet you later. Hi, Jim. Hello, Elliot. Any news from the watchman? Yes, while you were out, police headquarters called. The watchman definitely identified a man named Henry Davis, alias Hank Davis. Uh, what's the record on Davis? I've got it right over here. Here it is. Take a look at it. Uh, 23 arrests. Starting, you'll notice, when he was 15. Yeah, I see, one of these arrests was for hijacking. Mm-hmm. That would tie him in with this kind of a job. There's an even stronger tie-in than that down there. Uh, see that arrest back in 34? Uh, it's down to the bottom there. Uh, 34, yeah, here it is. Well, what about it? I thought I remembered that job, so I checked up on it. You find anything? Mm-hmm. Along with Davis, the police also arrested a man named Lou Mercer. The one who died last week? Same one. And at that time, Mercer had a gang of river pirates stealing stuff on both sides of the river. Yeah, that is a strong tie in, Jim. Now all I have to do is find Davis. Oh, uh, by the way, you pick up anything down at the docks? No, I spoke to the watchman on the adjoining dock. I didn't see anything. No clues of any kind? Huh? Not a thing. Looks like they must have glided up to the pier with their motors off. They weren't even heard. Yeah, I guess that's the way they would operate. Let's talk, excuse me. Sure. Special Agent Taylor. Yes, Sergeant. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Oh, wait till I get a pencil and I'll write that down. Give me that pencil. Sure. Thanks. Okay, go ahead, Sergeant. 721 Oak Street. Room 129. Got it. Yeah. Thanks very much, Sergeant. Something on Davis? Yes, that's the call we've been waiting for. We've got Davis's address. I'm going over there now. Ahoy there! Anybody aboard? Who's there? It's me, Nan, Ted. What do you want, Ted? I was supposed to meet Hank here. Okay. You see, Hank? Yes. Came down here. He's very angry. Yeah, I know. He was sore when he left me. Did he tell you what he wanted? Yeah, more dough. And I gotta admit, he had a point there, Nan. Why'd you say that? Well, after all, he did a lot of work. And me did, too. Kid, I got the boat. Yeah, I know. And I lined up the job. Sure, but... Uh, how can you say that you boys did so much work? Well, I should have got more than 500, man. After all, you got 8,000 for the stuff. Well, supposing I did. What about it? Well, I want a bigger cut. How much? Same as Hank. You know what he asked for? Yeah, 25%. That's right. Did you give it to him? No. Well, what did Hank do? Tried to use violence. Cut me around. What happened? Come over to the cabin. Look there. On the floor. Hank. He looks dead. He should. He is. Turn in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. See that happy-looking chap over there? He's a professional worry lifter. You mean he goes around cheering people up, giving them good advice and so on? He does more than that, Ed. He's a specialist. He lends a sympathetic ear to people in trouble, sure. But he also lends a helping hand. He not only acts, but he talks as well. Oh, sounds like a man everybody ought to know. Oh, he is. He's your Equitable Society representative. If fear about your family's future is destroying your peace of mind, you'll find that your Equitable Society representative really knows the answers. For instance, right now, you may be doing some unnecessary worrying, simply because you haven't heard of readjustment income. As a matter of fact, I never did hear of it. The Equitable Society's readjustment income plan provides extra income for the widow 
during the two toughest years, the two years immediately following her husband's death, years in which she is adjusting the family way of life to a lowered income. You know, expenses can't be reduced overnight. It takes time. And that's why every life insurance program should provide readjustment income for extra help during the two toughest years. Say, this readjustment income plan sounds okay to me. Is it expensive? Why, it may not cost you a cent. It may require only a simple rearranging of your present life insurance program. In any event, the man to see is your professional worry lifter, your Equitable Society representative. Look in the phone book for the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Ambitious Widow. It is not the purpose of tonight's case from the files of your FBI to tell you that the mobs of criminals operating in this country today are being run by women. Nothing could be further from the truth. And yet, women are active participants in the current crime wave. That fact has become more obvious as each year's records are studied. And it is an actual statistic that in the past year... Women were so active that of all arrests made for criminal homicide in the United States, the number of women arrested exceeded 10%. One other fact emerges from a study of that same table of arrested persons, and that is that there is virtually no crime or method of operation too difficult for the lady criminal. Yes, in this field, too, women have definitely proven that they are not the weaker sex. Tonight's file continues in the FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor has just returned from the search of Hank Davis's apartment. Jim, hmm? find anything up at Davis's place? No, not a thing. Any of his neighbors able to help? They wouldn't if they could. That kind of a place. Huh? Mm, that kind. It's one thing that bothers me, though. Oh, what's that? Davis didn't show up all night. I checked this morning before I came in. He couldn't have gotten in the back way, could he? No, no. We've had the building under complete surveillance. Hey, you don't suppose he found out he'd been identified by the watchman, do you? Why not see how he could have? You think he skipped town? No. No, I don't believe he's still around. Well, what's the next step, Jim? Do we wait for Davis to show up? No. No, on the way in, I asked the fire room to send up that copy of Davis's record. Uh-huh. We might get the names of some of his friends from that to start checking on them. Now, he's Hoggett. Special Agent Taylor. Oh, yes, Sergeant. Well, you have? Hmm. Yeah, thanks for calling. We'll be right down. That was the more, Gilly. They've just identified a body down there. It's Mr. Hank Davis. Nan! Oh, hi there, Nan! That you, Ted? Yeah, okay to come aboard? Come ahead. I thought you might still be sleeping. No. I've been up for hours. Did you get rid of the package? What package? Hank. Oh, yes. Yeah. Tied some weights on him, dropped him overboard. Well, right here? Surely, why? Suppose he comes up. Didn't you ever hear of a current? Oh. <laughs> Dad, stop worrying. Okay. Do any of the other guys know about Hank? No. Well, suppose they find out. Well... They might not like it. Well, I'm afraid they'll have to like it. It'll teach them that a woman can be efficient, too. Did you call that number I gave you? Off of the truck, yeah. He'll be here at six in the morning. Good. I called the rest of the boys. They're ready. Will we go tonight? N- at midnight. Oh, I hope it ain't too soon after the last job. Ted, just let me do the worrying. Come here. I want to show you something. What is it? You'll see. Look under that canvas. Hey, a machine gun. And the way it's mounted, you see, you can swing it to cover any angle. Well, what do you want with a machine gun? Just in case of trouble. 
Oh. This is going to be your job. The gun? Yes. You stay back here from the time we leave until we get home. Okay. And I don't have to tell you what to do, Ted. There's trouble. You use it. Over this way, Elliot. Body is right over here. Um, yeah, here we are. Ah, Davis, all right. Mm. Bullet hole in his head. Uh, must have been dead when he hit the water. According to the corner, he was. Davis's personal effects are over on that table. Let's take a look at them. Huh? Right. Yeah, sit here a minute. Okay. I guess these are just the papers and money he had on him. Yes. All of his clothes are over there. He wasn't carrying much money, was he? Ah, oh, for a fellow who just pulled a big job. That key you've got there won't help us. That's the key to his apartment. See the 129 stamped into it? Oh, yeah, that's his room number, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Phone number on this slip of paper. I wonder what this is. Maybe a girl. Could be. Oh, wait a minute. This exchange is in the business district. Elliot, let's get out of here. I'm going to make a phone call. See who belongs to this number. <laughs> Call that number. It was a trucking outfit. Trucking outfit? Mm hmm. They could have been in on the job. No, I checked up on them down at the office. They're legitimate. Well, what did they have to report? They picked up some crates of silk from the dock at the foot of 14th Street. Yeah, but who paid for the job? Well, they were paid at the warehouse where they delivered the silk. Oh, I see. I had the police send a radio patrol car around to the warehouse. Pick anybody up? No, there wasn't anyone at the warehouse, but the silk is there. Hey, the office can find out who owns the warehouse and the tax record. It'll probably turn out to be David. Well, the office is already working on that angle. I don't think Davis was the head man, though. Oh, well, why not? Well, the trucking outfit I spoke to said they got another call just about an hour ago. With another order? That's right. To pick up another load tomorrow morning and at the same dock. Well, why don't we get down to the dock, pick up whoever's anchored there? Well, the 14th Street Pier is open to the public. There's always about a dozen boats tied up down there. Oh. But I've got an idea. Let's get back to the office and we'll work from there. I know the police will want to join us. <laughs> On the river that night, there were three large, fast boats manned by special agents of your FBI. Boat number one, with special agent Jim Taylor, was idling in the middle of the river. Boat number two, with special agent Elliot Sheridan aboard, was north of 14th Street. Boat number three was to the south. Special agent Taylor is talking over the two-way radio to both of the other boats. I see movement aboard a large black boat. There are about ten men aboard now pulling away from the dock. The boat is headed north. Sheridan. Sheridan on boat two. Have you spotted her yet? Yes, Jim. Just picked her up in the glasses. Fine. Now start up the river yourself and stay in front of her. Right. I'll follow her from behind and check with you later. Jim Taylor. Come in, Sheridan. Can you see what she's doing now, Jim? She's headed in toward a pier. That's right. All right, stop your motors and stay where you are. We're going to follow her in. Boats two and three. The name on the boat is the Dolphin. It's pulling into Pier 40 now. Come up behind boat number one and give me some cover. The Dolphin is now tied up to the pier. They're starting to load. We can nail them in the act. Let's start to close in. What is it? How's it going? We've got one more crate to load and then we're finished. Oh. Ted, why aren't you standing by that gun? I wanted to see how it was going. Oh, please get back to it. Look, I... Wait. What is it? Here, motor. You boys, quiet a minute. I hear him, too. If there was only a moon, we could see. They're coming closer. Hey, those lights! They're shining right on us! Stand where you are, all of you! 
Nan, it's cops. Yes. What do we do? Look, there's more than one boat. I know. They got us cut off. Well, they aren't taking us. Huh? Get on that gun. Oh, Nan, look. Do as I say. No dice. They're right on top of us. I'll handle it myself. Oh, oh, no, Nan. Come back here. Nan, they're alongside. Keep on with this boat. Get away from that gun, lady. Jim, look out. Sir. Let go of me. All right. Elliot, cover the rest of them. I'll bring our lady right over to join you. All members of the hijacking gang were tried and sentenced to serve long terms in the federal penitentiary for larceny from interstate shipments. Nan Mercer was turned over to local authorities to be placed on trial for murder. And thus, another band of criminals was broken up by the cooperative efforts of local police who supplied the launches and of your FBI. Everywhere across America, that kind of cooperation is taking place. And as in tonight's case, every means of communication and transportation is being used to narrow the circle around the criminal. And to keep narrowing it until he is trapped, arrested, and convicted. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Just one second, Mr. Keating. I want to check and see if I'm on the beam about the Equitable Society's readjustment income plan. My understanding is that this plan would give my wife extra income during the first two years after my death. You've got it straight, Ed. Extra cash every month for two years to give her time to adjust her expenses to a new standard of living. Sounds like a mighty fine idea to me. Then let me suggest that you get in touch with your Equitable Society representative without delay. Let him show you how little it costs to provide your wife with equitable readjustment income. Call your Equitable representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the diamond-studded Double Cross. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The diamond-studded double cross on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Transcribed and presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. We are acutely aware that our Equitable Society radio messages are listened to in millions of homes. To the Equitable Life Assurance Society, that means a serious responsibility. Therefore, our equitable commercials are keyed to your home and family problems. Tonight's message is on education. Are there young children in your home? Then be sure to listen to the special message on the Equitable Education Fund, coming in just 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Benevolent Corpse. If you think about crime or criminals very much, 
You're likely to think that most crimes are committed out of hunger, out of passion, or a desperate need for revenge. But if those are your thoughts, then you are laboring under a popular delusion. The simple truth, and it is proven by the records of your FBI, is that more than half of all persons arrested have records of prior arrests that a large number of crimes are committed by those who have devoted their lives to this field. Therein lies the great tragedy behind the current crime wave. For the number of people who enter this field every day is increasing. And there is a serious question in many minds as to whether or not any nation can long stand the steady drain of its manpower. As a people, we have faced our problems honestly and squarely. We have succeeded in solving most of those problems by combined national effort. The time has come to turn that national effort into fighting the nation's criminals. Tonight's FBI file opens in a modest apartment located in the downtown section of a large Midwestern city. In the bedroom of this flat, a haggard-looking elderly man is lying on a cot. A young couple sits beside him. Wilbur. Yes, Uncle Ben? I I want you to know how pleased I am that you and Trudy could come. Oh, gee, we're we're glad to be here. Of course we are. As soon as we heard you were sick, Uncle Ben, we rushed right over. You're good kids, both of you. How long have you been in bed like this? Almost a week. Well, have you had a doctor? No. Gosh, don't you think you should get one? No. Why not? I just don't believe in them. Yes, but... Trudy, whenever Uncle Ben makes up his mind, don't try to change it. Oh, I'm sorry. <coughs> oh, can I get you something, Uncle Ben? No. Stay where you are. Let me tell you why I sent for you. Okay. I got a very strong feeling that I'm not going to get over this one. Oh, Uncle Ben. Quiet. So I want to do something for you kids. I want to leave you something. Sort of a combination inheritance and wedding present. Gee. It's right there in that box. Get it, Trudy. Yes, sir. You can open it now. Yes, sir. Never. Look. What? Look in here. It's full of jewels. Yeah. Oh, Uncle Ben, they're wonderful. They should be. They're the reason why I'm on my deathbed. What do you mean? I had to stand for two hours in the pouring rain, waiting for the people that own them things to go to bed. Oh. Did you steal them here? No, in Detroit. Now, here's what I want you to do with them. There's a card there on the dresser. Uh Uh-huh. A man named Richie. He's a fence. Take them to him. All right. Say I sent you. Okay. He'll give you enough for you to have a real good honeymoon. Uncle Ben, we couldn't do that. Why not? It'd leave you with nothing. I'm going to die anyway. All I ask is that you save enough out of it to give me a decent burial. Gee... You're the best uncle a fella ever had. In the same city at a local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk as a fellow agent approaches. Oh, Jim. Oh, yes, Andy? How about coming down for some lunch? Oh, I can't right now, Andy. I'm waiting for a report from the local police. Oh, what on? Suspect that's wanted by the Detroit office. And what's the story, Jim? They had a jewel robbery out there about three weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Local residence was broken into. A very professional job. Yeah? Over $30,000 worth of gems were stolen. I see. A car was seen pulling away from the house the night of the robbery, and a witness spotted the license plates. They were from our state. Did he get the number, too? Fortunately, yes. I did a checkup and found that the car was one that was stolen from him. Oh. The Detroit office combed the car for prints and finally found one behind the driver's mirror. Mm-hmm. We worked up, sent on to the laboratory, and identified as belonging to an old-time thief named Ben Cooper. Cooper? Mm-hmm. The name sounds very familiar. Yeah, it sure did. I checked with our local police. They knew him very well. In fact, to the best of their knowledge, he makes his headquarters here. Oh, excuse me, Andy. Yeah. Special Agent Taylor. Hmm? 
Oh, yes, Sergeant. Yes. You, wait, let, let me write that down, will you? 342 North River Street. Got it? Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sergeant. Goodbye. That was an address on Cooper. The police say you're still living there two months ago. Well, that's a break. Yeah, I'll get a warrant. I'm sure the police will be glad to go over with me and pick Cooper up. <laughs> Sit down. Sit down, both of you. Thanks, Mr. Ritchie. Sit here, Trudy. Thank you, dear. Now, then. You say Ben Cooper told you to come here to see me? Yes, sir. I haven't seen old Ben in a long time. How is he? He's not, Mr. Ritchie. Huh? He's dead. Oh, that's too bad. Yep. He died the day before yesterday. Well, what happened? Well, it was sort of in the line of duty. He caught a cold while he was doing the job. I see. Poor old Ben. We gave him a very nice funeral, Mr. Ritchie. The best that money could buy. Good for you. And that's one of the reasons we've come here. We have to pay for it. Oh. Well, look, Ben was really just an acquaintance. I oh, never... Oh, we're not here for donations. No, Uncle Ben sent us to you on business. What do you mean? Show him, Trudy. Oh, sure. Here you are. Well, Those are from his last job. Quite a haul. Uncle Ben said you could get rid of them for us. Oh, what, uh-huh. do you, what do you think they're worth, Mr. Ritchie? That's hard to say. Well, could you give us an idea, maybe? This is all kind of new to us. You mean you're legit? Oh, no. I've stolen some stuff, but never anything big. Wilbur started just starting, Mr. Ritchie. Yeah. He's stolen cars, clothes, things like that. But he's a comer. His Uncle Ben told me that. I see. So, uh, what do you think we can get for him? Well, I'll have to make an estimate. That'll take time. How long? I'm not sure. Could you kind of hurry, Mr. Ritchie? Wilbur and I want to go on our honeymoon. Yeah. Well, (laughs) come back tomorrow. Well, Jim, you pick up your suspect? No, Andy, we didn't. Oh, what happened? I thought you had an easy one there. It would have been, except for one factor. Cooper is dead. Well, when did this happen? Oh, he died two days ago. And of natural causes, too. <laughs> did you get this from an authentic source? Oh, yes, it's true enough. I talked to the undertaker who buried it. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about the jewels? No trace of them. Oh, fine. Mm-hmm. Searched his living quarters? Yes, I spent all afternoon in his apartment. No trace of them at all. Did he live with anyone? No, lived all alone. How about a safe deposit box? Oh, I'm checking on that angle now. Maybe you already cleared them with a fence. Yeah, it's a possibility. However, there was no trace of any cash around the place. I see. I'm checking to see if you had any bank accounts, too. Didn't you really run into a stone wall? Huh? Yeah. I did pick up one piece of information, which might be a leak. What's that? I told you I talked to the undertaker who buried him. Yeah. Said a young couple had arranged for the burial. Oh? One of them, the young man, said that he was Cooper's nephew. They paid for everything? No. No, they just gave him a small deposit. They said they'd pay the remainder in a few days. Did he have an address on this couple? Just the uncle's residence. They may just forget about it. Well, I felt that way too, Andy, but the undertaker said that they seemed like very nice kids. He was certain that they would pay him. Mm, Let's hope he's right. Yes, I told him if he did hear from them to let me know at once. Is that you, Wilbur? Oh, yes, sir. I'm out here in the kitchen. Oh. Come on out here. I want to show you something. Okay. Wilbur, look at what I'm doing. Huh? I'm making my first cake. Oh. It's going to be sort of like our wedding cake. I went to the store and bought a little bride and a little groom. I'm going to put them on top of it. Mm-hmm. Wilbur, aren't you interested? Huh? Oh, oh, sure, honey bun, but... But what? Well, I... Just been to see Mr. Ritchie. Yes? He gave us back the jewels. Huh? What for? Well, he said he didn't want to handle them. Why not? Well, he said they were too hot for him. Oh. Oh, gee, this is awful, Trudy. Now we won't have any money for our honeymoon or for Uncle Ben's funeral. Wilbur, don't be discouraged. We'll still get the money for those things. Oh, how? Well, we'll go to Cleveland. There's a thin sale we can see. Oh. Oh, very nice man. He's an old friend of my father's. Did your father ever do business with him? All the time. 
You know yourself, he was the best jewel thief in the business outside of your Uncle Ben. Yeah. Now, just give me those jewels. Okay. Here. You can start packing right now. And as soon as we... Wait a minute. What's the matter? This bridge. Well, what about it? Those aren't the same stones that were in it when, when we took it there. What? Let me look at some of this other stuff. Goody. Goody, what do you mean they're not the same stones? These are imitations. Fake. Oh. Uh, how can you tell? Wilbur, I used to look at diamonds when I sat on my father's knee. I had one of those glasses that fit in your eye before I had dolls. But, but they look just the same. They are the same setting, but the real jewels were removed. Well, the only one who could have done that is Mr. Ritchie. I know. Oh, so that's why he gave them back to us. It must be. Wilbur, we're going back there to see him right now. <laughs> Just a minute. Hello, Mr. Ritchie. Oh, uh, what do you want? We want to talk to you, Mr. Ritchie. Well, uh, look, I'm busy right now. This is very important. Go ahead, Wilbur. Now, just a minute. Sorry, Mr. Ritchie. What's the meaning of this? Tell him, Wilbur. Well, we came here because... Well, because you... We came back here because the stones were taken out of our jewels. What are you talking about? I know jewels, Mr. Ritchie. The ones Wilbur brought back were fake. Well, they were fakes in the first place. That's why I wouldn't handle them. Oh, but you said before they were too hot. Oh, I thought you were nice kids. I didn't want to hurt your feelings. I don't believe you. Now, look. You give us back the real stones. We want to take them to Cleveland. We know someone there who will treat us fairly. All right, I've heard enough of this. Get out of here. Wilbur, don't you let him talk to us that way. Get out, I said. Wilbur, take him give us back those jewels. Uh, Mr. Ritchie, you heard what she said. Now, if you don't give him back, I'll... I'll... You'll what? He'll use force. Won't you, Wilbur? Yes. Why, you little punk. You hit him. That's right. Wilbur, you get right up and hit him back. Very well, sweetie. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. How that grand old song brings back memories of bright college years. Years when you were forming friendships that were to last you all your whole life through. You're right, Mr. Keating. They were mighty good years. Profitable years, too, Bob. You may not know it, but the more a man learns, the more he earns. The fact is that the average college graduate earns $72,000 more during his working years than the average American. Of course, exceptional individuals do rise to the top without higher education. But the fact still holds good. College is the best investment loving fathers and mothers can make for their children. I wish I could be sure that my two boys would go. Don't just wish, Bob. Make sure they go. Make sure with an equitable education fund. What is an equitable education fund? It's a surefire plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. And it includes these important features. One, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Two, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him, right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Three, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die the education fund becomes fully established immediately. Boy, that's just what I need. How do I start an equitable education fund for my kids? The man to see is your equitable society representative. Give your children their chance to earn that extra $72,000 by getting in touch with your equitable representative soon. 
Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Benevolent Corpse. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI deals exclusively with professional criminals. With those who make their precarious livelihood illegally. There's a reason for presenting this file to you because there has been built up in the public mind a false picture of the typical criminal. There is no such thing. Tonight, for instance, you meet four separate and distinct types. One... The old man, whose age lends him a false gentility. Two, the young novice, whose youth lends him a false note of innocence. Three, the young bride, whose background gives her a knowledge of crime beyond her years. And four, the fence, whose hardness and cunning make him difficult to detect. There are many other types of criminals whose age brackets likewise cover the young, the middle-aged, and the old whose appearances are equally varied. So take this bit of advice from your FBI. Do not assume that you can spot a criminal by the way he looks, because no one can. Honesty is not in the face. It's in the heart. Tonight's file continues several hours later at the apartment of young Trudy and Wilbur Sheridan. Wilbur? Hmm? Oh, yes, honey, boys. What are you doing? Oh, just writing a letter to the undertaker. Oh. Yeah, I I explained to him that we were going to be out of town and that he'd have to wait a few more days for his money. That's very nice. Well, I didn't want him to think we'd try to cheat him. You're so sweet. Mm-hmm. You know, Trudy, I was just wondering. What about? Well, Mr. Ritchie. We don't know if he's alive or dead. Wilbur, whichever he is, it's his own fault. He's a very dishonest man. Yes, that's that's true. Oh, by the way, did you look over the stuff we took from him? Yes. Uh, his stuff, too? Yes, some of it's almost as good as ours. Oh, hey, that's swell. Wilbur, yeah? I think we'd better start packing. Oh, for Cleveland? Uh-huh. Uh, are you sure we can stay at your aunt's apartment there? Of course, she'd love to have us. Oh. She told me that any time I wanted to use it, to just get the key from the superintendent. Oh, she won't be there. Oh, no, she's in jail. Oh. I'm waiting until you see her apartment. Yeah? It has a wonderful kitchen. And you know something? What? I'll finally get a chance to make you that cake. Oh. Andy. Andy, over here. Oh. Hope I haven't kept you waiting, Jim. No, I just got here. You got that warrant for me? Yeah. I have it right here. Oh, swell. Go inside, huh? All right. Is this where that uh, young couple live? Mm hmm. Go ahead, Andy. Thanks. Ah, uh, let's see. Apartment's right down the hall here. How'd you finally locate them, Jim? Well, that undertaker received a letter from the young man. His name is Wilbur Sheridan. Sheridan? Mm hmm. He explained he was going out of town, said he'd forward the money later. He put this return address on the outside of the envelope. I see. Oh, uh, here we are. Do we ring the bell? No, no, they're not at home. The superintendent saw them leave with luggage last night. He gave me a key. That does it. Okay, after you, Andy. All right. Did uh, Sheridan say anything in the letter about where he was going? Yeah. Cleveland. Oh, did he give any address there? No. Oh, I thought we might find something around here that'd give us a lead. The place looks pretty barren, Jim. I'd say they're gone for good. Would appear that way. I'll take a look around in the bedroom. Wait a minute. Huh? What do you got? This card is on the table there. George Ritchie, exporter. Hey, that name sounds familiar, Jim. Yeah, it should. There's a George Ritchie who's an old-time fence. I ran across him several years ago on the Lewis case. Oh, yes, I remember him. It's got to be the same one, Andy. This is the same address here on the card. It sounds as if he might know something about those jewels. Yeah. Andy, look, why don't you go back to the office? Contact Cleveland. I'll give you a description of the young couple and have all hotels and rooming houses checked. Right. 
I'm going to pay a call on George Ritchie. Trudy! I'm in the kitchen, Wilbur. Oh. Close your eyes before you come in. Oh, what for? Oh, Wilbur, please. Okay. That's it. Now you can open them. Gee, they're cake. Uh Uh-huh. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, yeah. See the little bride and groom on top? Sure as well. You want a piece? Oh, be ashamed to spoil it. Oh, don't be silly. I'll cut you one right now. Okay, thanks. Oh, uh, I saw the fence. What did he say? He said the stuff should be worth at least $10,000. Oh, that's wonderful. Wasn't he a nice man? Yeah. When did you collect? Oh, he said I should come back this afternoon. Then we won't have to stay here at my aunt's at all. No. As soon as we get the money, we can go right off on our honeymoon. Sure. Oh, dear. What's the matter? I dropped a piece of the cake. Oh, Jim, I didn't know you'd come back. Oh, I just came in, Andy. I was just going to look for you. Well, what happened? Well, I went over to George Ritchie's place. Yeah? He wasn't there. I learned from the elevator operator that he'd gone out of town. Everybody disappears on this case. <laughs> it seemed that way. Any idea where he'd gone? No, but we may have. How's that? I got a warrant. Searched Richie's apartment. I found some pencil notations on the telephone pad. Oh, what were they? Well, one said 10.55, the other said 3.30. Well, they sound like a train or plane time. I believe they're train times. I talked to the switchboard operator in the building. She said that Richie had put in a call to the railroad depot just before he left. Oh. So I'm having railroad schedules checked now to see if they have a train leaving and arriving at a destination at that time. We should get some word soon. Good, good. Oh, Andy, I, I found something in Richie's apartment that definitely links him with a jewel robbery, but I must say I'm a little puzzled by it. Well, what do you mean? Oh, wait a minute, here. Take a look at these. Well. Now, those are the same settings that Cooper stole in Detroit. But all the original stones have been removed. Mm. These stones you see there are just worthless hunks of glass. <laughs> what do you make of it, Jim? Well, nothing yet. Oh, by the way, anything turn up from Cleveland on that young couple? No, no, not yet. Still checking rooming houses and hotels. Well, we have... Jim. Yeah, Bob? Here's the information you wanted from the railroad. Oh, swell. We have a train that leaves here at 10.55 for Cleveland. Does it arrive there at 3.30? Yes. Fine. Thanks a lot, Bob. All right. Andy, what time are you? Uh, one o'clock. I think we can catch up with Mr. Ritchie. <laughs> Honey Bunch, I got it. Huh? I got the money. Look. Oh, Wilbur. How much is there? $10,500. Oh, I can't believe it. Oh, wait, now. Let me spread it out on the table and you can see the whole thing. Oh, golly. Look, let's not hang around here one minute. Let's get started on our honeymoon. Sure. Did you pack anything? No, but it won't take a minute. I hardly finished unpacking. I... Who can that be? Oh, probably some friend of my aunt. Whoever it is, I'll get rid of him. Okay. Just a minute. Hello, young lady. Uh, oh. Surprised to see me? Yes. Who is it, Trudy? It's Mr. Ritchie. What? Stand aside and let me in. Oh, wait. Sorry. How did you get here? How did you know where we were? I remembered you saying you had a fence in Cleveland. I know most of the fences here, so I just inquired around until I found the right one. That was very unfair. Really? Wilbur, you tell me. Now, Mr. wait Ritchie... a minute. We're not going through that again. This time I have a gun. You see? Oh. oh, what do you want? The money you got from that jewelry. Oh. I see you very conveniently laid it out for me. Keep away from that money. Oh, no. Mr. Ritchie, that, that's for our honeymoon. Very touching, but I'm taking it with me. Oh, Wilbur, this is awful. These bundles may bulge my pockets a little, but I don't think the inconvenience will be too great. Oh, Wilbur, what can we do? What? I don't know. There's nothing you can do. I have the money, and now I'm leaving. No, don't. Wilbur, call the police. I think you'd have a tough job explaining things to them. You just stay put. Goodbye, suckers. Just a minute, Richie. Huh? There you are. Oh, thank heaven. Who are you? Special agent of the FBI. What? Huh? Put me out of here. Oh, no. Oh, no. We spent too much time locating you. You were picked up at the train, Richie, and trailed while you visited all those fences. I arrived here in time to see you visit the right one. Now, come along, all of you. Joe 
George Ritchie was given a 10-year sentence. Wilbur Sheridan, a five-year sentence. And Trudy Sheridan was given a three-year sentence in federal prison for violation of the National Stolen Property Act. And thus, your FBI ended a few more criminal careers. And ended them because of a factor in law enforcement that few criminals consider. They commit a crime in one city, sell their loot in another city, and then flee to a third city. There, they assume that they are safe. The distance lends them security. But your FBI is more than just a collection of trained specialists in crime investigation. Your FBI is also a network of field officers, each one available to every other officer, which makes the flight of the criminal valueless, because he can find no dark corner of the nation without an arm of that network, without a representative of your FBI. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Mr. Keating, that equitable education fund you were telling us about sounds swell. But I'm just wondering whether I can afford one for my boy. Don't let that worry you, Bob. If you can't afford a fund that will pay the full cost of your boy's education, why not start one that will pay part of the expense? In any event, the man to see is your equitable society representative. Get in touch with him soon. Or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Innocent Witness. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's program was transcribed, and the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Innocent Witness on This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. This program was transcribed from an earlier network broadcast. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Transcribed and presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In two and a half years, this program has grown to be one of the most popular on the air. Millions of homes tune in every week. To this great home audience, we of the Equitable Life Assurance Society feel a special responsibility. Our equitable messages must be keyed to home and family problems. Tonight's equitable commercial concerns the education of the coming generation. Are there children in your home? Then don't fail to listen for valuable information on the Equitable Education Fund. You'll hear it in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Innocent Witness. There is a feeling shared by many citizens that the current crime wave, the most serious and widespread in the history of the nation is the concern of local police departments and other law enforcement agencies. 
In part, that is true. Because it is their problem. But it's not their problem exclusively. The crime wave is also your problem. And it is shared with you by every other decent, law-abiding American. Because any study of the 5,000 major crimes committed in this country every day shows that the great majority of victims are innocent people. For that reason, it is to your best interest to see to it that your local police department is as strong as possible and as free from corrupt political influence as it can be. In that way, you'll be helping to protect everyone in your community, including yourself. Tonight's FBI file opens on the crowded west side of a large eastern city. In a hall in this modest neighborhood, a small dance band is playing music for a Saturday night dance. One of the couples on the floor, young Nick Gonzalez and his girl Peg, are paying much more attention to each other than to the music. Peg. Yes, Nick? What do you think I did during lunch hour today? What? I went looking at furniture. Oh? <laughs> What'd you see? Oh, a living room suit, all covered with that plush stuff, just the way you wanted it. Was it very expensive? Honey, everything is expensive. Well, yes, Look, but... if we're going to get married, we've got to have furniture. <laughs> I know that. Well, then let me worry about the money, Ann. Hey, Nick. Nick. Huh? Over here. Hey, honey, look who's there. It's Phil. Oh, yeah. Hey, let's dance over to the edge. Okay. Hiya, Nicky, old boy. Hiya, Phil. Long time, huh? Yeah. Hey, you remember Peg, don't you, Phil? Sure. Hello, Peg. Hello. You know, the last time I saw you, honey, you were playing with dolls. Hey, now, wait a minute. She wasn't that young. When we were in the eighth grade, she was in the fourth, remember? Nicky, I was just kidding. <laughs> Still sucker for a rib, huh? I guess so. Hey, what brings you back to the neighborhood, Phil? Well, to tell you the truth, kid, I came here to see you. Oh? It's, uh, kind of a private matter. Uh, well, Nick, I'll, I'll let you two talk. Hey, wait, Nick. But Phil didn't mean that... It's private, Nick. Uh, I'll go powder my nose. Hey, I'll Nick. need to just go to fountain and finish your drink. Okay. Let's sit down over here, huh? Yeah, we'll grab this booth, Nick. Right. Sit down over there. Okay. Uh, I'll fill you in on why I'm here. Go ahead. Last Sunday, there was a shooting down on 12th Street. Mm -hmm. According to my information, there was one witness to that thing. You were it, Nick. That's right. I also understand that a guy paid a call on you the other day and tried to get to change your testimony. Yeah. You, uh, chased the guy away. Sure. I work for the same fellow who sent him. Huh? Yeah, I'm here for the same reason. Wait a minute. Phil, you mean you're mixed up with that... Yeah, and let's stay with the business at hand, huh? You see, my boss knows I went to school with you, and he asked me to tell you it's very important to him that you forget what you saw. I couldn't do that, Phil. Not even for an old pal? Not for anybody. I saw a poor guy got shot down in cold blood. I saw the two men who gave it to him. They deserved a book thrown right in their faces. Oh, but kid, you don't Look, have... I don't want to hear any more of this. I got to find Peg. I'll see you around again sometime. <laughs> Just a minute. Hi, Ken. Oh, hello, Phil. Uh, can I come in and see you a minute? Sure, come ahead. Thanks. Ah, nice. Nice little room you got here. Well, that's okay. Uh, I just dropped by, kid, to see if you uh, changed your mind since last night. No, Phil, I haven't. I didn't think you would. Hey, uh... Nice picture of Peg. I tended it myself. Yeah? Nice. Say, uh, what's this I hear about you two? What do you mean? You're gonna get married? Is that true? Yeah. Well, why don't you let a guy know these things? Well, I haven't seen you in four years, Phil. Where can I get a hold of you? Ah, that was a rib, kid. Okay. Uh, when are you getting married? Next month. Big church wedding, I suppose. Yeah. All kinds of preparations. Uh-huh. <sighs> you know it. Be a shame to spoil all that, wouldn't it? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, have something happen that would upset everything. What are you talking about? That shooting you were a witness to. Well? 
Remember there was a third guy, the guy who got away, the guy nobody saw? Yeah. I just got the word this morning on who that third guy was. It's Peg's brother. What? The brother Jimmy. Now, wait. I- is this another one of those ribs, Phil? No, kid. This time I'm lovely. The boss himself gave me the information. Told me to pass it on to you. Oh, I see. He also said to tell you that uh, if you testify that you recognize the two killers, they'll turn around and blow a whistle on Peg's brother. Oh. I hate to hand you one like this, kid. Oh. What can I do? I can't change my testimony. Oh, you can go away. In fact, I got a place all picked out. I could never get away with that. Look, you stay under till the trial's over. Then you cop a plea. Amnesia. It's worked before, kid, plenty of times. Well, when, uh, when do you think I should go? Right now. Several miles away in the same city at the FBI field office... Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk working. A visitor interrupts him. Jim Taylor? Yes, that's right. Uh, I'm Sergeant McAllen, police headquarters. Oh, hello there, Sergeant. How are you? Fine, how are you? Uh, your agent in charge told me to come in and see you. Oh, I see. Well, sit down, Sergeant. Thank you. Now, what's on your mind? Well, I wonder if you remember reading about a shooting that occurred a week ago Sunday. It happened on West 12th Street. Uh, yes, yes, I do. I believe the victim was shot in the back by two gunmen who were later picked up by the police. That's right. We have them in custody now. Mm-hmm. Well, there's sort of an inside story to that shooting, Jim. Really? Yeah, the victim was a bit of a civic crusader, a champion of clean politics, a good government, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, we've got reason to believe that he had compiled some pretty damaging information about a corrupt political leader named Smith. I see. And indications are that Smith had this man killed. Well... Can you prove it? Uh, unfortunately, no, but we did have a strong case against the two gunmen. Did have? Yeah, you see, the killing was observed by a single witness, and that witness is now missing. Well, well what's the story on that, Sergeant? Well, the witness is a young man named Nick Gonzalez, and to the best of our knowledge, he's honest and reliable. Mm-hmm. And he was supposed to appear at the DA's office yesterday afternoon, but he didn't show. Well, we went to his rooming house, and he wasn't there. We set up his surveillance, and he didn't come home all night. In fact, he's still missing. Did you check his place of business? Yeah, I hadn't reported for work this morning. Uh, Sergeant, look, tell me, do you think this man Smith could have gotten to him and bribed him to go away? I don't know. Inasmuch as it's only supposition that Smith is involved, there's no basis for questioning him. No, 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 that's right. Well, in any case, we believe that there could be an FBI angle. You mean unlawful flight to avoid testimony at a criminal trial? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Have you checked on Gonzalez's background, his relatives, his friends? Well, he has a girl. He's supposed to marry her next month. Her name's Peg Martin. I'm going over to question her now. Fine. And, Sergeant, let me know what you find out. Phil? Hey, Phil! What do you want? Huh? I said, what do you want? Where's Phil? He's gone back to town. Who are you? I'm in charge here. In charge? Yeah. What are you running here, a prison camp? Very funny. What time is it? Uh, little after two. In the afternoon? Yeah. Hey, how did I sleep so late? How do I know? Where is this place, anyway? Just look out the window. Can't see anything here but trees. So you're near trees. Look, what I meant is, how close are we to the city? What town are we in? What are you asking me for? You drove here yourself last night. I was blindfolded. Phil blindfolded? Yeah. Well, let him tell you where you are. But you said he's gone back to the city. Look, stop bothering me, will you? Okay. Can I get something to eat? There's food in the kitchen. Swell. Think I'll eat and then take me a walk. Oh, no. No walk. Huh? Phil's orders, you don't leave here. Well, is there a phone here? Yes, but you don't use it. Now, wait a minute. Phil promised me I could get in touch with my girl, let her know where I am. You don't use the phone. But she'll be worried. Now, ain't that too bad. You just stay put here till Phil comes back. If you got any beefs, tell them to him. Busy, Jim? No, no. Come on in, Sergeant. Thank you. Did you get to talk to the Gonzalez girl? Yeah, I just left her. Did she give you anything? Well, no, she hasn't seen him either. She was pretty worried about him. 
She said they had a date last night, and he didn't show up. You think she was telling the truth? Yes, I do. Well, could she contribute anything as to where he might be? Well, she did give me one lead, yeah. Oh, what was that? Well, they went to a dance Saturday night, and a guy named Phil Dayton showed up there. Mm -hmm. He'd gone to school with Gonzalez. And? Well, they went off in a corner and talked, and when Dayton left, the girl said Gonzalez was quite upset. What about? Well, she gathered that Dayton had tried to persuade the boy not to testify. Oh, I see. Oh, Sarge, have you ever heard of this man, Dayton, before? Oh, yeah, he's a stooge for the politician, Smith. Well, that certainly ties in. Yep. Sergeant, look, before we can get in this case, we must be sure the witness has fled and then consult the United States Attorney. Uh, Meanwhile, I'd certainly advise you to question this man, Dayton. I, I can't tell you that. What do you mean? Or what's happened? I had to go away. But where? It's not far, honey. Just one hour's ride from town. Ah, uh, Nick, the police were here looking for you today. They questioned me for almost an hour. What for? It was about you. They think you've run away because of the trial. Nick, did Phil Dayton have something to do with your going away? Phil Dayton? Why well, should he... you told me at the dance that he asked you not to testify. Sure, but I told you then it didn't make any difference. Uh, look, you've got to come home at once. Peg... I can't. Well, listen to me. My family know about this. They think you've run away, too. If you don't come back, it... Well, it can mean the end of our marriage. Of everything. No. Honey, that's what my father said. But he can't do that. I'm telling you. Look, Peg, I'm doing this for you. What do you mean? Well, I didn't want to tell you, but I've got to. What? I did run away. Oh. I ran away because Phil told me your brother Jim was the third man in the killing. Yeah, that's why I'm in hiding. Look, honey, I can't talk much more. I had to sneak this phone call. Maybe the guy who's watching is asleep. Honey, wait a minute. That killing was a week ago Sunday night, right? Yeah. Well, Jim was home here all night. We all were. Are you sure? My Uncle Ben was here, too, and he's a policeman. That should be evidence enough. Well, sure it should. Peg, Phil lied to me. He must just... Give me that. No. Told you not to make no calls. Wait, I just found out something. Get back in your room. Oh, no, I'm getting out of here. Yo, what? I'm getting back to town. No, you're not. Oh. You're staying right here. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. To every college man, there is no music ever written that can compare to the songs he sang in his student days, on victorious football fields, or gathered round the piano in the old union house. Well, I guess I did my share of singing, Mr. Keating. But I majored in physics. I also had to study pretty hard. I'm sure you did, Jack. And there are plenty of others like you. That may be why the average college graduate earns $72,000 more during his working years than the average American. What's more, that extra $72,000 is just half the story. Educated men and women have cultural interests and appreciation that they wouldn't part with for any amount of money. So for many reasons. Everyone agrees college is the wisest and best investment loving fathers and mothers can make for their children. You're right. I've decided that my boy is going to college if it's the last thing I do. Well, if that's the way you feel, Jack, you'll be interested in an equitable education fund. Equitable education fund? What's that? It's a surefire plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society, and it includes these important features. One, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Two, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him, right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Three, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you're totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. That all sounds like just what the doctor ordered. How do I go about starting one of these funds? The man to see is your equitable society representative, 
Give your children their chance to earn that extra $72,000 by getting in touch with your equitable representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Innocent Witness. Tonight's case in the files of your FBI makes one point which is well worth bearing in mind. And that is that you aid no one when you shield a criminal. The history of the various law enforcement agencies like your FBI throughout the country shows that the number of unsolved crimes is relatively small. So that you're condoning the actions of a criminal and obstructing the course of justice does not help him to escape because there is no escape. All you do is to make it easier for him to commit another crime before his apprehension. And thus, you become a partner in that crime. As a decent citizen, you enjoy many privileges. But because you enjoy those privileges, you also have a moral responsibility to your fellow citizens. And the only way to discharge that responsibility in a situation like the one in tonight's case is to call your local police and give them the facts. They will do their part, and you will have done yours. Tonight's file continues at young Nick's hideout. His old schoolmate, Phil, has just arrived from town. Larry? Uh, Right with you, Phil. Am I glad you got here? Why? I've been having trouble. Yeah? What happened? I caught the guy using the phone. Oh, that's great. I thought I told you... Look, I couldn't keep watching him every minute. Who'd he call? I don't know, but I stopped it quick. Did you hear the conversation? No. Where's the kid now? In his room. I had to belt him. What for? He wanted to blow out of here. Now, look, what's this all about? Well, we got him here in the first place. Oh, he was a witness that killing last Sunday. The big guy paid to have it done. The boys who did the job declared that unless they beat the rat... They talk. Yeah, I get it. Now I better go in and see Nick. Find out who he talked to. Okay. Hiya, Nick. Oh, you're back. Yeah. I, uh, I thought I'd come out and see if there was anything you needed. I need to get out of here. Oh, now look, kid. Larry just told me what he did to you, and I'm giving him strict that orders. Had nothing to... to do with it. You lied to me, Phil. About what? About Peg's brother, Jim. I spoke to Peg on the phone. She said Jim was home all that Sunday night. She had witnesses. Really? Yeah. He just gave me that story so I wouldn't testify. Oh, now, that ain't so, kid. I only told you what the big guy told me. You both lied. Now, let me out of here. Oh, kid, please, don't make me call on Larry again. Next time, he'll use a gun. You stay here until the trial is over. Do you think I'll keep quiet even then? If you do, you're crazy. Look, you can't keep me here forever, Phil. When I do get out, even if it's five years from now, I'll blast you and your boss wide open. Well, thanks for the tip. I'll be talking to you later. Jim. Yes, Sergeant. Uh, Gonzalez's girl called me a few minutes ago over at headquarters. Oh? She said that Gonzalez had just phoned her. He told her that he'd run away, all right, but he did it to shield her brother. To shield her brother? Yeah. Well, what does he got to do with it? Well, it's Phil Dayton that handed him a story that the girl's brother was mixed up in the killing. And he fell for it? Well, he's just a kid, Jim. The brother had been in trouble before, so I suppose he thought he was being noble about it all. Oh, I see. Well, did she straighten him out? Yeah. But in the middle of the conversation, she heard a man's voice shout something about, get off the phone. Then the receiver was hung up. Did she hear from him again? No. Well, did he get a chance to say where he was? Not specifically. The only thing he told her was that he was one hour from town. Mm -hmm. And did she try to trace the call? Uh Uh-uh. Going to be a difficult one to locate, Sergeant. Oh, by the way, did you locate this man, Phil Dayton? No, not yet. We're looking for him, though. Well, now that Gonzalez knows the truth, you'll want to come back. But that man who grabbed the phone may prevent that. Yeah. We may have to go looking for him, Sergeant. Have you got any suggestions? Mm, yes. Let's get a map. Now, if he was, say, one hour from town, that should cover uh, 
Well, about a 50-mile radius. Yeah. I will draw a circle at that point and contact every telephone exchange. See if they have a slip on anyone who's called that girl's number. <laughs> Hi, Nick. What do you want? Hi. Just went into town. I saw the big guy. Your boss? Yeah. I told him the whole story. I kind of hated to do it, kid, but after all, I worked for the guy. Did you tell him I'd talk no matter how long you kept me here? Yeah. He didn't like that much, but he figured out a way to keep you quiet. He better forget it. It won't work. Oh, don't be too sure, kid. What was the big plan? I'll show it to you. Larry. Yeah? Bring in our company. Okay. Peg, what are you doing here? I brought her out with me. Oh, honey. Oh, darling. We'll be okay. Want me to break him up, Phil? Oh, of course not. Leave him alone. They're friends of mine. Peg, why did you come here? Phil called me. He said you wanted to see me. That was a trick. He just wanted to get you here, too. What do you mean? He wants to hold us both. What? He's right, honey. You see... Nick wanted to make a lot of trouble for the man I work for, and I want you to convince him that'd be a big mistake. Now, I'll leave you here with him until he changes his mind. Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Jim. Oh, hello, Sergeant. Uh, did you get anything yet from the telephone company? No, no. I got a map full of pins here, but nothing's turned up. Uh, I just went to see Peg Martin. Gonzalez's girl? Yeah. She'd gone out about a half hour before. Mm-hmm. Her mother told me that she'd gotten a phone call from Phil Dayton just before she left. Uh-oh, that's not so good. Yeah, I know. Look, did she tell her mother where she was going? No, as soon as she got the call, she ran right out of the house. Sounds to me like they want to trap the girl, too. Yeah. Dayton and Smith are pretty desperate men, Jim. No telling what they'll do with those kids. Sergeant, you better get right over here. I've only got a dozen more exchanges to call. We may get something from one of them by the time you arrive. Larry? Huh? How long would you say they've been in there? Uh, Over an hour. Well, that's time enough. Let's go in. Okay. We use any muscle? Don't be so anxious. Go ahead. Right. Well, you two talk things over? Yeah. What's the verdict? I want Nick to testify just as he planned. You, you sure of that? Look, we've made up our minds. It's too bad. Now I guess we'll have to handle things the way the big guy wanted it in the first place. What do you mean? His orders were that we should kill you. What? I was against it. After all, Nick and I are old pals. I asked the big guy to let me try to reason with you, but that didn't do any good. Look, is this another one of your ribs? No, kid. I'm sorry to say I'm lovely. Honey, Nick, you can't be serious. Honey, believe me, I am. You'll never get away with a thing like this. Why not? The police know I'm missing. So what? Next they'll find out you're dead. They won't be able to prove who killed you. Well, you're wasting time. Yeah. Well, who wants it first? Nick. Easy, honey. Take care of him, Larry. Oh, 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 o
is the keynote of the success of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Success which has brought your FBI recognition as the finest organization of its kind anywhere in the world. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Mr. Keating, what's the best time to start an equitable education fund? My baby's just a year old now. Is that too young? No, Jack. The sooner you start, the lower the cost per year will be. So don't delay. Get in touch with your equitable society representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mr. Big Shot. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's program was transcribed and the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mr. Big Shot on This Is Your FBI. This program came to you by transcription. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Transcribed and presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Here in the Equitable Life Assurance Society, we never lose sight of the fact that our equitable radio messages go into millions of homes. Because of this, we feel that it is our responsibility to key these equitable commercials to home and family problems. Tonight's message concerns education. Are there young children in your home? Then you'll be interested in getting the facts on the Equitable Education Fund. For full details, listen carefully in just 15 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Melancholy Mind Reader. More than a million and a half major crimes are committed in the United States every year. And they are committed for a variety of reasons. Some are the result of passion or temper and are usually unpremeditated. Some are the result of an overwhelming desire for revenge. But for the most part, crimes are committed because the criminal is overcome with greed. That type cannot wait until he has earned what he desires, because waiting, to his point of view, is needless. Take what you want when you want it, is his personal credo. And in order to live up to that, he will stop at nothing. Not even murder. Tonight's FBI file opens on the grounds of a large carnival that's playing an engagement in a Midwestern city. A stroll along the midway reveals the usual assortment of candy butchers, drink purveyors, pitchmen, and, oh yes, the mind reader. His tent, larger than the rest, bears a huge sign reading, Carrie, the Mental Marvel. 
In the rear of this tent in the living quarters, Carey, the mental marvel in person, reclines on a cot. His wife is discussing his work. That was a great little show you just did. Great. Point, baby. I'm talking about your performance. It's a wonder we weren't booed off the stage. Oh? Look, will you put down that bottle for a minute and listen to me? Go ahead, May. Do you realize what a fool you made of yourself out there tonight? And what a bigger fool you made of me? Oh. You were so drunk you blew 50% of the answers. That's many? Yes, that many. I have an object here in my hand. It belongs to someone near and dear to the owner. Identify the object, please. What do you come up with? A black sedan. Got a laugh, didn't I? <sighs> What's the use? Look, baby, quit steaming, huh? It's just a two-bit carny. Who cares how we do? You'd better care. And you'd better start right now. Whether you realize it or not, kid, this is last stand Nebraska for you. Well, thanks. And I mean it. You and that bottle have taken us down a real fast slide. May, you'd better change that billing. What do you mean? Put yourself in that act. What are you talking about? You're the little girl that brought me and the bottle together. Are you kidding? Just think back, May. It adds up awful easy. Oh, you're not going to start that old routine again. How I've run around with other guys. How I made a sucker out of you. How I drove you to drink. Honey, that's every drunk's excuse since bums laid on their backs and squeezed it out of grape. In my case, it happens to be true. Huh? I can prove it to you, May. I can show you where I... Uh... Wait. Lancaster's on. Yeah, the great Lancaster. He is great. He's magnificent. Look at him. Watch him ride that motorcycle on nothing but a wire. There he goes. Sure, May. Come ahead. Aren't you through packing? Oh, just about. When does the train leave? About an hour. I thought you were wonderful tonight, honey. You watched? Yeah. Scared to death, too. About me? Yeah. You mean that I'd miss? Mm-hmm. Hey, look, sweetheart, I ain't blown a trick in five years. Oh, Roy. When that motorcycle turns upside down in the air, my heart does the same thing. <laughs> I just can't help it. That's on account of the guy who's riding it. Am I right? You are right. Come here. How'd you get away so early? We didn't do our last show. How come? Frank was fractured. Oh. I thought he was on the wagon. He was for a fast five minutes. He started drinking again this morning. Oh, May, why do you put up with that guy? He's the only wheel in town. That ain't so. You got to deal with me, honey, anytime you want it. What would that prove? Hey, look, you go for me, don't you? Sure. Well, then why ain't we together? Because I made a little deal with myself. The only move I make is in the direction of money. Well, that don't belt me off. I'm afraid it does, Roy. I got a hundred a week from this outfit. And look at my billing. I'm talking about real money. In lumps. Is that why you hooked up with Carrie? Mm-hmm. That bum has money? Well, he did have when I met him. He was a big star then. Guess my luck he started down the day I married him. Oh, well, that could happen again. Oh, no, it couldn't. I'll be smarter with the next guy. Look, if I have to get dough to get you, I'll get dough. How? I don't know, and I don't care. But don't worry, I'll get it. Honey, if you really don't care where you get it, I think maybe I can help you out. <laughs> Several days later, in an FBI field office, Agent in Charge Newton is just greeting a visitor. Sit down, Mr. Pomeroy. Thank you, sir. As I understand it, the local police sent you here. That's right. They told me that my case came under your jurisdiction. Yes, I've heard enough of the facts to believe it does. I wonder if you'd mind giving me the whole story. Well, as you already know, I'm the owner of a carnival called the Pomeroy Wonder Show. Yes. We just finished playing a week's engagement in Cleveland last night. I see. Then we packed and moved on here to Detroit. We have our own private train. Mm-hmm. 
Well, sir, last night, somewhere between Cleveland and here, a money car was broken into. The safe was cracked and over $30,000 was taken. When did you discover this? Not till the train pulled in here this morning. Did you keep a watchman in the car? Yes. He was slugged from behind. He was still unconscious when I found him. He had no idea who gave it to him. Did you immediately notify the police? Yes, sir. They came right over, searched the car. They didn't seem to find any clues at all. I've sent one of our agents over to help them on the search. Good. You, uh, you say this is a special train, Mr. Pomeroy? Yes, sir. Nobody travels on it but our performers and crew. It's very likely, then, that this is an inside job. Mm -hmm. That's uh, how I feel. Have you checked to see if anyone is missing from the show? Yes, I did. Everybody is accounted for. Well, if a thorough search of the money car doesn't give us any clues, I'd like to assign an agent to your show. Give him a job. Let him mingle with the people. That'd be fine. I'll have to look in our avocation file for a man who'd be qualified for the job. Uh, suppose you come back here this afternoon, Mr. Pomeroy. I'll have that agent ready. Roy, can I talk to you? Oh, yeah, sure, May. Come on over to my tent. Okay. I see you got your wire up early. Yeah. Pomeroy asked me to do an extra show. He's expecting big business. Uh oh. How's Carrie? Still drinking. Any work today? <laughs> Just about. Go ahead, May. Right. Roy, you did it. Yeah. How much did you get? Over 30000 Honey, honey, that's wonderful. Did you have any trouble? No, it was a breeze. I hear the watchman's in the hospital. He'll be okay. Oh, you're terrific. Where's the money? In that repair box. Well, that's no good. Well, I don't know what else to do with it. You got any ideas? You better let me take it. Well, where'll you put it? In with my costumes. Oh, but May, that's now, not look, a good Now, look, I lined this job up, didn't I? It was me that made it come off. Oh, yeah, but I took honey. all the... Let me handle the money, hmm? Oh, okay. I'll take it over to my tent right now. Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? What's our next move? How long do we stick it out here? Not long. A few days at the most. Oh, now, May, we can't leave that soon. They'd know we have the money. Not the way I'm laying it out. What do you mean? Come to my tent after the show's over. You'll see what I mean. <laughs> Send for me, Mr. Newton. Oh, yes, Jim. Come on in. All right, sir. I'd like you to meet Mr. Pomeroy. Pomeroy, this is Special Agent Taylor. Hi, Mr. Taylor. How do you do, sir? Mr. Pomeroy is the owner of a carnival called the Pomeroy Wonder Show. Oh, yes, sir. Just reading a report on that. Then you know all the details on the robbery. Well, everything that's come in, yes, sir. Good. Is this the young man you had in mind, Mr. Newton? Yes. Uh, Jim. Sir? According to our vocation avocation file, you once worked for a carnival. That's right, sir. I worked one summer while I was on vacation. So uh, whose show was it? Paris Brothers. Oh, yeah. I know them well. well. What was your job at the show, Jim? Oh, I started out doing almost everything. But before the summer was over, I had a steady job spilling with a geek show. What in the world is a geek? That's a character who eats little tidbits like razor blades and broken light bulbs. Oh, yes. So that's what they're called. Were you a good spieler, Mr. Taylor? Well, the jury is still out on that one. Uh, give Mr. Pomeroy a sample, Jim. Oh, now, wait. I'm I... serious. If you qualify, I'll give you a job. Oh, I see. So you see it's in the line of duty? Yes, sir. Uh, well, here goes. All right, step right up, folks. It's the new show, the thrill show, the biggest show on the midway. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Young man, you can report to the lot tomorrow morning. You are hired. <laughs> Is that you, Frank? Yes, May. Well, where have you been? I just took a little walk. Uh, to that last show, I, I had to. I thought I was going to faint right on the stage, May. Yeah. I noticed you had the jumps pretty bad. Why don't you lie down? Huh? Stretch out. I'll get a cold cloth for your head. Well, thanks, May. Pomeroy was in here looking for you. Uh, uh, what do you want? Well, he was pretty sore about the way you've been drinking, missing shows. Can't say I blame him. What'd you tell him? Said that you were very sorry, that you knew you'd been doing wrong, and was trying to straighten out. I am, May. I am trying. Sure. You know something? Mm -hmm. If you just keep on being like you are now, it's... 
be the easiest thing in the world. I'll try, Frank. I'll try. Here's the cloth. Huh? Oh, well, that feels good. How many drinks have you had today? Uh, only half a dozen since noon. Pretty good, huh? Oh, honey, it's too good. What do you mean? I don't want you counting little pink things. You just can't stop that quickly. Well, I'm just trying to taper off. You're going too fast. Here, have a drink. Huh? Well, uh, well, you're the doctor. That's right. <laughs> Thanks. Honey, I've just been thinking about Mr. Pomeroy. Hmm? You know what you ought to do? What? Write him a little note, an apology note. That should help square things. All right, man. I'll do it first thing in the morning. Oh, Frank, I know you. If you're going to write it at all, you write it now. Yeah, but May, I... Paper right over here. Very efficient woman. Here you are, dear. Just to spoil you completely, I'll even tell you what to say. Ah, oh, gee, May. Uh, dear Mr. Pomeroy. Huh? Stop writing. Oh, oh. Uh, dear Mr. Pomeroy, I am sorry for what I did. Mm. Mm. Got that? Uh, yeah. Um, I was drinking. I... Well, go uh, on, write it. I, uh, I'm trying to. Okay. Please forgive me. You got that? Please forgive me. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll just sign your name. Uh, is, is that all? Yeah, that's enough. Very uh, well. May. What? May I? I feel funny. <laughs> really? I got a. <laughs> Can I come in? Huh? Oh, sure, Roy. Come ahead. Hiya, Carrie. Well, he's passed out, huh? No. He's dead. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. How those grand old college songs take you back. Back on a magic carpet to ivy-covered walls and carefree college days. Yes, I'll never forget the good times I used to have. Ah, but you've got more than memories out of college, Ed. Those four years were worth money to you. Plenty of money. Do you realize that the average college graduate earns $72,000 more during his working years than the average American? Of course, there are exceptions. People of outstanding ability who go far with very little education. But that doesn't alter the fact that college is the best investment loving fathers and mothers can make for their children. Believe me, I hope there's nothing to prevent my kids from going. Nothing can prevent them, Ed, if you start an equitable education fund now. Equitable education fund? What's that? It's a surefire plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society, and it includes these important features. One, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Two, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him, right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Three, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. Sounds swell, Mr. Keating. Whom do I see about starting one? The man to see is your equitable society representative. Give your children their chance to earn that extra $72,000 by getting in touch with your equitable representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to the FBI file, The Melancholy Mind Reader. Criminals, in the very nature of their business, are professional optimists. Because despite the overwhelming evidence to prove that criminals do not escape the web of the law, they continue to practice their illegal behavior. No criminal ever expects to pay for his crime. 
And the fact that other criminals do does not deter him. For his ego tells him that he is not only smarter than his fellow criminals, but also that he is smarter than any policeman in the world. To protect that ego and to prevent his capture, he will sacrifice anything or anyone, be that person brother, sister, wife, or husband. There's not the slightest strain of loyalty in any criminal, because he lives by one rule which says, do anything you want to do, but don't get caught. Tonight's file continues the following day at the Carnival Grounds. FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor is entering the office of Mr. Pomeroy, the owner of the show. Oh, come in, Mr. Taylor. Thanks, Pomeroy. Were you over in Kara's tent? Yes, I just finished a preliminary investigation. Not a great deal to investigate, was there? Oh, what do you mean? Well, he sent me that note saying he was sorry, asking me to forgive him. And? Part of the stolen money, still in one of our cash wrappers, was found in one of his pockets. That's right. Gary obviously committed the robbery, got remorse, wrote me the note, then committed suicide. Well, it's all very logical, Mr. Pomeroy, but I don't believe any of it. Oh, now, just a minute, Mr. Taylor. I don't like to dispute you, but I happen to know Kara's handwriting. He did write that note. Oh, I'll concede that, but I still question the circumstances under which he wrote it. And won't you concede that he had a motive? What motive? His wife. Hmm. She was carrying on with Lancaster. Stealing the money was his chance to make himself a big man in her eyes. Uh, am I allowed to rebuttal? Surely. Let's have it. All right. First of all, over $30,000 was stolen. Now, less than 1000 was found in Kerry's pockets. Well, he could have hidden the rest. Well, possibly. But I have a second and even stronger point. I found an unmailed letter in Kerry's coat pocket. Yes? It was addressed to a friend in New York. In it, Kerry stated that he could not pay back the $50 he owed this man as he didn't have it. He promised to pay him as soon as he got his hands on any cash. Well... Well, that letter was written the night after your money car was robbed. Oh. Now, if Carly Rhea had that money, he wouldn't have written such a letter. Yeah, well, there is something to that. So, you see, uh, I want to wait for the autopsy and find out more about how Carry died. Meantime, Mr. Pomeroy, this case is far from closed. Who's there? Me, Roy. Oh, Come in, honey. Are you alone? Yeah. Finally. I thought you were coming over to my tent. I couldn't. Why not? Well, there's been 45 investigators here this morning, including one from the FBI. Any of them suspicious? Why should they be? Well, May, after all, you and I... Shut have up. Been... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you know as well as I do, Roy. Frank stole the money, then committed suicide. Yeah. You know yeah. May... Where is the money? I've got it hidden. They're liable to search this place. I'm not worried. Oh, look, hadn't I better keep it for a while? No. Hey, isn't it time for you to go on? Well, I've, I've cut my first show. What for? Uh, well, if you must know, I was too nervous. Why, you stupid... Look, I take chances on that motorcycle. When I got the shakes, I missed that wire. I thought you never missed. I haven't. Well? Well, I've never been mixed up in anything like this before, either. <laughs> Stop being such a baby. <laughs> Go on back to your tent. I'll see you later. Mr. Newton, I'd like to bring you up to date on that carnival case. Well, Jim, I read your report just a while ago. No. I gathered you don't hold with the suicide theory. No, sir, I don't. I agree with you. Did any more of the money turn up? No, not yet. How about the coroner? Did he make his report? Yes, that came in just a little while ago. Carrie died of poisoning, all right. The coroner gave me the name of the poison used. It's not too common. I'm I see. Having a check made now on all drugstores to see if they've sold any in the last few days. Jim, from your report, Carrie's wife doesn't sound like too sterling a character. Well, from all I could gather, she isn't. Did you question her at all? No, no. I preferred to have her think that I went along with that suicide theory. Now I'm very glad that I did. Why is that? Well, as you saw in the report, it's common gossip around the carnival grounds that she was carrying on with a performer called the Great Lancaster. Mm -hmm. He does a pretty spectacular stunt on a motorcycle. I see. Out of the best of my knowledge, a stuntman working as he does would be liable to use rosin, wouldn't you think? I would think so. Why? Well, when I sent the stolen money that was found in Carrie's pocket to our laboratory, they reported finding numerous particles of rosin in it. I'd say that ties in, Jim. Well, I... Oh, excuse me. Certainly. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes. 
Yes, Sergeant. Well, it's a big help, Sergeant. Thanks a lot. No. Goodbye. That was police headquarters, sir. They had a report from a local drugstore. On the poison? That's right. It was bought late yesterday by a woman whose description exactly fits that of Carrie's wife. Well. I'm going back to the carnival at once. <laughs> Well, Mr. Pomeroy, that's the story. I see. Has it changed your mind any about the suicide? It certainly has. And when Mrs. Carey gets here, will you talk to her as I ask? I'll be very glad to. Fine. By the way, has Lancaster ever seen you? No. No, that's why I'm hoping this plan will work. Come in. Hello, Mr. Pomeroy. Oh, hello, Mrs. Carey. Come in. Thanks. You sent word you wanted to see me. That's right. Well, by the way, uh, this is Mr. Taylor. Uh... Yeah, we've already met. Yes, hello, Mrs. Carey. Hello. I have sent for you, Mrs. Carey, to tell you that the case is closed. Oh. That is, all but the recovery of the money. Mr. Pomeroy, I'm terribly sorry about the whole thing. I'm sure you are. I'm sure Frank was, too. I'm certain that if he hadn't been drinking, he never would have stolen the money. Oh, I'm sure of that. To show you that I've forgiven him, I, I want you to take his body home. Oh. He lived in Texas, didn't he? Yes. I'll arrange for your railroad tickets at once. You shouldn't do this. I insist. Now you wait right here until I make the arrangements. Hello there. Hi. My name is Taylor. Yeah? You the great Lancaster? That's right. I'm your new spieler. Oh, they're finally putting on an extra man, huh? Uh, well, I was originally hired to work for that guy who killed himself. Uh, what's his name? Kerry. Yeah, yeah, that's the guy. Now that he's dead and his wife's going away, where well, there's no job there. What did you so say? They... I said now that he's dead. No, and... I, I mean about his wife. Oh, oh, she's going away. Where did you get that information? Oh, she was just in the main office. The head guy gave her some railroad tickets. Are you sure of that? Yeah, Sure. For Texas. I heard her say she was going right back to her tent. The fact. I guess what with her husband being dead and all, I did. Hey! Hey, where you going? Bay! Bay! What is it? I'm just in time, huh? For what? To nail you. What are you talking about? Ah, stop the routine. What are you putting in those bags, laundry? No, I'm packing. I'm going to Texas. I'm taking Frank's body back home. That's a lie. You were going to run out on me. Oh, stop. As soon as I finished packing, I was going to come over and see you. As soon as you finished packing, you were going to walk out on me, and you know it. Now, why would I do that? For $30,000. 30000 that belongs to me. Stop yelling. I'll yell all I want to. I stole that money, and you're not beating me out of it. Roy, will you listen to me? I'm not running out on you. You've got to believe me. The last guy that believed you was dead. Would you shut up? Hey, you don't like to hear that, huh? You don't like to hear that you poisoned a guy. Roy, that's enough. It's too much, Mrs. What? Curry. <laughs> we both said too much. Just as I hoped you would. What are you doing here? He's from the FBI. The... Now I'd like to start arranging for a trip for both of you. <laughs> Roy Lancaster was sentenced to 20 years by a federal court, then turned over to state authorities who found him guilty of attempted murder and gave him a life sentence. May Carey was also turned over to state authorities and sentenced to life imprisonment for murder. Now, tonight's case in the files of your FBI was solved because of one important factor. A special agent knew in advance how the minds of two criminals would react when confronted with a given situation. That, too, is part of the training given to every special agent before he becomes a member of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Your FBI has the force with which to combat force. But it has found that in many cases, the trained minds of the special agent was more than enough to protect you, the American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Remember, fathers and mothers, the finest investment you can make for your children is an equitable education plan, an investment they can never lose regardless of inflation or deflation, an investment that enriches their personality and increases their earning power. Don't delay. See your equitable society representative soon or send a postcard care of this station 
to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Night of Terror. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's program was transcribed, and the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Night of Terror on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. The program you are now hearing is one of the most popular on the air. It's listened to in millions of homes. This means that we of the Equitable Society have a very serious responsibility... We must key our Equitable Society messages to home and family problems and give our listeners real help in solving those problems. Tonight's Equitable commercial will tell about the Equitable Education Fund. If you have children, be sure to listen to this important message from the Equitable Life Assurance Society coming in 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file... The Half Pint Horse Players. Your FBI has just completed another in its series of uniform crime reports. A study of crime and criminals throughout the 48 states. What the survey has to say about juvenile delinquency is frightening. Because this refers to no local situation, but to a national emergency. You hear of crimes such as robbery, auto theft, fraud, and forgery. And you think of them as being committed by hardened criminals with long records. And yet, the unfortunate truth, as shown by this latest FBI survey, is that almost one-third of all the crimes in those categories committed during the first half of this year were committed by boys and girls under the age of 21. Tonight's file opens in a large room in back of a pool parlor. There's a long counter against one wall behind which men are taking bets on horses. Two boys, one of them 17 and the other 15, approach the counter. Hey, Joe, it looks like the guy who runs the joint right over there. Uh Uh-huh. Let's talk to him. Okay, Phil. The first at Belmont, they got away at 1.35. They all went. Hey, you the boss here? Oh. Yeah, why? Well, that guy down at the other end don't want to take my bet. Well, we don't bet with kids. Hey, luck, it's American money, ain't it, mister? Yeah, let me handle this, Joe. Hey, how'd your kids get in here? Through the pool room, like everybody else. Uh, go out the same way. And here comes the winner at New York. Big Dip, the winner... Happy Breed, second. Star Song, third. No prices yet. Hey, look, mister. What is it? I got a tip on this horse, and I got to get down someplace. Ah, uh, someplace else, not here. Listen, I was betting parlays when I was in grade school. He used to work for a bookmaker back home. Ah, uh, give him your action, then. I'm telling you for the last time, get out of here. Go on, blow. Ah, uh, come on, Joe. Right. 
Where are we going, Phil? Now, let's find some other place where we can make a bet. Hey, uh, fellas. Uh, fellas. Wait a minute. Hey, you calling us? Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I want to talk to you. What about? Well, I uh, happened to be on the Erie when you were trying to get your bet down with Lou. Yeah, so what? So I felt sorry for you. Huh, thanks. Come on, Joe. Now, wait a minute. Well? Well, I'm a horse player myself. I know how it is when you got a hot horse and you can't get any action. Uh, look, if uh, you want to hang around out there in the pool room, I'll make your bets for you. Hey. Hey, that sounds okay. Now, yeah. wait a minute. What's in it for you, Mac? Well, if you have a good day, you stake me 10% of your winnings. Huh. That sounds fair enough, Phil. Eh, yeah, that's okay. A deal? A deal. Swell. Now, what do you want to bet? Well, there's 40 clams. They'll be the next two at New York. Black Jack and Dusty Legs. 20 if, 20 in reverse. 20 if, 20 in reverse. You got it. Now, now wait a minute. Huh? You give us the results as soon as they come in? Oh, sure, kid, sure. Okay. Come on, Joe. Let's go on out and shoot a rack of pool, huh? <laughs> Six ball in the corner. Okay, Joe, rack him up. Phil. Yeah, what? We, uh, we better stop shooting pool pretty soon. Ah, uh, why? We won't be able to pay the time. We gave that guy our last $40. Ah, uh, don't worry, kid. We gotta win it soon. Why? That system. If it goes more than four races in a row without a winner. Yeah, I know, but... Well, if we don't win this one, we got no more cash. Yeah, so what? We still got all the other stuff. I know, but that ain't cash. Hey, Joe, get out of my way. Let me take a shot. Hey, 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 wait. Here comes our guy. Oh, yeah. Hey, how do we do, Mac? Well, you blew a picture. Oh, another one? Uh-huh. Tough break. Oh, gee. This just ain't our day, Phil. Mm. Well, what do you want next, kid? I like a horse called Noble King. All right, how much you want to bet? I can't make a bet. Why not? I'm tapped out. No cash left at all? Nope. Oh, that's too bad. Well, sorry you didn't have a better day. Look, uh, if you get any fresh scratch, come back again, you hear? Now you just ask for Charlie. That's hey, wait a minute, Charlie. I want to talk to you. Hey, look, kid, if it's about dough, I ain't holding so good myself. No, no, no. I, I don't want to put the bite on you. I want to sell you something. Huh? Yeah. Take a look at this. Hey. That's a real nice piece of merchandise. It's a genuine ruby. Yeah, real nice. Uh, Charlie, what's it worth to you? Well, I couldn't say offhand. If you don't want to buy that, Phil, we could show him that emerald pin. Emerald pin? Yeah. Hey, what are you guys running? Teenage Tiffany's? Yeah, we got plenty of stuff like this. No kidding? Ah, oh, sure. Uh, look, fellas. Uh, let's go over and sit down where it's nice and quiet, huh? I think we can do some business. Not more than ten city blocks away from the pool room in a local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just greeting a fellow agent. Hello there, Ellis. Hello, Jim. When did you get back in town? Just this morning. Uh, you all finished up on the Wilson case? Yeah. I've been assigned to the case you're working on. Hey, that's fine. I can use the help. What's the story on it, Jim? Well, a local couple named Russell were returning in their car from a vacation trip to the Middle West. Yes? Last night, about three hours outside of town, they stopped and picked up some hitchhikers. Three youngsters. I see. Shortly after the pickup, one of the youngsters pulled a gun on them. Stopped the car, ordered the couple out. The other boys tied them up, and they were left abandoned on a lonely road. And the boys drove off in the car? That's right. Where did all this happen, Jim? Across the state line, just east of Fairview. Has uh, the car turned up yet? Yeah, it was found abandoned here in town early this morning. How much did the kids get? Well, they got about $200 in cash from Mr. Russell, but they took luggage which contained Mrs. Russell's jewelry, about $14,000 worth. Well, any descriptions? Mm-hmm. Fairly good one on all three of the boys. I presume you've already sent out an alarm. Yes, I went out this morning, along with a story to the papers. I thought that the publicity might help us on this case. I see. We also gave the papers a description of the pieces of jewelry that were stolen. What about uh, fingerprints? Well, we found some around the car. We sent them down to Washington and to Fairfield. To Fairfield? Well, I didn't think we'd have those youngsters in our files in Washington. But I thought we'd take a chance that maybe they came from the town where the Russells picked them up. I see. What do we do now, Jim? 
I guess the only other thing left to do is go over this list of hotels and rooming houses and check on every one. Uh-huh. Here, Ross, let's split it up and get to work. Get your beds down. Lou. Uh, excuse me, Lou. Uh, what is it? Uh, can I talk to you for a minute? Oh, look, Charlie, this is my busiest time of the day. Yeah, but it's important, Lou. Real important. Another touch? No, no, Lou. Honest, I swear it ain't. No, I got a proposition that can mean a lot of money to you. Uh, let's go into your office and talk, huh? Just for a minute. Well... Now, please, Lou. Okay, come on. Pass. Ah, well... Hey, Walt! Yeah? You handle the payoffs. I'm going into my office. Right, Go ahead, Charlie. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks. Now, what's your deal? Well, uh, this is a chance for the both of us to make a real bundle. How? Well, you remember those kids who came in today and wanted to bet some horses? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I got talking to them after they left here, see? And, uh, well, we talked about horses, and then we talked about money, and they said they needed dough. One of them flashed a ring. I bought it off them. Here, take a look at it. Hey, that looks real. It is real. Where would kids get a ring like that? Well, that's what I wondered. Then I remembered a story that was in this afternoon's paper. I just finished reading it when I met him. What about? About a stick-up out on Fairfield Turnpike. Here. Here's the story. $14,000 worth of jewelry was taken. Three kids did the job. Hey, let's see that. Now, this ring is described in the story as one of the pieces that's missing. You see? Right there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, the kids I've been talking to are the ones that done the job. Hey, the story says it says three kids here. Yeah, well, the other one is waiting for him someplace with the rest of the jewelry. Now, here's the proposition, Lou. See, I made a deal with them. I told them I'd give them five grand for the whole lot. Well, they went for it big. Now, they're going to bring the stuff to my room tonight at seven. Hey, where are you getting five grand? I ain't really giving them five. When I get them up the room, I'm cutting them down to two. Where are you getting two? Well, I sort of figured... That's where you come in. Yeah, I thought so. Well, look at the action you're getting, Lou. Fourteen thousand bucks worth. Why do you have to pay them at all? When they come up with the stuff, why don't you grab it and tell them to blow? Oh, you can't trust kids. They're liable to scream or make trouble. Lou, believe me, this is a terrific bargain. As a matter of fact, I'll see to it that we not only get the rings and stuff, but you get your two grand back. Lou. How? Well, I'll bring them back to the horse room. They'll bet it back with you. What do you say, Lou? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That you, Ellis? Yes, Jim. Hope you had better luck than I did. No, nope, couldn't find any trace of those kids. Uh-huh. Anything come in while I was gone? Yes, we received word from the Fairfield police. Did they identify the three boys? Yeah, the oldest one is named Phil Osborne. He's 17. Who are the other two? The other two are brothers, Joe and Tom Sherman. I see. The Fairfield police also passed on a message from their parents. They said that if we catch the youngsters to keep them, they didn't want to be bothered with them anymore. That's nice. Mm. That's probably the reason the kids ran away in the first place. That'd be my guess. You can't raise children by remote control. It takes work. Well, you're telling me. I've got two of my own. I work just as hard at home trying to help my kids grow up as I do here at the office. Okay. Pardon me. Special Agent Taylor. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. Yeah? He did? Yes. Yes, thanks very much, Lieutenant. Goodbye. It was Lieutenant Mitchell down at police headquarters. Yes? A special policeman at the Capitol Theater saw two boys answering to the description we sent out leaving the theater about a half an hour ago. Did he detain them? Well, he tried to, but they got away from him. Where's the special policeman now, Jim? He's waiting up at the theater. Ellis, I think I'll run up there and talk to him. Just a minute. Hi, it's Charlie. Oh, hello, fellas. Come on in. Go ahead, Joe. Right. Well, you got here right on a button. Yeah. Yeah, did you bring the stuff with you? Uh-huh. Ah, where is it? And Joe's got it. Yeah, it's right here in my pocket. Well, what do you say? Let's have a look at it. Oh, sure. sure. Wait a minute, Joe. Huh? Just keep it in your pocket. Well, what's the matter? We want to see some money first. Well, sure, kid. Have but... you got five grand? Well... Not exactly. What do you mean? Well, I went all over town, dug up all the cash I could. The best I could raise was two. But you promised us five. I know, kid, but... No more buts. We ain't interested. Come on, Joe. Wait a minute. 
Well, you better change your mind. Why? I know where that stuff came from. What are you talking about? You kids did that job out in the Fairfield Turnpike. It was in the papers. Yeah, so what? So, if you don't do business with me, I blow a whistle. You turn us into the cops? That's right. Now, do we do business with two grand? You got it with you? Yeah. Let's see it. Sure. There it is. Phil, are you going to take it? Yeah. With his gun. Huh? Hey, what is this? I got a gun, wise guy. Now let's have the dough. Come on. Drop it on the floor. Uh, what about the rings and stuff? Well, we keep them. Hey, now look, you can't just, just get... Just drop that dough. I'm warning you. Drop it or I'll shoot. Phil, wait. You can't shoot. I got the bullet. Huh? Now what do you do, big shot? I use this end of the gun. <laughs> Phil. What is it, stupid? Here's the bullets. Return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Close your eyes as you listen to one of those traditional college songs. You see the cheering section in the stadium, or the group around the fire in the fraternity house. Yep, those were the days. Yes, but don't forget they were days of learning, too. And believe it or not, there's a real tie-up between learning and earning. For instance, the average college graduate earns $72,000 more during his working years than the average American. And that extra $72,000 is only half the story. The well-educated man has a keener appreciation of the finer things of life, a better understanding of what makes the world go round. That's why everyone agrees that college is the best investment loving fathers and mothers can make for their children. I hope my children will get the chance. Well, if I were you, Don, I wouldn't leave it to chance. Why not make sure they'll go? Make sure with an equitable education fund. An equitable education fund? What's that? It's a surefire plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. And it includes these important features. One, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Two, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Three, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. Oh, sounds okay to me, Mr. Keating. Where do I get one of those equitable education funds? The man to see is your equitable society representative. Give your children their chance to earn that extra $72,000 by getting in touch with your equitable representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Half-Pint Horse Players. Any edition of your local newspaper will bring you fresh evidence of the fact that juvenile delinquency is one of the most pressing problems facing the nation today. Barely a day passes but that some new crime is reported that was committed by a boy or girl so young that the community is momentarily shocked into trying to fight the problem. But half-hearted measures or whole-hearted temporary measures are not the answer. The answer to juvenile delinquency lies in the home of every child, where the problem starts. As has been said in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, it takes work to raise children. But only by investing that work can you, parents of America, help fight the number one law enforcement problem of the nation. Tonight's file continues in the FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor has just returned from his visit to the theater. Well, Ellis, the special policeman didn't have anything to add to what we got from headquarters. Too bad. Did you see these? What's that? 
this set of character notes on the three boys that came in from the Fairfield police. No, no. What's it say? Well, one of them, Phil Osborne, he's the oldest, is a horse player. At 17? Yeah. Joe Sherman, the 15-year-old, is a tremendous eater. And according to Fairfield, he's not too bright. He can't be to get mixed up in something like this. The third boy, Joe's brother Tom, is a movie fan. No? He's been known to stay in a movie house for 10 hours at a stretch. Oh, oh I get it. Special Agent Taylor. Yes, Lieutenant. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's that address again? Uh, just a minute while I write it down. Hand me a pencil. Thanks. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. I've got it. 37 South 15th. Thanks again, Lieutenant. This may be something else. What's that, Jim? That was Lieutenant Mitchell again. They just had a report that two young boys answering the descriptions we sent out assaulted a man in a furnished room. Who made the report to the police? Man's landlady. He's still in his room. Come on, let's get over there and talk to him. Mr. Brown? That's right. My name is Taylor. This is Mr. Anderson. We're special agents of the FBI. Here are my credentials. Ah, I see. Well, what do you want? Your landlady reported to the police that you were assaulted here earlier this evening. That's right. Who did it? Two boys. They said they were messengers when they came to the door. When I let them in, they knocked me out. I see. What do you know about the boys, Mr. Brown? Nothing. I never saw them before. Look, my landlady shouldn't have bothered busy men like you with something like this. Oh, that's quite all right. Oh, now, why don't you just forget about the whole thing and let me go back to bed? Huh? My head hurts. You say you never saw these boys before, and that you didn't know they were coming here? That's right. That's not the truth. Huh? You told your landlady at 6.30 that you were expecting two boys to call on you, and to let them right up to your room when they came. Ah, uh, she's crazy. Mr. Brown, before we ask you any more questions, may I see that ring you're wearing? Huh? Oh, uh... Well, it's uh, it's kind of hard to get off. Oh, that's all right. I'll look at it right on your hand. Where'd you get this ring? Uh, my uh, my father left it to me. It's been the family for years. I hate to tell you that you're lying again, but this ring is part of the loot from a job that was pulled last night on the Fairfield Turnpike. I'm telling you, it was my father's ring. Now look, Brown, let's start all over again. And this time, let's try and tell the truth. <laughs> Joe, we're in good shape. Yeah. Yeah, we got two G's in cash, and we still got the jewelry. Uh-huh. Hey, you know what we do tomorrow? Nope. We hop a train, go to New York. And we can go to the movies, the races. Bill. Huh? I wish I was home. What? I, I mean it. Look at us. We got $2,000, and we can't even get a place to sleep in a hotel. But I told you, the cops will be watching every hotel. That's why I... Wish I was home, Phil. Ah, oh, come on. I used to have plenty to eat when I was home, Phil. You don't let me eat unless you're hungry. I ate too much. But I like to eat. I like to sleep, too. I could sleep at home whenever I wanted to. Now, look, Joe. Your brother's waiting for us at the Capitol Theater. You can sleep there, okay? Only till about 12 o'clock. Look, it's open all night. Well, I'll sleep there tonight. And then tomorrow morning, the three of us go to New York. Ellis? Yes, Jim? I think Brown is ready to tell us the truth now. Aren't you, Brown? Yeah. All right, now let's have the whole story. How did you meet the boys? Well, they came to Lou Thomas's horse room to make a bet. Mm. I was there, and I picked them up. I see. And did you know who they were? No, not at first. But when one of them offered to sell me the ring, I remembered the description of the ring in the paper. You bought this ring from them? Yeah, for 50 bucks. Then I made a deal with them to buy everything they had. Where were you going to get the money? Well, Lou Thomas, the guy with the horse room, went in with me. He put up the money. Thomas knew what the money was to be used for? Sure. He was my partner. I see. Go on. What happened then? Well, then I made a date with the kids to buy their stuff from them 7 o'clock tonight. And they came up here and held you up? That's right. How much did they get? 2,000 bucks. Brown, have you any idea where they might have gone when they left here? Well, I wasn't altogether knocked out when they left. I, I think I heard one kid say they were going back to the movies to meet his brother. That'd be the third boy, Ellis. They didn't say what movie, did they? No, they didn't. Okay, Brown, get your coat. What for? We want you to come down to the office with us. Okay. What do we do about this man, Lou Thomas, Jim? Want to put up the 2,000? Yes. He's implicated. We'll have him picked up. 
Why those dirty little crooks? What's the matter? Oh, one of them punks took my sport coat and left his dirty leather jacket. Here, let me look through that jacket. How do you like those guys? What thieves? Find anything, Jim? Yeah, I don't know how much help it's going to be, though. Three ticket stubs from the Capitol Theater. That's where they went today. Yes, that's right. Ellis, let's take Brown down to the office and then let's go see a movie. See a movie? At this time of night? That's right. Come on, let's go. We come upon many rare and beautiful specimens of the orchid. Nowhere in the world are so many different varieties to be found. And they constitute one of the main sources of export revenue. Jim. Yeah? Jim, you think we ought to ask the manager to throw on the house lights? No, I don't think that'll be necessary, Ellis. We should be able to spot them if they're here. It's a pretty small audience. Here? You see them being packed. Why don't you look up in the balcony while you work the orchestra? Hey, that's a pretty good idea. Go ahead. In two days, they'll be in your florist's window. Alice, Alice, wait a minute. What is it, Jim? Take a look at those three kids sitting down there. Yeah, they look like the ones we're looking for. I'm sure it's him. Come on, let's get down there. And so you see how much the airplane has meant to the economy of Panaloa. Jim, I don't know how you figured they'd come back to the Capitol Theater. You remember how many ticket stubs there were in that leather jacket? Yes, three. That meant that all three of them came in here today. But the special policeman only saw two of them come out. See, that's right. Then there was one other thing. Remember in the notes from the Fairfield police, they said that one boy was a movie fan and could sit and watch the same movie for ten hours? Well, of course. All of the Panaloans are expert sailors, of course. And this canoe racing is their main sport. It takes two years to build one of these canoes. But once built, they are sturdy enough to last a lifetime. Hello, boys. Huh? You're Joe and Tom Sherman? Yeah, that's right. That other boy there is Phil Osborne? Yeah. Be quiet, you dope. Who are you? What Special do you want? Special agent of the FBI. Why? Now, don't raise your voices. You're coming along with us. Come on. Yeah, but you don't now, understand. No arguments. Come on, boys. And so, with the last beautiful glimpse of the sunset sinking into the bay, we say farewell to the beautiful island of Panaloa. <laughs> Bill Osborne and the two Sherman brothers were committed to reformatories until they are 21 years of age under the Federal Juvenile Delinquency Act. Lou Thomas and Charles Brown were sentenced to three and five years, respectively, for violating the National Stolen Property Act. And thus, three young boys were halted in their careers of crime by your FBI and given fresh chances to straighten out their lives and to become decent citizens. Every child deserves that chance. And the fact that there are as many juvenile delinquents as there are is not the fault of the children themselves, but of the adult population. When the parents of America face that fact honestly and try to do something about it, then and only then will the most important step have been taken. Law enforcement agencies like your FBI fight juvenile delinquency with every facility at their disposal. But they cannot hope to win their fight without support. Support from you, the parents of America. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Fathers and mothers, the sure way to increase your child's chances of success in the future is to start an equitable education fund now. Remember, the average college graduate earns $72,000 more during his working years than the average American. So don't delay. Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, a case that emphasizes the inherent viciousness of the professional criminal. Its subject, interstate theft. Its title, The Friendly Frame-Up. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. 
Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The friendly frame-up on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. At this exact moment, your home is one of many millions in which this radio program is tuned in. In the Equitable Life Assurance Society, we feel that this nationwide home listening carries with it a very serious responsibility. Our equitable radio message must be keyed to home and family problems. Tonight's Equitable Society message is on education. If there are children in your home, you'll be particularly interested in this commercial about the Equitable Education Fund. Don't miss it in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Friendly Frame-Up. It is a truism in law enforcement circles that no criminal is easy to catch. Each one presents a new problem, demanding a new approach. Some, of course, are easier to apprehend than others. It is simpler to bring to justice the criminal who lives by crime alone, who earns no honest dollar than it is to trap the species of lawbreakers among us, who live a Jekyll and Hyde existence who operate a legitimate business as a front and a criminal business undercover. Those people are difficult to weed out because, for the most part, they take no active role in the commission of any crime. Mainly, they are the brains and the money behind the operation of a complex criminal machine, a machine which is built to stop at nothing. The night's file opens in a smoke-filled gymnasium. Sweaty fighters are going through their training workouts. One shadow boxing, one working with a sparring partner in the ring, another punching the heavy bag. It's 11 o'clock in the morning as Pete Webb, who manages these fighters, walks through the gym to his office. Work, Lefty. Keep going. Okay. Nice footwork, Jackie. See me later, will you? Right. Hey, Mr. Webb. Hi, Buffalo. No time for you now, kid. Catch me in an hour, huh? Okay. Louie. Right with you. Louie! Call back later, will you? Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Goodbye. Good morning, boss. Who was that? Bob Hudson. What do you want? The job. Is he kidding? Bob thinks just because I managed him, when he was fighting, I should support him for the rest of his life. Let him drop dead. What's coming this morning? Little Danny's in the jug. Where'd you get that? Yancey was in. He just visited Danny, got the whole story. What happened? Well, Danny said he met a guy on a train coming east. What kind of a guy? A bond salesman. Danny got him loaded, and the guy spilled that he was carrying some bonds. Uh-huh. Well, it's perfect for Danny. He's always got those go-to-sleep pills in his kick, so he slipped some on the guy's drink and clipped his briefcase. Well, what went wrong? Well, the guy must have come too awful fast. He quit contact with the cops. They call it Danny in the station? No. Uh, not till he hit his apartment. What about the bonds? Well, Danny was afraid he might have a tail on him, so as soon as he hit the railroad station, he checked the briefcase of the baggage counter. Uh-huh. Then he put the claim check in an envelope and dropped it in the mailbox. Who'd he mail it to? Well, that's what Yancey came up to tell us. Danny mailed a claim check to you. No. Oh. Did it come in? No, Danny figured we should get it this afternoon. 
Then he wants for you to get rid of the bonds and get some cash to him for a mouthpiece. I see. Uh, where'd he check the stuff? North side station. Well, when the baggage checks him, then you run over there and pick the stuff up. Me? Yeah. Are you kidding? No, why? There's liable to be 50 cops waiting around that baggage counter. You just told me that he wasn't picked up till he hit his apartment. All right, he could have talked since then. Mm, Daddy wouldn't talk. Then why don't you pick the stuff up? Well, uh... well, for the same reason I got, huh? Look, we just can't leave the stuff there. It's too good a score for us. We got to get some... Wait a minute. What? I got an idea. <laughs> Ellie. Yes, Bob. Where are you, honey? I'm in the bedroom. Okay. You're home early, honey. Any luck today? Yeah, I got a job. Oh, Bob, that's wonderful. Oh, I'm so excited. Wait a minute, honey. Don't get too excited. Why not? Well, will you hear who I'm working for? Who? Pete Webb. Oh, no, Bob. Well, Ellie, I had to find a job. Yeah, but not with Pete. Bob, how could you after the things that he's done to you? I know what he's done to me, but... We also have to eat. But, Bob, there are plenty of guys. For two solid months now, I've been pounding the pavement looking for work. I know, but... I found out real quick about my friends. They turned out to be a lot of guys who only wanted to be around while I was winning. But other people... Other people? Well, I take one look at this nose and these cauliflower ears and practically come right out and tell me they're not interested in hiring a punch-drunk fighter. That's why I finally called Pete. I understand, honey. I'm sorry. Okay. What are you going to do for Pete? I don't know, but I told him no larceny. What did he say? He said the job was clean. When did he start work? This afternoon. I got to pick up something for him. What? A package that's checked at Northside Station. The same afternoon in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just approaching his desk. Jim. Oh, Jim. Oh, yes, Paul. I've been looking for you. Oh? I just left the boss. He's put us both on a case that just came in. Oh? What are the details of it? A man named Lawrence Black was on a train en route here from Cleveland. He was robbed of $21,000 of negotiable bonds. Oh, how was the job done? The thief slipped some knockout drops into one of Black's drinks. I see. When he came to, he gave the police at the station a good description of the man he was drinking with. Uh Uh-huh. The description was so good, in fact, that the local police picked up the thief within an hour as he was entering his apartment. Oh, wait, Paul. If they picked him up, what's the case? What are we working on? The thief didn't have the bonds on him. Oh, I see. I presume the police searched his apartment. From top to bottom. But there wasn't a trace of either the bonds or the briefcase they were in. Are the police sure they've got the right man? The victim made a positive identification. Mm, I see. Jim, our job is to find out what he did with those bonds between the time he got off the train and the time he got home. Okay. Who's the thief, Paul? His name is Newton. He has a long criminal record. Newton, huh? What's his first name? Dan. Dan Newton? That's right. That could be little Danny. Paul, have you got anything on him here? A description, maybe? Got a whole file right here. Pictures and all. Swell. Have a look at it, huh? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, that's little Danny, all right. You know him, Jim? Yes. Yes, and I think I know where the bonds are. Really? Yes, you see, little Danny has always used a regular pattern of operation. He rides trains, picks up a victim, clips him, then checks his loot at the railroad station as soon as he gets off. But, Jim, there was no baggage check found on him when he was picked up. No, no, there wouldn't be. His usual procedure is to mail the check either to himself or to a friend. Paul, what station did he arrive in? The north side station. Let's notify the police and have them send a man to that baggage counter at once. Hey, Bud, how about that bag? I gave you the check five minutes ago. Look, can I get some service here? Oh, brother. Hey, hey, you, is that the briefcase? Yes. Well, it's about time. Let me have it. Here. Wait a minute. Hmm? You better let me have that briefcase. Who are you? Police. Here's the badge. What is this? Just give me the briefcase, Hudson. How do you know me? I used to watch you fight. Now, let's have the bag and come along with me. What for? This is an arrest. Hmm? I got to take in. Look, I don't get any of this. You just claim that briefcase. Well, so what? I'm picking it up for the guy I worked for. Hudson, that briefcase was stolen. Hmm? There's $21,000 worth of negotiable bonds in there. 
Well, wait, there must be some mistake. There's no mistake. I know the briefcase, and I've been waiting an hour to nail whoever picked it up. Whoever picked it up? Yeah, now come on. Wait a minute, I'm being framed. Come on, I said. Oh, no, let go of me. Hey, come back here. Stop or I'll shoot. Hudson, you hear me? Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Jim. I'm down at the railroad station. We've gotten a bad break. Oh, what's that, Paul? A man picked up the briefcase about ten minutes ago. An officer attempted to arrest him, but he got away. With the briefcase? Yes. Oh, that is tough. The police feel they can pick him up pretty quickly, though. How's that? The arresting officer recognized the man. Said his name was Bob Hudson, ex-prize fighter. Yeah, I've heard of him. Hudson was wounded in the getaway. The officer fired two shots at him. He certainly hit him at least once. Any idea where this Hudson lives? The police are checking that now. Paul, have them call me as soon as they find his address. What's wrong? Just let me sit down a minute. Look at your shirt. That's blood. Yeah. Tell him what's happened. A bullet grazed my shoulder. Well, I'll call a doctor. Wait. No doctors, Ellie. Huh? The guy with the gun was a cop. Oh. I was framed, Ellie. Pete Webb framed me. Oh, no, darling. How? What well, bag I was to call for at the railroad station it was loaded with stolen bonds. $21,000 worth. And he sent you there knowing that? Sure. Hoping I'd get away clear. Oh, this is awful. Oh, you were right about Pete, honey. I shouldn't have taken that job. Oh, forget about that. Why did the cop shoot you? Well, it was going to take me in. I couldn't let Pete's frame go that far, so I busted away from him. Bob, you shouldn't have done that. Pete was in the wrong, not you. Well, I can never prove that from the city jail. Bob, you just got to let me call the doctor. I said no, Ellie. But I can't Look, just... I wouldn't be here anyway when he came. What do you mean? I got a call to make. What? I'm going to go see Pete Webb. I'm going right now. Oh, Bob, please listen to me. Your shoulder... The bleeding stopped. But you, you've got to let Ellie, me... Ellie, I'm going to go see Pete Webb, and I'm going to make him come down to the cops with me and tell the real story about those stolen bonds. Uh, just a minute. Hello, Louie. Hiya, Bob. Come on in. Pete, it's Bob Hudson. Oh, hiya, kid. Hello, Pete. What took you so long? I was beginning to get a little worried about you. No kidding. Hey, what's with the blood? In my shirt? Yeah. What happened? I got shot. Huh? By who? Cop. What for? You should know what for, Pete. I don't get you. The briefcase. The briefcase that you framed me into picking up. Oh, I sent you on there, and that's all. Stop right. the routines. Hey, where is the briefcase? I haven't got it. The cops get it? No. And where is it? I put it away in a safe place. It's going to stay there until I take both you guys and the bonds to the cops. You're going to take us to the cops? That's right. <laughs> Pete, this guy really is punchy. You did frame me. you got to admit that. Yeah. I admit it. But only to you, not the cops. I was just paying you back for an old score. What do you mean? The time you double-crossed me in Bay City. I never double-crossed anybody in my life. Remember the time I had you in a main at Bay City? I bet against you. I told you about it. You turn around and win the fight. I've tried to win every fight. You're in one now, you ain't gonna win. Oh, no. I'm taking you both to the cops right now. Hold the phone. Hmm? This gun says different. That ain't stopping me, Louie. That's what you think. No guns, Louie. This is better. Louie, uh, take this blackjack. When he comes to, keep using it on him till you find out where he stashed that briefcase. Well, okay, boss. Where are you going? I want some action. I'm going to the fights. Return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. (laughs) 
Tomorrow on hundreds of football fields, boys and girls will raise their voices in the old traditional songs. The same songs you and I sang in our college days. Well, college wasn't all singing for me, Mr. Keating. I had a swell time, but I took medicine and studied pretty hard at it. Of course you studied, Harry. And there are hundreds of thousands of others just like you. That's why the average college graduate earns $72,000 more during his working years than the average American. What's more, that extra $72,000 is just half the story. Educated men and women have cultural interests and appreciation that they wouldn't part with for any amount of money. So, for many reasons, everyone agrees college is the wisest and best investment loving fathers and mothers can make for their children. Well, I certainly hope that my boy will get the chance to go. If I were you, I wouldn't leave it a chance. Why not make sure he'll go? Make sure with an equitable education fund. An equitable education fund? Never heard of it before. It's a surefire plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society, and it includes these important features. First, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Two, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Three, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. Well, sounds okay to me, Mr. Keating. Where do I get one of those equitable education funds? The man to see is your equitable society representative. Give your children their chance to earn that extra $72,000 by getting in touch with your equitable representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Friendly Frame-Up. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI illustrates one major point. A point which cannot be stressed too strongly or repeated too often. It is absolutely impossible for a decent, law-abiding citizen to do business with a criminal. The two cannot mix any more successfully than oil and water. Because their minds and their hearts are so different. The decent man lives by the credo that he must work for what he gets. And that his fellow man is entitled to the same courtesy and dignity that he himself expects in return. But the criminal regards his fellow men as just so many potential victims. And he looks with contempt on those who work for what they want. Your FBI asks you to remember those things if you're ever tempted to enter into any agreement with a criminal. Remember them and heed them well. Tonight's file continues that same evening at the local FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor has just returned to his office where Special Agent Meriden is waiting for him. Hello, Paul. Any word from the police on Hudson? Not since I've been here, Jim. Had any dinner yet? No, the drugstore's going to send up a sandwich and some coffee. That'll hold me for a while. The note you left for me said you went to Hudson's house. What happened? Oh, his wife was there. When I questioned her, she told me that Hudson had been given a job just this afternoon by his old manager, Pete Webb. Pete Webb? Yes. Webb's a local character who's on the shady side, but nobody's ever been able to get anything on him. Mm-hmm. Mrs. Hudson says that Webb sent her husband for the briefcase. Did he know what was in it? Well, she said no. She said that Hudson returned to the house wounded this afternoon after he'd been at the station and that he'd gone from there to Webb's apartment. What for? To make Webb go to the police with him and admit that the whole thing was a frame. I see. So I left Hudson's and went over to Webb's apartment. Yes. Webb had gone out to the fights, according to a stooge of his named Louis Slater, who answered the door. Louis Slater? Hmm. Where do I know that name from? Oh, he's a petty larceny hoodlum. He said he'd heard of Hudson, but that he didn't know him and that Hudson had positively never been to Webb's apartment. I don't trust people who are so positive. Neither do I, Paul, but I didn't have a search warrant, so there wasn't much I could do except take his word for it. I'll I'll get it. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Hello, Taylor. This is Spencer down at headquarters. Oh, hello, Spencer. We've got Hudson again, Hmm? and this time he won't break loose. Where'd you find him? He was unconscious in an alley off Main Street and First Avenue. He's over at City Hospital now. Still unconscious? According to last reports, he was. In fact, the doctors say they don't know if he'll ever come out of it. Oh, 
Well, thanks very much, Spencer. Right. Bye. Hudson is at City Hospital. Unconscious, Paul. Come on, let's get up there. Thought you were going to wait for me at the apartment. Yeah, I was, but something important came up. I came to tell Don't you. Don't tell me nothing this round's over. Come on, Sailor. Come on, boy. Get in there now. Keep it left out there. Yeah. Now, what have you got? A guy from the FBI was around. He was looking for Hudson. What'd you tell him? I said I didn't even know the guy. Good. What'd you do with Hudson? I dumped him in an alley. Alive? Yeah, just about. That's bad. Look, you didn't say nothing about knocking him off. Okay, okay. Did you find out where you put the stuff? Yeah, I think so. What do you mean, think? Well, he never came to after you conked him. So I frisked him and I found this key. What is it? Well, it fits one of those subway locker boxes. It says so right here. Yeah. I figured it's probably a box on that station near where Hudson lives. Yeah, the key's got a number on it. Well, we can check. That's a good idea. Uh, look, Louie, why don't you go up and see if you're right? Are you kidding? No. Look, that's how Hudson got where he is. Look, Louie, I want to watch this fight. I'll see you at the gym in the morning. Report to emergency. Hi, Jim. How is he? Oh, he's still unconscious. They patched up the bullet wounds, but somewhere Hudson took an awful beating. After he was shot? Must have been. You think he got the beating at Webb's place? Mm -hmm. Could be. I checked on what time Webb got to the fights tonight. He'd have had time to see Hudson and still get to the arena when he did. Hudson didn't have the bonds on him when they found him, did he? Uh, His pockets were empty, Paul. What did the doctor think of Hudson's chances? Oh, 50-50. He might pull out of it, but there's no telling. Oh, comes his wife now. Hello, Mr. Taylor. Mrs. Hudson. The nurse told me you spoke to the doctor. Yes, that's right. How is he? Is he going to get better? Well, Mrs. Hudson, it'll be a little while, probably, before the doctors know any more than they do now. Here comes one of them now, Jim. Uh, Oh, yes, that's him. That's Bob's doctor? Yes. He's coming over here. Well, now, be calm, Mrs. Hudson. Bad news. I, I know it. I can see it in the doctor's face. (laughs) <laughs> hey, Tiger, peek him in his office yet? Yeah, he's in. Thanks. That's you, Louie? Uh-huh. Pete, I got some news for you. What is it? Well, you were worried about me not knocking off Hudson, huh? Uh-huh. He died this morning in the hospital. How do you know? I heard the rumor from a dozen guys, so I called the hospital. I see. They said it was official, and he also told me he'd die without ever coming to. That means he couldn't tell the cops where he stashed the bonds. That's right. Uh, where's that locker key? Right here in my kick. Where do you think we should start looking? Like I said last night, we go first to the subway station near where Hudson lived. Okay, let's go. Pete Blocker should be down at this end of the platform. Uh-huh. Wait a minute. What is it? It's a train killing. Oh. It's an express, Pete. It ain't, it ain't stopping. Uh-huh. Well, come on. Louis, that looks like the locker's down there. Yeah. Now, let's just hope they got number 2177. We'll just walk by the lockers and take a gander at the numbers as we pass. Okay. Hmm. Do you see what I see? Good old number 2177. Uh-huh. Let's go to work. Here's the key. Okay. Fits, huh? Yeah. Yeah, 
There we are. What's in there? Just what we're looking for. A briefcase. Oh, swell. Let's open it up, huh? Not here, stupid. Come on, let's get going. Wait. What is it? That guy coming toward us. He's the guy from the FBI. You sure? Yeah. Let's round and make the other exit quick. Everyone, both of you. Not a chance. Oh, oh, they're coming your way. I see them. Wait, Pete, we're blocked off. All right, you two, don't move. Nice going, Paul. All right, Webb. Let's have that briefcase. What is this? I don't think I have to explain. Well, Paul, let's call the hospital as soon as we can. Hudson will be happy to know we picked these men up. Hudson's dead. You just heard a rumor that he was dead. I planted that rumor with a fight mob. I hoped it would get back to you. The hospital said he was dead. They were instructed to say that. Hudson's not only alive, but he told us where the bonds were. He also told us that you probably had the missing key. This is nothing but lies. I think you'll change your mind when Hudson's testimony sends you both away for a long, long time. Pete Webb and his henchman, Louis Slater, were tried in a federal court and given 20 years for violating the National Stolen Property Act. They were then turned over to local authorities and sentenced to an additional long term for attempted murder. And thus, your FBI performed a double function in tonight's case. First, they apprehended the guilty criminals. And second, they proved the innocence of an accused man. It's the everyday job of special agents to arrest the violators of certain federal laws. And the story of their success in that job is in their record and in their reputation. But the second function performed in tonight's case is even more important. Because the basic foundation of good law enforcement must be public confidence. The knowledge that the public has that it will not be victimized in order to build up an impressive record of convictions that each individual questioned will be treated as innocent until he is proven guilty. That is why every special agent is instructed when he is appointed a member of the Federal Bureau of Investigation that the primary job of your FBI is to protect the American people and that a major part of that protection is seeing to it that no innocent man be found guilty of a crime he did not commit. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now one last word about the Equitable Education Fund. The outstanding feature of this plan is this. It makes sure that your children will be educated no matter what happens. Whether you live or die, they'll get the education you want them to have. So don't wait any longer. Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case that graphically illustrates the fate of a supposedly honest businessman who chooses to consort with thieves. Its subject, fraudulent bankruptcy. It's titled, Merchants of Arson. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society broadcast are adopted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Merchants of Arson, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. 
presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight, the Equitable Life Assurance Society is going to give you some facts about group insurance a type of insurance that is important in the lives of 50 million Americans. How important? Well, take the Pan American Petroleum and Transport Company. Its president and chairman of the board of its marketing subsidiary, the American Oil Company, Mr. D.J. Smith, says, Greatly as we regret the loss in the recent Texas City disaster of valued employees to the company and their families, it is comforting to know that group insurance provided for their families. For further information on group insurance, showing just how it can benefit you, be sure to listen in about 14 minutes to a message from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Tonight's FBI file, Merchants of Arson. is a nation of 140 million people. And in that number, there are more than 50 million wage earners. Some earn their daily bread in normal ways, working with their hands in factories, driving trucks, or tilling the soil. Others manage to exist because they engage in some bizarre occupation like diving for sponges or riding with smoke in the sky. But of all the various obtuse methods used to make money... Perhaps the least understood is a method used by a certain breed of criminal. This perverse system of garnering a yearly income is managed by those criminals who fraudulently go through the process of bankruptcy. In other words, there are those who make their profit by having a court declare them penniless. They never make the page one headlines and the public rarely hears about them. But like the killers and the thieves who become notorious, these men too are criminals. Tonight's file opens on a quiet tree-lined street located in one of the suburbs in a large eastern city. In the backyard of one of the cottages on this street, an elderly man is expertly hitting a croquet ball through a maze of wickets. Two visitors approach. One of them calls out. Uncle Ed. Hmm? Oh, here, you know, Chet. Mind a couple of visitors? Nope. Uncle Ed, I hate to interrupt your practice, but I'd like you to know Mr. Bedford. He's a client of mine. How do you do, sir? I do. Uncle Ed, uh, me and Mr. Bedford would like to have a little talk with you. Hmm? What about? Business. Not interested. But Mr. Bedford here has a real good proposition for you. Yeah, I'm retired. Hey, stand away from that wicket there. Chuck, this looks like a waste of business. Oh, no. But no. he just said, look, Uncle Ed has retired more times than Harry Lauder. Let me handle him. How? I got a sure system. Never fail. What? Oh, Uncle Ed. What is it? Are you uh, positive you don't want the job? Yep. Then would you mind doing me a favor? Yeah, what? Tell me where I can get in touch with uh, Tommy Gillen. Yep. Hmm? What do you want him for? I want to bring him together with Mr. Bedford. You're going to give that old bungler a job? Who else can I get? You're the only two guys around. Mr. Bedford, don't you let him do this, do you? Well, if you won't take the job, sir, it looks like I have no choice. <clears throat> I'll take it. Well... What's the setup? Uh, it's a warehouse. Oh, they're tough, boy. Big buildings like that take a lot of work. This is only a two-story structure. Uh, you work with me, Chuck? Sure, be glad to. You know my price, Mr. Bedford? Yes, Chuck told me. You'll be paid immediately after the job. Good. Uh, wait, uh, yeah. when can you do the job? Yeah, when do you want it? Well, could you do it tonight? Mr. Bedford, your warehouse will be nothing but ashes by morning. Chuck, bring me some more rags. Sure. There you are. What are you doing with that gasoline? Well, I was going to pour some in that corner. Don't let me handle that. You get bad distribution, the place burns uneven. I've got my reputation to think of. Here, so please. Okay, sure. Now, yeah, I'll just blind them neatly along this wall here. We want some help? No, no, no. How much longer will we be here? Well, about a minute. 
Kirk? Yeah? This place is empty. What does Bedford want it burned down for? Where's the profit? Well, Bedford runs a legitimate business. Uh -huh. About two weeks ago, he bought 40,000 bucks worth of drugs on consignment. Oh, where are they? Well, he had me move them over to another warehouse as soon as they came in. Oh. Now Bedford's going to say they burned up in this fire and collect insurance, eh? No, no. He didn't insure the stuff at all. Huh? He's got a much smarter touch. Oh. What? Well, after the fire, he can make the claim that he can't pay for the drugs. That he's broke. So he goes bankrupt and sells the stuff to a fence. Yeah, that is pretty smart. He deserves a first-class fire. We should just about give it to him. Are you all finished? Yep. Hey, let's get over by the door. You going to light it now? Uh-huh. Get ready to run, boy. Here it goes. <laughs> A few weeks after the warehouse fire in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is at his desk going over a file of correspondence as a visitor approaches. Jim Taylor? Yes, that's right. Vic Norwood. Just got in this morning. Oh, hello there, Vic. Hi. Fine, thanks. Say, uh, by the way, Bill Sweet said to say hello. Oh, hey, that's right. You were in the Salt Lake City office, weren't you? That's nice country out that way. Nice people to work with, too. Yeah, I know. I was in that office for a year myself. Oh, uh, you've been in to see the agent in charge yet? Yeah, some first thing this morning. He wants me to work with you on this bankruptcy case, if there's anything there. Well, I'm just going over the file of correspondence myself, eh? Well, what's the story? Well, we received a letter yesterday from C.J. Crawford and Company. That's a drug house out on the West Coast. Well, how'd they happen to write us? Well, they sold a man named George Bedford $40,000 worth of drugs on consignment about three weeks ago. Now, Bedford's business is here. Oh, I see. There was a fire in Bedford's warehouse right after the shipment arrived. And then Bedford filed a petition in bankruptcy. That's right. Well, how much do we know about Bedford? Well, nothing yet, Vic. Well, have you contacted the fire department for their reports on the fire? Yes, they're sending them over. In addition to that, I'm going to talk to the inspector who covered the fire and interview him. Well, that should help. Those fellows are pretty shrewd. Yeah. Vic, I'll tell you what. You take this file here and read through it, huh? That's the correspondence between Bedford and the Crawford Company. Good. That'll give me a little more background. Mm -hmm. And why don't you check and see what you can find out about this Bedford fellow? All right. Meanwhile, I'll go over and see the fire inspector, and if he thinks there's any point to it, maybe we'll go see what's left of Bedford's warehouse. You'll check back here with me? Yeah, I'll call in by noon at the latest, Vic. And if you've got any dope on Bedford by that time, maybe I'll pay him a visit, too. Uncle Ed. Uh, I'm out here on the back porch. Oh. Alone? Uh huh. Uh, can I talk to you for a minute? Where did I finish up here? What's all that stuff? Press clippings. About what? Fires. Ones I set. Is that whole book full of them? Yep. A scrapbook. You scan it if you like. <laughs> this one was a pippin. Detroit. Four alarms. I'll, I'll uh, read it over later, Uncle Ed. I got something to talk to. Talk up with you about first. Uh -huh. What? Well, I, I've kind of got the shorts. I, I was wondering if I could tap you for a couple of hundred. You broke? Yeah, real broke. Well, what about the money you got from Bedford? Well, I spent it. So soon? Well, you only gave me five hundred. Five hundred? Yeah, so well, I... Wait a minute, boy, wait a minute. He paid you that measly amount after all the things you've done? Oh, I didn't do so much. Well, you made it possible for him to steal $40,000 of merchandise. Yeah, but he thought the thing up. Well, you've done all the dirty work. He should have cut you in for plenty. Well, look, it's too late for that now. It's I... never too late. Wait. Did Bedford get rid of them drugs yet? No. Then you cut in for 50% of them. By who? By me. Oh, now, look, Unc, how can an old guy like Save you... Save that talk, boy. Save it. Where does Bedford live? On 12th Street. Why? We're paying a call on him tonight. Mr. Taylor, you say you're from the FBI. That's correct, Mr. Bedford. Here are my credentials. I see. Well, what can I do for you? You were the sole owner of the Bedford Company before it went through bankruptcy. Is that right? Yes. We received a letter from the C.J. Crawford Company with whom you did some business. Yes, I purchased quite a bit of merchandise from the Crawford outfit just uh, prior to the fire that wiped me out. Yes, I know. You see, that warehouse was a fire trap, and I could never get any insurance on it, Mr. Taylor. When that Crawford shipment burned, I was wiped out. 
Clean as a whistle. I went over the fire department reports on that fire this morning. You did? Why? Just checking. And I went to the scene of the fire with the inspector who examined the ruins right after the blaze was put up. What was the purpose of all that, Mr. Taylor? Now, look, I'm a taxpayer and I'm entitled to know. Oh, certainly, Mr. Bedford. I went over the reports and over the scene of the fire to try and make sure that the Crawford Company drugs actually burned, as you claimed. Are you implying that I'm not an honest man? That's not part of my job, sir. I'm merely checking to make sure there is no fraud connected with your petition of bankruptcy. Well, what was it you want to know? Are you absolutely sure that those Crawford drugs were in the warehouse when it burned down? Certainly I'm sure. I saw them with my own eyes. Why? The fire inspector's report and an examination of the ruins today failed to disclose any traces of tin or of steel rods. Tin or steel rods? Some of the products in that shipment were packed in tin. And every one of the Crawford shipping cases for the past six months have been reinforced with steel rods. There should have been some evidence of those things in the ruins. Mr. Taylor, I gather that you're calling me a crook. I'm not calling you anything. I just came here to ask you some questions. You've asked your questions. You're going to arrest me? No, Mr. Bedford. I don't have anything to arrest you for. Nobody can prove anything yet. If you ever think you can, come back and see me. I'll be right here. All right, sir. Thank you. Just a minute. Hi, Mr. Bedford. Oh, hello there, Chuck. You remember my Uncle Ed? Yes, of course. How are you, sir? I do. Uh, come in, both of you. Go ahead, Uncle. All right. I'm very really glad that you stopped by, Chuck. I was about to call you. What for? A man from the FBI came to my office today. What did he want? He asked questions about the fire. I gather that they don't think the drugs were there when the place burned. Oh? I think it might be wise for me to get out of town for a while. Which means that I've got to get rid of the drugs as soon as possible. You mean sell them? Yes. You know these men. What are they called? Fences. Get the best deal you can. Uh, Mr. Benfin. Yes? Now, what do you figure on paying the boy for this? Same fee I gave him before. Five hundred dollars. He's not interested. Now, just a minute. This is a matter between your nephew and myself. I'm handling this business now. The job will cost you 50%. What? Right, Chuck? Right. Well... This is preposterous. I'll get someone else to do the job. Yeah, hold, hold on there, mister. Let me point out something to you. Well? I understand that the warehouse you get the drugs in now is rented in my nephew's name. That's right. I arranged it that way. You know what that could mean, don't you? What? Chuck here could take everything. Oh, that's how you're playing it. Mm-hmm. Does the boy get 50%, Mr. Bedford? Yes. Of this. He's got a gun. That's right. Then I'll use it, too, Chuck. Yeah, put that away. You'll hurt somebody. Get out of here. Chuck, take that gun away from him. Don't come near me, Chuck. I'll shoot if you do. He won't shoot, Chuck. Ain't got the fortitude. Just walk right up to him. That's it. Uh, keep him away from me. That's it, Chuck. Now, take the gun. Come on, give me that. Chuck, take it. Okay. Give it, no, give it no, to me, no, I said. No, let it go. Let it go. What do I do now? That's elementary, son. You've got a gun in your hand. Use it. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Now, a 50-second interview on group insurance with a man from Texas City, Texas. Ed, you were in Texas City last April when that ship blew up and wrecked the town. Yes, I was there. And am I lucky to be talking to you right now? 31 of the guys in my plant were killed in that blast. Yes, it was one of America's most terrible tragedies, Ed. Sure was. I don't know what the families of those boys in our plant would have done if it hadn't been for group insurance with the Equitable Society. I understand those 31 families in your company received a check from the Equitable Society totaling more than $300,000. That's right, Mr. Keating. What's more, Equitable paid off fast. Yes, group insurance with the Equitable Society is a mighty good thing for the employee and his family, and it's just as good for the company, for three good reasons. First, it means satisfied, loyal workers. Yes, think of getting life insurance, accident and sickness insurance, and retirement income, plus hospital, surgical, and medical benefits. All in one package from the Equitable Society, without any medical examination. Second, group insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society decreases labor turnover. Right. A fellow thinks twice before he walks out on a job which gives him extra insurance coverage. 
At far lower cost than he could buy it as an individual. Third, Equitable Society Group Insurance improves quality and quantity of production. Believe me, I do better work. Now that I've got rid of worries about sickness and accidents and my wife and kids' future. Well, I hope every employer in this radio audience hears what you've said. And that every one of them is resolving now to get the facts on complete group insurance protection from the nearest office of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or write direct to the New York Home Office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, Merchants of Arson. As can be seen in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, the professional bankrupt, the man who makes a living by alleging that he is poverty-stricken, is the true criminal. For his crime contains the very essence of criminality, the taking of something for nothing. That what he is doing is morally reprehensible carries no weight with the criminal. For he's not concerned with what his community thinks of him. He is an isolationist who lives in his own little world with his own rules and his own moral code. It is unfortunate that nowhere in that code is there any room for loyalty or compassion. But the absence of those things is what makes him what he is, a criminal. He not only has no desire to live by the golden rule, he doesn't even understand what it means when he sees the words do unto others as you would have them do unto you. For his motto is different. His motto reads, rob and cheat and steal, because people are fools, and there's only one real crime, and that is being caught. Tonight's file continues in the local FBI field office, where Special Agents Jim Taylor and Vic Norwood are comparing notes on the fraudulent bankruptcy. Jim, I checked on George Bedford every place I could. There's one thing that puzzles me. What's that, Vic? How he ever got a $40,000 shipment from anybody on credit. No, why? Well, the Better Business Bureau has him marked down as a sharpshooter. Every credit rating bureau in town has him listed as a bad risk. Well, that figures, I guess. Oh, I also picked up pretty definite information that Bedford was mixed up in the black market during the war. Oh? He was supposed to control the penicillin black market before it became plentiful. Huh? Nice guy. Making a racket out of people's health. Now, what'd you get on him, Jim? I just received a supplementary report from the fire department on Bedford's warehouse. Well, what'd it say? Well, there is no proof, but there's an awful deep suspicion that the fire was no accident, that the place was empty when it burned down. Well, what happened to all those drugs, then? I don't know, but I've notified every wholesale drug company in town to be on the lookout for anyone trying to sell anything on the list that we got from Crawford. Well, it looks like we're going to have to wait for Bedford to make a move, then. Well, I'll, miss. Oh, I'll get it. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes, Lieutenant. What? Oh, where? Hmm. What's that address again? 26 12th Street. Yeah. All right, I'll be right over. It was Lieutenant Jones down at police headquarters. Bedford was found dead in his apartment a half an hour ago. What happened? Shot through the head. Oh? Lieutenant thought it looked like suicide. I'm going right over there. Chuck. Yeah, Unc. Uh, let me have that music. Sure. Hey, uh, putting something in the scrapbook? Yep. Another fire? Nope. About Mr. Bedford. Oh, you mean his suicide? Mm-hmm. Hey, that's a good picture of him. Too bad he ain't alive to see it. He should have got it years ago. Them legitimate fellas give honest thieves a bad name. Yeah. Well, I think I'll take a run downtown. What for? I'm going to shop around, see if maybe I can peddle them drugs. Uh, not yet, son. Why not? Uh, too hot. But Bedford's dead. They'll or... still be looking for the drugs. When the time, time comes to peddle them, I'll give you the word. Okay. Well, I think I'll get downtown anyway. Hey, wait a minute. What? Don't leave that cigarette burning there. Things like that could start a fire. Jim, what'd you find out about Bedford? That suicide story looks like a phony, Vic. Like... Why? Well, for a lot of reasons. The living room showed signs of a struggle. There are no powder burns near the wound. The bullet entered at a bad angle. Oh, take your own reason. I see. And Bedford probably was doing business with criminals who got rid of him when trouble turned up. Certainly looks that way. Yeah, what happened to the drugs, though? I don't know. 
But if we had any doubts at all, this kind of clinches the fact that the drugs didn't burn and that that bankruptcy was illegitimate. Yeah. You didn't get any leads at all on where Bedford might have hidden the drugs, did you? No, just one. I found a key in Bedford's desk that had a tag attached to it, and on the tag was written an address. 171 Front Street. Front Street? Yeah. Oh, I forgot, Vic. You don't know this town very well. Front Street is down in the warehouse district. That might be the key to the warehouse where the stolen goods are. I hope so. I had Wentworth go over and check on it. He ought to be calling back here pretty soon. And what about Bedford's office? Nothing much up there that I could see. The police and Bob Williams came over from our office, and they're going up there now and over his books. Do you have a secretary? Yes, I spoke to her. Did you get anything? She told me Bedford had a visitor who seemed to be able to walk right into the private office whenever he wanted to. What was his name? She never knew. Said he was a tall, blonde fellow, about 26, 27 years old. Excuse me. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes, Lieutenant. He did. Mr. Horton at the Brooks Company. That's first to Main Street? Yes. Yes, Thanks, I've got it. Fine. Thanks for the information. Vic is our first lead. That was the police. Somebody just tried to sell the stolen drugs to a Mr. Horton over at the Brooks Company. They're wholesale suppliers. Did they catch him? Not quite. They tried to detain him, but he got away. Vic, why don't you hop over and see Mr. Horton? I'll wait for the report in the warehouse. Hey, who's that? Me, Uncle Ed. Oh, Thought you were going to stay downtown for dinner. I was, but something happened. Oh, what? We got trouble. What is it, boy? Well, I, I tried to peddle a drug. You, you what? Look, I told you. I know, I know. So I made a mistake. Uh, what happened? Well, a guy I tried to sell the stuff to called the cops. Uh, what did you do? I ran out. Anybody follow you? I don't think so. I circled the block a couple of times, did some fast turns, and then I went to the warehouse and left the car there. What shall we do now? Uh, only one thing we can do. What? Can you get a truck? Sure, rent one. Then let's get to the warehouse, load the truck, and head for Chicago. What do we do there? Get rid of the drugs where the heat's off. Where do we go? Get the truck right now. Jim, I got the description of the man who tried to peddle those drugs. Good, let's have it. It was that same tall blonde fellow who hung around Bedford's office. Did he tell Mr. Horton where he had the drugs hidden? No, he didn't. Horton sent one of the boys out in the office to trail him. You going to call you here when the boy comes back? Yes. I take it you had no luck with the key to 171 Front Street? No, it turned out to be a warehouse, all right, but the key didn't fit any lock in the place. Well, whose warehouse is it? Parker and Gordon. The furniture company owns it. Oh, yeah. No legitimate firm. Oh, excuse me. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes, sir, just a moment. I think it's few. Special Agent Norwood speaking. Yes, son. Just a moment. That boy from Horton's office, Jim. Uh-huh. Go ahead, son. Yes. Yes. That's where you lost him, huh? I see. Well, thank you for the information. Goodbye. Jim. Hmm? The boy followed our suspect down 7th Street, but he lost him on the Interstate Bridge. Interstate Bridge? Vic, why didn't I think of that before? What? The Interstate Bridge. Come on, let's go. Ought to be that next building, Jim. Okay, Vic. Let's park the car right here. Leave your door open, Vic. I'll slide out that side. Right. I think the best thing to do is try this key I found at Bedford in the office door, Vic. If that doesn't work, then we can try the trucking entrance. Okay. Can you see all right? Yeah, fine. Works. Must be the place. Morning, Vic. Right. Turn on my flashlight. Hold it a minute. I thought I heard something. Oh, it's okay. All right, go ahead, flashlight. There's a desk. Should we look through it? No, no time. Jim, there's a door over there. Mm-hmm. Put your light on deck. We'll try it. Right. There's to be a passage down into the warehouse. Come on. Okay. Listen. Come on, let's see who that is, Vic. Look, it's a truck. And that front door is opening. It's going to drive out. Look at that man behind the wheel, Jim. Looks like our suspect. Yes, I'll cover the truck, Vic. You close those doors. Wait. Hold that truck. Don't move it. All right. 
All right, come on. Cut that motor and get out of there. Better do as he says, boy. He's got a gun. Looks like I've got a couple of murderers, too. Oh, well, Vic, never mind closing those doors. We'll all be driving out of here together. <laughs> Jock York and his uncle were given a 10-year term for a violation of the Federal Bankruptcy Act in a federal court. They were then turned over to local authorities who tried and convicted them for the murder of George Bedford. And so, because of the timely intervention of your FBI, another crime was solved. Solved because a special agent remembered when he heard that the criminal had crossed the interstate bridge that there was another front street in another community on the other side of the river. In addition to adding to their total number of successfully investigated crimes, your FBI also added to the total value of stolen goods recovered and restored to their rightful legal owners. For that, too, is part of their job. A job so well done that last year the amount of goods recovered and returned ran into millions and millions of dollars. An amount that was a dividend of good law enforcement paid to you, the American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now some more useful facts on Equitable Society Group Insurance. It's a bargain for workers because it enables the company to give its employees the benefit of its wholesale purchasing power. It's a bargain for the management because it builds loyalty and goodwill, decreases personnel turnover, improves quality and quantity of production. For instance, the president of General Oil Sales Corporation, Mr. O.D. Robinson, writes, The tragic loss of 31 of our subsidiary employees in the Texas City disaster emphasized to our company the dollars and cents advantage of operating with group protection. If your company does not have group insurance, or if your group program is incomplete, get in touch immediately with the nearest office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case that dramatically exposes the battle between honest law enforcement officers and a corrupt political machine. Its subject, anti-racketeering. Its title, The Sinister Shakedown. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis, your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The sinister shakedown on This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. If you're a regular listener to this Equitable Society program, you've probably noticed this about the commercial messages. There's no high-pressure selling. Each Equitable Society message is designed to help you, to give you expert advice on home and family security to keep you abreast of the latest development in life insurance. For instance, tonight our Equitable Society message deals with a type of insurance most people know little about. Yet it's important in the lives of one out of three Americans. So, in 14 minutes, listen carefully for interesting information on group insurance 
from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Tonight's FBI file, The Gullible Groom. There has never been a time in the long history of the nation when there was so much money in circulation as there is at the present time. And when you have that situation, it is axiomatic that you will also have a certain proportion of the population trying to get their hands on some of that money illegally. Some criminals will take a gun and stalk the highways, robbing stores or gas stations or people in parked automobiles. Others will break into homes, steal whatever is available, and convert the loot into money through the use of a fence. But there is one special brand of criminal to whom these days are the days of milk and honey, to whom prosperity presents a personal challenge. He stalks his prey carefully and makes elaborate plans to separate the victim from his wealth. But this criminal does not use force. He uses cunning. He is the confidence man. The night's file opens in a football stadium in a small college town. The game is in progress. It is midway in the second quarter. The two teams are lined up on the midfield stripe. The ball is snapped. Both lines lunge, pile up. Suddenly, out of a pack, a player carrying the ball seems streaking down the sideline. Is it the 35? The 30? The 25? The 20? The 15? The 10? The 5? He's over for a touchdown! so stupid. It's terrific. For sake, I've never seen a game before. I thought you told me you used to go to games every week back home. Well, I always went with Stella, so I never looked. Not with either head? Huh? Oh, nothing, honey. Just be quiet for a minute. I want to watch this conversion. What's that? They kick for the extra point after touchdown. Oh. There it goes! Yes, sir. Well, what happens now? State college kicks off. And they start all over again? That's right. That's silly. Hey, here comes Walter. Where? Coming down the aisle. To see us? Oh, I guess so. Walter! Walter, over here! Okay, okay. Excuse me, please. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, please. Excuse me. Well, hiya, girls. Hello, Walter. Hi. Well, how are you enjoying the game? Never mind that. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. Who's the man you're with? Oh, well, he's the sucker I'm building up. His name is Herbert Franklin. Has he got money? Oh, loaded with it. Where'd you meet him? Hey, I told you this morning I met him last night at a bar. He thinks I'm an old grad, too. Is that why you're carrying that pennant? Oh, yes, Faye, yes. It's also the reason why I'm wearing this feather, this badge, this school tie, and this horse throat. They're lining up for the kickoff. You better go back. Yeah, okay, okay. When do we go to work? I'll be with Franklin in the cocktail lounge at the hotel at 8 o'clock tonight. We'll be there. <laughs> You've got a magnificent voice. The best voice in this whole saloon. Well, Walter, I, I love to sing, but I, I don't get much chance. Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't tell me that. To sing as gloriously as you do, a man has to get plenty of practice. No, no. No, really, Walter. I never get a chance to sing when I'm home. Emma doesn't like noise. Emma? Didn't I show you her picture? Oh, no. Well, wait, wait. Here it is. Here, that, that's Emma and the kid. Oh, hey, fine-looking woman. Yes, she is. And those husky youngsters. Why, why they're going to be football players. I certainly hope so. Oh, pardon me. Yes? Uh, aren't you Herbert Franklin? Why, why yes. Well, don't you remember me? Well, I, I, 
I remember your face, but I... Oh, we met in New York when you were there last April. My name is Grace Carter. Well, I was in New York last April, but I... Uh, Herbert, still... Herbert, what's wrong with you, man? Where is your old state spirit? Invite the ladies to sit down. Oh, yeah. Please pardon me. Will you join us? Oh, surely. Uh, Mr. Franklin, this is my friend, Faye Madison. I'm pleased to meet you, Miss Madison. How do you do? Uh, Miss Carter, Miss Madison, my old chum and classmate, Mr. Roberts. Well, how do you do? How do you do? It's always nice to meet any of Herbert's friends. Uh, sit down, sit down, won't you? Oh, thank you. Hey, waiter, waiter, bottle of wine, please. Oh, well, I just love wine. Do you, Mr. Franklin? Well, uh, yes. Bubbly wine? Yes. In big bottles? Yes. Oh, Mr. Franklin, we have so much in common. <laughs> <laughs> Say, Herbert. Herbert, let's sing the girls our old school song. Say, huh? that's a good idea. Yeah, come on, come on, everybody sing. Well, you start. Go ahead. All right. <clears throat> Royal sons of old state, you, you are always right. So, on you go, on down the field. Fight, fight, fight. fight. Who's there? It's me, Walter. Oh. Oh, Walter. Wait a minute, Walter. Good morning, Walter. Good morning. Come on in. Well, how do you feel, Herbert? Awful. Just awful. Well, then you'd better sit down, Herbert. I... I have some upsetting news for you. What is it? How much do you remember about last night? Not too much. Yeah, I was afraid of that. What do you mean? Herbert, you're in trouble. What kind of trouble? Well, last night when we were celebrating our victory, we, we met two young ladies. I remember that. And you remember that we bought them a couple of bottles of wine downstairs in the lounge. I remember that perfectly. We sang some songs. That's right. Then you insisted on leaving here and going over to Pete's Tavern. I used to go there when I was a student. Yeah, I know, I know. So we went there and we had some more wine. Then about 10.30, you and the girl called Faye got up and said you were going someplace with her and that you'd meet us later. Did you let me go? Oh, sure, sure. You look sober to me. Well, in a couple of hours, Herb, you, you came back. The two of you were giggling like school kids, and you told Grace and me you had gotten married. What? Well, that's what you said. Oh, oh at the time, I just laughed it off. Well, right, it was a joke. Yeah, that's what I thought. But this morning I got to worrying about it, and I checked with the Justice of the Peace you mentioned and the town hall. Well? I'm sorry to tell you this, Herbert, but you really did get married last night. I couldn't have. Oh, believe me, you did. Oh, heaven, Walter. What am I going to do? Well, I've been thinking about that, Herbert. Maybe, maybe there's some way of buying people off. Let me investigate, and, and you wait right here until you hear from me. Meanwhile, in a nearby city in the FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated with his fellow agent Carl Putnam discussing a new case to which they have both been assigned. I'm sorry I had to call you away from the family on a Sunday, Carl, but the boss wanted you to work with me on this. That's all right, Jim. What's it about? Well, I don't know whether you remember a circular some time ago about a trio of swindlers, two women and a man. No, I don't. Who are they? Well, the names are Grace Carter, Faye Madison, and Walter Robertson. I see. What's a swindle? Well, in the past, we've wanted them because Robertson was marrying these girls off to servicemen and then taking their allotment checks. Well, that must have been some time ago, Jim. Yes, it was. That racket stopped with VJ Day. But then, two months ago, the same trio changed their pattern. Oh? What did they switch to? An old racket. They found a wealthy married man, took him out, got him drunk, and then in the morning they told him that he had married one of the girls. What's their angle? Well, the married man naturally can't afford to have that become known, so Robertson acts as a go-between and buys off the girl. Robertson also acts as if he doesn't know the girl. And somebody actually fell for that swindle? A man named Stewart in New Orleans just two months ago. Well, if it worked, how did we find out about it? Well, after thinking it over, Stewart decided that he'd been clipped, so he came into the New Orleans office. They sent out the circular on it. But you said all this happened two months ago. What's the rush now? Well, New Orleans got a tip that they hid out down there and just headed up this way last week. Oh, I see. Well, what's the first step, Jim? I've already taken care of it, Carl. The police have been alerted, and they're checking all hotels and rooming houses in the city. Uh, look, while we're waiting for them to call back, why don't you take the records on this trio and study them, huh? Okay. I'll check with you as soon as I hear from the police. <laughs> Where's, uh, where's Faye? Down having breakfast. 
Well, how do you feel? Awful. Have you seen Franklin? <laughs> uh, yeah, I just came from their dreamboat, and there's good news tonight. He paid off? Please, Tempo. I haven't asked him for any money yet. Why not? I told him I was coming over to see Faye to find out whether I could make a deal for him. Did he remember anything about last night? <laughs> remember anything? <laughs> From the amount of stuff you put in his last drink, it's a wonder he even woke up. I had to do something the way you were going. What do you mean? You got that wine in you and almost killed the whole deal. How? You told Franklin that he shouldn't marry Faye, that he was too good for her. I don't believe you. Look, you got plastered and you pulled the same thing in Pittsburgh, remember? I in Shut Pittsburgh. up! When are you going back to see that guy? I told him I'd return in half an hour. How much are you asking him for? Ten thousand. That's too much. But he's loaded with dough. That means nothing. I cased the guy last night. For ten G's, he'd rather be a bigamist. But, Grace, I... Ask him for five. He'll go for that much. And when you collect, bring the dough right back here to Mama. Carl, I located Robertson and his female accomplices. Good work, Jim. No, not too good. They were at the Central Hotel, but they've checked out. I see. I don't suppose they left any forwarding address. No, none at all. Did you check with the local hotel accounting department? Yes, most of the charges on their bill were from the cocktail lounge. I'm looking for a sucker, I suppose. I don't think so, Carl. I learned that he spent most of his time there with the piano player. An entertainer? Yes, I spoke to him. He told me that Robertson had staked him pretty well to teach him the state university songs. What would he want to know those for? I think I found the answer in this morning's paper. Oh, what is it? There's a story on the sports page about state winning its homecoming game, 7-6. You think Robertson was there? I'm sure he was, and probably as an old grad. We'd better alert the police up there at once. Come in. Hello, Herbert. Hello, Walter. Well, are you feeling any better, old-timer? Frankly, no. <laughs> well, I got some news that should cheer you up. It's about your marriage. Oh, yeah. I've been doing lots of running around trying to fix up things, you know. My first stop was to see the Justice of the Peace, the one who married you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I had to do a big sales job on him, and he finally agreed to do business for $500. What do you mean, business? Well, you know, forget that he ever married you. Oh. Yeah, then, then I went to see the man at the town hall who issued the license, and for another $500, he'll forget all about the license. Walter, I'm sorry you went to all that trouble. Ha <laughs> ha, it's no trouble at all. We're old schoolmates, aren't we? I did it for good old state. I know, and I appreciate it, but... But what? I wish you hadn't done it. Oh, <laughs> why not? Well, since you told me all about what happened, I've been sitting here thinking. Yeah? Mostly, I was thinking about Faye. What a... <sighs> what a pretty girl she is. Herb, what's your point? Well, I've decided that I want to stay married to her. Uh, you... You what? I want to stay married to Faye. But, but, but you can't. Why not? Well, uh, that, that's obvious, isn't it? Well, what are you talking about? Emma and the kids. You showed me their picture, remember? You'd be arrested for bigamy. But, Walter, they're not my children. They're Emma's children. I just helped to raise them. What about Emma? Well, she'll be mad, I suppose. But she'll get over it. Get over it? Your wife will get over it? Wife? Emma's my sister. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Now, a 50-second interview on group insurance with a man from Boston. Pat, what are you going to name the new baby girl of yours, eh? Mary Ellen Ryan, Mr. Keating, after her mother. But we really ought to name her Equitable Ryan. Equitable Ryan? <laughs> yes, sir. Our company has complete group insurance with the Equitable Society. And my group insurance is going to pay all the bills for Mary Ellen. Hospitals and doctor bills both? That's right. Before we had complete group insurance, my first two kids each put me in debt. But this time, we own our baby free and clear. Yes, group insurance with the Equitable Society is a mighty good thing for you, Pat. And it's just as good for your company. For three good reasons. First, it means satisfied, loyal workers. Yep. Think of getting life insurance, accident and sickness insurance, and retirement income, plus hospital, surgical, and medical benefits, 
all in one package from the Equitable Society without any medical examination. Second, group insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society decreases labor turnovers. Mm -hmm. Right. A fellow thinks twice before he walks out on a job which gives him extra insurance coverage at, for lower cost and he could buy it as an individual. Third, Equitable Society group insurance improves quality and quantity of production. Believe me, I do better work now that I've got rid of worries about sickness and accidents and my wife and kids' future. Pat, I hope every employer in this radio audience hears what you've said and is resolving now to get the facts on complete group insurance protection from the nearest office of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or write direct to the New York Home Office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Gullible Groom. There is no telling with any degree of accuracy how much money confidence men have cost the American people in the past year. But despite the absence of any official records, it is safe to say that the amount runs into millions. And yet, as illustrated by tonight's case from the files of your FBI, there is no reason why these swindlers should be as successful as they are. There is one weapon at your disposal with which they can be stopped. And this goes for any swindler. That weapon and your FBI ask you to use it whenever you're approached with any kind of a proposition by anyone who is at all a stranger to you. That weapon with which every one of you is armed is common sense. The night file continues in a hotel room in the college town. Walter Robertson has just finished explaining his failure to his two female accomplices. So that's what happened. Instead of being his wife, this Emma he kept talking about is his sister. That's just great. Now, look, don't start hopping on me. It's bad enough as it is. Walter. What is it, Faye? I don't understand how he could be married to his sister. That's bigamy. Oh, honey, honey, just keep out of this, will you? What made you think this Emma was his wife? He showed me a picture, said it was Emma and his kids. Walter, if he's not married, he couldn't have kids. I know, Faye, I know. That's bigamy, too. Now, please shut up and let me figure a way out of this. You shut up, too. I'll do the figuring from now on. What am I, stupid? Now that you brought it up? Yes. Uh... You've run this show long enough. It's my turn now. Okay, Mrs. Genius. Now listen to me, both of you. Faith, this Franklin guy wants to stay married to you. Okay, let him have his way. But, Grace, we're not married. How can we stay married if we're not married in the first place? I know you're not married. But go along with the game. He wants to take Faye back to Aurora with him. When? On the train in a half an hour. You can make it. You're all packed. Sure, I'm packed. But don't I have anything to say about this? Who wants to live in Aurora? Faye, you go with him. The whole trip only takes two hours. Walter and I'll be on the same train, and we'll see you in Aurora. <laughs> Jim. Oh, hello, Carl. I've checked the other two hotels. Robertson didn't... Robertson register. stayed here, Carl, but he checked out by the time the police made their call. I see. Any idea where he went? To a town called Aurora. That's about two hours from here. It's also across the state line. Yes, I know. How did you find out they went there? The transportation desk got two tickets for Robertson on the two o'clock train. He's there by now. Should be. I've already alerted the Aurora police to check all the hotels and rooming houses every hour. You think there's anything else to do here before we go to Aurora? Yes. Now, look, Robertson must have gone to Aurora to follow a victim. That's logical. It isn't the kind of a town he'd pick to live in. All right, that's point one. Point two is the victim must be an old grad who was back here for the homecoming game. Right. Point three is that the old grad must be married because that's Robertson's pattern. How does knowing all that help us? I'm going over to the alumni office and get a list of the married alumni who live in Aurora. Well, I hope you find somebody at the office. It's Sunday, you know. Oh, I've already gotten the alumni associate secretary on the phone. He's going to meet me at his office in ten minutes. Good. Now, what do you want me to do? Well, look, Robertson's room hasn't been cleaned since he checked out. The manager will give you a pass key. So, Carl, why don't you go up there and see if you can find it? Okay, well, I'll meet you. When you're finished, come over to the alumni office. I'll wait for you there. Are you sure this is a place you told Faye to meet us? Certainly, I'm sure. How many cocktail bars do you think there are in this town? I don't know, and I don't care. Oh, there she is. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello, Faye. How was the trip? Oh, it was just fine. We had lunch on the train, and he bought me some magazines with pictures in them and some candy. Oh, never mind that. 
What kind of a joint does he live in? Well, it looks like one of those castles in fairy tales. I never saw a place so big in my whole life. <laughs> I knew the guy was loaded. He hasn't paid off yet. But you've got a way to make him pay off, remember? That's right. And here it is. You're going to call Herbert in a couple of minutes and tell him we just got into town. Tell him you've got to see him. Why? Tell him you spoke to the Justice of Peace and the guy in the town hall again. And that they're going to give the whole story about the marriage and the attempted bribery to the papers. Implicating Herbert in the bribe, too? Right. Then you tell him that they're both waiting for a call from you. And that for 5000 you can chill the beef. Whoa. <laughs> Not bad. Thanks. Faye, he'll undoubtedly talk to you about this. You advise him to pay. Then we come over and pick up the 5000 Grace. What? I don't want to do it. Huh? huh? I, I don't want to do that. Herbert's been very nice to me, and I'd like to stay married to him. Listen, lame brain. You forget you're not married to this guy. He only thinks you are. Oh, that's right. Look, you just go back home and keep Herbert there till he gets our phone call. <laughs> Alumni Association's office? Carl. Carl, I'm in here. Oh, fine. Had any luck yet, Jim? I spoke to the police at Aurora a couple of times since I saw you. What did they say? They've checked every hotel and rooming house twice now, and still no sign of any of the trio. I don't understand that. No. The transportation desk at that hotel said definitely that Robertson bought tickets to Aurora. Yeah, so they did. You know, he might be staying at the home of the victim. I never thought of that. How about the alumni records? Well, I've come up with 45 alumni who live in Aurora who are married. That's not too many. We ought to be able to comb through them in time to stop Robertson. Carl, I'm afraid we've made a mistake someplace along the line. Why? I phoned the list of the police in Aurora and had them contact every one of the names. And none of them was the right one? None of them had ever even heard of Robertson or the girls. Well, how do you figure that, Jim? Well, we must have made a mistake. What do we do now? We retrace our steps and see where we went wrong. Well, where do you want to start? Uh, look, before we do that, let's go over your stuff. Now, what did you find in Robertson's room? Well, nothing very much, I'm afraid. This football program, for one thing. Any writing on any of the pages? No, I checked through every inch of space. Okay, what else? This red feather that I suppose Robertson wore in his hat yesterday. No, that's no help. And this banner that he probably waved as he sang the state alma mater. Mm, with tears in his eyes. Yeah. And then in the waste paper basket, there was this ticket stub. I guess that's where he sat for the game. Let me see that, huh? Yeah. There's a red A printed on it. That means it was in the alumni section. And that also means that that ticket was sold to an alumnus through this office. But Robertson's no alumnus. How did he get this kind of a ticket? I don't know, but I think we can find out. Come on. I hope Faye kept Franklin at home. Of course she did. She's not that stupid. Don't underestimate that girl. Well, hello there, Herbert. Oh, hello, Walter. You uh, remember Miss Carter, don't you? Oh, yes, of course. Hello, Miss Carter. Hello, Herbert. Okay, come in, both of you. Well, thanks, thanks. Go ahead, honey. Who's that, Herbert? It's Grace and Walter. Oh, hello there. <laughs> it's been such a long time since I've seen you. Uh, Herbert, I want you to know how awful we feel about this shakedown you're getting. Oh. Thank you. Have uh, <clears throat> have you got the money, Herbert? Yes, yes, I have it right here. Good, good. I certainly appreciate your taking care of this for me. <laughs> Think nothing of it, old man. Are there any other steps I should take? Oh, no, 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 no. I'll handle the whole thing so that no one will know about the marriage until you get ready to announce it yourself. Oh, Thank you. Uh, Herbert, I think Faye had better come back to town with us, just uh, so nobody sees her around here and starts to talk. Well, uh, that's probably a good idea. Faye, uh, I'm sorry that you have to start your married life off this way. Oh, that's all right, Herbert. This isn't the first... Uh, we'd better be going. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, go ahead, honey. You run along with them. I'll talk to you in the morning. All right, dear. Well, come along, girls. Good night, Herbert. Step back, Robertson. Oh, what? I said step back in there. You and the girls, too. What is this? Yeah. Looks like we arrived here just at the right time. Who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. Are you Mr. Franklin? Yes. Why are you here? To arrest this trio of swindlers. Wait, Faye's not a swindler. She's my wife. Mr. Franklin, that makes you a member of a very large club. However, I seriously doubt that you are married. We can check that, though, when these people are booked in jail. <laughs> Walter 
Robertson was tried in federal court and was sentenced to serve five years in prison in violation of the National Stolen Property Act. His two female accomplices were also convicted and sentenced to terms of 18 months. And so your FBI captured three criminals for whom it had been searching a long time and captured them because of one single slim clue. That clue was the stub of the football ticket found in the hotel room. Alumni Association records showed that the ticket had been sold to Herbert Franklin, and it was at his home that the arrests were made. Thus, once again, your FBI showed that one way to help curb the crime wave is to follow every clue, however meager it appears, to its conclusion. That is a part of the training given to every special agent before he becomes an accredited member of the agency which serves every one of the 140 million Americans from coast to coast. Your national law enforcement agency, your FBI. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now some more useful facts on Equitable Society Group Insurance. It enables the company to give its employees the benefit of its wholesale purchasing power. It builds loyalty and goodwill, decreases personnel turnover, improves quality and quantity of production. For instance, the president of General Tire and Rubber Company, Mr. William O'Neill, says, We believe that group protection has made our employees happier by freeing them from some of the major worries of life and has thereby helped to improve the morale of our organization. This protection is one of the strongest ties that a man and his family can have with the company that employs him, and it comes to him on such easy terms. If your company does not have group insurance, or if your group program is incomplete, get in touch immediately with the nearest office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case in the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case that dramatizes the pursuit of an innocent fugitive by a relentless killer. Its subject, Mob Vengeance. It's titled, The Runaway Dancer. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis, your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Runaway Dancer on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service... by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States... and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Now let me read a telegram to the Equitable Life Assurance Society from St. Louis. I quote, Dear Equitable, at discussion group meeting last Wednesday, your Equitable Society commercials were voted best on the air. No high-pressure selling, lots of facts and helpful information. Keep it up. Well, we are. Tonight's Equitable Society commercial will deal with a type of insurance that's important in the lives of one out of every three Americans. Yet most of you people who have it know almost nothing about it. So listen carefully in just 14 minutes to a message on group insurance from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Tonight's FBI file, The Runaway Dancer.
Your FBI makes periodic studies of the field of crime in an effort to be better prepared to apprehend every criminal possible. And from each of those studies, certain facts are deduced. One of those facts is that there are no two criminals exactly alike, even as there are no two decent law-abiding citizens who are exactly alike. Yet there is at least one common characteristic among all criminals who commit crimes as a business, who try to make their living by stealing, lying, cheating, or killing. That common denominator is brutality. Brutality born of the constant effort to take what rightfully belongs to someone else. Brutality which has always accompanied every evidence of the lust that helps make some men criminals. The consuming lust for power. The night's file opens in a shabby second floor dance hall located in a large western city. It is early evening. One of the hostesses is seated at the corner of the table as another hostess approaches. Hi, Sally. Oh, hello, Peg. Oh, if I sit here a minute. Oh, my feet are chilling me. Oh, that's a shame. How many tickets you got so far, kid? Three. Oh. Look, honey, do you mind if I tell you something? No. You're brand new here, and I've been at this thing a long time. Oh, I feel entitled to give you a little advice. I wish you would. Honey, you don't spell enough. Spell? Yeah. Laugh, talk, turn it on. But, Peg, I try. Sweetheart, nothing comes out. Well, what do you suggest I do? I mean... What should I laugh and talk about? You talk about him. That's all the guys are ever interested in. Oh, you butter him up, you laugh at his jokes, and you don't look so sad. You just got to remember, there'll always be nights like this. <laughs> well, I... And you wait. Here comes a guy now. Turn on the charm and you nail him. No, no, you dance with him, Ah, uh, none of that. Stand up there and let me see you go to work. Come on, come on, get up. Well, I... I... Go on, talk to him. Uh, hello there. You want to dance? Oh, sure. Now, here's a ticket to one. Excuse me, Peg. By all means. My, but you're an awfully good dancer. Uh-huh. <laughs> you just seem to have so much rhythm, don't you? Yeah. Uh, uh, do you come up here often? I certainly hope so. You, you just dance so wonderfully. There's another I'm... way out of here. Huh? Is there any way to get out besides from them front steps? Oh, yes, the fire escape. Where is it? Right behind those curtains in the back. Now we'll dance over there. Why? Please, just do as I say. You, you want to leave? That's right. But we just started dancing. Well, I... just let me... What? You're hurt. It's nothing. Your, your shoulder is bleeding. Is this where the door is? Yes, but I... I... Take the rest of my tickets. Just let me go out. And do me a favor, will you? Forget you ever saw me. Wait. Huh? That shoulder, I I can't let you. Look, I'm coming with you. The following morning in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just greeting his fellow agent, Pat Walsh. Hello, Pat. Welcome back. Oh, thanks, Jim. How was the vacation? Great. Well, go ahead. Oh, you've been in to see the boss, can Yes, that's what I'm doing here. He wants me to work with you. Fine. Fine, I can use the help. Well, what's the story? A bank job. Four men held up the Travers National. Well, how'd they work? Well, one man went into the bank and did the actual job. Two others stood guard outside, and the fourth man stayed in the car. Any identification? Tell her that the bank saw the one who did the actual stick-up. No mask? Oh, yes. He had a handkerchief over his face. They got a coughing spell, and it slipped. Tell her downstairs now, going over our file of pictures. Any uh, dent on the others? No. You know, there's one thing about this holdup that puzzles me, though. Oh, what's that? Well, the bank is on a corner. The getaway car was parked right in front of it on Main Street. Yes. Now, when the bandit ran out of the bank, he didn't make for the car. Instead, he turned the corner onto 3rd Avenue and ran into the railroad station. Well, what happened then? According to a few of the eyewitnesses, one of the men in the gang ran after him, but he got away. The other two drove off in the car. That is odd. Did anybody think to get the license number of the car they used? Yes. Yes, the car turned up abandoned this morning. How much did they get? 18000 Excuse me. Special Agent Taylor. Yes, Jack. He did? Bell, Marla. Yeah, fine. Thanks very much. That was the ident section. Teller just definitely identified a thief named Bellman as the man who did the job. Well, that's a break. They're sending us up Belmont's record. 
As soon as it gets here, we go to work. Feel any better? Who are you? Sally. Sally? Oh, the girl from the dance room. Yes, that's right. Where am I? <laughs> well, this is my place. I brought you here last night. My shoulder. I, I bathed it and I put a bandage on. He made me promise not to call a doctor. Did you call one? No. Oh, thanks. Well, can you eat something? No. Not just yet. I've got to be getting to work soon. What time is it? Almost six. At night? Yes. Not really, but I... Hey, wait a minute. What do you knock yourself out for? What do you mean? Bringing me here. You needed help. I can't pay you nothing. I didn't expect nothing. I'm sorry. I... I know what it is to, to be alone and need somebody to help you. I suppose you've been wondering what this is all about. Why I got shot. I didn't ask you, did I? No. And there's some guys who want to get their hands on me. Gangsters? I guess you'd call them that. Well, why don't you call the police? I can't. Why not? They'd help you. I'll explain some other time. You'd better get some more sleep. Are you leaving? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to work. Uh, Sally. Huh? I'm going to ask you one more favor. Would you call the place I work? I'll give you the number. Tell them I won't be in. Sure, but I... But what? You never told me your name. Oh. It's Belmont. Tell me about that. <laughs> Hi, Jim. Anything happened while I was out? Uh, Bill called. He went out and examined the car that was used in the bank job, but he couldn't find a thing. Oh? Huh? Any news from the police? I uh -huh. How'd you make out? Well, I finally found the hotel where Belmont was living. Was living? Yes, he checked out the morning of the stick -up. One of the bellboys said that he took Belmont's bags down to the railroad station and checked them, but Belmont never came back for the claim checks. Oh, that's funny. I got the claim checks and went down to the station. The bags are still there. Did you go through them? Yes, but there wasn't anything in them that might be a lead. There's some shirts and socks and two old suits. Hmm, sounds like he intended to come back for the checks, but never got a chance. Yeah, I guess that must be it. He must have just grabbed the train when he ran into the railroad station. But did he have any friends at the hotel? No. No, he was a loner. But the clerk told me he was sick a lot, that he used a house doctor. Did you get to see him? Yes, he told me that Belmont has quite a bad case of tuberculosis. Uh, it would explain that bit of coughing during the stick-up. Yes, it explains that, but it doesn't explain why he didn't use the getaway car. No. Jim? Hmm? I'm convinced of one thing. He ran into that railroad station on purpose. It wasn't just the first safe place. Yeah, I'm inclined to go along with you on that. I've got the switchboard working now on something that might prove you to be right. What's that? The doctor at the hotel told Belmont to go away to a sanitarium up in the mountains. Yeah, any particular one? No, I gave him a list of places I got. No oh, pardon me. Special Agent Taylor. Yes. Oh, yes? Oh, yes. Yes, thanks very much. Now, look, will you will you put a call through the police headquarters up there for me? No. That's fine. Thanks. That was the switchboard, Pat. They were working on that list. They've located Belmont at one of the sanitariums. Good. You hold down the office. I'm going to take a run up there right now. What happened to you last night? Well, oh, I, I went home. And what happened to that tall kid you were dancing with? Who? The tall kid, your last customer. Oh, oh, he, he didn't feel good. He, he needed some fresh air. So you went out the back door with him and down the fire escape. So how do you know? I saw you. Oh. Oh, look, Sally, I don't want to run your life, but be careful. What, what do you mean? That tall kid is red hot. I don't understand, Pig. There was a guy in here last night right after you two left. He was looking for him. Huh? No. A hoodlum. And he's here again tonight. Where? He's walking toward us right now. In the brown suit? Yeah. Hey, what'll I do? You late for anything now, honey. I got some tickets here. 
I want to dance. With me, honey. No, honey. With her. But she's kind of tired. Shut up. Come on, sister. But I... I dance, I said. That's it. My, but you're an awfully good dancer. You, you just seem to have so much rhythm. Stop the routine. Where's Tommy Dolman? Who? The guy you took out of here the back way last night. I don't know what you're talking about. You took him out of here. He didn't go home, so he must have gone to your place. Where do you live? That's none of your business. Look, you'd better answer me. I don't have to. I don't have to dance with you either. Find yourself another girl. <laughs> Is that you, Sally? Yes, sir. Ain't this pretty early for you to be home? Yes. You didn't get fired on account of me, did you? No, Tommy, no. I came home because... because you're in trouble. Well, what do you mean? A man came up to the dance hall. He was looking for you. What was his name? I don't know. He danced with me and he asked me where you were. What did you tell him? I said I didn't know. Oh, what did he look like? He's short with his black hair and a mustache. And a scar on his right cheek? Yes, that's right. Marty Stokes. The guy who shot me. Well, what does he want? Nothing. I don't want to get you in trouble. I, I gotta get out of here. Look, you can't get out of bed. You're too weak. Tommy. What? Please let me call the police. No. But he'll kill you. I know he will. Let me take care of myself. They shot you once, they'll kill you the next time. Please, Tommy. Honey, there's an awful good reason why I can't. But you, you... look. I, I got a brother. He's older than me. His name's Frank. He's been in trouble ever since I can remember. Trouble? With the cops. Last week, three of his gang held up a bank. What? Yeah, they held up a bank. Frank found out the other three guys were going to double-cross him, so he beat them to it and ran away with the loot. Were you mixed up in it? No. They came to my house and talked to my landlady. She told him I'd gotten a phone call from my brother. Well, how did she know? The phone's in the hall, she answered. These guys want to know where Frank went with the money. I'm not going to tell him. Tommy, I think it's swear you that night to your brother, but if it means getting killed, I... Sally, I... Frank is sick. So sick, he's only got about six months to live. That's why I can't go to the cops. I have to tell him where he is. I don't want him to spend his last few months in any prison. I understand. Tommy, what are you going to do? Well, one thing I got to do for sure... To get out of here. But you're safe here. You don't know that mob. They'll find out where you live. We've already oh. found out, Tommy. Marty. How did you get here? I followed you. Now get out of my way, sister. <laughs> okay, Tommy. Start talking. <laughs> Turn in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Now, a 50 second interview on group insurance with a man in his 60s who's just about to have himself a vacation in Florida. Andy, how soon do you expect to get back to work? I'm never coming back to work, Mr. Keating. This vacation is going to last for the rest of my life. Well, you must have saved a lot of money to be able to retire these days. <laughs> we saved what we could. But what really fixed things up for my wife and me was my company's complete group insurance with the Equitable Society. That included a pension plan, too? That's right. Every month, as long as I live, the postman's going to hand me a check from the Equitable Society. Yes, group insurance with the Equitable Society was a mighty good thing for you, Andy, and it's just as good for your company. For three good reasons. First, it means satisfied, loyal workers. Yep. Think of getting life insurance, accident and sickness insurance, and retirement income, plus hospital, surgical, and medical benefits, all in one package from the Equitable Society without any medical examination. Second, group insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society decreases labor turnover. Right. A fellow thinks twice before he walks out on a job which gives him extra insurance coverage at far lower cost than he could buy it as an individual. Third, Equitable Society group insurance improves quality and quantity of production. Believe me, a man does better work when he's rid of all those worries about sickness and accidents and his wife and kids' future. Andy, I hope every employer in this radio audience hears what you've said and that every one of them is resolving now to get the facts on complete group insurance protection from an equitable society expert. 
Get in touch with the nearest office of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or write direct to the New York home office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Runaway Dancer. Occasionally, there are extenuating circumstances which tempt a decent, right-thinking citizen either to consort with criminals or to shield a criminal by hiding something from the police. When that happens, as in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, that citizen thinks he is doing the right thing by following the dictates of his conscience. But in every case, and there are no exceptions, he is not only doing the wrong thing, but he is endangering himself. If a situation should ever arise in your life where you have some information which would help to solve a crime, even though it compromises someone near to you, there is only one step you can take, only one thing you can do which will be to your ultimate advantage. Call your local police. Tonight's file continues in the FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor has just returned from a visit to the sanitarium and is relaying his information to his fellow agent, Pat Walsh. Jim, did you find Belmont? Yes. Oh, where is he? He's still at the sanitarium under protective custody. I see. What did you get from him? He admitted taking part in the stick-up. I brought back his written confession. It's in on the boss's desk now. How much did he tell you? Everything. Including the names of his accomplices? Yes, he named the three others who worked on the job with him. I sent out alarms on all three. Isn't it kind of odd that Belmont talked so freely, Jim? He had a reason for talking. Well, what's that? He says that he found out the gang was going to double-cross him. So he decided to double-cross them instead and run away with the loot. Uh This morning, he just received word that the other three hoodlums are gunning for his kid brother and may kill him if he doesn't tell them where he's hiding. Well, that might be the truth, and then again, it might not. I think it might be for one reason, Pat. Belmont still has that money someplace, and he offered to make us a deal. What kind of a deal? Well, we've got him, but we haven't got the money. He says that if we capture the other three and in that way remove his kid brother from any danger, he'll turn in the money. So our job now is to find the other three Confederates and Belmont's brother. That's it. And if Belmont's story is true, we'd better hurry. Tommy. What is it? You know I'm a nice fella. I don't like to hurt nobody. But I may have to start if you don't open up soon and tell me where your brother is. He has been telling you. He doesn't know. You keep out of this. He's right. I don't know where Frank is. Okay, kid. Let's forget about where he is. Make believe I'm not interested. We'll change the subject. Okay? Fine. Suppose you just tell me where he stashed the dough. I don't know that either. Look, Tommy. Believe me, if it was just me... I'd walk out of here and forget the whole thing. Then why don't you? What would I tell my partners? That I came here, you told me a story, that I was a big slob and said forget it. They wouldn't understand, kid. No? No. So why don't you make it easy for both of us? Tell me where we can find Frank, or the dough, and let me get out of here. The hundredth time, I don't know. Look, kid, I never belted anybody who was laying in bed. Don't make me break my record. You leave him alone. You hear what I'm saying, Tommy? I hear you. This is your last chance. Where's your brother? I don't know. Okay. I guess you gotta get the full treatment. Jim, we just got a phone call from police headquarters. On that alarm we sent out? Yes, they pulled a surprise raid and arrested two of the three men who worked with Belmont. Good. Now, which one is missing? Marty Stokes. Stokes, I know him. He's a killer. How about you? Do you have any luck? Yes, when I left here, I went up to the rooming house where Tommy Belmont lived. Mm-hmm. Anybody home? I spoke to his landlady. She told me Tommy hadn't been home last night at all. Well, sounds like Frank's story might be true. Exactly. Did you know where he works? Yes, in a garage on 11th Street. I went over there. Any luck? Well, I spoke to the garage manager. He said that he received a phone call earlier tonight about Tommy. Who called? What did he say? It was a she. She said that Tommy was sick and he wouldn't be into work. 
Well, did he get her name? Just a first name. It was Sally. Well, that's not much help. No, but the manager remembered that she said she worked at the Rainbow Ballroom. On Main Street? Yes, that's the place. I called them. They have a hostess named Sally, but she wasn't there. Pat, I think we should go over to the Rainbow Ballroom. <laughs> Pardon me, are you Miss Peg Jackson? Yeah. We're special agents of the FBI. Here are my credentials. What do you want? We'd like to ask you a few questions about your girlfriend, Sally Adams. What about Sally? What's happened to her? Nothing, we hope. No riddles, mister. Well, from what the manager says, Miss Adams just came to work here last week. That's right. And he says that because you girls get paid on the 1st and the 15th of the month, well, he still hasn't gotten her address. Well? Uh, Miss Jackson, since you seem to be the only friend she had up here, we thought that you might know her address. You came to the wrong store, Mr. Taylor. I don't turn in my friends. We don't want to arrest Miss Adams, but she might be in very serious danger. We'd like to help her. Are you leveling? We have absolutely no reason to want to arrest Miss Adams. You can take our word for that. Okay. What do you want to know? Where does she live? I don't know. I went there last Thursday night with her after work, but we went in the cab and we were talking all the way. You know the way it is. You don't pay much attention. Yes, I understand. Do you remember anything about the house? Mm, yeah, it was number 333. But I don't know what street it was on because there was so much excitement. Oh, about what? There was a big fire right across the street. Miss Jackson, can you remember what kind of building was on fire? I think it was a store. Why? We may be able to check the fire department records and see what fires they covered on Thursday night. Oh, I see. Miss Jackson, did you take the cab to Miss Adams' home from here in front of the dance hall? Yeah, we did. Now, this is very important. Do you remember how much the cab fare was? Um, let's see. I paid it. Uh, the meter read 60 cents. Well, that means it's less than two miles from here. Pat, let's get a map of the city and check with the fire department on what fires they covered within a radius of two miles of here last Thursday night. Okay, Jim. A fire across the street from a building numbered 333 ought to give us Sally Adams' address. <laughs> Tommy. Tommy. All right, break it up, break it up. <laughs> Get away from the guy. Time I went back to work. No, you can't hit him anymore. He's unconscious now. I just want to bring him to... No! Shh! Look. I told you before about that screaming. If anybody comes in here, your boyfriend never gets off that bed. Now, get away. Don't hit him anymore, please. I ain't gonna hit him. I give you my word. All right, Tommy. Come around. Come on. Is that water in that glass? Yes. Give me. Here. All right, Tommy. What? Come on. What? What? That's it. What is it? Can you hear me? Yeah. Look, I ain't working out on any more, kid. Do you hear that? Yeah. I got a better way to get my information. I'm using your girlfriend here. Huh? Yeah. Let me lift you up a minute. <clears throat> there. I want you to have a ringside seat for the main attraction. Leave her alone, Marty. Come here, sweetheart. No, let go of me. Now watch this, Tommy. Oh, wait, you... And this will keep up till you decide to do business. You want her to take any more? Taking enough, Stark. Uh, who are you? From the FBI. Oh. Uh, Jim, he's taking a break. Oh, no, he isn't. Well, thanks, Stokes. Thanks for trying to get away. Mister, you're, you're not going to arrest Tommy. Oh, no, Miss Adams. You take care of Tommy. We'll take care of Stokes. Marty Stokes was given a 25-year sentence in federal prison for bank robbery. The other members of his gang were sentenced to 15 years each for their part in the crime. And thus, by careful deduction and painstaking investigation, your FBI was able not only to round up the four criminals who wantonly robbed a bank, but also to save two young innocent people from further sadistic torture meted out by a brutal thug. In this case, as in so many others, time was an all-important factor. And for that reason, the special agents assigned to this case worked through the night. 
criminals have no office hours. And as many of them have learned to their regret, neither does your FBI. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, some more useful facts on Equitable Society Group Insurance. It's a bargain for workers because it enables the company to give its employees the benefit of its wholesale purchasing power. It's a bargain for the management because it builds loyalty and goodwill, decreases personnel turnover, improves quality and quantity of production. For almost 20 years, we have provided our employees with group life, health, and accident insurance writes Mr. J.W. Glenn, president of R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. And we consider that this insurance, one of our many benefit plans, contributes greatly to the morale and security of our employees. If your company does not have group insurance, or if your group program is incomplete, get in touch immediately with the nearest office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case involving crime on a tropical island. Its subject, jewel theft. Its title, The Flying Felon. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis, your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Flying Felon on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. On tonight's program, it is our pleasure to present Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, who will speak to you from Washington, D.C. We have stated that this program is presented by the Equitable Life Assurance Society as a public service. This applies not only to the program itself, but to the commercials. All Equitable Society messages are designed to be of service to you, to point out ways and means by which you can give greater security to your loved ones, to keep you informed on present-day developments in insurance. For instance, tonight's Equitable Society message is on a type of insurance which touches the lives of 50 million Americans. Yet most of the 50 million know little or nothing about it. So it will pay you in just 14 minutes to listen to the message on group insurance from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Tonight's FBI file, The Indifferent Mother. Every law enforcement agency in the nation is faced with many seemingly eternal problems. And when, as sometimes happens, those problems appear in pairs, then the path to a solution becomes that much more difficult. Juvenile delinquency, always a major problem, has recently become entwined with one of America's most serious crimes, auto theft. In a recent study made by your FBI of the field of crime during the first six months of this year... One figure stood out. That figure was the total value of automobiles stolen during those six months. And that figure was more than $31 million. (laughs) 
The Knight's file opens in an apartment located in one of the residential sections of an eastern city. Alice Roberts, a slim, pretty teenage girl, is just entering her mother's bedroom. Hi, Mom. Hello, Alice. Hey, what are you getting all dressed up for? Are you going out? Yes, please don't bother me now, dear. But, Mama, will you... Alice, stop stammering, dear. What do you want? Well, I... I was just hoping you'd be home tonight to help me with my dress. What dress? My costume. Darling, will you stop talking in riddles? What costume? The costume I'm wearing in the school play tomorrow. Oh. Is that tomorrow? Well, yes. Oh, Mother, don't tell me you're not coming. Why, I'll die. Now, Alice, don't be dramatic. But, Mother... I have a date to go to a matinee tomorrow with Mrs. Williams. But you can always see a matinee. But tomorrow's the only time we're giving the school play. Now, Alice... Mrs. Williams would be very offended if I called at the last minute. But you knew about the school play a month ago. Well, I, I'm sorry, darling. I just forgot about it. Oh, now, don't start that, Alice. Oh, Mother, please listen to me. Why, everybody else's parents will be there. You've got to come. You've just got Alice. to. Now, how do I look? Huh? I asked you, how do I look? Oh, well, you look okay. Oh, thank you, dear. Well, I've got to be going. You'd better let me sleep late in the morning, dear. I'll be home quite late tonight. Oh, good luck tomorrow, darling, with your play. All right, children. Just one more bow. I'll throw that in. All right, children. Come on now. I'll see you at dressing room. You were all excellent. Excellent. Watch the noise, please. Hi, Alice. Oh, hello, Flo. How come you didn't take any bows? I didn't feel like it. Honey, that ain't the reason. You got the same trouble I have. What do you mean? Your mother didn't show up. Mine didn't either. Isn't that it? She didn't even send any flowers. Oh, look, honey, what do you care? Don't you? I don't pay any attention to those things anymore. I'm used to them. But, well, don't you feel funny when your own mother doesn't care enough to show up? Well, it used to bother me, but why ride with it now? My mother lives her life, I live mine. You want to do the same thing. I don't understand, Flo. Well, it's simple. You're a pretty girl, like me. Lots of fellas would like to go out with you. My mother doesn't let me go out. Is she going to be home tonight? No. She's got a date to go someplace to a party. Well, that's fine. Then why don't you come home with me for dinner? I got a date tonight. I'll have him get a friend for you. Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just greeting Ned Hamilton, a policeman attached to the local force. I'll pull up a chair, Ned. Oh, thanks, Jim. Hey, uh, congratulations on winning that pistol shooting contest. You beat some pretty good shots. Oh, thanks. I've got a problem, Jim, that calls for something more than being a good shot. Well, what's your trouble? Do you know how many automobiles are stolen every day in this town? Well, I know it's quite a few. Well, there's a new angle on it now. Oh, what's that? Young kids are stealing some of them. Oh, but that's always happened, Nick. Mm, not this way, Jim. In the old days, any car stolen by a kid would be used for a joyride and then abandoned. Yeah, that's right. These cars are disappearing. Well, I've got a list here of motor and serial numbers on cars that have been stolen and haven't turned up anywhere. Well, then they must be selling them someplace, Ned. But who'd buy a car from a kid? I wish I knew. That's what I came up to see you about. You think there's an FBI violation someplace? Yes. You see, we picked up one of the kids who stole a car. Get anything from him? Not much. He's only 16, but he's got that misguided notion about honor among thieves, so he wouldn't talk. What about his parents, Ned? Have you spoken to them? Mm-hmm. They asked us to keep the kid in jail. A nice attitude. To make the story even nicer, the kid was drunk when he was picked up. How could a kid that age get whiskey in his son? He didn't. He got it out at Aunt Clara's. Aunt Clara? Who's that? Well, she runs a juke joint across the state line. That's why I can't touch her. Oh. But I know that high school kids from all over the town go out there, and the place is one of the biggest contributors to juvenile delinquency that we have. That name, Aunt Clara, is very deceptive. So is she. I'd like to see that place. I, uh, I wish you would, Jim. Just run out and take a look for yourself. Okay, I think I will. Well, where's that list of serial numbers on the stolen cars? Oh, there you are. Thanks. I'll send out an alarm on these at once. Aunt Clara! Hello there, son. Come on over. Huh? 
Hi, Aunt Clara. Hello, Ricky boy. Sit down. Sit down. Thanks. How about a nice big slice of homemade pie? Made with Aunt Clara's own loving hands. I... I ain't hungry, thanks. Well, what's on your mind, Ricky boy? Well, I got a date tonight. That's nice. Anybody I know? Yeah, Flo Duncan. Is that the little blonde you had out here Sunday night? Yeah, that's the one. Say, she's real cute. Yeah, I think so, too. Red! Those kids over in booth four want more beer! Keep your eyes open, boy! Aunt Clara? Yes, sir? I, I kind of got the shorts. I need some cash. About 50. <laughs> That's a nice number. Can I have it? From me? Yeah. Now, Ricky boy, your account is overdrawn. Well, I can't be. You haven't turned in a car in a month. You've given a lot of parties to the thing. But, Aunt Clara, I told you, I got a date. Well, what time is your date? I'm picking Flo up in front of her house at 8.30. Well, it's only 6.30 now. Look, Ricky, why don't you be a smart little boy? You've got two hours. Go into town and steal yourself another car. Jim, I received word at headquarters you wanted to see me. That's right, Ned. We got pretty quick action on that list of stolen cars that you gave us. Oh, what have you got? Well, the Cleveland office made a raid yesterday and broke up a big stolen car ring that was operating out of there. One of the cars they found in the garage was on your list. Well, any idea how they got the car to Cleveland? No, none so far, but the Cleveland office is working on that. And from what they teletyped to us, it's indicated the ring got cars from local agents all over the country. Then they changed the car's numbers and sold it. That's it. Hmm. Oh, Jim, did you get out to Aunt Clara's? Yes, 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 I did. I just looked around, though. The place was teeming with kids and all of them drinking quite heavily. Did you see anything that tied in with the stolen cars? No, no, I didn't. But if this Aunt Clara is tied in with that racket, she's going to be a difficult one to trip up. Yeah, I know. Ned, it'll probably take the Cleveland office a couple of weeks to go through all of the papers they seized when they made that raid. But my suggestion is we keep our eyes open at this end. Okay. As soon as you get word in the next car that's reported stolen, we'll go to work. <laughs> Hi. Hope you weren't waiting long. We didn't finish dinner Who's until... Who's she? Huh? Oh, this is a girlfriend of mine, Alice Roberts. Alice, this is Ricky Hill. Very happy to meet you. Hi. Get in, huh? Okay, you get in first, Alice. Wait a minute. She's coming? Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you. I thought maybe you could get a date for her. Can you, Rick? Well... Oh, look, Flo, I really don't care to force myself. Get to... in. There'll be guys fighting over you before the night's over. <laughs> Going? Out to Aunt Clara's. Oh, swell. Is that the place on the old mill road? Yeah, a very sophisticated place. Flo, does he have to drive this fast? But don't worry about Rick's driving. He's very conservative. Yeah, but... Oh, quit beefing, will you? Sorry. Where'd you dig her up? Oh, we go to school together. We were in the school play. Uh-huh. I have a program of the play right here if you'd like to see it. I'm driving. Well, you might know some of the kids. Rick, girl. do you hear that? Uh-huh. It's a motorcycle, Sarah. Yeah, it's a cop. Well, he's after us, Rick. We're not going to stop. Oh, Rick, don't be foolish. He's bound to catch us. Not when I open this thing up. Oh, oh, make him stop. I can't. This ain't my car. Oh, Rick, whose is it? I don't know. I, I stole it. What? Oh, Rick, he's pulling alongside. You've got to stop. Oh, no, I don't. Oh, Rick. Oh, you, you hit him. How else could I get away? Oh, you can't leave him there. Shut up. We're going to Aunt Clara's. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Now a 50-second interview on group insurance with a man who's recently had a lot of sickness in his family. Isn't that so, Sam? Sure is, Mr. Keating. Within six months, my kids had mumps and measles. Then my wife caught pneumonia... And all the rest of us came down with the flu. Oh, that was tough going, Sam. I'll bet you owe a mint of money to your doctor. No, sir. I don't owe Doc Smalley one red cent. Where I work, we've got complete group insurance with the Equitable Society. And that even covers medical expenses for you and your family? You bet it does. While well, we had 20 visits from Doc Smalley, not counting the times we went to his office. 
The checks from the Equitable Society paid the doc faster than he's ever been paid before. Yes, group insurance with the Equitable Society was a mighty good thing for you, Sam. And it's just as good for your company for three good reasons. First, it means satisfied, loyal workers. Yeah. Think of getting life insurance, accident and sickness insurance, and retirement income, plus hospital, surgical, and medical benefits, all in one package from the Equitable Society, without any medical examination. Second, group insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society decreases labor turnover. All right. A fellow thinks twice before he walks out on a job which gives him extra insurance coverage at far lower cost than he could buy it as an individual. Third, Equitable Society group insurance improves quality and quantity of production. Believe me, I do better work now that I've got rid of all those worries about sickness and accidents and my wife and kids' future. Well, I hope every employer in this radio audience hears what you've said and that every one of them is resolving now to get the facts on complete group insurance protection from an Equitable Society expert. Get in touch with the nearest office of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or write direct to the New York home office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Indifferent Mother. Tonight's case in the files of your FBI gradually illustrates how easy it is for the most innocent youngster to get into trouble. How very important it is that every child be given as much parental guidance as possible. Because without that guidance, without that pillar to lean on, any young boy or girl can easily become involved in any one of a series of major crimes. Children don't just grow. They must be helped. And in helping them, you help fight the greatest problem American law enforcement officers face today. The problem of juvenile delinquency. The night file continues at the local FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is studying a later report from the Cleveland field office about the stolen car gang when the telephone rings. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Oh, hello, Jim. Ned Hamilton. Oh, hello, Ned. I'm down at the city hospital. Hey, what happened to you? Oh, nothing. I came down here to get some information from a patient. Uh, who's that? One of our motorcycle patrolmen was chasing a car out on the old post road tonight. As he pulled alongside, the car swerved and knocked him into a ditch. What happened to him? Broken leg and severe contusions. But he's conscious. I, I just spoke to him. Hmm. He got the license number of the car, and I checked it. Stolen? Yes. It was being driven by a young boy. There were three kids in the car, and he recognized one of them, a young girl. Oh, who was she? She was a girl who sang in a school play out at Washington High School this afternoon. The patrolman saw the play because his daughter was in it, too. What was the girl's name who was in the car? Alice Roberts. Mm -hmm. Have you sent an alarm on the car yet? Yes, just before I called you. Well. Whoever the kid was, he stole a car he can go a long way with. The man who owns it had just put four brand new tires on it less than a half hour before it was stolen. Ned, did you get an address on this Roberts girl? Yes, she lives at uh, 410 North Adams Street. 410 North Adams I'll go out there right now. And, Ned, when I finish, I'll meet you at the hospital. <laughs> Aunt Clary, you got a minute? I've got to see you. Sure, Ricky boy. What's on your mind? I had an accident. What kind of an accident? I was coming out here with a heap and a cop started to chase me. Did you shake him off? Better than that. What do you mean? He was on a motorcycle. I let him get alongside him, and then I swerved, and he went into a ditch. Well, what did you do with the car? I drove it into the basement downstairs. Ricky boy, are you crazy? You want to get everybody thrown into jail? What do you want me to do? Stop and get picked up? I want some protection. Where's your girl? She's down in the car, and there's another girl with us. What'll I do? Get back downstairs and wait for me. <laughs> All right, Alice, I'm coming. Oh. Hello. I thought it was my daughter. She's always losing her key. Are you Mrs. Roberts? Yes, that's right. My name is Taylor. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Oh. Here are my credentials. The FBI? What do you want here? It's about your daughter, Alice. Alice? Where is she? I don't know where she is, Mrs. Roberts. That's why I came here. What's happened to her? She was seen tonight riding in a stolen car along the old post road. In a... St- Oh, that can't be true, Mr. Taylor. She's in the school play at Washington High School tonight. 
That school play was held this afternoon. It was? Yes. It's odd. I, I was sure it was tonight. Mrs. Roberts, did she say where she was going tonight? Well, I didn't ask her. I, I haven't the faintest idea. Well, can you give me the name of some of her close friends? They might know. Well, I I don't really know any of Alice's friends. Mm -hmm. Well, then can you tell me where your daughter likes to go when she goes out? Why, I... Well, how would I know? Well, girls usually tell their mothers about things like that. Yes, but Especially I... if the mothers show any interest. Oh, oh my poor baby. It's a little late for that, Mrs. Roberts. However, if you'll try to help me, we'll do everything we can to find her. any way I like. I can the chatter. Here comes Aunt Clara. Well, what are you doing, Ricky boy, robbing the cradle? Look, Flo is all... I mean the other one. What's she crying for, her mother? No, she felt sorry for the cop on the motorcycle and wants to call the police. It serves you right, Ricky boy. I've told you a dozen times. It's always better to work alone. Well, I did the job alone. I picked them up after. You should have delivered the car before you picked them up. Well, it's too late for that now. What will I do next? What do you do with us? Please, dear. One thing at a time. Rick, the first thing to do is to get rid of the car. Okay. Now put the girls in my office and we'll lock them in while you're gone. Right. And don't go near the garage with that car. It's too hot. Just take it out on the road someplace and leave it. And when you come back, I'll let you know what I've decided about the girls. <laughs> Hello, Ned. Sorry I made you wait this long. Yeah, that's okay, Tim. I just finished talking to the patrolman's doctor. Uh -huh. Oh, I went out and saw that girl's mother. Well, could she give you any help? No, not a bit. You know, I can understand why her daughter is out with the kind of company she's keeping. She's just letting that girl grow up by herself. Yeah, I know the type. One thing puzzles me, though. I spoke to the patrolman's daughter after I spoke to you. She swore this Alice Roberts is a fine girl. Yeah, well, she is with that kind of a mother. It's a miracle. Oh, have you spoken to your office since you talked to me? Yes, I called them just before I came down to meet you. Yeah. They uh, found the car that the motorcycle patrolman was chasing. They did? Where? About five miles the other side of the straight line. Did you get the exact location? Yes, I did. Well, come on, Ned. I'd like to take a look at that car. Find anything inside the car, Jim? Just this program from a show that was given at Washington High School this afternoon. Mm -hmm. It uh, has Alice Roberts' name on it. Well, it proves she was in the car, all right. Yeah. Well, the car wasn't left here too long ago, either. The motor's still warm. Any fingerprints inside? None that are good enough to help us. Well, I guess this dent here is where the motorcycle hit. Yes, it's a fresh dent. The scratches are still clean. Well, at least we're getting a little closer to whoever did the job. We couldn't have missed him by very much. Ned, how about the state trooper who found the car? Did he give you anything? No, I was just talking to him. He didn't see anybody around here. How do you happen to be on a dirt road like this? Well, the farmer who owns that field saw the car and called the state police barracks. Oh, I see. Trooper made a complete inspection of the ground, followed a set of man's footprints up the dirt road, but he lost them when they reached the concrete highway. A set of man's footprints? Is that all? Yeah. Why? Well, that means he must have dropped the girls off someplace before he decided to get rid of the car. Yeah, that's right, Jim. Come on, let's take a look around up the outside of the car. I only went over the inside. Uh, let's use your flashlight, too, huh? Okay. Ed. What? Yeah. Look down here. Oh, what is it? Didn't you tell me that these were brand new tires that the owner had just put on the car this afternoon? That's right. Now, you see those little bits of blue stone that are caught in the tire? Yeah. What about them? They could lead us to that missing trio. <laughs> She's running the show. I want to go home. Oh, quit that, will you? Stay off her, Rick. Look, all she's done is beef and cry about wanting to go home. I want to go home, too. I don't like this any better than she does. Since when? Since you hit the cops. I like to have fun, but I didn't know you were stealing cars. So now you know. Yes, and I also know enough never to go out with you again. 
Well, Ricky boy, you got rid of the car, huh? Uh-huh. Look, we want to get out of here. You're getting out of here. You're letting them go? No, but I'm getting rid of them. What do you mean? You girls are taking a little trip. And I think we should get ready for it right now. Uh, Ricky boy, I'll need your help. Okay. What is this? Well, you're going away, that's all. And I have something here that should make you sleep through the whole journey. Hold her first, Ricky. No. No, keep away from me. Shut up. Let go of me. Get her alone, both of you. Who are you? Special agent of the FBI. Oh, thank huh? you. What are you doing here? I think that's obvious. Well, how did you know we were here? The car that was abandoned tonight had blue stones stuck in the tires. I remembered that the driveway here was covered with blue stones. Ricky, can you please take us home now? Well, there's a policeman upstairs who will take you home. I'm going to drive Aunt Clara here and a young friend down to jail. The woman known as Aunt Clara was tried, convicted, and given a 10-year sentence for a violation of the Motor Vehicle Theft Act. Her young accomplice, Ricky Hill, was sentenced to a reformatory until he reaches majority. And now, this is your FBI brings you a message on juvenile delinquency from the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The next voice you hear will be that of Mr. J. Edgar Hoover speaking to you from Washington, D.C. My message tonight is directed to the mothers and fathers of America, to all adult citizens responsible for the welfare of our youth. During the war years, when age 17 was leading all other age groups in frequency of arrests, the volume of juvenile delinquency in the United States reached an all-time high. It was disheartening to see thousands of our youngsters caught in the backwash of war. But I had hopes then that the condition was temporary that after the war, the factors that contributed to delinquency would be removed and corrected. That apparently was wishful thinking. There was an encouraging decline in youthful delinquency immediately after the war. But arrests of youngsters are again on the increase. During the first nine months of 1947, arrests of boys 18 to 20 years of age increased nearly 27% over the same period in 1946. Moreover, some of the wartime teenage offenders have grown up, and many are now committing more serious crimes. With a major crime occurring every 18 seconds, it is time to pause and examine the problem. I have noted that there is something lacking in the home life of most youngsters who violate the law. Even the delinquents, who are from apparently normal homes, are victims of parental neglect. The parents are either too careless or too busy with their own pleasures to give sufficient time, companionship, and interest to their children. I am convinced that a parent's gravest responsibility is to understand his children and win their confidence. Many fine, law-abiding parents actually do not know what their children are doing or how they spend their leisure time. When they find out, it is often too late. Their remorse does not remove the shame which their negligence has caused. Boys and girls are not hard to please. A little attention given to their problems and pleasure can mean so much. They violate the conventions of society because they are unhappy, because they feel insecure, and because they have not had the love and sympathy due them. Hence, my message is for the parents. Are you, the parents of our young people, doing everything in your power to develop your boys and girls into good citizens? Do you know your sons and daughters? Do you have their confidence? Are you acquainted with their friends? And do you know how they spend their leisure time? If you do not, I suggest that you take inventory and do what is necessary to make your home a place of learning as well as a place of living. A little more attention given to your child today may save the beginning of a life of degradation tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Hoover, for your telling and forthright message. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now some more useful facts on Equitable Society Group Insurance. It's a bargain for workers because it enables the company to give its employees the benefit of its wholesale purchasing power. It's a bargain for the management because it builds loyalty and goodwill, decreases personnel turnover, improves quality and quantity of production. 
For instance, the president of the Colgate Palmolive Peat Company, Mr. E.H. Little, says, Colgate Palmolive Peat Company, together with its employees, has recognized the advantages of group insurance protection. We believe that certain basic group plans are an important feature of a well-balanced industrial relations program. If your company does not have group insurance, or if your group program is incomplete, get in touch immediately with the nearest office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The colorful story of a cross-country quest for a stolen fortune. Its subject, bond theft. It's titled, Lady Luck's Husband. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time. For this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. If you have a friend who is a representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society, maybe this phone conversation will sound familiar to you. Hello? This is your Equitable Society representative. I just called up to remind you to listen to This is Your FBI tonight. The Equitable Society has some good news for you in the middle commercial. What news is that? There's a new edition just off the press of the Equitable Society's famous fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. That's the chart that made such a big hit with members of this audience last year. So be sure to listen to the middle commercial to learn how to get your copy of the Equitable Society's new fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Tonight's FBI file, Lady Luck's Husband. It is a regrettable but true fact that many decent, hard-working citizens hear or read about the current crime wave and regard it as something which only remotely concerns them. They are wrong. And if you believe that the crime wave does not directly affect you, then you are wrong, too. In the first six months of this year, thieves in the United States stole property worth almost $60 million, an average of well over $2 million a week. That property was not stolen from any special class of people, but from everyone in every strata of our society. More than one theft was committed every second of every hour around the clock, day and night. And the thing to remember is that for every theft, there was a victim. A victim who might just as easily have been you. Tonight's file opens in a gambling house located in a suburb in one of our large eastern cities. The owner, a lean, hard-looking, gray-haired man, is standing near the entrance and watching the various tables as a woman approaches. Where have you been? At the bar. I told you to lay off the grog, didn't I? I only had two drinks. Our, uh, boy is here. I know. I got the office from Charlie. Which one is he? The guy in the gray suit, standing next to Harry. I see him. You remember everything I told you? Don't worry about it. Here. Here's some chips. Go over and bet with him. Whatever he bets. There's only 200 here. You won't need any more. He's going to win tonight. Okay. See you later. Yeah. Good luck. Five minutes, two. 
Say the come and take the line. Next shooter. I'll shoot 50. 50 is right. And make your plays. Here he comes. Six and a one, natural. Pay the line. Now let it ride. I'll stay with him. Keep lucky, mister. Coming out. E-O-11, pay the line. Keep those dice hot. I'm shooting a hundred. And another hundred with him. Two and a four. Six is the point. Twenty and a hard six. Bet me twenty the same way. Here he comes. It's a three and a three. Hard six. Pay the line. Pay the hard six. Make your bet. Same man shooting. You're my lucky man. Yeah, you ain't doing bad for me, either. Make your bet. All right, make your bet. Shoot another hundred. How about you, honey? I'll go. Uh-oh. I've got to quit. Uh, what's the matter? I have to duck somebody. Still your dice, now, wait a minute. Come I don't want to lose you. You're too lucky. Well, then cash in my chips for me and meet me later at the bar. <laughs> Hey, over here. Oh, sorry, I kept you waiting, honey. I had to finish my shoot. How'd you make out? Oh, I went about a G. Well, not bad. Yeah, here's your dough. 600. Say, thanks. Can I buy you another drink? Sure. What is it, scotch? Mm, and water. Hey, Joe, two scotch and water, huh? Yes, sir. I'm sorry I had to run out on you like that. Well, did you have to? Yes. Why? Oh, I spotted a fellow coming in. Friend of my husband's. Your husband? Uh-huh. You see, he doesn't want me to gamble, so I have to sneak out and come here alone. He must be daffy. If I was married to anybody as lucky as you, I'd drive you to the game. Well, uh, I'm not usually so lucky. Maybe it was me? It was. Why don't you just say we're a good combination? Okay. One that ought to stay in business. Is, uh... That an invitation? Well, now that you bring it up? Yeah. But I'm a married woman. Well, you're with me now. Well, big, strong type fellow. Now, now it's like rolling dice. I pick my spots. Mm, I see. Hey, I don't even know your name. It's Hazel. Oh, I'm Bill. Hi, you Bill. Hi. Hey, look, uh, I got an idea. What? Where'd you tell your husband you were going tonight? To, to the theater with a girlfriend. You got any more excuses like that? That depends. What do you mean? I'm like you. I pick my spots. Well, how about picking a spot to meet me tomorrow night? <laughs> no, we'll look. listen to music instead of dice. What do you say? Well, okay. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk when Special Agent Frank Brady enters. Oh, Frank, full of a chair. Thanks, Jim. Hey, congratulations on the baby. Oh, that's right. I haven't seen you since then. <laughs> oh. How's Evelyn? Fine, Jim. She and the baby came home from the hospital this morning. Oh? No sleep at night for you for the next couple of months. <laughs> I've been thinking about <laughs> that. I hope there isn't too much night work on this new case. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Well, what's it about, Jim? I, all I know is that the boss assigned me to work with you. It's a bond job, Frank. Huh? $88,000 worth of negotiable securities were stolen two weeks ago in Los Angeles. Oh, and they uh, think the bandits are back here? No. No, the Los Angeles office arrested the bandits the day after the job. Well, I don't get it. What are we supposed to do? Find the bonds. Oh, I see. The L.A. office got a tip that the bonds were sent east right after the robbery. They, uh, they don't know how, do they? No. No, but my guess is they were sent by messenger. Now, have we got the records on the two bandits who were arrested? Yes. Yes, I've gone over them three times now, but I haven't been able to find any link that they had with anybody here in the East. Well, did either one of them have any family back here? Uh-huh. No, not according to the records. What do you think our first move ought to be, Jim? Well, I guess the only thing we can do right now is send out an alarm on the bonds, Frank. I've got all the serial numbers right here. I'll get up a list of security offices here in the city. Fine. And we'll follow up the circular with some phone calls. Check with me as soon as your list is ready, Frank, and we'll go to work. Hazel, throw me a match, will you? Hmm? Oh, sure. Here. Thanks. Oh. Jack, you look tired. 
I am. I was up all night. Again? Yeah, the tables ran late. We let the suckers play till six o'clock. <laughs> it's lucky I've got a boyfriend to take me out. Hmm. How are you doing with him? Not bad. We had another date last night. That's three, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, three. You got another date tonight? Mm-hmm. I'm meeting him at seven. Hmm. How nice for you. <laughs> How nice for him. You think you got him on the hook? Mm, well, all I can tell you is, last night the way he talked, you'd have thought I was the original dream girl. Hmm. You like that, huh? Sure. Why not? Did you tell him you were married? Uh-huh. Have you given him the husband routine yet? Uh-huh. You mean that he doesn't understand me? Yeah. Have you used it? Not yet. You, uh, kind of like this assignment, don't you? Jealous, baby? No, baby. I'm just reminding you. This is a business deal you're swinging. Look, why do you need this guy so bad? I already told you we need somebody to crack a safe. Why well, couldn't we hire him? We'd have to cut the job down the middle. This way, we get it for free. Oh. Honey. Huh? You've had enough fun with this guy. Tonight, I want you to go to work. Sorry I'm late, Jim. I was on the phone with Evelyn. The baby's been sick. Oh, really? What's wrong? The doctor says there's nothing serious. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, it's quite a relief. He cried all night. Oh, well, you'll get used to that. That's yes, all I understand. Uh, has anything come in on the alarm, Jim? No, not a word so far. But we did get a teletype this morning from the Los Angeles office. About the bonds? Yes. One of the men who committed the robbery decided to change his plea to guilty. Oh, that's good. Did you tell the whole story? Yeah, just about. Including the location of the bonds? He says they sent the bonds back here with a messenger. Well, that's what you guessed, Jim. Who was the messenger? A young hoodlum they gave $50 in expenses to. Pretty cheap for transporting that kind of loot. Well, it seems the messenger didn't know what he was carrying. I see. Who'd he bring the bonds to? A fence named Tom Reynolds. Tom Reynolds? Mm. Don't I know that name? Sure, sure you do. He's got a record that runs two pages long. A big, heavy set man with a, a small mustache? That's the guy. And now we know what our next step is. Let's see if we can find Tom Reynolds. Hazel? Yes, honey? Now, what's the matter with you tonight? What do you mean, Bill? No chatter, no smile. You want to dance? Hmm. No, baby. I got other things on my mind. Trouble? Well, I... Talk, spill it. Maybe I can help you. Come on, talk. Well, I left my husband. Oh? I couldn't stand his nagging another day. Well, that kind of a guy, huh? Yeah. Now, what was the final rule about Mm, well, it's a long story. The main thing was he always complaining about my spending too much money. I understand. That's a pretty common beef with husbands. He had no right to use it. It's my own money I was spending. You mean really yours? Yes. Well, you should feel happy to be rid of the guy. I would, but for one thing. Oh, what's that? Oh, it's a personal matter. Well, what is it? Maybe I can straighten it out for you. Well... I had $88,000 worth of bonds, my bonds, in my husband's safe at home. And when I left, he wouldn't let me take them. Why not? He said if he kept them, it would make me come back. Are you going back? Not if I get the bonds away from him. And if you don't? Well, then I'll have to go back. I haven't got anything else to live on. How do you feel about the guy? How do you think? You think you'd like to stay away from him? You're so right. How do you feel about me? You should know by now, Bill. I'm really hooked. Honest? Honest. Look, baby, you never did tell me where you live. I'm staying at the Central Hotel. I don't mean now. Where did you live before with your husband? 28 Mapleton Drive. Honey, we're getting out of here. Why? I'm taking you back to your hotel. Then I got a little trip to make. Where to? Your house, honey. To get those bonds. <laughs> Jack? Yeah? You all through work? Yeah, yeah. Not much business tonight. We closed early. Oh. Say, so what are you doing here? I thought you had a big date. I had it already. Oh, how'd it go? Fine. Uh, did he go over to Tom's to get the bonds? Yeah, an hour ago. Is he coming back here with him? 
Oh, just as soon as he gets them. Ha <laughs> ha, swell, swell. It worked out real good. You know something, Jack? Uh, what? I almost hated to do it. What? What are you talking about? Well, the boy really had a big yen for me. So? It's going to be real disillusioned. <laughs> no, ain't that too bad? I mean it. Look. Look, you ain't running a lonely hearts club. This guy's coming up here any minute with 88 thou worth of bonds and we're getting them free. Yes, Forget but... it, forget it. Now, uh, you know what to do when he gets here. Yeah. Just have him leave the bonds and say you'll see him tomorrow. Mm, I know. Oh, oh, that must be him now. Get in the other room. Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, uh, just a minute. Uh, hello. Is this uh, apartment 407? Uh, well, that's right. The man said to bring this package here. Just sign it, please. Oh, surely. Uh, there you are. Thanks. Uh, Jack. Yeah, yeah. Who was it? Delivery boy. He brought this. Oh, it's like flowers. Uh, who are they from? Uh, well, wait till I get it open. There. Hey, there's a note. Oh, wait a minute. I'll read it. What's it say? Uh, dear Hazel, many thanks, sweetheart, to you and your real husband for tipping me off where the bonds were. Your loving sucker, Bill. <laughs> Return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now let's bring this question of security closer to home. Ed, can you see the title of this chart I'm holding in my hand? Yes, it reads a fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Right, a fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers prepared by the Equitable Society. Okay, facts don't scare me. What's this chart all about, anyway? Ed, it's designed to open your eyes to your family's financial needs if you should die. Fill in this fact-finding chart, and you'll know how much money it would take to keep your wife and children well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed. Have you ever faced that fact, Ed? I'm ashamed to say I haven't. It'd be quite a job to figure all that out. Ed, with this Equitable Society chart, you'll have the answer in five minutes flat. Look, you're guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures, which illustrate the rock-bottom expenses your family will have to meet. And when you're finished, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Critical years? What are they? The years before your youngest child finishes high school. Years during which the home must have a minimum income to keep it together. I see your point. Where do I get one of these fact-finding charts? And how much does it cost? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy. Sit down with him, you and your wife together. There's no obligation, and get a true picture of where you stand. Phone him tomorrow to bring you an equitable fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard care of this ABC station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, Lady Luck's Husband. The history of the world since time began is studded with crimes. For even in the very earliest days, some men were so overcome with greed and lust that they became the first criminals. From that day on... Up to and including this very minute, some men have devoted their time and their very lives to planning and committing the perfect crime. In tonight's case from the files of your FBI, you see another example of a pair of criminals who tried the same thing with the same inevitable result. Someday, man will give up that evil dream of committing that perfect crime, but from all appearances, that day will not come soon. Tonight's file continues in the local FBI field office as Jim Taylor has just returned from a trip to the home of Tom Reynolds. Well, Jim, was that the right Tom Reynolds? Yes, Frank, it was. Did he have the bonds? I don't know. What do you mean? He was on the floor, unconscious, when I got there. How'd you get in? The front door was open. I guess whoever knocked Reynolds out left it that way. Well, where's Reynolds now? He's at Memorial Hospital. They came and took him away while I was there. Hmm. Did he ever regain consciousness? No, no, I didn't. Any lead on who knocked him out? Well, maybe I worked up a set of prints that I found on his wall safe and on a strong box that was laying open on the table. 
I sent them on to the Ident Division in Washington. Well, it looks like somebody else knew Reynolds had those bonds. Whoever did must have had a pretty good grapevine, because the bonds couldn't have gotten to town more than a couple of days ago. I guess word spreads fast on a deal like that. Yeah, apparently it does. What do we do now, Jim? Frank, I think the best thing to do is go home and get a couple hours sleep. We won't get a report on those prints until morning. <laughs> Is that you, Jack? It ain't your boyfriend with the bonds. Oh, stop beefing, will you? Go out and get those bonds for me and I'll stop. Wasn't my fault we got double-crossed. Didn't I ask you to stay right with the guy when he did the job, didn't I? Yes, you did, but I thought it was better this way. Ah, uh, every time you do any thinking, we get into trouble. Did I pick him out and say he was a sucker? No, that was your idea. The whole thing, the whole thing was set up for you, and if you stayed with him, we'd have the bonds. Look... You once told me, don't cry about losing a bet. That's right. You said, just worry about winning the next one. Well, we blew a bet. You blew it, not me. All right, all right, I blew it. But we're in this thing together. Let's try to figure out how we can win the next bet. Ah, that's a cinch. All we got to do is find Bill Newton. I was just over to the place where he used to live. Used to live? Yeah, yeah, the janitor told me he blew with all his bags. There must be some way to find out where he went. (sighs) I called every guy in the mob. If he shows up any place, they're going to call me. Well, let's stop worrying, then. He's got... Wait a minute. Huh? Do me a favor, will you? What? Throw out those flowers. Frank. Oh, Frank. Hi, Jim. I came right over as soon as I got your message. What's going on? We received a report from Washington on those fingerprints that I found at Reynolds' house. They were identified as belonging to a thief named Bill Newton. Ah. I checked, and I found that he lives in this building. Good. No, not so good. He's gone. Oh? Huh? Yeah, I checked out early this morning. See. I have a pass key here to his apartment, though. Come on. Any idea where he went? No. No, I talked to the superintendent. He couldn't give me anything on him. But he did have one piece of information. What's that? He said there was a thin, gray-haired man around here about two hours ago. Also looking for Newton. Who could that be? I don't know. Oh, here's the elevator. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, press number four, will you? Right. You know, whoever that gray-haired man was, it was pretty important to him to find Newton. Why did he say that? He offered the superintendent $1,000 if he could remember where Newton was headed for when he left here. Sounds like the gray-haired man knew about the bonds. Yeah. No, he's up for Go ahead. Thanks. It's the last door on the left-hand side. You know, if we get lucky and find a lead, maybe we can catch Newton before he leaves town. Hello? Hello, Hazel. Anybody call me? No. No, where are you? At the joint. Oh, you coming home? Oh, later. Should I get dressed for dinner? We going out? I don't know. Right now, I'm not interested in dinner. Did you hear anything about Newton? No, nobody's seen him. Well, he must be someplace. I know that. I mean, he's got to turn up sooner or later. If he turns up later, he's no good to me. I need him now. But, Jack... Uh, Hold the phone a minute, honey. There's a guy trying to talk to me. Hazel, listen. How soon can you get our bags packed? Why? I just spoke to Harry Marshall. He saw Bill today. Where? At the airport. He was getting on a plane for Miami. So pack your bags and I'll pick you up in ten minutes. How are you doing in here, Frank? Not very well, Jim. Anything in that closet? No. Looks like Newton had time to pack all of his suits. Mm-hmm. Anything in these papers in the wastebasket? No, I've been through those, Jim. Oh. The only thing he left here is an overcoat. Oh. Well, that could mean he's headed someplace where he doesn't need one. Unless he left it here to throw us off. No, I don't think he's that smart. Besides, he didn't know we were looking for him. That's true. Did you find anything? No, the laundry hamper in the bathroom is full of soiled monogram shirts, handkerchiefs... And... There's a laundry box full of clean shirts, also monogrammed, delivered after Newton had skipped. Well, those monograms fit in with what it said in his record, remember? Oh, yes. It's a very fancy dresser. Well, Frank, I think we'd better go back down to the office if we can work up some of the lead. Okay. There's nothing here except the shirts. Not a lot. Hey, wait a minute. Huh? I think I just thought of something. What? 
Let's go back in there and look over that laundry. What number are we looking for? 1027. Come on, come on. It's down this way. Are you sure he's in? Honey, I didn't give that bell captain 20 bucks for nothing. This I'm going to enjoy. When I think how he can't... Quiet, quiet. That's the room there. Who's there? Telegram, Mr. Newton. Step back, sucker. Well, this is a surprise. Listen, you... Lay off. I'll do the talking. What do you want? Take a guess. If it's the bonds, I haven't got them. Don't make jokes. I'm not in the mood. I'm telling you, I haven't got them. Look, son. You ever seen one of these? In case you haven't, it's a gun. Yeah, and that little thing on the end is a silencer. It don't make any noise at all when it goes off. You want me to show you? No, never mind. Where are the bonds? In the top drawer over there. I'll get Stay them. where you are. Hazel, take a look. Okay. Well? I'm looking. In the right-hand corner. Did you hear that? Yeah. Yeah, I've got him. Good, good. Here you are, Jack. Now, the next time, stick to your own racket, Newton. Just crack safes. Don't try to outsmart anybody. Come on, let's get out of here. Wait a minute. I'm not finished. But, Jack, We you... can't leave the chump like this. Now, look, you got your bonds, didn't you? That ain't enough. What do you mean? I'll show you. Drop that gun. Huh? Go on, drop it. I turn around slowly. Who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. What do you want with us? Those bonds? We don't know anything about them. She's right. They belong to this guy. He's lying there, hers. Suppose you tell all this to the real owner in federal court. Now, come along, all of you. Jack Mayfield and Bill Newton were tried and given a 15-year sentence for violation of the National Stolen Property Act. Jack's wife, Hazel, received a five-year sentence for her part in the crime. And so, three more criminal careers were brought to a close because of the alert observation of a special agent of your FBI. A special agent who remembered that every piece of laundry he had examined had borne the same label. He also reasoned that if Phil Newton was a fastidious dresser, it was likely he would order his new supply of shirts from the same man who had made his old ones. A check at the store revealed that Newton had called before taking the plane and had ordered his new shirt sent to him at the hotel in Miami. That was not a big clue, or even a seemingly important one, but every special agent is trained to follow every clue, big or small, to its conclusion. For that reason, your FBI was able to close this case And once again, to protect you, the American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now, one last word about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Mr. Keating, I've been looking over that chart. My wife and I have been dodging this issue for years. Now we're really going to know how she and the youngsters would get along if anything should happen to me. Believe me, I want one of those charts for myself. Well, Ed, the man who'll see that you get one of these fact-finding charts is your Equitable Society representative. No charge or obligation, of course. Make a note to phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this ABC station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The story of a special agent's search for Santa Claus. Its subject, the Christmas season. Its title, The Return of St. Nick. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. 
Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Stein. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The return of St. Nick on This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. This afternoon and this evening, all over the country, Equitable Society representatives have been calling their friends on the telephone. Hello? Good evening, Mr. Long. This is Frank Morris, representing the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Mr. Long, I just wanted to remind you to listen to the Equitable Society's program tonight. It's This Is Your FBI. Yeah, I know. I listen every Friday. Well, tonight the Equitable Society has an announcement that is going to interest you personally. The Equitable Society has just issued a new and enlarged edition of its famous fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Don't miss the middle commercial. Find out how to get your copy of the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Tonight's FBI file... The Happy Honeymooners. Crime in the United States today is at an all-time high. And the figures gathered by your FBI and by other law enforcement agencies are enough to shock even the most complacent into a realization that the time to fight the crime wave is now. There is an average of more than 2,000 thefts committed in this country every day, or more than one every minute around the clock. That fact is serious enough. But even more serious is the companion truth that crime, like any disease, spreads quickly when it remains unchecked. We are all about to enter a new year. If we all do our part to help fight that crime wave, it can be a year to be remembered with pride. If we fail to do our part, then the same crimes we suffered this year will be repeated. With one difference, there will be more of them. Tonight's file opens on a remote country lane in one of our Midwestern states. It is early afternoon, and a young boy and girl are riding along the river road in a brand new convertible. Isn't this nice, honey? Oh, it's lovely, Eddie. Just lovely. <laughs> Happy? Very. Oh, look at that view. You can see ten miles up the river. Uh-huh. Oh, gee. I wish we could sometimes settle down in a place like this. I hate to keep traveling all the time. Well, I don't like it too much myself, dear, but I know. Gotta... Business comes first. That's right. Well, this is where we get out. What do you mean? Look through those trees. You see that cabin? Uh-huh. It's ours. What? I rented it this morning. Oh, Eddie, you didn't. I've got the keys right here. Come on. Oh, Eddie, this is such a wonderful surprise. I hoped you'd think so. Gee. That's what I've always dreamed about. Honest? Honest. It's perfect. I just wish now that... You wish what, honey? Well, I don't want to have to leave this. You don't. You mean we're going to settle down? 
stay in one place? Yeah. But what about work? Oh, well, we'll keep working. In fact, we got a job tonight. We're sticking up a jewelry store. <laughs> Go ahead, honey. Ring the bell. Okay. Gee, what a ring. Yeah. You think anybody's home? Oh, oh yeah, I checked. Yes? Uh, good evening, Mr. Mitchell. Good evening. I'm sorry to trouble you, but my car broke down outside your door. I was wondering whether I might use your phone to call a garage. Certainly. Right in. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Okay. A young couple. Their car broke down and they want to use the phone. Oh. Well, Howard asked them to take off their coats. They must be drenched. I'll uh, keep mine on, Mrs. Mitchell. I'm going right out again. In fact, your husband's coming with me. Oh. What? Howard, he's got a gun. What is this? Don't get excited, folks. Howard, this is a holdup. If it is, he's wasting his time. We have nothing of value here. We know that, Mr. Mitchell. Then what? My husband wants you to take him down to your jewelry store. Then, if you don't mind, he'd like to have you open your safe. I won't do it. Mr. Mitchell, this gun here says you got him. How would you better do as he says? He's right, Mr. Mitchell. All right, Mary. I'll go with him. Oh, swell. What happens to my wife? Oh, my bride won't mind staying here with her, will you, Lucy? Of course not. I just love to visit. She'll stay here till I get the jewelry. Oh, by the way, Mrs. Mitchell. Yes? She has a gun, too. Well, come on, sir. We'd better get going. Very well. Wait, Eddie. Huh? It's such a nasty night out, honey. Ask Mr. Mitchell if he'd mind bringing an umbrella. That same evening in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk just finishing a report on his last case. Busy, Jim? Hmm? Oh, hello, Doug. What are you doing around the office this late? Oh, uh, the boss called me at home and asked me to come in. Huh? Something special come up? Maybe yes, maybe no. Will you wait one second while I sign this report in the Fulton case, and I'll be all finished here. Yeah, I'm certainly glad that file is closed. Oh, my. I don't want any more of those tough cases. I'd like to work on a simple one for a change. We don't get any simple one. Uh, I guess not. Well, what have you got, Doug? Well, about two weeks ago, two youngsters stuck up a jeweler in Memphis, and we just got word from the Memphis office about it. Memphis thinks they're headed this way? That's it. The switchboard is working now, covering every hotel in town. But I doubt that it'll do any good. Oh, why not? Well, the descriptions aren't good enough. Too general. Hmm. But all we know is that one is a girl, and that both the girl and boy are blonde. Mm-hmm. Anything unusual about the robbery? Yes. They went to the home of the jeweler at night, forced him to ride back to the store and open the safe. No, well, that's a no wrinkle. You know, I wish people would pay more attention to robbers when they're held up. Not one in 20 can give you any kind of a description at all. Well, this jeweler in Memphis claims he was so scared he forgot everything. Hey, how'd they get into the jeweler's house? Oh, phony story about the car breaking down outside the door. I see. What do you think we ought to do first, Jim? Well, let's see. It's, uh, 7 o'clock now. I guess all the jewelry stores are closed by now, aren't they? Well, I imagine so. Well, we'd better get a list of the home phone numbers of every jeweler in town. You know, I think I know where I can lay my hands on that kind of a list, Jim. Fine. Get the list and we'll split it up and make the calls ourselves. Uh, Doug, how long will it take you to get the numbers? Oh, about 15 minutes at most. Good. I'll wait right here for you. When you get back, we'll go to work. (laughs) Gee, Mrs. Mitchell, I wish you'd stop that crying. Everything's going to be all right. I know it is. Look. Worrying isn't going to do you a bit of good. I know from experience. When I first started dating, Eddie used to do jobs all by himself, and I used to just worry myself sick about him. But he always came home safe and sound. Oh, please leave me alone. Well, I'm only trying to be sociable. I'm only trying to point out that you shouldn't be so unhappy. In fact, if I was you, I'd be glad. My guys have got a beautiful home here. You don't have to travel. You've got lots to be thankful for, Mrs. Mitchell. Why did you have to pick on us? Huh? There are other jewelers in this city. Why did you pick on my husband? Well, you know, that's a funny thing. We went window shopping one day, and we passed your husband's store, and I saw a ring in the window that I was just nuts about. So right then and there, I said, it... 
Wait, Mrs. Mitchell, before you answer it, I'll have to ask that you don't let on that anything's wrong. And make the conversation very short. Very well. Hello? Uh, hello, Mrs. Mitchell? May I speak to my wife, please? It's for you. Thank you. Hello? Hello, honey. Everything's fine down here. Mr. Mitchell was very cooperative. Oh, good. Yeah, I'll be leaving here in a few minutes. I'll see you back at the cabin. Well, how are you going to get there? Oh, in Mr. Mitchell's car. Oh, well, that's nice of him. All right, dear, I'll meet you in about half an hour. Oh, fine. I love you, honey. I love you, baby. Bye-bye. Goodbye. I'm sorry, Mrs. Mitchell, but I've got to go now. Oh, thank you. Before I leave, though, please be a lamb and let me tie you up. Hi, Jim. How you coming? Made my last call a minute ago. How about you? I just finished. Well, it ought to be tougher than to pull that same stunt on any jeweler around here. Yeah, I think so. Hey, uh, any numbers on your list that didn't answer? Yes, two. Mm-hmm. Say, um... How about the newspaper? I've already called him, Doug. They'll use the story tomorrow. Oh, excuse me. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Mr. Taylor, this is Sergeant Drew down at headquarters. Yes, Sergeant. We just got a call from a Mrs. Howard Mitchell in Springtown. Mm-hmm. She says a young couple came into her house tonight, made her husband go down to his door and open the safe. Uh, Sergeant, is Mr. Mitchell a jeweler by any chance? That's right. How'd you know? We've been looking for that couple, Sergeant. Have you got any descriptions on them? <laughs> Not very much. Mrs. Mitchell was too excited to tell me more than just the bare facts. Mm-hmm. You say this Mr. Mitchell was brought into the city from Springtown. That's right. That's across the state line, Mr. Taylor. That's why I called you. That makes it a kidnapping case. Uh, Sergeant, what's Mrs. Mitchell's address? 169 Bedford Street, Springtown. 169 Bedford. And the address of her husband's store? 1218 Fifth Avenue. 1218 Fifth. Thanks very much, Sergeant. We'll get on it right away. Doug, we've got some work to do. What's that, Jim? A young couple has already pulled a job. Well, that's what I gather. A local jeweler was taken from his home to his store. Here's the address of the store, Doug. You check there. I'm going out to the man's home. Who's there? Oh, oh, just a second. Oh, baby, you're so... I know. Oh, gee, why didn't you blow the horn or something? I, I would have come out with Mr. Mitchell's umbrella. Oh, that's okay. Oh. Let me get this coat off. Sure, let me help you. Oh. My gosh, I never saw such it. rain. Yeah, I know. Eddie, huh. where's the jewelry? Oh, right over there in that bag. Oh, I can't wait to see it. Okay, I'll get it for you. Okay. Eddie? Yes? Isn't that Mr. Mitchell there in the corner? Mm-hmm. Well, what's he doing here? Oh, I brought him back with me. Looks like he's tied up. He is. Here. Take a look at this stuff. Oh, Eddie. Real nice, huh? Oh, it's beautiful. And look here, honey. Remember this? It's a ring I like so much. Uh Uh-huh. I had Mr. Mitchell make a special effort to put that in. Oh, honey, you're so thoughtful. Oh, that's okay. Eddie. Yeah, dear. What made you bring Mr. Mitchell home with you? Oh, I had a reason. We only have one bedroom. Well, he can sleep where he is tonight. What was your reason? Oh, I figured he could afford to give us a little more money. Oh. Well, I called his wife and told her we were going to keep Mr. Mitchell until she gave us $20,000. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now let's bring this question of security closer to home. Mac, you're a father. Did you ever see a chart like this before? Hmm. A fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. What's it all about, anyway? This fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers has just been published by the Equitable Society to perform a very useful service for a man like you. Go on, I'm listening, Mr. Keating. It was designed to show you how much money your family would really need to keep going if you should die. Fill in this fact-finding chart, and you'll know exactly what income will be required to keep your wife and children well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed. Hey, that's something every man with a family ought to figure out. Well, with this Equitable Society chart, you'll have the answer in five minutes flat. Look, you're guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures, which illustrate the rock-bottom expenses your family will have to meet. And when you've finished, 
you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Critical years? What's that mean? The years before your youngest child finishes high school. Years during which the home must have a minimum income to keep it together. Okay. I'm going to buy one of these fact-finding charts tomorrow. Now, they're not for sale, Mac. They're free. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy. Sit down with him, you and your wife together. There's no obligation, and get a true picture of where you stand. Phone him tomorrow to bring you an equitable fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard, share of this ABC station, to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Happy Honeymooners. According to the most recent figures available, there are approximately seven and one-half million persons with arrest records in the United States today. And like any other group of people, they have certain things in common. But there is one thing which each criminal has that is his and his alone, his appearance. No two criminals look alike any more than any two decent citizens look exactly alike. It has been a popular misapprehension that you can spot a criminal by watching him. Experts in the living habits and movements of criminals like the special agents of your FBI will be the first to tell you that nothing could be further from the truth. There is absolutely no way to tell a criminal from a law-abiding person until one of them commits a crime. For that reason, your FBI advises extreme caution in dealing with any strangers. Do not assume that every stranger is a thief. But by the same token, being careful may save you from becoming another victim of America's current crime wave. Tonight's file continues in the FBI field office. Special Agent Taylor has just returned to the office from his interview with Mrs. Mitchell. Well, Jim, I see you got soaked too. Yeah, the skin. I don't think I ever saw it rain this way. I certainly hope your trip was more productive than mine. Nothing at the store at all, huh? Not a thing. The police had already arrived when I got there, and they went over everything. How about the safe? Oh, it was wide open and empty. No fingerprints? None at all. Mm. I imagine that Mitchell must have opened the safe himself, but if he did, he was wearing gloves. How about Mrs. Mitchell? Well, she was all right until she got a phone call from the man the girl called Eddie. Eddie said he was holding Mr. Mitchell for $20,000 ransom. Mm -hmm. They didn't kidnap the jeweler in Memphis. No, no, they just robbed him. This is something new. How is uh, Mrs. Mitchell going to contact Oh, she's not. When Eddie called, she said that she didn't have $20,000, so he said he'd give her a little while to dig it up, that he'd uh, call her back. Well, any call out to Springtown is a long-distance call, Jim. Uh, I know. The phone company is going to trace any call made to the Mitchell's number. Mm-hmm. We'd better sit right here until they call. All yeah, right, that's about all we can do. Could Mrs. Mitchell uh, describe the couple? Only very poorly. She was... Practically in the starch, not to the screen. Oh, pardon me. Special Agent Taylor. This is Sergeant Drew again. Yes, Sergeant. Mrs. Mitchell got another call from the kidnapper. How long ago? About five minutes ago. Operator Trace it? Yes, she said the call came from Centerville. Centerville 842. Centerville 842. Thanks, Sergeant. We'll get on it right away. That was our call, Doug. Mitchell is being held at the house with the phone number Centerville 842. Let's check that number and get out there as fast as we can. <laughs> Yes, honey. I was just listening to the most wonderful program on the radio. All about a woman who forgets her name and she can't remember where she uh, lived. Uh, and... Look, look, dear. I'm trying to make a rough estimate on these jewels. Tell me later, huh? But, Eddie, the announcer broke into the middle of it. Oh, what did he say? He said that the river was rising. Mm-hmm. He said it'll flood the whole valley, that everyone will be marooned here after the night. Hey, that's not so good. What do we do, honey? We're practically next to the river. Yeah. I think maybe we'd better get out of here. Oh. Look, if we're marooned here, we'll get picked up for everything. Well, what do we do with Mr. Mitchell? We'll just have to leave him here. How about the $20,000 from Mrs. Mitchell? I think we better settle for the jewels. 
Are your bags still packed? Yes. Well, you better get them, and we better get going. Well, can't we wait about ten more minutes? What for? I want to hear how that program comes out. <laughs> Look at that river, Jim. Yeah, it's really roaring. I don't think I've ever seen it that high. It's flood stage, all right. Think the bridge will still be open? All we can do is hope. Well, if it's closed, we don't get across. Mm, I know. Look, Jim. Huh? There's a man with a lantern in the road. Yeah, yeah, I see him. Coming around on my side. I'll roll my window down, Doug. Sorry, sir. The bridge is closed. We're both special agents of the FBI. You're my credentials. Is there any chance of us getting across? Oh, I wouldn't suggest it. Huh? How bad is it? There's no telling. But you can gamble if you want to. Doug? Any way you want it, Jim. Well, let's take a chance. Okay with me? We're going to try it. Well, good luck. I sure hope you make it. Thanks. The left a little, Jim. Okay. Hold it. Huh? What is it? Railing's down. Suppose that means anything? Well, let's find out. The water looks pretty deep up ahead. Yeah. I think we can keep the wires dry for a short slot. Okay, now, this is the end of the bridge. Yeah. Now, let's go find our couple. That going all right. Look, there's Mitchell tied up over there in the corner. Yeah. How is he, Jim? Mm. He's breathing, but he's unconscious. Come on. Come on, it's in time. Get him to a doctor and then come back here. Daddy? Hmm? You know, how are you thinking? About what, honey? About how nice it must be to live like Mr. and Mrs. Mitchell. What do you mean? You know, with a nice home and pictures on the wall. And a place where you can have your friends over for dinner. Hey, you're not sorry you married me, are you, honey? No, Eddie, you know I'm not. Oh, it's just that I wish you weren't a traveling man. Oh, but you knew what business I was in when we got married. I know, dear. I'm not complaining, honey. What are you stopping for, honey? Well, there's a fork in the road, uh... Uh, take a look at the map and see which way we go, huh? Oh, Eddie, I forgot it. I left it in the cabin. Oh. Well, I'll take a chance on this right turn. Where are we going, honey? To Chicago and sell the jewelry. And then on to New York. Come on, Doug. I want to see where this door leads to. All right. What's there, Jim? It's a shed attached to the cabin. It's been used as a garage. Mitchell's car is here. They must have used their own car for a getaway. Mm-hmm. What do you got there? A map. I wonder if it was theirs. Is that a route marked on it? Yeah. Yeah, it's the road between here and Chicago. Mm-hmm. It still doesn't help much. We don't know what kind of a car they were driving. We don't know what they looked like. Mm-hmm. Aside from that, everything's under control. Mm-hmm. Not much point in setting up a roadblock if we haven't got a description. Wait a minute, Doug. Well, look here. Hmm. Look, this can give us one lead on that young couple. Come on, let's get to the phone. Take a right turn here, Jim. I know. Got about five more miles to go. Uh huh. You spoke to Mitchell's wife. Yes, I called her from the doctor's home. I told her he'd be okay. 
hope that roadblock has been set up. I just hope it was set up in time. There's a line of cars up ahead, Jim. That's the beginning of the roadblock. Like a hundred cars or more. I was hoping there wouldn't be that many. What are they all doing out in weather like this? They're probably trying to get into the city before both bridges go out. Do we start at the head of the line? No, Doug. We'll park it here and walk up. Only about 20 more cars, Jim. Well, we can't get any wetter. That's one consolation. <laughs> That's true. Now, right, let's take a look at this convertible. Okay. Doug? Yeah. Shine your flashlight closer, will you? How's that? Yeah, that's fine. I think we may have something here. I wonder how long they're going to keep us waiting here. Oh, a man said it'd be only a couple of minutes. He said they were fixing the road. Well, this is certainly a silly time to be fixing a road. That's all I can say. Well, maybe the storm washed some of the gravel away. Ready. Huh. Look, here on my side. Well, what is it? Two men standing there. Oh, maybe their car got stuck. They're looking in, Eddie. Maybe they're cops. You better get out of here. Hey, that's what we're going to do. Look out, Eddie. They both got guns. There you are. Oh, oh, no. Special agents the FBI. What do you want? We want you for armed robbery and kidnapping. Well, you must be mistaken. Oh, no. no. Your car left its signature in the dirt floor of the garage by your cabin. Huh? Your left rear tire had a deep gash in its diamond-shaped thread. That's all we had to look for, but it was enough. Mister, can you close the door? I'm getting soaked. Oh, don't worry about that, lady. Both of you are going to a place where you'll be dry for a long, long time. The wanton young couple was sentenced to 25 years and 15 years, respectively, for kidnapping and violation of the National Stolen Property Act. And thus, by careful investigation and hard work, your FBI thwarted the get-rich-quick scheme of another pair of criminals. A pair who proved they would stop at nothing. A pair who, though young and innocent in appearance, were as completely criminal as any murderers on record. That their well-laid plans came to nothing is a tribute to the thoroughness with which two special agents followed every clue and kept following them until they achieved the two goals of your FBI in every kidnapping case. The safe return of the victim and the capture of the criminals. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now back to the news we announced in our middle commercial. The new and enlarged fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Just issued by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Uh, Mr. Keating, let's see if I've got this straight. The purpose of this chart is to give me a true picture of the minimum income required to give my family a decent standard of living if I should die. That's right, Mac. And the man who'll see that you get one of these fact-finding charts is your Equitable Society representative. No charge or obligation, of course. Phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Meanwhile, your Equitable Representative wishes you a very happy New Year. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case involving the operations of a gang of professional thieves. Its subject, bank robbery. Its title... The Sorrowful Safe Cracker. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis, your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Sorrowful Safe Tracker on This Is Your FBI. <laughs> Thank you.
This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight, would you know what to say if your telephone should ring like this? Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? It's, uh, this is your FBI, just starting. Do you know who sponsors that program? Sure I do. It's the Equitable Life Assurance Society. I listened to this equitable program last week. Heard about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. My Equitable Society representative bought me a copy. So naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. In about 15 minutes, I'll be back with full information about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Tonight's FBI file, The Sorrowful Safe Crackers. Fashions in crime, just as there are in any other field. And while there are some who go against the trend, most criminals, like most legitimate citizens, follow the current fashion religiously. Some years ago, for instance, if a criminal wanted a quick reputation among his fellows, or if he wanted the biggest possible loot, he planned to rob a bank. In those days, bank robbery was almost a common crime for banks were poorly protected. But today, all that has changed. Few criminals will undertake the tremendous risk involved in robbing a bank. In one six-month period last year, for instance, there were only 21 bank robberies attempted. Thieves have turned to attacking easier targets. That is, most of them have. But despite the overwhelming odds against them, there are still some criminals who believe that they can succeed where so many others have failed, who believe that they are smarter than the law. Tonight's file opens in a small furnished room located in the downtown district of a large western city. Harry Wheeler, a lean, hungry-looking young man, is reading a book when there is a knock at the door. It's open. Hi, Harry. Oh, thank you. Hey, it's getting cold out. You got a drink handy? Yeah. Here's a bottle. Help yourself. Thanks. Yeah, what are you doing, Reedy? Yeah. What are you wasting your time with that for? I ain't wasting my time. This is very special reading. Uh, hit me with it. Well, I, I don't know quite now how to tell you this, Cranky, but uh, well, for the last couple of months, I, I ain't been getting no fun out of my job. Hey, what do you want with fun? You get money, don't you? Oh, sure. But in the beginning, every time I cracked the safe, I, I got a big jolt. Now it's nothing. Hey, that don't make sense. Maybe it don't to you, Frankie, but it does to me. That's what made me go to a psychiatrist. A what? Well, them doctors that make you talk. You mean... Like that guy in the picture with Ingrid Bergman? Yeah, yeah, that's right. What do you need with, uh, with one of those guys? You going crazy? No, of course not. I went to him because I needed to get straightened out. I did. That's why I'm not doing any more jobs. <laughs> what about tomorrow? You and Rip have to get another guy. Now, look, Harry, we got... My to... mind's made up. But what about tomorrow? The doc says I should never have been a thief in the first place. What does he want you to do? Get a job in a grocery store? No, he, he thinks I ought to get away from the city. So I'm gonna. You're gonna what? I'm gonna take his advice. 
and get me chicken for him. Now, look, Harry, the job is all set for tomorrow. Where is Rip going to get another guy that quick? The job has got to be done on a holiday when the bank is closed. You know that? Frankie, I made up my mind. No more jobs. Fix me another drink, will you? Here's my glass. Yes. What is it? You know what I saw downtown today? What? The most beautiful gabbard in suit with a long skirt and those narrow shoulders. You'd love it on me. All right. You just got a new dress and two new hats. Yeah, but this suit's a bargain. How much? Three hundred. Wait till after the job tomorrow. Then will you get it for me? I don't know yet. Answer that, will you? Sure. Just a minute. Hiya, Nora. Oh, Frank, good morning. Rip, we got trouble. What kind of trouble? Harry is pulling out of the job. What? When did that happen? Just now. I just left him. What's the matter with him? He want a bigger cut? Nah, he went to some doctor, and the guy told him he shouldn't do no more jobs. What kind of a doctor is that? I don't know. He told me, but I don't remember. I better go talk to him. Uh, talk and do no good, Rip. He says he's finished. All right, don't get excited. Don't we have to do the job tomorrow? We'll do it tomorrow. And we'll do it with Harry. I'm you, Rip. Talk will do no good with him. It's mine. It's wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Honora. Yeah? You want to get that gabbard old suit? Oh, honey. Not so fast. First, you got a job to do. What kind of a job? Harry Wheeler's always been a little strong for you, isn't he? I don't think Harry likes me. Don't con me, honey. This is important. So he has a yen for me. It's not my fault. I'm not blaming you. I just want you to throw some charm at her. I know she said. What? What are you two talking about? Nora, Harry wants to pull out of the job tomorrow. Huh? You get him to go along with us, and you got your soup. Honey, you just made a deal. Two days later, in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk when Agent Don Brooks approaches. Hello, Don. Hello, Jim. Well, when did you come back to work? I checked in this morning. Huh? How do you feel? Well, I'll be all right. I was three weeks in the hospital. Straighten me out fine. Yeah, you look great. What are you working on? Well, the boss asked me to work with you on that bank job that was pulled yesterday. <laughs> I'm glad he did. It's a tough one. Huh? What's the story? Well, the robbers, whoever they were, rented the store next to the bank a month ago. And they dug a tunnel from the store onto the bank and into the bank's basement. Well, how come they didn't set off the alarm? The trap wires don't run underneath the vault, and I guess they knew it. You think they might have had some inside help? No, I kind of doubt that, John. After all, if they'd had inside help, they probably wouldn't have had to rent the store and dig the tunnel. Yeah, that's true. How much did they get? About $55,000. All of it in cash? Yes, they didn't touch any of the bonds that were in the vault. And once they got inside, of course, they turned off the alarm. That's right. Then they had an expert who blew that safe. I was down there this morning, and whoever did that job really knew what he was doing. Mm. Now, what time was the job done? During the day, according to the clock on the vault, it was blown at 11.14. How come there wasn't anybody in the bank at that time in the morning? It's closed, remember? The mayor declared a holiday yesterday because it was the city's 100th birthday. Oh, yeah, I remember. Whoever planned this job planned it to happen just as the parade was passing the bank. I spoke to some people who were standing in front of the bank. They didn't hear a thing. Well, how did they get away? Well, imagine they came back through the tunnel and out of the store. After that, they could melt into the crowd, isn't it? Mm. Any fingerprints on the vault? Not only no fingerprints, but not a single clue anyway. Who rented the store? The man who gave his name is William Adams. He paid cash for the first two months' rent. I guess William Adams is not available. Huh? Correct. He gave the landlord a fake address, so it probably isn't his right name either. Any description on it? No, no. The renting agent couldn't remember much about him. Well, you were right when you said this was a tough one, Jim. Well, what do you think we ought to do for a start? Well, Don, I think the best thing to do is get out the file of known bank robbers and take their pictures out of that running agent. If he recognizes any of them as Adams, we start to look for him. And if he doesn't? Well, if he doesn't, we'll try somewhere else. But for now, let's get those pictures and go to work. Okay, okay. Hold it a minute. Hello, Frankie. Come on in. Hey, the, uh, the job went okay, huh? Yeah, of course. I told you there wouldn't be trouble. 
Where's the dough? I rented the safe deposit box. Put it in there this morning. At the bank? Sure, it's safe there. When we get ready to blow, we take it out. Hmm? When do you think you want to be moving? Oh, I don't know. A week, ten days, then we get back east, do another job that's all cased out. Yeah? What kind of a job? Same thing. A job. Oh. Hey, who do we get to fill in for Harry? We don't need anybody. He'll be there. But he told me he was going to take the move from this job and pay for that chicken farm. How can he pay for the farm if he ain't got the dough? Well, his hand will be more than the farm court. I'm not giving him a dime. Oh, now, Rip, what'll that prove? Then he'll only get sore and never do another job. Yes, he will. He'll be back. What's going to make him? Nora. Oh. After we went to the bank this morning, I sent her down to see Harry. He's going to throw some uh, charm at him. And make him stay with us? That's the idea. Then with Harry, all we got to do is four or five more jobs like this. We can all quit with plenty of money in the bank. Yes, Jim. While you were out, we got a break. Here, take a look at this picture. Well? The blow-up of a section of yesterday's parade. The newspaper photographer who took it just brought it in. Take a look at that background. See the bank? Mm-hmm. And the store next to the bank? Hey, there are three men coming out of that store. That's right. Here, take a look at this through this glass here. The funnel they're carrying. Yeah, it must be the money. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, only one face shows up in the picture. He's been identified, though, as a thief named Joe Stewart. Well, what are these other pictures? Oh, well, those are a gallery of everyone who was ever arrested with Stuart. Mm, they ought to come in handy. Mm-hmm. Say, uh, did you notice the suit on the one who's holding the door open for the other two? Well, the one who's back is turned to the camera? Yeah. That's a pretty loud stripe to show up so clearly in a picture taken at that distance. Yeah. Who took the picture, Jim? One of the regular photographers in the morning dispatch. He just went up to the second floor of a building to get a better angle on the parade. Has it appeared in the paper? Mm-hmm. Oh, too bad. Oh, you mean because it'll warn the bandits that we know who they are? Uh-huh. They'll really go under. Yes, but by the same token, we also have a whole city full of helpers now. If anybody sees this man any place, they'll call the police. Uh-huh, that's true. And if they stayed in town thinking they had done a perfect job, they'll have a tough time getting transportation out. Mm-hmm. Every bus line, railroad station, and airline ticket counter has been alerted. Good. Well, what do you think we ought to do now, Jim? First thing to do is find Joe Stewart. Let's take another look for his record and see if we can get a lead. <laughs> Take it easy. Take it easy! Oh, Rip. What's the matter with you? I'm glad you're still here. Why? Don't you know what happened? What are you talking about? You ain't seen the paper yet. No, they got a story about the job? A story, nothing. They got your picture. What? Yeah. Let me see that paper. Yeah. That's the trim. Yeah. But your face is the only one that shows. You're the one who takes the rap. How do you like that? Yeah. What do we do now? We can't blow town. They'll be looking for me in the rock. But well, we can't stay here, Rip. One of these bell boys or somebody will turn you in for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. You take it, Frankie. Okay. Hello? Hello, Frankie. This is Nora. Oh. It's Nora, Joe. Let me talk to her. Yeah. Nora? Yeah? You still with Harry? Uh-huh. You better get back here right away. I can't, Joe. Why not? That's all off now. But you asked me to talk him out of buying that chicken farm. I know I did. Well, I did what you asked me to do. He's not going to buy the farm. I don't care about the farm now. Get up here as fast as you can. We've got to make a quick move. You mean because your picture was in the paper? Have you seen it, huh? Yeah. But then get back here. We've got to go under. Joe. What? You'll have to go by yourself. What do you mean? Well, instead of buying the chicken farm, Harry's going to Florida and... And I just promised him that I'm going with him. Goodbye. Hello? 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 What's the matter, Rich? Nora and Harry. They're double-crossing us, Frankie. They're going to go to Florida together. Uh, what do you lose? Just another stupid dame. Just another stupid dame, huh? That stupid dame happens to have the other key to my safe deposit box. What? And all our dough is in that box. <laughs>
return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now let's bring this question of security closer to home. A year ago on this program, the Equitable Life Assurance Society offered a special fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. The response was overwhelming. Thousands of charts were distributed by equitable representatives, and the supply was quickly exhausted. So this year, the Equitable Society has prepared a new and enlarged edition of the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. It's ready now. Just what does this chart do that makes it so popular, Mr. Keating? Well, Tom, it was designed to open your eyes to what your family's financial needs would be if you should die. Fill in this fact-finding chart, and you'll know within a dollar or two how much money would be required to keep your wife and children well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed. Come to think of it, that is something I ought to know. Tom, with this Equitable Society chart, you'll have the answer in five minutes flat. Look, you're guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the rock-bottom expenses your family will have to meet. And when you finish, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Hold on a bit, Mr. Keating. Just what are these critical years? The years before your youngest child finishes high school. Years during which the home must have a minimum income to keep it together. You sold me, Mr. Keating. Where do I buy one of these fact-finding charts? You can't buy them, Tom. They're free. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy. Sit down with him, you and your wife together. There's no obligation, and get a true picture of where you stand. Phone him tomorrow to bring you an equitable fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard care of this ABC station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to the FBI file, The Sorrowful Safe Cracker. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI graphically proves one important point about the alleged loyalties of one criminal for another. It proves that these loyalties are entirely legendary. The criminal who pursues his livelihood outside the common decencies does not have any loyalty nor anything else that is not for sale. He may hire his talent, his mind, or his muscles, but only for the money, never for anything else. By the very nature of his chosen career, sentimentality to the point of loyalty would be a liability. Because while it is true that a criminal may plan his every action... There is no way of his foretelling one important thing, and that is, who is going to double-cross him next? The only more important element in his plans is, who can I double-cross next myself? Tonight's file continues in the hotel apartment of Joe Stewart. He's seated in an upholstered easy chair, running his fingers nervously through his hair. How could she do this? And every dime I had on her. I know. Why would you want to leave a guy like me for a mooks like Harry? Yeah, the dirty cooks have probably emptied that safety the box by now. Well, even if they have, they're not going to swing with my dough. They, uh, they ripped one. How come you, uh, you give Nora one of the keys to the box? In case I get into a jam and I couldn't go get the dough myself. I never figured she'd double-cross me. Still got to get out of here. How can we move without dough? You carrying anything? Yeah, about a yard. I got 200. Uh, hey, Rip, I know where we can go. Where? Out to Harry's chicken farm. You know where it is? Yeah. Okay, let's pack and blow out the back way. Don, here I am. Oh, well, fine, Jim. The clerk at this hotel recognized Stewart's picture and called the office. That's why I left that note for you. Uh Uh-huh. Is Stewart living here? He was, but by the time the clerk called, Stewart had already sneaked out of his room. We didn't miss him by much, though. I found a cigar butt in one of the ashtrays. It was still warm. And he leaves it all on where he might have gone? The manager gave me this list. Oh, what is it? The list of the phone calls Stewart made for the past two weeks. That might give us a lead. Mm -hmm. Uh, Was there anything at all left in Stewart's apartment? No, he cleaned it out pretty well. The only thing in the place were these two library books. Oh, what are they? 
how to raise chickens, and this other one is those golden eggs. What was Stuart doing with books like that? I don't know, but it kind of ties into something I picked up at the switchboard. Oh, what was that? Operator told me she cut into Stuart's last phone call by mistake and heard some woman mention a chicken farm. Was that all she heard? Yeah. You know, maybe Stuart is using that farm as a hideout. Mm, Could be. Were the library books taken out in his name? I don't know. There's no card in either one of them. Hmm. I don't suppose we can check with anyone from the library at this hour. No, I tried from the phone up in Stewart's room. There won't be anyone there until nine in the morning. And by that time, Stewart can be wherever he's headed for. Well, John, the only thing we can do now is go back to the office and start checking these phone numbers. Yeah. If they don't give us anything, we'll check with the library first thing in the morning. Frankie. Frankie, get up! Oh. Come on, get up. You're all dressed, huh? I haven't been to bed yet. Why not? Those chickens, they drive you daffy. I kind of like them. Are you kidding? Look, I've been thinking how we can get our dough. In the safe deposit box? Yeah. yeah. I remember that when Nora called me yesterday afternoon, I looked at my watches. It was exactly 4.50. Well? Bank closed at 3 o'clock. That means they couldn't have gotten the dough yesterday. Hey, that's right. Nora will go to the bank as soon as it opens this morning. What did you say? I said Nora will go to the bank as soon as it opens this morning. Oh. Now, I want you to get dressed and meet her. Huh? Will you get dressed and get out of here? Yes, dear. What time's the plane leave? Well, let's see. One hour and twelve minutes. Uh, uh, we got plenty of time. Yes. Oh, sure. It won't take us well, ten minutes to get the money once we get to the bank. We'll have this cab wait for it. Happy? Gosh, yes. Will you... you miss that doctor? I should say not. <laughs> You're just what the doctor ordered. <laughs> oh, Harry, that's sweet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do we go much farther? No, the bank's right ahead. Well, I'll be open by this time. Sure. That's the building driver on the right-hand side. Come on in with me, honey. Okay. Here, now let me help you out. Oh, thank you. Hello, Nora. Frankie. Uh, what are you doing here? Joe sent me. I'll wait for you. Where is Joe? You'll find out. Let's go in and get that dope first. Eh, uh, don't oh. rumble. This gun in my pocket might go off. Sorry, I kept you waiting, Jim. Okay, I just got back here myself. Who's this Harry Wheeler who lives here, Jim? I don't know, but he's the one who took those books out of the library. Oh, I see. I came over here right from the library, but Wheeler was gone. Landlady said she didn't know when he was coming back. Oh, well, that's why you wanted this search warrant. That's right. Let's go in and take a look around his room. Okay. Go ahead, Don. Wheeler's room is on the ground floor. It's the first door down there on your right. This one, Jim? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's it, number three. Can you get the key? Yeah, right here. Good. Right. I don't know how much to search in here. It doesn't look that way. Jim, how does this Harry Wheeler fit in anyway? I don't know, Don. This is the only lead we've got right now. I see. Hey, Jim. Uh, I think I found something. What is it? Uh, it's a lease on a poultry farm. Well, looks like we came to the right place. Well, it still doesn't hook Wheeler into the bank job, though. All it proves is that there's some connection between Wheeler and Stewart. I'm come here. Huh? What is it, Jim? Look in this closet. I think this is all the proof we need. Who's that? It's me, Joe. I got company with me. Did you nail him? Yeah, I got him all right. Here's the door. Joe, Joe, honey. Shut up. Frankie, what'd you bring him back here for? What else could I do? Knock him off in the bank? He brought us here against our will. 
Lord Lee wanted to go away. That's not so. Huh? I didn't want to go away with you at all. Laura. You got me into this, Joe. You made me force my attentions on him. I did it all for you. Joe, she's breaking my heart. You stay out of this. Joe, honey, I was really doing like you asked me to do. Frankie, let's but, get out of here. Joe. Come on, Frankie. Right. There we are, Tony. Hey, what? Who is that? Don. See if any of them are loaded. Right. Oh, Cops, huh? You... Special agents of the FBI. Frankie, you let him tell you here. We didn't have to. We found the lease to this place in Wheeler's room. We also found the suit that he wore when you three did the bank job. That suit with the last stripe? That's right. The next suit for all of you will have stripes, too. Now, come on, let's get back to town. <laughs> Stewart was sentenced to 25 years. His confederate, Frankie, 20 years. Harry and the girl, 15 years each on charges of bank robbery. And thus, because of careful investigation and the determination to follow every clue to its logical conclusion, your FBI was able to check the careers of four criminals and also was able to return the stolen money Stolen money that formed part of an aggregate total of more than $36 million, which was returned to you, the citizens of America, after it had been stolen. That, too, is part of the protection which you receive from your local law enforcement agencies and from your FBI. moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now, for a moment, let's get back to the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. I've been looking over that chart, Mr. Keating. The way I figure it, it's going to take a load off my mind. From now on, I'm going to stop taking chances with my family's future. And as a first step, I'm going to get one of these charts for myself. Well, Tom, the man who'll see that you get one of these fact-finding charts is your Equitable Society representative. No charge or obligation, of course. Make a note to phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The dramatic story of a cunning killer's attempt to outwit the law. Its subject, extortion. Its title, The Unwilling Hostess. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The unwilling hostess on This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.